Welcome to the best of May 2020, 63 stories ranging all the way from real life horrors, such as stalkers, all the way to the darkest imaginations from the mind. As always, these stories are placed in no particular order. A huge thank you to all of the talented writers who allowed me to share their stories with all of you. Please be sure to drop a like if you enjoy. Let's see if we can reach 1500 likes. Subscribing if you're new is also very much appreciated. Enjoy the video. And as always, I hope you all have a great night. Every neighborhood has one, that creepy old house that nobody wants to go near. They're usually surrounded by overgrown trees and bushes. Parts of the siding have fallen to the ground due to neglect from whomever lives there. Dusty, old windows around the house only gives you a hazy glimpse of the shabby curtain hung in front of it. Of course, rumors would always be spread around the neighborhood about it being haunted or cursed. One particular house in my neighborhood checked every single one of those boxes, including the one about how an old, creepy hermit lived inside. I've only seen the owner of the house a few times, usually yelling from her windows at the children who have wandered too close to her home. Some of the kids occasionally taunted her yelling, Public sidewalk! public sidewalk, with their arms outstretched, almost daring her to come make them leave. She never did. She would always rabble on incoherently and slam the window shut. One particular night, I was walking my dog in past her house. As my dog stopped to sniff a very exciting patch of grass that had grown through the sidewalk, I took a second to look up to the house. One window was lit up and I could see through the sliver between the curtains. It was her. She was frantically talking to herself. I obviously couldn't hear what she was saying, but she seemed to be going back and forth between arguing with herself and then pleading with herself. A frown drooped across my face as I watched her yank at her hair while continuing her solo rant. I could see her throw clumps of hair to the floor after each yank. I hurried my dog along, and we continued home. Now, I've left out one particular feature of this horror house. Several of the windows were lined with old, creepy dolls. They were usually just piled up on the windowsill and all facing outward, staring at you from an already spooky house. I've never gotten close enough to really take a look at one of the dolls, but they were clearly old and decrepit. I've always assumed they were to frighten off the neighborhood kids, as most of the dolls looked purposely mangled, almost as if it looked as terrifying as possible. If that was her intent, she succeeded. My hell, they were horrific. Did you hear? My girlfriend asked me as I dried off one of the last dishes. Old Lady Higgins died last night. I saw the ambulance haul her off. I guess living to a ripe old age of 200 was a bit too much for her. She continued. Lori had been my girlfriend for two years now, and we had just barely moved in together. This was our first venture as full-fledged adults on our own, so we were that stereotypical excited couple, enjoying the wonders of our newfound freedom. Okay, first off, I never knew that was her name. Did you know her? I asked with a smirk as she dried her hands. No, my grandma told me. I guess they went to school together. She said she was always the weird girl in the corner who just doodled all day. She replied. Well, the crazy hit her pretty hard as she got older then. Still, it's always sad to see someone go. I offered, feeling a bit guilty about my first statement. I wonder what they're going to do with her house. She said in an echoing voice while talking into her coffee cup. What are you guys talking about? Paul said as he walked into the kitchen. He had stayed the night after our poker session from the previous night, when it went a bit longer than we thought. Paul was my best friend, and we'd often lose track of time when we hung out. Oh, that's crazy. Old lady up the street passed away last night. We were just talking about what's going to happen with her house. I replied, as I sat at the kitchen table with Lori. You mean that decaying old lump of a house? I didn't even know anyone still lived there. It looks condemned. He said with his eyebrows lifted. Probably should be. I replied. Hey, let's go check it out. Paul shouted excitedly. What? Lori yelped as she slammed her coffee cup a little harder than expected on the table. If she had any family, they probably won't be around for a while to get her stuff. I've always wanted to know what it looked like in there. 
although those dolls give me the creeps. He said almost in a salesman-like pitch. I scoffed. Aw oh, man, I'm good. Paul slumped his shoulders to show his disappointment. How about we just go take a peek in the windows? Seriously, my curiosity is killing me, he said, lifting his hands up on either side. I looked towards Lori. She shrugged her shoulders. It's up to you guys, she said, as she lifted herself from her chair. Apparently, Paul's little sales pitch worked, as we were soon venturing out towards the creepy house. Its ominous presence seemed to be quite a bit more menacing knowing the house was now vacant. A hesitation came over all three of us as we stood at the sidewalk of the house. We looked at each other for a bit of approval and began our walk. The crunching of the dead leaves and sticks under our feet reminded me of old horror movies where it would get quiet right before the big scare. A sense of thrill came over me as we walked around the side of the house. I looked towards Paul who immediately bit his bottom lip with his eyes lit up as if to dare me to peek in. I did. To my disappointment, the dirt on the window paired with the dark, unlit room made it impossible to see anything. The only thing I could clearly make out was an old wooden chair backed up against the closest wall. I sighed and looked towards Paul. Uh, guys? Lori said under her breath. We both turned to see Lori pointing towards another portion of the house. We walked over slowly to see what she was trying to point out. I snapped my head back as I saw an open window to the house's basement. We all gazed at each other for several seconds of quietness. We all had the same idea, but it was Paul that piped up. I say we go in, he demanded. I looked to Lori for her thoughts. Screw it, she said in a laughing tone. Without thinking, we marched towards the window. Paul, being the most eager of the three of us, made his way in first. It was a smaller window, but just enough room to make our way in. I heard a thud as he dropped to the ground. You good, man? My son, squinting into the dark basement. Yeah, come on down, he yelled from the echoed room. I made my way in followed by Lori. A fright came over me as I tried to gather my surroundings. We were actually in the creepy old lady's house. This was so crazy. A lone light bulb flickered on in the center of the concrete room. Paul had found the light switch. Oh, thank God, Lori exclaimed. A quick tour of the basement area showed... Nothing much. It was mostly empty aside from a few boxes and old furniture. We found the stairwell and made our way up. We were in luck as, while lights were far and free between, the electricity was still on. As we made it to the first floor, I felt a resignation as I assumed the upper levels were going to offer even more mediocrity. I was wrong. I was so wrong. We entered the living room area. What stared back at us gave all three of us a shock. Dolls. Hundreds and hundreds of dolls littered the entire room. These things weren't just in the windows. The entire place was filled with them. All of them mangled and deformed in their own unique ways. Every single doll had its eyes cut out, leaving only two black voids staring back at us. This was terrifying. I jumped in fright as Paul yelled, breaking the silence. What in the hell is going on here? This lady was some kind of weird hoarder. I guess, man. I said as I panned the room. We continued walking while stepping over doll after doll. We made it down the hallway to the kitchen. At least, I think there was a kitchen underneath the blanket of dolls. I think we should leave now. Lori said while folding her arms in discomfort. Paul clicked his tongue in disappointment and glared at her. No, man. I think she's right. Let's go. I said sternly. You can go if you want to. I'm going to explore a bit. This is crazy. He replied as he continued his way to the next room. We wished him luck and turned back towards the living room and stairway to the basement. As we approached the top of the stairs, something happened that terrified me to the core. The loudest scream I have ever heard filled the entirety of the house. It was a blood-curdling scream of terror from a female. Lori grabbed me in a hug with a frightened yelp. What the hell was that? I said, trying to keep my voice down realizing someone else was here. I don't know, but I say Paul is on his own. If he doesn't want to leave after hearing that, it's on him. She whispered, holding me tighter. I nodded, and we began our trek down the stairs to get out of this terror house. As we approached the halfway point of the stairs, we were once again startled by a door slamming behind us. We looked at each other in confusion. 
There was no door at the top of the stairway before. We stared at each other in concern. We looked up as the single, hanging light bulb began to flicker. Another startle hit us as yet another door slammed shut was heard. This time, it was the bottom of the stairs. What the hell is going on here? I said as I felt my voice break with every word. Lori simply stared at the door in fright. I put my hand on her back to guide her down the rest of the way. We arrived at the now closed door. I turned the knob to open it. It swung open, and to our horror, more stairs. Another flight of stairs continued with the basement at the bottom. I can't do this. Let's go. Lori yelled, grabbing my hand. We proceeded to the bottom of the new set of stairs. I almost tripped over as the light bulb flickered off. I grabbed Lori immediately. It was pitch black. We had to continue though. We carefully took one step at a time as to not fall. We continued blindly with one hand outstretched. Ouch! I yelled as I stubbed my finger into a solid surface. We had reached the door. I slowly turned the doorknob. Horror coursed through me at what I was seeing. We were back in the living room, dolls strewn across the room, all blank and emotionless with those black, cold eyes. Lori began crying as I held her tighter. We have to find Paul, I said almost involuntarily. We proceeded into the direction Paul had went. A long hallway led us to two more rooms as well as the staircase upstairs. Both rooms were filled with knickknacks and old furniture. Oh, and of course, more dolls. As if we weren't freaked out enough, the dolls gave us a lifeless, terrifying gaze as we made our way through the house. Paul? Paul? Lori yelled up the staircase. We made our way up, hoping to not have another staircase incident. Luckily, nothing happened. Yet. Paul, are you up here? Paul? Lori continued, her jittery pleas to get his attention. Nothing. I'd say let's split up, but I've seen way too many horror movies to know that's not a good idea. I said, attempting to lighten the mood. The fright was too deep, though. We continued our search for several more minutes in an eerie silence. As we approached yet another room, I heard something behind us. I turned around, and in the unwell lit hallway, I saw Paul, just standing there. I could barely make out his face as it was shadowed, but I saw his expression. He was staring with a smile, a smile bigger than any I've ever seen him make. His eyes glared at us with an almost evil looking intent. Paul? Is that you? What are you doing? Let's get the hell out of here. I ordered. Lori looked back as well. I could see the look of confusion paired with fright on her face from the corner of my eye. I began walking towards him with an almost inhuman speed. Paul ran quickly into one of the bedrooms. I looked at Lori in fright. I had to get my friend and get out of here. I walked towards the room and peered in. Paul was gone. A bed covered in those damn dolls was all that filled the room. I walked inside with Lori behind me. I'm 100% sure he ran in here, but he's nowhere to be seen. We turned to leave, but we were suddenly stopped by the now closed door. No slam this time, just a closed door. I wasn't having it anymore. I quickly opened the door. Lori fell to her knees and began sobbing. The door led us back to the living room, and the same doll stared back at us. I don't know what stopped mid-sentence as I looked back at Lori. She was crouched down and sobbing in the living room. I looked back at the other side of the door, another living room. We were stuck between two identical rooms. I grabbed Lori's wrist and began searching through the living room for anything I could to bust one of these windows out and make our escape. At the edge of the room, the same old wooden chair I saw from the outside sat. I stomped my way over kicking dolls out of my way in anger. I grabbed the chair and immediately began smashing it against the window I had originally peeked into when we arrived. It was working. The window began to crack and eventually shattered. I looked out to the ground to prepare for our escape. I... No words can accurately explain the fright that came over me. What I witnessed as I turned to Lori was horrific. A slimy, green, deformed thing stared back at me. Its pale, green bulging skin was glistening in the little light there was as it reached out to me with its limbs that seemed to be bent and broken in different angles. 
It let out a gurgled moan as it began towards me. I let out a primal yell and began to run. I didn't make it far before I tripped over the chair I used to smash the window. The creature made its way on top of me and began screaming in that same gurgled voice. Moisture from its head dripped on my face as I yelled in terror. I could see its skin bubbling under the deformations as it attacked. Babe? Babe? I heard Lori yell. I opened my eyes and slid back hitting my head on the windowsill. The monster was gone. Lori looked at me with a look of confusion and fright. What? Who? I frantically said, not knowing what to actually say. I don't know what happened. You went over to the chair and just sat in it. A little bit later, you just began freaking out on the ground and pulling at your hair. What happened? She said quickly. I didn't want to tell her what I had just seen. I wiped the tears from my eyes and stood up. We have to keep trying to get out of here. I said. I'd had enough. We shuffled through more dolls to reach the stairway to the basement. A stairway that scared us so much, but we had to try. I shook my head as the stairway was blocked by a door. I opened it up with Lori clutching my arm. I stared in defeat as I was looking into the upstairs bedroom Paul had darted into. Dolls in that same bed greeted me as if to say, you're not going anywhere. I walked into the room with my head down, leaned up against one of the bed posts and let out a sigh. Lori cleared some of the dolls to make a spot on the bed and slumped down. There were several minutes of silence. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something on a nightstand. It was a book. I don't know why, but I moved to check it out. Helen Higgins was written on the front. It was a diary. I looked over towards Lori, who was still sitting on the bed with her face cupped in her hands. It seemed very far-fetched, but this old lady clearly knew the house. Maybe the diary would offer information on how to leave it. It started out as any diary would, talking about her day people she would interact with, etc. After a few minutes of reading, it got far worse. The beginning seemed to be when she was in her early 20s, with the later excerpts being decades later. Her ramblings became more incoherent as the pages flipped. Towards the end is when her entries became much darker. Her ramblings became much more disturbing as she spoke of people watching her from the windows, trying to get into the house, she would yell and scream at them to go away, but they persisted for years. A few excerpts gave me an insight into her strange behaviors. Yes, after a lot of research, I finally found out how to get rid of these damn intruders. They are not welcome here, and they will know it. The dolls. The dolls will work. Scary. I will make them scary, and the evil trespassers will not want in. More dolls. More dolls will keep them away. Yeah, they will know they can't come in. They will lose interest in my house. In me. Not working. The book said it would work. These people are still getting in. Why aren't they afraid? Mistakes. I've made mistakes. No. They live in them. The very thing that was supposed to keep them out is where they dwell. I invited them in without knowing. I found my old diary. I missed you. It's been decades. I've lived with my demons in seclusion. I hate them. They hate me. They haunt me when I'm awake. They haunt me when I'm asleep. They are evil. They delight in torturing my mind. I'm so glad I found you, diary. You're all I have now. I covered my mouth in shock as I read the last entry. No more. It will end. Thank you, my diary, for being there for me. This day will be my last. My tortures will finally be over. Only blank pages followed. I carefully put the diary back on the nightstand as I looked over at Lori. She seemed to be catatonic. Lori? Babe, I'm going to get us out of here. I said attempting to add confidence to my voice. She continued staring forward. I lifted my head up as I realized something was happening. From the walls of the room I heard voices. What seemed like hundreds and hundreds of voices were emanating from all four walls. There were so many. I couldn't understand what they were saying, but they were getting louder. I covered my ears as they continued their ramblings at us. I looked up at Lori, who was still staring ahead with no emotion. Just as suddenly as the voices began, they stopped. I clenched my teeth in anger. Without a word, I grabbed Lori's wrist and began to lead her out. 
No, no, I can't, she said, sobbing. Lori, I'm going to get us out of here. No matter how much of this damn maze we have to go through, I'll get you home, I demanded. She wiped the tears from her eyes and quickly nodded. I was just glad to have even a little bit of my girl back. We proceeded out into the hallway. I felt a strength in me as I was determined to get through this and get us back to safety. My strength faded quickly though as I looked left and right into the hallway to determine our next move. Something was staring at us. At the end of the hall, a silhouette of a man was just standing there. The shadowy form was dressed in an old fashioned outfit. He was not from our time dressed in an old dust coat and top hat. We stared at each other for several seconds as I contemplated what to do next. His face was pure black, but from the emptiness, I saw a toothy smile begin to form. No eyes, no features, just a grin is all that looked back at me. I shook my head and darted towards the stairs with Lori. We made it to the living room. As if everything we'd gone through wasn't enough, we were met with more stairs. The dolls, those damn dolls were all staring at us. We stood in silence as we looked around in terror. Deformed and mangled faces glared at us as we slowly proceeded towards the stairway. We entered the stairwell and began our descent. I would say I prepared myself for whatever horrors these evil spirits that dwell here had for us, but that was impossible. To my astonishment, nothing. No twists and turns. No voices or screams. We'd made it to the basement. A look of excitement was on Lori's face as we stood at the open window we had climbed into to start this nightmare. Apprehension fell over me as I wondered if this could be another cruel trick. As we continued to stare in disbelief, loud, heavy footsteps came hurtling down the stairs. Damn it! Go! Go! I ordered Lori. We hastily climbed out the window to avoid whatever was stomping down the stairs towards us. We both crawled on all fours through the dead leaves and twigs towards the backyard wall. I turned towards the window with my back flat against the concrete wall. My eyes were wide open as I stared. The window slowly closed. It creaked shut with a soft clicking sound. The window closed and we were free from this terror. We walked back to our house with heads hung down. Lori continued her sobbing as I held her. As we sat down on our living room couch, I began sobbing as well, but we were safe. We broke our lease and moved out as quickly as possible. We could not stand even being near that house. The events of that day was four decades ago. I still have nightmares from the brief time I was there. Lori was never the same. I remained with her, trying to help her recover, but what happened to us was far too scarring. In an almost face your fears type of move, I returned to the neighborhood today. The house, that house of dolls was still there. Dolls filled the windows just as they had 40 years ago. The house was more overgrown with foliage and as decrepit as ever. A group of children on bicycles pulled up inquiring as to why I was just staring at this house. We chatted for a few about the house, but I did not want to tell them my story. Apparently, old Miss Higgins, was a member of a very rich family that owned the house. I guess it was just another page in a book as they've all but forgotten it to let it rot. Although, the kids did inform me of a resident in the house. He can be seen sometimes, blabbering to himself and yelling at kids that pass by. The local kids have named him Crazy Old Paul. It was my mom who first insisted there was something special about me. From a very young age, there were things I would say to her that, by all reasonable explanations, I shouldn't have been able to know. I asked her if we could go blueberry picking like her and grandpa. I begged her to let me go see his toy planes. Whenever my uncle came over, she insisted to him that she'd never told me about the model plane collection, or their summers in the fields, or any number of things I'd casually mention over the years. There were no pictures or anything in the house that would hint at these moments, saved only in memory. He wasn't easily convinced, but I hadn't yet learned to keep my mouth shut, and she appeared to made some compelling arguments. So before I was even a teenager, they were both in agreement. 
It was their belief that I was in some way the reincarnation of my late grandfather. After all, how else could I know so much about their own childhoods? Of course, my mother was especially close to him, which seemed to explain why I could recall more about her past with him than with my uncle. At a certain point, I was bringing up details about the two of them which even she didn't seem to remember. Of course, I wasn't my dead grandfather. I started to catch on to at least that much at school. I'd seem to know things about my teacher and the kids in my class, things I shouldn't be able to know. But my mom was so happy. She had missed my grandfather so much. Even as a kid, I knew if I told her about it, she would figure out exactly what I had, and she'd be devastated. So, kept quiet. It worked out for both of us. I'd only tell her things I knew about my grandfather, and she held on to that connection to him. I still look back fondly on those early days, before things began to fall apart. She was diagnosed with dementia when I was in my teens. She'd been forgetful before, but that's the only way I ever remembered her. It was my uncle who convinced her to see a doctor. Maybe it was because he was an adult that allowed him to notice before I did, or because the infrequent visits made a gradual process more obvious. In hindsight, I should have figured this all out sooner. I wanted everything to stay the way it was, so I kept myself ignorant. I didn't think it all through. What she had wasn't a clear-cut diagnosis. The doctors didn't know precisely what was happening to her. She had day-to-day -day difficulties, but her long-term memory suffered the most. I could see that treasured relationship with my grandfather she once reminisced about start to wane. It hurt even more because I knew how much it had mattered to her. As this ability I had developed, I'd almost felt like I had been there with them at times. But he slowly lost a spatial place in her heart. He mattered less and less. Until by the time I was finishing high school, she had a hard time even remembering his name. Leaving to attend university was a tough decision. I knew she'd need someone to take care of her before long, but my uncle insisted he'd check up on her regularly and make sure she was properly taken care of if things grew worse. So, I drove 1,400 kilometers away. This is where I started doubting that I really had any sort of gift at all. The only people who were convinced of my abilities were two direct members of my own family, people with a vested interest in that belief. It seemed to click in my head. She had trouble remembering things. Maybe that's where it all began. Maybe she told me about the blueberries and the planes and entirely forgot. Then when I brought them up, of course she'd be shocked. It's not like I had a clear memory of how the events went down myself. I was just a little kid. After she grasped onto her beliefs, I could have picked up on so many other things through the memories she insisted on reliving with me. Maybe I'd sold myself on the delusion enough to fabricate the events in my own imagination. I mean, even the things I seemed to just know about the people around me were never things that I was able to independently verify the validity of. Plenty of crazy people think they have superpowers, right? So I decided I would remain skeptical until I was able to properly test to see if this was all real. I picked up surprisingly little information about people around me on campus. It was a crowded place. There were way more people than I was used to. That made it all the stranger that I was getting close to, nothing from them. Even when I did manage to glean something from passing acquaintances, there wasn't much opportunity to capitalize on the chance. You don't just walk up to a near stranger and ask them if they did, in fact, pee themselves in front of their entire class in fourth grade. A few months passed. And my hope of properly testing to see if I was a mind reader began to dwindle. Even worse, I wasn't feeling at all like my usual self. I had little to no appetite. I was usually pretty active and stayed fit. And I'd probably lost about 15 pounds just in muscle. Honestly, I was having a tough time even finding motivation to get up most mornings. Though, none of that worried me nearly as much as the final symptom. I was starting to forget things. It started with my grades slipping. Studying just didn't seem to be as effective. I'd even taken up one of my mom's old habits of leaving sticky notes for myself. I was a mess, and the thought that my mother's condition was heritable was constantly looming over me. My supposed ability was almost at a standstill. It was only ever giving me occasional memories of my father. Or at least, that's who I guessed the man to be. I'd never met him. The memories weren't happy. At the time, I considered it another possible delusion. I called my uncle at one point to ask him if he'd ever gone on a boating trip in the lake outside town, 
and caught a fish the span of his arms. If I had a gift, this was one memory I was certain it had given me from his childhood. I'd held on to it for years since it first appeared in my mind. I remembered how proud he felt. He said he didn't recall anything like that. The images that did still appear to me took on a different shape. A girl in a mirror, a smell, something darker, a few somethings. I wrote them down in my journal, but otherwise dismissed them. Chloe approached me first at a party. I didn't figure out until later that it was her who included me in on the online invite. Figures. I didn't really have friends at the time. We got to talking, and had a lot in common. Apparently we even shared a few classes. Not much time passed before we started studying together. She helped me get my grades up. I finally was able to find the energy I needed to make it through the day. My mind cleared up. She was someone I really felt I could talk to. We got to sharing stories, and I opened up to her about my situation back home. I told her about how my mom was still deteriorating, how every time we talked on the phone, she'd say she was thinking about me, and how I'd always try to make my voice sound happier through the tears, because every call, I worried that would be the last time she'd say it. I even told her about what my family believed about me. Of course, I left out some details. I proposed my theory of a rational explanation. I didn't tell her I at any point actually thought there was something special about me. She was sympathetic. Her own past was less paranormal, but not less painful. I'd rather not publicize her past to the internet. I probably wouldn't be mentioning it at all if it weren't for something strange. Everything she told me matched closely what I'd written in my journal right before we'd met. We spent a lot of our time together after that. It transitioned into dating. She always said it was like having a weight lifted off her shoulders when we were together. That's about when I began to learn how my powers actually worked. I'd stopped lurking on the internet and began building an online presence. A small blog, really small, but it revealed something. I gave weekly tips on surviving university life, with personal experiences sprinkled in. As the page views increased, I'd start seeing memories. Memories of places I'd never been. People completely unfamiliar. Some would be one-time events. But there were others whose memories I'd regularly see. My followers. Felt good. I played around with the format for a while before the blog lost traction, and the memories trickled to a halt. Thought I was onto something, so I didn't give up. My next project was a fan fiction, which actually got decently popular through Tumblr. Not a single memory result in. What followed were a flurry of tests, first online, then in real life. I started figuring out the rules. It was based on connection. It worked on my mother's memories, my uncles, and people at my school as a kin. It worked on Chloe, on friends, and even people through the internet. It didn't work on people who didn't know me, or know of me. Not the strangers on campus, or the people reading my fanfic. There's been a knot in my stomach ever since I realized it'll continue to work on my mom, as long as she can still remember who I am. I'm not a mind reader. I'm a mind stealer. The memories I take, I can't give back. The more someone gets to know me, the more I can take. So far for Chloe, that's been to her advantage. But I can't stay with her. I can't let her lose everything. But I also can't leave her quite yet. Why? Because there's another rule. When I'm not taking enough memories, I start deteriorating, but I came up with a plan, and I thank you so much for your participation, because now you know more about me than I've ever told anyone. You won't realize the memories going missing at first, and how could you? It'll be like they never existed. You might have similar ones to fill the gaps. I hope you do. I really hope you remember me. The sounds are horrible. The sounds are like a train speeding down the railroads. After one night at a train station, those sounds will never leave my head. Writing this makes me go insane. Just thinking about the sound makes me go crazy. Sorry for the lack of introduction. My name is Mila. I just graduated high school not so long ago. and already have a part-time job at a McDonald's. I leave for college next month, but those sounds will follow me everywhere I go. Sorry going off track again. I'm going to college in Umblewood, which is far from home, but no matter how far from home I am, 
The cells will follow me wherever I go. I wish I saved the girl, Claire. She was cut in half by a train. When I saw the train ride over her and cut her in half, I fainted. She didn't live. I wish I called for someone to help her. She was the most innocent person in the world. She worked at McDonald's and she always helped me, but I didn't help her. Even though I never phoned for help, someone did. I woke up in a hospital bed. She never woke up. Ugh, the guilt of my past was ruthless. I was at work, taking orders of the last batch of customers before I could go home. After her death of being run over by a train, it was hard to pay attention. Sometimes when someone is talking to me, I doze off. I would stop in the middle of my tracks or just freeze up randomly. My therapist calls it survivor's guilt, which is when you feel like you did something wrong during a traumatic event, like me seeing the woman be split in half. This customer ordered his food and sat down at a table, waiting for his order. After he ordered, I dozed off, just staring in space, and the voice of the man snapped me out of it. Hey, miss, come over here and take a seat. The man starts to reach for his wallet. When he pulled his wallet out, he pulled a photo out of it. Do you see something strange in this photo? The man asked. I flipped the photo and saw the train station I go to take a train home. The train station where my friend was cut in half. The photo was on the bridge that goes above the train tracks. It was night, and the photo looked pretty normal. I see nothing, sir, I said, holding up the photo. He placed the photo back down on the table and pointed to something on it, and what I saw gave me chills. It was a woman with dirty hair, crawling towards the photographer, which I assumed was the man. In the woman's hand was a sickle, a bloody sickle. I look at the woman more, and I didn't see any legs. Sir, where are her legs? I asked with a puzzled look. The man looks at me and what he said gave me more chills. The woman had no legs. It was like her legs were cut off, the man said. He picks up the photo and puts it back in his wallet, then puts the wallet in his pocket. So, I saw the woman in the photo six days ago near the train station down the block. I take the station every day, and I see you all the time. So, I thought I should tell you something, the man said. What? I asked. If you see the woman in the photo I showed you, run, because your life depends on it, the man said with a dead serious voice. Sir, what are you talking about? The man immediately then said, a friend of mine was killed by her, and I almost died six days ago. She hunts you down and cuts you in half with the sickle she holds. I start to chatter my teeth a little. Sir, he interrupted my words. Call me Dale. Dale crossed his arms. Dale, what are you talking about? I ask in confusion. Just listen. If you encounter her, run for your life. I almost died six days ago, and she is fast. I'm lucky I'm still alive. Being a gun carrier saved me. He then pulled out his gun to show me. I... I stutter with my words. I shouldn't have to explain anymore. Just follow my advice. He puts his hand on the table. Then her conversation was interrupted by an employee with the man's order. Oh, your order. I'll, I'll go get it. I'll be right back, I said. I stand up and walk towards the tray on the counter. I pick it up and walk back to the guy. I then place it on the table. Well, enjoy your meal, sir. I stand at the train station, waiting for my train to stop and let me on. But the entire wait, I was thinking about the conversation with Dale. Is he being serious? Is the photo even real? Why would he even tell me that? I started to have thoughts, which distracted me from knowing I was the only one on the train station. I look around the train station. Dale must have told everyone. I tell myself. I then see someone walk into the station, which made me relieved a little. But as I examine the person, who was a woman, she looked a little strange. Tattered up clothes, bruises on the skin that was uncovered, and she stared down at the ground. I stared at the woman a little more, and she looked like someone I knew. I, excuse me, ma'am, do I know you? I asked, which made the woman look at me. She lifted her head slowly, then looks at me dead in the eye, and I figured out who she was. She was my friend, who was cut in half by a train. Mila. 
It started to call out my name. Claire? I call out in shock. All of a sudden her torso falls off of her legs onto the floor, like when she was cut in half. Her arms hold her torso up as the legs fall on the floor like a wooden plank. I start to back up swiftly towards the bridge over the tracks. I'm sorry, Claire. I'm sorry. I yelled, almost sobbing. Then I started to recall Dale's instructions. I remember him saying, if I see it, run for my life. So I booked it, and it chased me. Her crawling sounded exactly like the train. I climb up the bridge, and she just crawled up. As I try to run, she tackles me down to the ground. Then that's when I cry as Claire crawls on top of me. Please stop, I beg, trying to punch her away from me. And my punch threw Claire off the bridge onto the tracks. I get up on my two feet and continue to run down the bridge. All I can hear is my running and heart pumping. Then Claire caught up to me, and I felt the sickle drive through my pelvis. My torso and legs fell to the surface. I then just lay there in silence. The silence is then filled by her crawling. Claire crawls away. As I lay there dying on the ground, I was found. Not cut in half, but passed out on the table at my McDonald's. An employee called an ambulance for me after noticing my weird behavior. He noticed I was talking to the air. When the ambulance arrived, I was passed out on the table Dale was sitting at. When I looked at the surveillance footage of the night I passed out, there was a Dale, but Dale didn't even know me or understood what I was telling him. He didn't even tell me advice. My therapist told me that it was all caused by the guilt in my chest. Apparently, I had so much guilt my mind created my death. I'm in college now. Claire is still dead. And I'm happy I'm still alive to this day. Every time I walk to class, I still hear the haunting sound. I can never tell if it's real or my imagination. God, please let it be my imagination. I guess you could say I'm a bit of a junker. My office closet is filled with boxes upon boxes of old computer parts. I've been a PC builder since the Windows 95 era, and never let up on my hobby. This allowed me to collect a fairly large stock of spare parts. If I'm ever out and about shopping, and see a good deal on an old, used PC, I snatch it up immediately. This is what happened to start off a set of events I won't forget anytime soon. In browsing the wares at a local pawn shop, something caught my eye at the end of one particular aisle. I made my way through the 20 to 30 weed whackers that lined each side of the aisle way. Apparently, once winter hit, it was time to pay off a few debts with said items. Once at the end of the aisle, I pushed several items out of the way on the bottom shelf to reveal an old, dirty, beat up PC tower. It was one of those old plain Jane white computer towers that was obviously owned by a smoker as it had a yellowish hue to the color. Well, 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 what do we have here? I said to myself in a sarcastic tone. I grinned at the thought of what I could find once I dissected it. I brought the dirty tower up to the employee at the register. The item didn't have a price tag and, fighting the urge to ask the employee if this meant it was free, I inquired about how much it was. How much is this thing going to set me back? I asked, wiping my hands on my jeans from the gunky case. After a squinty-eyed examination of the item, he looked back up at me. Ten dollars. He said in a tone as to not even attempt to bargain. His tone had no effect on me. Oh, come on, I exclaimed. Look at this thing. It's disgusting and old. Most likely, it doesn't even work. I just wanted to see if I could get a couple working parts out of it. After a few seconds of staring at the tower with his lips puckered to the side, he relented, and I made my way home with my new prize. I hastily brought the tower to my office as soon as I arrived home. I quickly grabbed the screwdriver and began opening the side plate. It was disgusting. Peering into the now open case, cobwebs were strewn about. A black substance, I don't care to know what it was, was just lying in a dried up puddle at the bottom. I grounded myself on metal and began cleaning the insides with a paper towel. It was not fun. Once cleaned to the best of my ability, I began removing each piece one by one. I scoffed to myself as I removed the old video card that was a tiny little board. Today's cards 
are bulky bricks with no less than two fans on them for major gaming. This PC had not been used for years, decades even. In the corner of my office I had an open PC tower I used to test spare parts. I would never use my newer updated PC to test old items. Faulty parts could conflict with the other components, and let's not forget about computer viruses. To my disappointment, almost all of the spare parts taken from this old setup didn't work at all, including the motherboard. Only one solitary component proved to be functional, the hard drive. As soon as I plugged it in with the old gray ribbon cable, I fired up my computer. To my delight, it worked. I could see old DOS prompts scrolling up the screen, including the size of the hard drive. I smirked and shook my head at the 2048 megabytes that it showed me. For context, that's 2 gigabytes, and my newer PC is equipped with 2 terabytes. This is equal to 2000 gigabytes in comparison. This computer might be older than I first thought. Right here, I have to admit something. One of the reasons I was ecstatic that the hard drive worked was that's really the only components I get really excited to test. I get a bit of a thrill browsing through old files and pictures, even music that was probably pirated off of Napster or one of those old peer-to-peer -peer sharing programs. It's almost like peering into the past and looking at how life was back then in their family photos, old games they used to play, and the music of the time. Admittedly, I would find folders full of porn as well. Sometimes I found a side of a certain person that I didn't want to see judging from the context of their videos. Some people are twisting. My curiosity increased as I hit the hard drive button. The obvious files were shown with all the Windows folders, my pictures, my music, and the such. I slumped my shoulders in disappointment as I discovered all the files were empty. It was almost as if someone installed Windows, then did nothing. Well, that was worth it, I said to myself as I sat back in my chair. After several seconds of staring at the screen while holding the mouse, I realized there was one folder I hadn't tried, my documents. I double clicked on the shortcut. It opened the file to show another file. This file was labeled documents, clearly made by the previous user. I ended up clicking through three more subfolders. This was clearly a lazy attempt to hide something, probably their adult entertainment folder. As I reached the last folder, I don't know if Disappointed is the right word, but I only had one lonely file looking back at me. My sins dot doc. A doc is simply a word file used in a lot of businesses for memos, school reports, and so on. Normally, I would have been a little bummed to not find something a little more exciting, but the title piqued my interest. I opened it. What was presented in front of me was, as you'll discover shortly, Kind of a diary, except in list form. Sounds confusing, I know, and trust me, it's equally confusing to describe. Each sentence was quick and to the point of what this person did that particular day. I suppose a log would more accurately describe it, but it was a little more personal. The formatting of this diary was not the most interesting part, though. Not in the least. It's what was said. It's what this person did on these particular days and decided to log it here. She made the mistake of dumping me. I had the last laugh when I dumped her back, right into the river. The girl said she wants some adventure. I took her to the woods, gave her a head start. The hunt was good, but I made my kill. I hope she liked her adventure. That's your girlfriend? Nobody talks to me like that. I followed them home. She didn't even budge out of her sleep as I slowly pierced his throat. Very slowly. I didn't realize how long it took for someone to suffocate. I didn't have to kill that jogger. Didn't even plan it. She was just there. My jaw was dropped and my eyes wide open in shock of what I was reading. Could this just be a joke? Or could I really be reading the ramblings of a serial killer? I read on. I like this one. I kept her for a few days. I would have kept her longer, but I wanted to see how long she could last as I chopped off a few fingers and toes each day. It wasn't as long as I thought. This one was an accident. He bumped into me first, but hit his head on the brick wall. I accidentally slammed his head into the same brick wall repeatedly. 
The human skull is surprisingly easy to open. I stopped reading. I could tell the murders, the sins of this monster, were getting more and more gruesome. I slid my chair back and stood up, putting both of my hands on my head to hopefully get more air into my lungs. What the hell is this? I murmured to myself as I paced my room. I stood, staring at my computer screen from across the room, wondering if I should resume my reading of this psycho's memoirs. I don't know why, but I did. Police came to ask me if I knew anything about a husband and wife's disappearance. Their ineptness showed no bounds, as I jokingly told them they were in my basement tied up. They told me not to joke like that. I think the husband will go first. I've always wondered what castration was like. I waited for him by the river. The old man was on the brink of death anyway. I laughed in delight at the irony of me pulling him with his own fishing pole into the river. I gasped in horror. This couldn't be. My grandfather went missing on a fishing trip in 1996. Slim chance, I know, but the idea that this killer could be responsible for my grandfather's death sent me into an extreme frightened state. It took me a full minute to come to my senses. I let out a heavy exhale and continued. Don't ask me why, but I did. The entries went on for page after page. Could this be some sick person just writing out his fantasies and I'm getting worked up over nothing? This thought filled my mind as I perused more and more of these sick stories. That thought ended up being false. About five pages in, this person began pasting photos onto the document. Photos of his victims. I held my hand over my mouth in horror as I saw the gruesome death scenes in front of me. I couldn't take it anymore. I stood up, ready to head to the police station with the hard drive. Something caught my eye. In one of the pictures, it was my house. It was my childhood house in the background. The victim lay bloody and bashed on the ground, but in the distance, through the trees, you could see the distinct second level patio my dad built. The paneling on the side of the house was exactly the same. The windows were in the same spot. It was definitely my house. I begrudgingly scrolled through more photos trying not to read the killer's little captions on what happened. I needed to find more evidence that this was happening in my neighborhood. I found it. My elementary school filled the photo. Children were playing. No brutal death scene. Just children playing on the playground. I looked at the photo in confusion. The caption on this particular photo chilled me to the bone. Next. The psychopath was contemplating the brutal murder of children. I felt a tear roll down my cheek. I remembered news reports of a spike in child kidnappings one particular year. Could this have been caused by the owner of this hard drive? I have to know. I whispered to myself. Daylight was ending fast. I quickly ran to my car to begin a trip I wasn't sure I should make. Familiarity set in as I arrived in my old neighborhood, where my parents still lived. I wasn't there for a visit, though. I parked my car on the side of the street and began walking. Walking to the spot, I saw my house in the ghastly photo from. As dusk approached, I found it. It was the exact spot I saw in the picture, except no evidence anything had ever happened here. I don't know what I was expecting to find except the trees and now overgrown bushes, but... I now knew. I wasn't wrong about the location. As it got darker, I began mindlessly walking around the area. I was contemplating what to do next. Obviously, I had to report to the police, but I needed a moment to recollect my thoughts. I was stopped suddenly at realizing there was something directly in front of me. Covered in overgrown branches was a tiny shack. When I say tiny, I mean this thing could have passed for an outhouse. I looked behind me realizing I had walked a lot farther than I thought. Civilization was nowhere in sight. I began to walk back from where I came, but my dumb brain kicked in, and my curiosity beckoned me to check out the shack. I brushed away several droopy branches that covered the front door as I clicked on my flashlight. I tried looking through the wood panels on the door to see if I could get a preview of what's inside. As I opened the door, I was greeted with the sight of what I could only describe as a hunter's shack. A large hunting knife laid on a shelf. Two curved meat hooks hung in the corner. I couldn't tell if the discoloration of the blades was from rust or a possible victim's body. Did I just find the killer's stash? 
With my jaw dropped, I slowly panned the entirety of the structure. A flicker of light from a small reflective surface caught my eye. I shifted my head back and forth to get another glimpse of what I just saw. As the now developing moonlight hit the surface again, I crouched down. I dug through a small pile of rags to retrieve the item that almost seemed to be calling to me. I found it. It was an old, beat up camera. The tiny lens from the camera offered a reflection of the moon behind me. The old tech of this camera could have been laughable if I was in the mood. I pushed the power button. Nothing. Obviously there would be no charge to this thing after all this time. I turned the camera over and let out a scoff. Double light batteries. I said to myself with a smirk, shaking my head. I quickly set the camera down and began disassembling my flashlight. I was in luck as the flashlight housed several double A's. I hastily transferred the batteries to the camera and hit on the switch. I was almost, yet again, disappointed as it did nothing. A few seconds passed and I moved to open the battery compartment again. The tiny LED screen on the camera flickered to life. It was working. After a quick browse of the operating system on this ancient camera, I was able to find the photo gallery. I remember backing up into one of the shelves as what was displayed on the tiny screen in front of me was more death. More and more pictures similar to what I found in that doc file. Everything connected. I grabbed my power down flashlight and began running. Moonlight was the only thing that lit my path as I ran. It felt like forever before I finally made it back to the scene of the murder by my house. I quickly jumped in my car and made my way to my parents' house. I screeched to a halt in their driveway. I jumped out of my car. With the engine still running, I began pounding on my parents' door. Hold on. I heard my dad's voice yell from the other side. I began calming down as my dad slowly opened the door. Dad, Dad, I have something to show you. Something I found. I yelped, catching my breath. My dad looked down at my hands and gazed towards the old camera I was holding. A toothy grin came across his face as he said, Wow, I haven't seen that thing in years. How did this all happen? Those are the famous words everyone asks whenever anything horrible happens. Those words are just the same words that are going on in the head of Tristan. He glanced around the large cage he had been thrown in with his nine of his classmates. It was just a simple trip, he thought to himself. He looked out from the cage to see the thing that had brought them all here. He cursed under his breath as he watched the thing move. Just then, Tristan noticed the shadow of someone coming to the side of him. He turned his head seeing his classmate, Jacob, come forward. Jacob peered out of the cage, his eyes focused on that thing. What do you think it's going to do? He asked softly. Tristan turned back to the thing, shook his head. Not sure, but we need to figure something out. Tristan looked at his phone. It's been about four hours since it captured us. Jacob turned from the thing focusing his eyes inside the cage. Besides he and Tristan, there were about seven others with them, four girls and three guys. Damn, how did it get the jump on all of us? I mean me, Jay, Marcus, and Richard are football players. The hell, Cynthia's in track. She could have outran that damn thing. Jacob turned back around to join Tristan in watching the thing. Doesn't make sense. Tristan nodded again. Yeah, it doesn't. Neither does its appearance. He said with shakiness in his voice. Hey, do we have a plan yet? Cynthia's voice butted in. She came to join the two of them at the front of the cage. One of the other girls, a shy, nerdy looking girl with round glasses, rose up. Hey, what's what's going on? She asked. It's okay, Jennifer. Cynthia said. She turned back to Tristan and Jacob. So, anything? Not a clue. Jacob slumped his head into one of his hands. So far, we've been watching this thing. Cynthia elbowed Tristan. Come on, you're the brains, aren't you? You must have figured out something. Tristan stared Cynthia in the eyes. Without saying anything, Cynthia knew he had nothing. She cursed under her breath. Hey, what if he comes to the cage and we rush him? Jay stood in the middle of everyone else in the cage. Hell, I know Jacob can tackle anyone down. And with me and Marcus, I'm sure we'll buy enough time for us to escape. 
Jacob pushed himself away from the front of the cage, shaking his head. He walks over to Jay and poked his chest. Don't you think I thought of that? It won't work. Think about it, will you? This thing, whatever the hell it is, managed to capture all of us. I'm sure he'll have no problem stopping us if we tried that. Jay pushed Jacob away. Hey man, we don't know if we don't try. Come on. Marcus stepped between the two of them. Hey, knock it off, you two. Jennifer and the other two girls, Dayla and Charlotte, huddled together in fear. Cynthia walked over to the three of them. Hey, don't go letting this thing see you guys are afraid of it. Tristan watched his classmates either argue or console one another. Doing so, his mind wandered off to the hours before all of this happened. He remembered they all gathered together at a party after their team had beat their rival school. They drank and ate all the way through. But it was around midnight that Jay remembered seeing a person staring at them from off the way. And as they all stood together to see who the person could be, that is when the strange person let out a sharp, stinging cry, making a lot of them black out. Tristan's only memory after that was waking up in a groggy state in the cage. He looked around to see where they were, only to see one source of light that lit the area in front of the cage. Everywhere else he looked was nothing but a shroud of darkness. As he looked in the darkness, he heard the shuffle of movement. He froze upon seeing the strange looking thing emerge from the darkness like a piece of cloth. Hey, Jay cracked, voice shouted. Tristan snapped out of his memory from Jay shouting. He saw Jay's eyes stare off behind him. Turning around, he jumped back as the thing's pale bone hands gripped the cage door and stepped forward with its spike-like legs. The thing was clad in torn green cloak that clashed with its pale skin. It almost looked human save for the strangeness of its tongue. Its tongue was so long that it twirled around its body but never hit the ground. It eyed everyone in the cell. The thing threw open the door. Everyone watched in horror as it put its right arm. In a flash, the arm stretched faster than anyone could see. It grabbed Richard, who had been sulking in the corner of the cage. He screamed and kicked, but it didn't matter. The thing retracted its arm and slammed the cage door shut. Everyone hurried to the front of the cage, watching the thing place Richard in the middle of the room. It stood in front of Richard, about a few inches away. Richard dare not look at the creature. What is it going to do to him? Jennifer asked. Do you see how fast its arm stretched? Marcus asked. Its arm? Do you see its tongue? Dale said. Guys, shut up. Jacob gripped the cage with both hands. He began to rattle the cage. We need to get out of here and save Richard. How can a clam cram in a clean cream can? Everyone hushes when the thing spoke. Its long tongue and strange appearance didn't match the voice that came from it. A simple, normal-sounding voice. Richard opened his eyes, but flinched at seeing the thing. What? What? How can a clam cram in a clean cream can? Richard shook his head. I don't... I don't know what you want. The thing stepped forward, its hands gripped tightly. How can a clam cram in a clean cream can? Its voice rises in both anger and annoyance. Uh, how can a clam cram... Ah, oh, shit. I bit my tongue. Richard put a hand over his mouth. Then the thing's shadow loomed over him. Before he had a chance to glance up, everyone in the cage grew pale as the thing ripped apart Richard's head in two. The three girls jumped back in fear, crying and closing their eyes. Cynthia turned to the side, letting out a stream of vomit. Tristan, Jacob, Jay, and Marcus couldn't believe what they had seen. No, oh, no, no. That can't be real. Richard. Richard. Jay screamed. Marcus pulled Jay away from the cage front. He's gone. No, he can't be. Not Richard, man. Shut up. Jacob shouted. We need to stay focused. The thing kicked away the top half of Richard's head. It grabbed Richard's lifeless body by the ankles and pulled him out of sight. The thing returned walking in a faster pace toward the cage. Its tongue never bounced as it made those fast strides. Guys, watch out, Tristan said. The thing hit the cage once with its fist. It let out a deep, guttering growl. It pointed a bony finger at Charlotte. Hey, no way, 
Jay shouted. The thing slammed his fist on the cage again. It pointed once more. No, I don't want to go. I don't want to. The thing swung open the cage and reached inside. Again, without anyone seeing the thing had grabbed Charlotte, shutting the door behind itself. Hey, motherfucker, let her go. Jay shouted. Go. Charlotte screamed. Why is it doing this? Dela asked. Cynthia finally done vomiting, looked up to see the thing place Charlotte in the middle of the room, like Richard. Please don't do this. She cried. I don't want this. Please. Charlotte shook her head. I don't want this. How can a clam cram in a clean cream can? The thing continues to ask the question. Like before, its anger and annoyance rising. Charlotte took a step back. She looked behind herself to see the pitch blackness. The fear of not knowing if more of this thing existed, or if there was a bottomless pit emerged inside her. She turns back to the thing. Please. Tears pour from her face. Please. The thing let out a deep roar that sent the ears ringing. Please stop it. Charlotte screamed. No. Cynthia buried her face into her hands as the thing sliced Charlotte's head in half, her body jerking as it hit the floor. The thing kicked away the top half and dragged her body away just like Richard. No fucking way. Jay said. What does this thing want with us? Tristan watched the thing put the body of Charlotte and Richard away. I think it wants to play a game. A game? Jay asked. A scary fucking game. Hey, easy man. Marcus said. Jacob nudged Tristan's shoulder. What do you mean? Well, what it was asking. I don't think it wants an answer to it. Meaning what? Dela asked. I think it wants us to repeat it. The phrase it is saying is a tongue twister. You mean those stupid sayings people say? Like the one about Peter Pickle something? Jay crossed his arms. Well, Peter Piper. But yeah, that's right. Tristan replied. Are you saying if we can say it correctly, the thing might let us go? Cynthia asked. Tristan's eyes drifted away. For that was an answer, he did not know. He shook his head. I don't know. Well, let's just see if we can beat this thing and get out of here. I guess that's all we have to do then. Jacob's son. Oh, fuck that shit. Jay shouted. I say the three of us, you, me, and Marcus, rush them so the four of them can escape. Jay, I told you before, and I'm telling you that we can do this. Jay said. It's better than playing games with some demonic thing. The thing returns to the cage staring down everyone. A strange green-like liquid dripped from its mouth down to its abnormally long tongue pointed its bony hand at the group. Hey, who the fuck you pointing at? Jay shouted. Jacob grabbed his hot-headed friend. Easy. The thing opens up the cage once more. Before it could stitch in its long, stretchy arm, Jay's voice boomed over everyone. Now. Tristan watched as Jay and Marcus charged into the creature, pushing it down on the ground. Jay turned back to everyone. Run. Dela and Jennifer ran out of the cage entering the darkness. Cynthia went to move after the other two girls, but the sound of Marcus coughing, something up, made her pause. Jay was pushed into the cage at such a force that he felt he couldn't move. Marcus had been impaled by the thing's long tongue. It raised Marcus up into the air before slamming him down into the ground. It went on to slam him into the ground until his face resembled that of putty. It removed its tongue only for it to wrap around Jay. Jay screamed out as he felt his insides move into one another, as the thing's tongue squeezed into him. Jacob ran out of the cage to pull the thing's tongue off Jay, but it was so slimy that his hands just slipped right off. The thing pulled Jay toward it. It held out its two bony hands and grasped Jay's head. In a sheer instant, it ripped Jay's head off his shoulders. Jay's blood hit Jacob in the face. The thing tossed Jay's body and his severed head came across the room. It reached out to Jacob and sliced him in half with his tongue. Tristan and Cynthia stood frozen in fear at the thing. It stared right into their eyes before shutting the cage door. It rushed off into the darkness chasing after Jennifer and Dela. As Tristan and Cynthia waited frozen in that cage, they heard the blood-curdling screams of Dela and Jennifer slowly followed by the sound of bones and body parts being ripped apart. Minutes went by before the thing returned to the cage. Cynthia and Tristan 
now the only ones left of their classmates. The thing had cleaned up the dead bodies of everyone it had killed, putting away their mutilated piles. Away properly in a sort of pile it keeps hidden in the darkness. It returned to the cage, eyeing what was left of its players. Swinging open the cage door, it pointed a finger at Cynthia. Tristan gave a nudge in Cynthia's side. He muttered under his breath, Just try to play along with it. I'm sure we can leave if we beat it. She muttered back with her eyes, never leaving the thing. How can you be so sure? Tristan shook his head. I'm not, but what else can we do? We've lost everyone else. But I don't want to be lost. Cynthia's voice began to crack. Tristan grabbed her hand. Don't let it see your fear. Be strong. Though he said those words, he knew if she messed up what her fate would be. Then it would be his turn, and the fear of what would happen began to seep into him. The thing bangs its free hand against a cage. Cynthia nodded at the thing slowly exiting the cage and followed it to the middle of the room. There the two of them stepped just a few feet apart. Then, from this thing's strange looking mouth came the familiar line it had been saying the entire time. How can a clam cram in a clean cream can? Cynthia looked back at Tristan, who watched her from the cage. He gave a slight nod. Cynthia turned back to the thing who continued to say the words his voice growing like it did before killing Richard and Charlotte. Cynthia swallowed the fear that made her body tremble and shout in, How can a clam cram in a clean cream can? Then silence came in the room. The thing looked happy at hearing Cynthia, as she said it without any issues. However, Six sick hicks, nick six, slick bricks with picks and sticks. Cynthia swallowed again. Six sick hicks, nick six, Slick bricks with picks and sticks. She closed her eyes after repeating it. She knew she didn't mess up, but feared what would happen next. Tristan watched in amazement as the thing almost jumped for joy. The thing begins to walk around Cynthia, continuing to eye her down. There those thousand thinkers were thinking how did the other three thieves go through. Cynthia nodded as the thing stopped to stare at her. It bobbed its head as it waited for her to repeat it. She glanced back at Tristan and smiled. There those thousand thinkers were thinking how did the other three thieves go through. Tristan banged against the cage. No. Cynthia looked at him wondering why he shouted no. However, it was too late before she could look back at the thing. A quick breeze flew by her. Her life vanished as her head rolled off her shoulders onto the ground. The thing let out a deep, angry howl. It began to kick and stomp Cynthia's body. Watching the thing put away Cynthia's body, it was soon Tristan's turn. He stood up in the middle of the room. The light above them began to flicker every few seconds. The thing glared into Tristan's eyes. It was there that Tristan felt that the thing wasn't truly mad at them, but at something else. He felt it when he saw it stomp Cynthia's dead body. Was there a reason why the thing played this game? What did he get out of this? Would it truly let them leave if they won? Would they even win, or would Tristan be stuck playing tongue twister with this thing forever? He slapped his face. No, can't think of that now. He had to focus. He took a deep breath. He met the glare of the thing. Then it spoke. How can a clam cram in a clean cream can? How can a clam cram in a clean cream can? Six sick hicks, nick six, slick bricks with picks and sticks. Six sick hicks, nick six slick bricks with picks and sticks. There those thousand thinkers were thinking, how did the other three thieves go through? There those thousand thinkers were thinking, how did the other three thieves go through? The thing began to chuckle in glee. Like the words it spoke, its chuckle didn't match its appearance. It sounded almost human. Tongue twister after tongue twister. Tristan managed to repeat the words back without screwing up. Each time the thing became happier and happier. Then as the light flicker grew from seconds into minutes, the thing held up its head letting out a deep, hearty laugh. It then stood wondering what another twister could say. Then it looked up. Its eyes narrowed, giving it an appearance of one who would look at something with curiosity. It took in a deep breath and said, Yolly Bolly had a jolly golly wog. Feeling folly, Yolly Bolly bought his jolly golly, a dolly made of holly. The golly, feeling jolly, named the holly dolly, Polly. So, yolly bollies, jolly gollies, 
Polly Dolly, Polly's also jolly. Tristan couldn't believe what he had heard. Out of all the tongue twisters he had heard, that one was the one he couldn't wrap his tongue around. Hell, he didn't even want to wrap it around it. Tristan cleared his mouth and throat. All the twisters he spoke began to make his mouth water. He glared at the thing who just returned that curiosity glare at him. It waited patiently for Tristan to repeat the phrase. Tristan grit his teeth, his body shaking for he knew if he failed, he'll just join the pile of his classmates. Taking in all the fear and deaths of his classmates in mind, Tristan stepped forward. The thing cocked his head back, surprised of Tristan moving forward. Yolly Bolly had a jolly golly wog, feeling folly. Yolly Bolly bought his jolly golly a dolly made of holly. A golly, feeling jolly, named the holly dolly Polly. So Yolly Bolly's jolly golly's holly dolly Polly's also jolly. Tristan shouted the tongue twister the loudest he could to make sure the thing could hear every word. A long silence surrounded the two of them as the light flickered again. The thing vanished before Tristan's eyes. He looked around seeing no sign of the thing. He let out all the fear that he swallowed. It took him over, making his body shake and his eyes to release streams of tears. He couldn't believe it. He had beat the thing. Or, that's what he thought. He felt a hand grab his head, bringing him close to the thing's face. With his other hand, the thing reached into Tristan's mouth, pulling his tongue. It began to brand Tristan's tongue with a strange mark. Tristan riled on the ground as the sheer burning sensation was something he couldn't believe. He looked up to see the thing crumble into dust with a smile. Tristan held out to his mouth, yet as he did, he felt a bulge hit his hand. As he removed his hand and opened his mouth, his tongue shot out like silly string. Stretching out as far as a thing's tongue had, he watched in horror as his skin turned a pale color. Just between you and me, I used to hate our prisoners. You might think it made my job as a guard harder, but it actually helped. First thing you gotta understand is that they are criminal trash, a bunch of robbers, killers, and drug dealers who must be kept in line. You ain't gonna get them to respect you with kind words and hugs. That said, I must give it to them. They are smart. Maybe smart ain't the right word, because they are a bunch of stupid idiots. But they are undoubtedly resourceful. Those fuckers can hide contraband in their cells like masters. Even if you search every corner and crevice, you're still gonna miss something. They can also figure out such elaborate escape plans you'd be amazed. I can respect these skills. For most of the other guards, it's a pain in the ass, but I consider it a game. They try to hide something or find a way out, I bust them. And then it's time for the best part of this job, punishing them. My favorite tool for this is the pepper ball gun. The shot knocks those idiots back, and the gas that comes out of the bullet really messes them up. They thrash around with teary eyes, even throw up sometimes. It's always fun to watch. At this point, you might be disagreeing, thinking I'm a monster or something. But let me ask you this, if a bunch of murderers and rapists were riding like wild animals and trying to hurt you, wouldn't you protect yourself? Would you feel bad for them after they tried to kill you? I might be enjoying my job more than the other guards, but there's nothing wrong with that. Unfortunately, the warden disagreed. Smug guy with his fancy suit and gold watch. He wanted to fire me at first. The reason? Use of excessive force, abuse of power, and some other BS like that. But even the asshole knew I'm good at what I do, so I was given a choice. Start working at another prison, or be an unemployed sack of crap. Not much of a choice, is it? I wasn't surprised that the prison where I had to go to was short on staff. Everyone from my line of work has heard of the godforsaken place. The whole facility is underground, high security, no visitors, and best of all, it's supposed to be haunted or something. Nobody in their right mind wanted to work there. I never believed in ghosts and that kind of crap, but I still hated the idea. I wasn't afraid of getting spooked. But starting from scratch and winning the respect of everyone is a hell of a challenge even in a regular prison. I was kind of hoping there was nothing to the rumors, but from the moment I got there, I knew something wasn't right. Gotta tell you, most prisoners are really noisy. A lot of people create a lot of noise. Makes sense, I guess. But this place was quiet. The inmates were just sitting in their cells like sacks of potatoes. They did not talk to one another, 
Even at lunchtime, they just sat down, stuffed their faces without speaking, and returned to their cells. It was the same with the guards. I tried to have a conversation with some, but you couldn't get more than a few words out of them. They were like robots. At least the job itself was a piece of cake. Almost too easy. Prisoners weren't harassing each other. They did not try to hide contraband in their cells, and they followed my instructions without a problem. Even out in the yard, where most fights happen, they just walk around quietly. Now you might think that I was happy to have such an easy life there, but it creeped me the hell out. It's not normal for humans to behave this way. There was no logical explanation for it. Felt like I was the only sane person in the building, and everyone else was full of sedatives. I tried to speak to the prison nurse, ask her what the hell was going on. Would you mind telling me what's wrong with everyone here? Do you put something in the food or what? I asked, after I requested a session with her. She answered in a monotone voice. Our current population is 1,417 men, and all of them are perfectly healthy. Yeah, no shit, lady. Now would you mind answering my question? She looked at me with her lifeless eyes and continued. The men come here in search of change. We have to address their criminal thinking and lifestyle. Now, listen here. Do you put something in the food? A balanced diet includes foods with five groups and fulfills all of a person's nutritional needs. I realized she wouldn't tell me anything useful. Maybe the whole thing had nothing to do with the food, but I was sure as hell that I would never touch anything from the canteen. I tried asking the other guards about the strange behavior of our prisoners too. I only got vague answers about how everything is normal and tranquil. Now, I ain't easy to scare, but god damn that place gave me the creeps. I wanted to resign after my first week there, but my job has never been easier. No riots, no fights, no nothing. Just boring guard duty. So I decided to put on my big boy pants and try to ignore all the unsettling crap. Easier said than done. After a month there, it felt like I was going crazy. I started hearing strange stuff all the time, unintelligible sounds and odd noises coming from somewhere. I tried to find the source, but the volume of these noises didn't change, no matter where I went inside the prison. Never too loud, but always there. Of course, the other guards couldn't hear it. They just said the same thing with that empty look on their faces. This place is quiet. All of prisons should be. Fucking idiots. It was around this time that an inmate from my former prison got transferred to us. His name was Michael Hill, but everybody used to call him Big Mac. He was about seven feet tall and covered with tattoos. A fat motherfucker, but strong as an ox. I told you earlier how I loved to use the pepper ball gun. Well, this beast could take multiple shots without flinching. And to make matters worse, he hated my guts. As soon as he saw me, a piece of crap started shouting. Can't escape from me. I came here for you, and mark my words, I'll gut you like a fish. Your days are numbered. No, you might think seeing my friend Big Mac upset me. On the contrary, I was happy as a clam that someone I knew was there. Death threats from prisoners were nothing unusual for me, and I was curious to see if this place would break good old Big Mac as the rest of the prisoners. I was relieved when he started harassing the other inmates, as a regular prisoner should. They never stood up to him. When he took their food, they just went back to their cells without eating. When he pushed them to the ground in the yard, they stood back up without saying anything and continued to walk around aimlessly. When he saw that all the prisoners were pushovers, he started picking fights with the guards. They did not shout or beat him. They simply used mace, a lot of mace actually, to calm him and put him in solitary for a day every time he stepped out of line. After a few weeks, I could see that the place was starting to drive Big Mac crazy too. I figured he might even be open to conversation. I wanted to ask him what he makes of the place, and also about the disturbing sounds and noises I kept hearing, so I approached him out in the yard. Hey Michael, you piece of crap, how you holding up? Hey CO, I was hoping this prison made a mute motherfucker out of you too, but I guess I'm not so lucky. He used his prison slang and the emotions in his voice made me unreasonably happy. Well, ain't you a pleasure, Rave Sunshine. Now listen here. I'm not thrilled either that I have to speak with you, but you are the only prisoner here who is more or less sane, so I wanted to ask you something. Go ahead. Did you speak with the other inmates? Does anyone know what the hell is wrong with this place? Zombies. A lot of them. Prisoners and guards alike. 
I was kind of hoping you would tell me what's going on here, and what's up with these noises. Can you hear them too? You're driving me crazy. He sank his ugly head as he continued. These were the worst three months of my life. What are you talking about? You have only been here for two weeks. Not even I have been here for three months. Something messed with your head big time, CEO. You left our old prison and got transferred here about a year ago. Sure, Michael. You either take me for an idiot or lost your mind too. Just take a look at your employee card, fool. I did as he suggested, and what I saw didn't make any sense. The card was issued 11 months and 4 days ago, but why the hell couldn't I remember? I wanted to resign immediately and get as far away from that messed up prison as possible. I left Big Mac and ran through the entire facility to the exit, where a guard stopped me. Where are you going? Yes, in the usual monotone voice. I'm going home. Not feeling too well, so let me out, will ya? All correctional officers have living quarters within their prison grounds, but if you are ill, please go see the nurse first. What the hell? He was right. Some of the memories came back to me. How could I forget? I've been living there with the other guards the entire time. I actually haven't left this place since I started working there. All this crazy stuff made me doubt myself. I wanted to sit down in my room and think things over. I walked through the concrete tunnel that connected the prison with the guards' quarters, turned right at the end, got into the elevator, exited on the minus third floor, and entered room 307. I knew the way, yet I couldn't recall living there. I looked around and all of my stuff was there. My clothes in the wardrobe, my laptop on the desk, the poster of my favorite country band on the wall. It was my stuff and my room without a doubt. I tried to remember the things that happened in the last 11 months, but my head was a mess. Memories of myself eating in the staff canteen flashed before my eyes, and it made my stomach turn, but I realized it doesn't matter anyway. They could have been stuffing me full of different drugs without me remembering it. As I was thinking I could swear the noises I've been hearing got louder than ever before. Did these sounds have anything to do with my memory loss? I didn't really care. Only one thing mattered to me at that point getting out of there. Now I ain't dumb. It was obvious they wouldn't let me go if I asked nicely. Officially, I might have been a guard, but in reality, they were trying to make a brainwashed zombie out of me. But luckily, my mind was too much for them to handle. I started to think about escape routes, but the whole building was underground. There was no internet or phone service either. The place was totally isolated from the outside world. I'll be honest with you, I was pretty scared. I never had to think about this stuff before. My job was to prevent the prisoners from getting out, not figuring out ways to escape, but I knew who could help me, even if the thought made me sick. The next day, I felt like crap. Those sounds in my ear got even louder, and my head was throbbing. It didn't help that as I opened my door, one of the other guards greeted me with the usual expressionless face and voice. You left your post yesterday without saying a word. This is unacceptable. Yeah, sorry about that, buddy. I had a bad day. Needed some rest. If you are not feeling well, please visit the nurse. Oh no, it's all good now. I'm better than ever and ready for some good old guard duty. I will make a report about this irregularity. Do that. But now, get out of my way. I had to hurry up with my escape. If these guys figured out what I was planning, they probably would put me in a cell or worse. I just hoped Big Mac would have some kind of plan. Getting out of there with help from a guard should be a piece of cake for him, right? I have no idea how to get out of this place, he said, after I spent about half an hour convincing him that I was serious. Are you shitting me right now? You're supposed to be the big bad prisoner with thousands of escape plans. Listen here, the yard is the only place that's not underground, but there is a 16 foot fence and a 30 foot concrete wall topped with more than a dozen guard towers around it. Even if we make it through the fence, the snipers will shoot us by the time we make it to the wall, but let's pretend we make it there. Are we supposed to climb out like Spider-Man? No, we should forget the yard and try the main gate. There are several armed guards stationed there. You must have seen them too when they brought you in. How are we supposed to make better chances there? If I could start a prison riot, we might be able to overpower them, he said. But it would be easier growing wings and flying out than convincing these gumps to fight. The throbbing in my head intensified. It was almost unbearable. Better start thinking, or we are going to end up like these other brainless idiots. 
There must be a way for God's sake. I hear you. The ringing in my head keeps getting louder every day. We need to get out now. He said, then sat quietly for a while. I can almost see the gears turning in his fat head. All of a sudden he asked, Do you know where the backup generator is? You want to cause a power outage? How would that help us? I can't start a riot, but this is the next best thing. It should confuse the guards. The two of us might be able to make it through the main accent if we sneak up on them in the dark. But even with the element of surprise, we are going to need some good stuff from the armory if we want to force our way out. And how am I supposed to? I was interrupted by another guard. He approached me from behind and said, You should not talk to the inmates. You are exhibiting strange behavior. I will escort you to the nurse. To say that I didn't like our escape plan would be an understatement, but it was sure better than letting the nurse near me. It's now or never, Big Mac. I shouted. He jumped up and knocked the guy down with one punch. The other guards started running towards us, so I quickly handcuffed Big Mac and told him that I will personally take him back to his cell. The bluff worked. They let me through. And once inside, we could make our way to the armory. There was nobody in the room, which didn't surprise me. No one needed the riot gear in this prison. No one, except us. Big Mac chuckled as he was getting into the body armor. Who would have thought that one day, I'll be a ninja turtle? Yeah, very amusing. You should hurry the fuck up, please. There are security cameras everywhere. If they still don't know that we are here, they'll figure it out soon. I said as I picked up a flashlight. I'm almost ready, but you forgot your favorite tool. He said as he handed me a loaded pepper ball gun. The guy was more human than I thought. For a moment, I even felt bad for shooting him so many times in the past. We made our way to the backup generator in full riot gear. As we were running, I started to question my sanity. I've lost my memory. Been hearing strange sounds. And now, I have even armed a prisoner. And we are on our way to cut the power. It was a nightmare, but there was no way back. As we were getting closer to the generator room, the alarm went off. The damn thing was abnormally loud. It sounded like an air raid siren, but at least it overpowered the other noises in my ear. Surprisingly, only one guard crossed our path, and Big Mac made short work of him with his baton. When we finally got to the generator room, I used my keys. We entered and closed the door behind us. The alarm was too loud. We couldn't speak with each other, but not much. Coordination is needed for unplugging power cables and pressing a big red button below the sign that says Power off to be used in case of fire or emergency Does being brainwashed in an underground prison count as an emergency? I would say yes The generator stopped Lights went out And the alarm that was making my ears bleed finally stopped We were in total darkness I don't know which was worse That or the stillness Don't get me wrong, I was kind of glad that I could finally hear the noises, but something wasn't right. No footsteps, no panicked voices in the distance, no nothing. Big Mac spoke up to break the silence. There is no time to waste. We're in the middle of an escape. Let's move. We turned on our flashlights, left the room, and made our way towards the exit. We were advancing slowly in the darkness, expecting a guard patrol to jump out from the shadows and attack us any time, but no one was coming. The only thing we could hear as we were walking down the dark corridor, was our own footsteps. What the hell is going on? Where are all the guards? I whispered. I don't like this any more than you. Something isn't right, but let's hurry up and get out of here. When we finally got closer to the exit, we could hear faint breathing. We turned on our flashlights and proceeded slowly towards the main gate where the sound was coming from. There should have been at least ten guards there, but we could only see the silhouette of one person standing in front of the gate. And to my surprise, for some reason the gate was open. That person was the only thing standing between us and our freedom. My hands were sweaty as I pulled out my pepper ball gun and shot. My aim was perfect. The ball hit right in the head, but the bastard didn't even flinch. It just stood there as if nothing happened. I was looking at the shadowy figure in disbelief when it started speaking. I couldn't see its lips move and the whole thing sounded like a whisper in my head. Experiment successful. Sadistic guard cooperates with violent prisoner. Time for the interview. Please tell me, Subject 432, what made you team up with a criminal? Did it really think I was going to answer? I aimed at it again and took another shot. The pepper ball hit the figure, but it continued to speak as if nothing happened. 
Test subjects 432 and 732 are not compliant. The interview must be postponed. Power could be turned back on. Broadcast on Ifrasonic noise should continue. Subject 432 should be returned to his room and subject 732 to his cell. Big Mac let out a roar and started running towards the figure, ready to smash its head with his baton. But as he reached the person and swung, all the lights came back, blinding me for a few seconds. The noises in my ears also returned louder than ever before. Once I was able to open my eyes, there was no one there. I could only see Big Mac as he was swinging left and right with his baton and shouting, Come back and let me kill you, you rat. Let's just get out of here. We can think about this later. I don't want to stay a second longer in this place. I said as I grabbed his shoulder. He shut up and followed my lead. We ran through the gates and pushed ourselves forward through the passageway leading outside. After what seemed like ages, the passage began to rise and we saw the light at the end. My memories are a bit fuzzy, but I can remember how great the sun felt as we made it outside. The relief that nobody was following us. The excitement as Big Mac was hot wiring a car in the parking lot in front of the prison. The happiness as we were finally riding on the highway and the refreshing taste of the beers we bought at a gas station to celebrate. I must admit, it was almost too easy. I had the feeling that they were letting us go, but hey, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, right? The only thing that's bothering me is that I still hear these noises. I tell you, it's driving me insane. That's why I'm here, nurse. I told you everything just as you asked me to, but I doubt some BS advice can help me. Just prescribe me something strong. I need it to relax a bit. I've been on the run for... Now that I think about it, I can't really remember. How did I even get here? You look awfully familiar. What the hell? The shadowy figure at the gate. I couldn't quite see its face, but it looked like you. And this room? No windows? Am I still in the prison? No. It's getting louder. Make it stop. I shall return to my quarters. Please let me know when I can resume my work. Thank you. Interview Notes Reprogramming the brain of test subject 432 through psychological conditioning using infrasonic noise met the modeled goal. The subject believed the escape attempt was successful. Loss of short and long-term memory is within the expected range. Aggression level decreased, and empathetic tendency level increased. Further conditioning is not required. Subject 432 can return to his daily tasks. When I was a child, my friends and I used to love swimming. During the summer, every Friday, we would all go to my friend Harry's house and go to the village pool, which was just down the road. Harry's dad wasn't just a qualified lifeguard, but also a member of the local council, and of course, was in charge of the pool. Thanks to this, even though the pool was only open during a select few months, my friends and I could catch the last of the good weather during July. Some years, we were even lucky enough to use the pool right up until the middle of September. Me, Sam, Harry, and Jack were as close as young friends as we could possibly be. Our year group was made up of about 13, 14 people, so becoming friends with everyone was a guarantee. Yet we shared a much deeper bond. We did absolutely everything together. And unlike a lot of friend groups, where you may prefer some members over others, we all shared the same amount of admiration and respect for one another. It was like hanging out with the cool kids and feeling like a leader at the same time. And it was an unmatched period of time in my life in terms of acceptance and true, unrivaled happiness until Harry was taken. I believe it was a Monday. We had a bank holiday, so we had an extra day to spend together. And of course, it was towards the end of July, right when the pool closes for the public. Sam and I cycled down to Harry's house, which took about 15 minutes. Harry and Jack were already standing outside, with their bags on their backs and holding their towels in their hands. Sam hopped off his bike and ran to go and greet them. Well, I offered to take both of our bikes into Harry's garage, where his dad currently was. Hey, Jacob. Looking forward to swimming? Uh, hi, Mr. Davies. It should be really fun. Harry's dad was an incredibly kind man, seemingly always full of life and never angry. There was a certain childish passion that made him feel like an honorary member of the group, 
without ever overstaying his welcome. I left the bikes up against the wall and ran back to my friends. Harry and Sam were looking at something on Sam's phone, while Jack was sitting on the wall next to Harry's front gate. I jumped up and sat next to Jack on the wall. We were just launching into a conversation, presumably about some schoolyard gossip. When Harry's dad came out of the garage, walking down the road and beckoning to us to follow him, Jack and I jumped off the wall, and we walked as a group of four, taking playful verbal jabs at one another. At the age of 12, we had just about developed the bravery to start using all of the four-letter swear words, and Harry's dad couldn't have cared less. In fact, I often heard him sneak a laugh when one of us said something particularly crude, something that only someone new to swearing would think was funny, but that held a lot of charm. We got down to the park and spent about 10 minutes on the climbing frame while Harry's dad unlocked the metal gate leading to the pool and made sure that everything was safe. I bet I'm the fastest out of all of us, Jack quipped. We settled this last week. I beat you, Sam snapped back. No, idiot. I mean in the pool. I can outswim all of you, hands down. Jack was a great friend and, as the strongest of all of us, always kept us out of harm's way if any older kids ever tried to pick on us. He never hurt anyone, but he knew that his physical presence was enough to make most think twice. His pride was unmatched, but he was always good-humored when playing the role of the bad loser, making terrible excuses as to why he lost, and laughing at himself along with the rest of us. Sam, by contrast, was the smallest and meekest of us all, but was lightning quick both physically and mentally. I've never met a faster thinker, I don't think I ever will. He had an unnatural way of making sure that we all avoided trouble and could talk his way out of anything. Come on, boys, we've only got a few good hours left. Harry's dad didn't need to tell us twice. We all made a mad dash towards the gate, with Sam making it to the toilet, which doubled as the changing room faster than all of us. He let out a mocking laugh before slamming the door shut and bolting it. All three of us made it to the outside of the toilet, panting, short of breath, and boiling under the hot sun. As soon as Sam came out, Jack moved filling the doorway, making sure that he was next in line. Sam ran past us, cannonballing into the pool, soaking both me and Harry. We shouted out in mock rage as Sam laughed before diving straight underwater. Harry's breathing was still rather ragged, so I got out my inhaler and gave it to him. He took a quick puff and thanked me. Harry was the only one of us that had asthma, but we all kept a spare inhaler just in case he was ever without his. We cared about each other like that. Jack came out, and I let Harry go in next, so he could get out of the sun and recover a little easier. Harry's dad looked a little concerned, but I gave him the thumbs up and he returned the gesture, mouthing the words, thank you, as Harry walked in. Jack made a beeline straight for Sam, letting out a roar as he dove into the pool. Sam had resurfaced and let out a squeal of childish delight before diving straight back under. I watched the abstract shapes of Jack and Sam fight underwater and shivered with glee as I watched Sam struggle violently as Jack grabbed him by the shoulders, pulling him back up towards the top. Sam and Jack broke the surface of the water, both laughing violently. So much so, they began coughing through their mirth. Harry came out of the toilet, giving me a high five before pencil diving into the water, sinking to the bottom before Sam and Jack could notice. I knew this technique, as Harry often liked to grab us underwater, with us unaware of his presence scared the crap out of us, and brought Harry an unlimited source of joy. I went into the changing room, being careful to untie my shoes, instead of just kicking them off, and got changed into my trunks. I put all of my clothes into my bag, and left my bag alongside the others, coming out of the toilet. I ran towards the pool, seeing Sam, Harry, and Jack lined up along the wall, preparing to swim the length of the pool as fast as possible. I hopped into the pool, lining up with the rest of them. Harry's dad sat in his lifeguard chair, had a faux steely look on his face, making us all giggle. Champions, are you ready? He bellowed. Yes, sir, we roared back. Ready, set, go. All four of us launched ourselves off the wall, making a mad dash towards the other end of the pool. I vividly remember putting every fiber of my being into that sprint, cutting through the water at a blistering pace. Meeting the wall, I somersaulted in the water, pushing myself off the wall once again, and felt pure exhilaration as I saw that both Harry and Sam had only covered half the difference. Jack, however, 
was hot on my heels. I concentrated my efforts, moving faster than I thought was physically possible. I arrived at the start, finishing my length. As Jack came crashing in after me, I stood up in the shallow water, taking a deep breath, before roaring in victory as Jack screamed in defeat. I felt incredible. Jack pretended to sob in sheer woe. I laughed in his face, and he got up and playfully pushed me into the water. I rolled over onto my stomach and pulled myself along the floor until it became deep enough to swim again. Jack followed suit, and I swam towards Harry's dad, as both Harry and Sam stayed panting on the wall. Harry's dad helped me out of the pool, and raised my hand in the air in victory, as Jack stayed outraged, while Sam and Harry cheered for me between deep intakes of air. Gentlemen, you're superior, Harry's dad exclaimed. Harry hopped out of the pool to fetch his inhaler, just in case, as I hopped back into the pool. Harry's dad went to the shed where the heater was kept, raising the temperature of the water slightly. From the shed, he brought out a bunch of inflatable floats and lilos. Sam and I got on top of a huge yellow float, and Jack took up the role of the sea monster. Jack dove under the water and swam underneath our float, pushing upward on the float to try and unseat me and Sam. We wobbled and shrieked as Jack roared, and even underwater, his incredible strength was a marvel. I looked over and saw Harry and his dad sitting together talking. They both looked rather sad, and I assumed that Harry's asthma was stopping him from coming back into the pool. I called Jack's name, and he resurfaced. I'm going to go over and see if I can get Harry to come back. Alright, that's cool. Guess I'll just have to eat Sam alive. You can try, shithead. Sam yelled, with pure smugness on his voice. Without a word, Jack dove down and pushed himself off the bottom of the pool, breaking the surface of the water and barreling Sam off the float into the water with a shriek of fear. I made my way over to the pool ladder and stepped out, making my way over to Harry and his dad. Harry's dad turned towards me, a somewhat melancholy smile on his face. Is everything okay, Mr. Davies? I asked. It's fine. It's just Harry's asthma. He just got a little frightened. I looked past Harry's dad to Harry, and he looked very cold. Hey, we can get back in the pool and you'll warm up, and I'll make sure I don't leave your side. So if you need your inhaler, I'll make sure you get it as soon as possible. My son. Harry looked somewhat convinced but I could tell he was still full of trepidation. If we don't have you, we'll never kill the sea monster. He's quite fat, and I'd really like to stick his arse in a frame and hang it on the wall of the toilet. I smirked. Harry laughed, and I knew I had him now. He got up and gave his dad a hug. His dad laughed, his shirt wet, but he held Harry tightly. Harry let go and quickly spun, running towards the pool, diving into the water. He climbed onto the float with Sam, but before I could follow suit, Harry's dad grabbed my arm and I turned to face him. Jacob, thank you. Harry has a hard time with his lungs and I know how much you and the guys mean to him, he said earnestly. I smiled, shrugged my shoulders humbly before jumping into the water, attacking Jack with my special sea monster slang dagger. He fought viciously, but with the help of the brave men atop the float, he managed to kill the foul beast. Jack came back to the surface. Whilst Harry and Sam dropped off the float, so that all four of us were treading water. We started playing superheroes under the water, darting from one side of the pool to the other, corkscrewing and somersaulting through the water. Eventually, Sam and Jack went to the shallow end of the pool, while myself and Harry moved towards the deeper end. Harry and I always played a game with the floor vent at the end of the pool. The floor vent? Small and circular, no longer and wider than both feet put together sucked water through. As such, it had a small pull, not nearly enough to keep one of us in place, but it was enough for us to feel a small rush of adrenaline, almost as if we were, in fact, trapped. When one of us was trapped, the other would have to swoop in and save them. Essentially, it was a game to see who was stronger and could force the other person to move. Harry and I played this game for about 10 minutes, laughing under the water and joking around, screaming, help me, help me before chortling at the warbled sound of our voices under the water. Eventually, I moved from the vent over to the left side of the pool, at the middle point between deep and shallow. Harry was still over by the deep end of the pool, along the right side. We were both dipping under the water together, making rude signals at one another, 
laughing even harder this time. After some time, Harry turned towards the wall underneath the water and pretended to be typing on a keyboard, presumably as part of some sort of joke. At that moment, something changed. The vent always had a small stream of bubbles rising from it, all the way to the surface of the water. All of a sudden, they stopped. I watched the stream of bubbles die. The water looked too calm, and even while surrounded by the heated water, my blood ran ice cold. The vent started moving ever so slightly, almost as if a light vibration was running through it. It shook more and more violently as seconds that felt like hours passed. Harry was still engrossed in the setup of his joke, not noticing as the vent opened slightly as if someone were opening it from the inside. A long, thin red arm, glossy and perfect, snaked out of the vent. It had a cartoonish white glove on the end of the arm. At first, I didn't believe it was real, frozen in abject fear underneath the water. More and more of this arm came out of the vent, and an incredible, limp mass lay on the bottom of the floor. It still trailed into the vent, and I have no idea just how much of this thing there was. The white glove fingers twitched as Harry turned, about to execute the punchline of his long-forgotten joke before looking at the thing on the floor of the pool. Without warning, the gloved hand balled into a fist and immediately lunged for Harry's ankle. I heard the bones crunch underneath its vice grip, and Harry screamed under the water. Yet, little sound came out. The thing straightened out as Harry kept screaming, in too much pain to resist. Its entire mass had become straight, leading a diagonal line from Harry to the drain. In a split second, it retracted back into the vent, still holding on to Harry, and with another scream of abject terror, he went with it. His legs went through the vent opening, but he became trapped at the ribs, his torso too wide to move through the hole. The sound of cracking, splintering bone filled my ears, yet neither Sam or Jack had noticed, arguing with their heads above water. I heard Harry's ribs snap, his sternum giving out, and his muscles tear. As he shook violently in the vent, blood started gushing from his mouth like crimson clouds, and his eyes rolled violently into the back of his head. His body began jolting, moving slowly through the vent like processed meat through a grinder. I watched as the life faded from Harry's eyes, and the water surrounding him became saturated with thick red blood. Harry was slowly swallowed by the vent, and as his torso went under, his limp arms went vertical as the vent consumed him. The last thing I saw of Harry were the tips of his fingers, and then he disappeared entirely. I broke the surface of the water, so stricken by fear that I said nothing. I did nothing. Harry's dad, unaware of his son's fate, sat by the toilet reading a book. Sam and Jack were still arguing, their words abstract and overwhelming. Left with no other choice, I dipped under the water again. I closed my eyes on the way down, too scared to open my eyes again. When I did, the blood in the water was slowly rising to the surface. The vent grumbled, it appeared. With a sound like sandpaper rubbing against itself, the white glove appeared again, this time not followed by the red arm. The white fingers were stretched, elongated beyond any reason, and I dared not move, for fear that I was next. I could feel my lungs burning like white hot fire, begging for me to take a breath, but it was like being hypnotized. The fingers stalked the bottom of the pool and came across the vent cover, moving at a breakneck pace. The fingers retracted, slamming the vent cover back over top of the hole. I broke the water with a gasp, so loud that everyone, Sam, Jack, and Harry's dad, shot around to look at me. My lungs were screaming, my body demanding air in spades. I was forced to take shallow breaths as I bawled like a child into the air. Harry's dad immediately jumped into the pool and moved towards me, calming me down and asking what was wrong. I fell into his arms, weeping and gasping, pointing into the water towards the area where Harry was taken. As if he hadn't noticed the absence of his son until this moment, Harry's dad moved with a frightening pace, wading through the shallow water and diving down towards the drain. For a few moments, I stood in shock, as did Sam and Jack, unaware of Harry's fate. Those few moments dragged more than I can possibly describe. I waited, knowing that whatever came next would not be anything short of horrific. Seeing a grown man, a father, someone you'd idolize as everything you wanted to be, broken and sobbing in front of you is a strange thing. 
Harry's dad was strong and kind, and more of a leader of our group than a separate person. When he broke the surface of the water, wailing in pure fear and sorrow, I think that's when I realized what had really happened. He flailed like a child who'd never been taught to swim, as if he was fighting the water. Nothing separated him from me anymore. He wasn't the idol he always was to us all. He groaned so deeply. It almost scared me more than what happened to Harry. To take someone who was everything you wanted to be, and reducing him to primal, base sorrow, it was like having a hole punched straight through your chest. His cries pierced my eardrums, his voice radiating all around us. Even Jack, who was not one to become fearful, cowered from the sound. And Sam did the same, breaking into the same weeping and gasping as I did. Harry's dad fluctuated between screaming and crying, until a family passing through the park came by, immediately rushing in to help us all out of the water. Harry's dad flailed and lashed out, not wanting to be taken away from what was left of his son. How they finally managed to remove him, or what they managed to salvage, I can't honestly say. The entire event past this point is a blur for me. All I know for certain is that the police arrived shortly after, and what happened to Harry was treated as a disappearance. Nobody was going to believe the kid who testified to seeing the endless red arm take his friend through the vent of the swimming pool. The addition of the white glove didn't exactly help either. The cruelest part of the entire investigation was that they pretended to take me seriously. And I would go on to find out that, behind the scenes, having me sectioned was a source of constant friction between the police and my family. Despite my lack of detail due to the obvious trauma of the event, my mother always believed me. My father was more skeptical. But he never called me a liar and supported me when telling my version of events to the police. When I was old enough to do some searching myself, I found that Harry's death was listed as a disappearance, despite the copious blood in the water. After thoroughly investigating the pool and its filtration systems, they found nothing at all. In the following weeks, our school went nuts. When the year group has only 14 people, anything happening to anyone creates a huge ripple. Not only did Harry disappear, but the only lead was my witness of his violent death at the hands of that red monster that lives in the vent of the pool. I wish I could say that Harry was okay, that my friends and I reconnected as adults and went back to the pool where Harry had gone, that we went down into that vent and slew the monster that took our friend and crippled our childhood. I wish I could say that we returned Harry to his father and the two were reunited and we lived the rest of our lives as friends who once shared unimaginable trauma and overcome the evils of this world, and emerge victorious. But that's not true. How could three 11-year-old boys ever shoulder trauma of that magnitude? Sam's family moved away three days after the memorial service. I checked his Facebook yesterday. He's married, two kids of his own, only 22, but his family always were the traditional sort. He looks, I don't know how to describe it, like a boy forcing himself to become a man. He doesn't smile all that much in the photos. Jack stayed, like me. But we didn't talk much after what happened. When we moved to secondary school, he fell in with a rough crowd. It started innocently enough. He and his friends picking on the lower years and gaining a mean reputation. He, in particular, got vicious. So much so, his new friends were more like his hired help. As he got older, it got worse. Last I heard, he was out on parole and his girlfriend has a pretty heavy restraining order against him. I have no desire to help him. I don't even know that I could. About a year after Harry disappeared, both his mother and father shot themselves. Still being a child, I didn't get to hear any details until I was old enough to seek them out for myself. I was told they died peacefully when it happened, and I resented my parents for a time when I found out they lied to me. Protecting a child who watched his friend be snatched and crushed by a creature no one else could confirm the existence of. And the truth of the situation, I felt like they were treating me like a kid. Of course, I was a kid. I never once felt like it. They'd shot themselves, laid together on their bed. From what I could gather, Harry's father had pulled the trigger. The bullet went through her skull and into his. Even in his dying moments, he chose to help someone else first. He couldn't let her feel the pain of loss, even for a millisecond. I don't think I've ever cried as much as I did when I realized that. In between their two bodies, tens of photos of Harry. Of course, I couldn't find out exactly which photos. 
but I know it would have been the ones of all of us together. Sam's ninth birthday, which we had at Harry's house, where Jack got stuck up the tree for an hour and a half. Harry's role in the nativity performance as a blade of grass. Me in the staff room with Harry, after we both got stung by multitudes of bees the year before we went to the pool for the last time. Harry and I, laughing with puffy red eyes from crying. He didn't take any photos while we were crying. He didn't pull out the camera until he'd made us laugh. I got pretty extensive therapy. Always carefully towing the line between indulging my fantastical recounting of events and making sure to instill the ridiculousness of my story in my subconscious. I made my way through the school system as something of a loner, but still managed to make some friends, even made a few close ones. They stuck to me through college and, now, university. We're a close-knit group, but I've never really told them what happened. They know the abstract, of course, but not the whole thing. I talk to my mom about it a lot, minus the worst bits. She keeps telling me to talk to my friends about it. I know they'd believe me. They're wonderfully kind in that way. Maybe it's the pressures of being an adult, the strain it puts on certain relationships, and the way you interact with the people in your life, but I feel certain I'll never have what I had with Sam and Jack and Harry. They say the chances of the Big Bang working out exactly the way it did are so infinitely small, it's difficult to comprehend. I suppose that's how our friendship felt, like a miracle, a beautiful accident, chance. My parents helped me all the way through. Dad making sure, after some time, that I knew he believed what I had seen. I often think they must carry as much trauma as I do. The number of times they've heard me retell the story. The midnight wails of agonies I'm thrust wide awake. Ripped from the familiar nightmare of the white glove. The hour-long panic attacks and the guilt of the knowledge I carry. That I will always carry. I'm training to be a marine biologist. I'm determined to be something. To make something of myself. In a sense. I have to live the life Harry won't, as well as my own. I'm doing it for Harry, and I'm doing it for Harry's dad, marine biologist. How ironic. Y'all ever seen a wiggle man? I'm not one for this ghost and goblin stuff. I don't know what else to call it. It's shaped like a person. Stands on two legs and all, but it twitches and shakes when it walks. Like it's tortured every step. It's almost like it's blurry from the shaking. Does that make sense? I've only seen it at my job, when I'm alone and the lights get turned out. I work in a garage. I've been here since I dropped out of high school in 73. It's harder now that most cars are diagnosed with computers. I have a hard time keeping a job that relies on the digital stuff. I just started at a new shop. We specialize in older vehicles. Feels like old times. It all seemed to be going smoothly for the first few months. Then my boss Randy gave me the keys and had me start locking up at the end of the day. That's when I noticed this wiggler moving around. I ain't seen nothing like it. Seems to have an aversion to lights. I only seen it after I shut the lights down. It shudders as it walks, shaking like a dog shitting peach seeds like it's getting an electric shock or almost like it's made from tv static fast twitchy movements i don't know how else to explain it can't see much in the way of details like skin or clothing or nothing but i can feel that it wants to hurt me the damn thing is angry and i can feel it in the air so when i shut off the shop lights i always spring to the office where the lights are still on i feel like a damn fool I'm too old to be afraid of the dark. This thing always rattles its way from the back of the shop. The thing ain't too fast, but I run anyways. There's a mess of storage and half-finished projects in the back. During the day, I rummaged around there thinking I'd find some hobo setup. Some makeshift living space. You've heard the stories where some crazy person is living in an attic or a crawl space, and the owner doesn't know till it's too late. That's what I was expecting, but there was no sign of it. Just the normal crap and corruption to be expected. That's why I stop thinking it's a person, and maybe something otherworldly is happening. I should mention that there's a large stain on the ceiling back there too. Like a large oil stain you'd find under an old truck, but on the ceiling. There's some black charcoal looking stuff below it. I don't know how someone could make a stain like that. So high. 
If you look at it in just the right manner, it almost looks like it has depth. Like one of those hologram stickers you'd get from a gumball machine as a kid. There's something wrong about it. It must just be weird lighting or something. I don't know if that stain has anything to do with this twitcher, or if I've fallen off my rocker. It does seem connected though. Last night, when I was closing up shop, I could feel the hatred in the air before I even went to switch off the lights. Maybe all this paranormal stuff is getting to me. Either way, it was like there was a low hum oscillating in my ears, and the air felt thicker. Time moved like molasses. With the lights still on, I went to the back to make sure the air compressor was drained for the night. One of the normal closing duties. Felt the urge to run away. To get the fuck out of the shop as soon as I could. Skip closing it all down. The compressor kicked on as I was getting closer to it. Not going to lie. It startled me a bit. The old thing is loud as hell. Can't hear nothing past the rumbling of that old machine. I'm still a good ways away when the dang lights shut off. The switch is at the other end of the shop. No one is there but me. I stopped like a brick wall just appeared in front of me. The air compressor's motor blaring in my ear filling my head with lightning. The noise is the only thing I can sense while my eyes are adjusting to the darkness. My boots are made of lead and tarred to the floor. The damn compressor camouflaging any sounds. I can feel every muscle keeping me on my feet, feeling every breath that passes from my lungs into the darkness, every heartbeat claw and scratch another hole in my chest, feeling every second stretch like a rubber band and snap, and then the lights turn back on, just like that. No ceremony, although I would have thrown a parade for the occurrence. Pop. A deafening hiss from the old beast air compressor as its tank is finally full. I quickly look around and run to shut it off. I finish up the rest of the closing duties and start for the lights. I prepare myself the way I always do. A couple deep breaths and get ready to run to the office. The lights oasis. I flip the switch and as I'm rushing to the office like a scared child, I see this chattered bastard close out of the corner of my eye. I don't know how it got so close. Usually it takes a minute or two for it to stagger its way to the front of the shop. Maybe it hid in the shadows, under a car, while well, the lights were out. Who knows? I don't know how this stuff works. All I know is it's less than a Buick's length away. I bolt to the office and slam the door as it clamors behind me. Safe, I assume, under the fluorescent lights. I was crouched under the window that overlooks the shop catching my breath, wondering if I've gone crazy, and knowing I have to get up to leave, that I can't stay. That I should turn the lights off in the office before I do. But fuck that. The lights are staying on tonight. I slowly lifted my head up to peek out the window to make sure the coast was clear. The coast was clear as mud. Just past where light from the office fades into the darkness of the shop. I could see this jolting demon pacing back and forth. Like a tremoring tiger trapped in a cage. Agonizing in its every movement. I watched for as long as I could bear then ducked back down. Fumbling for my keys with sweaty hands, I prepared for my escape. Six, maybe seven good strides to the door. That's it. That's all I had to do for safety. Without checking to see where this convulsing monstrosity is, I take my chance and run for the door. Again, time turned to winter oil. Between strides, the lights fail me again. Last few feet in total darkness. I fling the door wide and slide out as fast as I can. Pivot to slam it shut, and the quick sliver before I do, I can see the rattler opening up the office door and heading for me. As soon as the door is sealed, I try to slip the keys in and lock it up, but the keys had other plans. They fell to the ground before I could lock it up. Knowing I only had a few moments before the shaker got to the door, I just ran. Not my proudest moment. I'm outside and I can see the electricity is out on the whole block. I jump into my pickup and back up onto the street to hightail it. As I switch from reverse into gear, I see the entrance to the shop office open up. Mr. Wiggles was out. I put it in gear and squeaked my tires. I let loose a monster. I called in sick today. Shameful, I know. I don't have it in me to close up shop again. Being the new guy, I know I'll have to. I don't want to lose this job. I finally got to wrench on cars for real, instead of being told how to fix them by a computer. Who knows where that demon made it to last night. 
Maybe the sun fried it up when it spit out light this morning. Hopefully. I guess I'll find out tomorrow. I can't call in sick forever. Hopefully Randy isn't too pissed about the front door being left unlocked. I guess it'd be a blessing in disguise if I did get fired. I wouldn't have to deal with this shaky bastard ever again. April 18th, 1991. My dad used to tell me a story when I was a child of a hereditary spirit known only in our family as the Grinning Man. Passed down through generations, he would warn of tragedies, appearing before misfortunes to alert the bearer of his curse that something terrible would shortly happen. One day, he said, once his body has returned to the weeds, the Grinning Man would come to me. The borders of the cemetery were teeming with crowds of reporters and journalists all eager to take that one perfect picture to go on the front of whichever paper they were there for. I suspected as much, but I was a step ahead. As my father's casket was lowered into the ground, I scanned the surrounding crowd of mourners for my private hire, the only photographer I would allow into the ceremony, Jeremy Winger. I spotted him on the other side of the hole, his fluffed, russet hair sticking out between a couple of suits that I couldn't quite place. Business partners of my father, I figured. He had many. Once Jeremy locked eyes with me, I nodded to him subtly. He nodded back and began doing what he was there to do. I could see that the constant flashing of Jeremy's camera was upsetting the already upset people in attendance. Namely my brother, Edward. He shot me a brief look of disappointment. Listen, if people are going to take pictures, the least I could do was make sure they would be good ones. It was a win-win. I made sure Jeremy would get the best shots, that way he could sell them to all the papers, and it's not as though they would use any of their own. All the other photographers were a hundred feet away. As the eldest son, I was now the honorary head of the family, and I had to make a good first impression. I sure as hell wasn't going to let some hack, amateur journalist, cover the event or run a shoddy blurry image make it to the front of tomorrow's paper. The car ride home was uncomfortable. My wife. Lillian glared at me the entire way there, not just because of Jeremy, there were lots of reasons for her to be upset, I wish I understood that at the time. Later that night, me and my wife crawled into bed, not saying so much as goodnight to each other. She rolled over, her back facing me. I wanted to see if she would say anything to me. She never did and I eventually drifted off. It couldn't have been more than two hours before I awoke to her prodding my back. I rubbed my eyes and perked up. Perhaps she was about to apologize, I thought. Are you going to get the fucking phone? She barked to my dismay. The faint sound of ringing began to become more audible as I stumbled downstairs in my nightgown. Yeah, I growled after I yanked the phone off the wall. Hi, George, it's Jeremy. I think we should meet. Meet? I stuttered. I glanced at the grandfather clock ticking monotonously in the corner. It's two in the fucking morning. What purpose could you possibly have to meet me at two in the morning? Sorry, Mr. Clay. I understand you must be living. I could hear a slight apprehension in his voice. But this really is quite an emergency. I think it's best to meet as soon as possible. I sighed and arranged to meet up at a bar called Danny's. The only place I knew would be open so late. Sorry. Honey, I'm going to meet a friend. I won't be any longer than an hour, okay? I shut it up the stairs, slipping on my pants and shoes. No response. I suspected as much. I pushed open the door to Danny's, the stench of stale beer filling my nose. Jeremy was already there, sat in an isolated booth in the corner. As I approached, I noticed his left leg shaking under the table. You not gonna order anything? I smirked, referring to the empty table. Jeremy was not amused. He pulled some papers out his satchel, resting on his lap and laid them on the table. Pictures from the funeral. Now, I really am sorry, Mr. Clay. I don't know how I could have missed him. What are you talking about? I said, more than irritated. He pointed to his spots on the leftmost picture. This was the first picture I developed when I got home. Look closely. There was an urgency about his tone. I looked to where he was pointing. There was a man. An elderly man dressed in all black like everyone else, donning a similarly colored trilby. 
He was amongst the miserable crowd of mourners, but what differed him from the rest was the wide, sinister, almost cartoonish grin. His face contorted around his ominous smile as though it was painting him. I was speechless. Then I developed another and another, the same man appearing in all of them. Jeremy continued. I don't know how this could have happened. As I said, I didn't even notice him at the time. There was a sort of dismay in his voice. I almost felt sorry for him. Well, can't you just edit him out or something? I mean, this is what you do, isn't it? I said, trying not to sound too harsh. Yeah, well, I thought of that too, but look closer. The man is obscuring you in all of them. George, you are not in a single one of these pictures. I told Jeremy to leave. What should I do with these? He asked on his way out, holding up the pictures. Flush them down the toilet, burn them, destroy them, I don't care. I responded, defeated. He left and I sat at the bar, ordering more than enough drinks. Didn't stop me from driving myself home though. I stumbled my way through the door and in a stupor and collapsed on the couch. The next few weeks were a blur. I went from meeting to meeting, function to function on some sort of anxiety riddled autopilot. It was during this period of limbo that the grinning man made another appearance. Honestly, I couldn't give two shits about my nephew's football game, but Lillian wanted to go and things were already bad with my brother so the choice had already been made for me. Once we got there, I was surprised at the size of the field and the surrounding stands. I have my dad to thank for that one. He preferred homeschooling for his children. Our family sat near the top of the left stand, best seat in the house apparently. I wouldn't know. Alex, my nephew, was number three. He was actually fairly good. I can't remember exactly what the score was, but Alex's team was winning as the game neared its end. By that point, I was more invested in the game than I could have ever anticipated. Through a series of catches and throws, Alex had gotten his hands on the ball once again. The crowd erupted as he tore across the pitch. But as he did, in the rim of my peripheral, I spotted an unsettling sight across the field. Up at the very top of the stand, immediately opposite ours, a familiar face grinned at me. Thinking my eyes to be deceiving me, I squinted and leaned forward. Sure enough, it was him, the same man from my father's funeral pictures, wearing the exact same dark outfit, his black hat tilted downwards atop his twisted face. Suddenly, in an instant the crowd became almost silent aside from a few gasps. I looked back down at the pitch, number three was laying on the ground clutching his legs surrounded by the other players. Eventually he was lifted off and taken to a nearby hospital. I later learned that one of the other kids, in a brutal attempt to keep him from scoring, tackled Alex so belligerently that his left leg snapped clean in two at the shin. I didn't see the man after that. He was nowhere to be found after the game, and believe me, I looked. I wanted to question that freak on who he was and what he wants with my family so I waited at the entrance to the stand I saw him in, but he never came out. Lillian didn't take kindly to me neglecting her after the game, however. She was much closer to Alex than me, and I could see she was a little shaken. Once back home, I tried to comfort her, but it was too little, too late, I suppose. And the day ended the same way they had the past month, with not so much as a good night before we slept. Another month passed without incident, Alex was in the hospital for a day or two before coming out with a cast and a pair of crutches. I gave my sympathies to Edward and his wife over the phone. They thanked me, but I could hear the faint whispers of bitterness in their voices. They weren't too impressed with my apparent lack of concern. I waited for a day in which I was free. Back in those days, that privilege came seldom. The plan was to have my chauffeur, Rodrigo, drive me up to the city to buy a gift for Alex. It was time for me to start giving a shit. I leaned my head against the back left window as the car rolled along the road. The sky was gray. I stared at it with a sense of melancholy. Or perhaps, just boredom. You okay back there, sir? Rodrigo asked, glancing at me in the rearview mirror. I shot him a subtle thumbs up and returned my gaze to the window. Rodrigo? Yes, sir, he responded. Rodrigo was young, you see. His father used to work for me, so I figured I'd throw his son a bone after he died. He was a good kid, who looked good behind a wheel, especially the wheel of a car expensive as this one. What's your favorite movie, Rodrigo? I asked. Die Hard, 
he answered quickly. I snickered. That was your dad's favorite as well. Maybe that's why he decided to be a security guard. Yeah, maybe. Rodrigo responded hesitantly. But John McLean wasn't a security guard. He was a cop. Same difference. I mumbled. You got a girlfriend, Rodrigo? No, sir. Never had a girlfriend in my life. I turned my head facing the front windshield. What? How old are you? 20, and you've never had... I paused. Past Rodrigo's head, on the right sidewalk, the silhouette of a man came into view. It was him. Quickly, I lunged out of my seat, into the parting between the two at the front, basically breathing down the back of Rodrigo's neck. I pointed at the man whose unhinged grin became visible as the car rapidly approached. Do you see that man? I shouted. Rodrigo was startled. Who? I don't know him. Him. Him in the black hat. He tried to keep his eyes on the road, but my voice was getting more and more urgent. Mr. Clay? I don't know. I can't see. I was borderline screaming now. Look. Would you look? In between the commotion and without warning, a young boy ran out from between two parked cars and into the road. As if in the same instant, Rodrigo swerved to the right, narrowly missing the child but still hurtling into the rear end of another parked car. As we collided, I was launched back into my seat, my head smacking off the leather, which almost broke my neck. I shook my head in an attempt to recover from the stun of the collision. Once I could see straight, I scrambled out the door and into the road, looking for the grinning man. He wasn't there. Rodrigo was fine, if not a bit disturbed. The car, however, wasn't so lucky. The entire front was completely demolished, almost sinking into the back of the other car, as though it was one long vehicle. The rest of that day was a blur. Once I was back in my house, it was non-stop phone calls. My assistant was furious and strongly instructed me to fire Rodrigo. I ignored her advice, but it was no matter. Rodrigo quit the next day. Once back home, I was surprised with an unfamiliar display of concern from Lillian. Her tone wasn't what I would call affectionate, but beggars can't be choosers. We sat on the couch and talked. I know you only told me you were fine not to worry me. I'm not stupid, you know. She spoke firmly and confidently. I looked to the floor as she did. What's on your mind, George? I turned back to her. I thought of telling her that perhaps my father's death had affected me more than I first let on, or that the guilt of my poor behavior had finally caught up to me. But like police dogs have a scent for drugs, she had a scent for bullshit. When I was a boy, Dad used to tell me a story. I can't remember the details, but in its simplest form, the story was about our family, of a figure that only us with clay blood could see. Oh, Jesus. She interrupted. Are you going to let me fucking finish or what? I barked. Her willingness to write this off so easily made me live in. I'm not asking for a goddamn ghost story, George. I'm trying to show you that I worry, which is more than you deserve. She was standing up now. You asked me a question, but you're not letting me answer. Just because you bothered to ask doesn't automatically mean you give a shit about me. You know, it kind of defeats the purpose when you don't let me get a word in. It was a miracle I was able to make an actual reasonable argument, let alone do it while staying relatively calm. I fought the urge to stand. Instead, I just sank back on the couch. So... How about you sit down and let me finish, yeah? I said, patting my hand on the free space of the couch. Lillianne huffed before sitting, folding her arms as she did. I'm no expert, but I'm pretty sure that means they're closing themselves off. Thanks. Now, what I was trying to say was that I think that my father's death has affected me more as I may have let on. I said, defeated. Over my dead body, would I let that forked tongue bitch know that I believe in ghosts. Honestly, I didn't care all too much about good old Arnold Clay's passing, as I think I've made that abundantly clear. She squinted at me condescendingly. What's all this about ghosts or whatever then? She said, with an almost cartoonish level of suspicion. It was just my long-winded way of saying I'm sad. I said. Lillian scoffed. She didn't believe me. I figured as much. 
but at least it didn't end with a storm of curses and tantrums. She said nothing else and excused herself to the garden. To smoke, I suspected. I didn't blame her. As soon as she left, I called my brother up. I asked if dad had ever told him the same story as he had told me. He didn't know what I was talking about. Listen, George. He spoke softly. I worried about you. We all are. You haven't been the same since dad died. I rolled my eyes as Edward continued. As I'm sure you know, it's my birthday next week. I'm having the whole family around and I'd like for you to be there. I understand if you want to be alone. I was almost caught off guard by this uncharacteristic show of kindness. Yeah, I'll definitely be there. I responded without hesitation. This was my chance to prove that I wasn't batshit. Immediately after Edward hung up, I began to dial again. I waited eagerly for Jeremy to pick up the phone. Hello? He said. Jeremy, it's George. I'm going to need those funeral photos. You know the ones. With the grinning man? It took him a few moments to answer. Where? I threw those out, Mr. Clay. Remember you told me you didn't care what I did with them. He responded confused. He was right. I did tell him that. Fuck. Okay, Jeremy. Are you free now? I need to meet you at Danny's again. Mr. Clay, I told you I don't have the photos anymore. No, I know you said that, but you can still help me. I'll explain when I'm there, okay? Can you be there in an hour? I asked with a stern confidence. To my delight, Jeremy agreed to meet. The sky outside was aglow with golden rays of sun as it lapsed down past the conurbation. I pushed open the door to Danny's to see Jeremy sat in the same place he was last time. I sat opposite him, same as before, and waited for him to speak. So, what can I do for you? He said nervously. I need you to free up your next week, I replied firmly. He tilted his head in confusion. Before he said anything else, I continued. I need you to shadow me everywhere I go for the next week with your camera. Is that something you think you can do? Yeah, I mean, you're gonna pay me though, right? Name your price. His son, he still looked confused. I'm sorry, Mr. Clay. Can I ask what this is for? I thought he would ask that. I figured I'd just tell him the truth. I mean, I owed him that much. Okay, listen, Jeremy. Do you believe in ghosts or demons or any of that stuff? His eyes widened. Yeah, actually I do. Some guy a few years back hired me to photograph certain parts of his house at night. He thought the place was haunted, you say. He said his dead ex-wife was tormenting him from beyond the grave. So, I do what he said, and stayed with him for the night and did my thing. Taking pictures where and when he tells me. Lo and behold, the next day I developed them. There was the vague outline of a woman in a couple of the pictures. I sat back. Well, Jeremy, I'm going to need you to do a similar thing for me. Jeremy leaned forward. So what's your story, Mr. Clay? Who's your monster? He asked. Jeremy seemed the type of man to enjoy a good ghost story. Well, it's complicated. You see, after my father died, I think he passed something down to me. He used to tell me the story of a grinning man appearing before tragedies or disasters. Some sort of hereditary spirit. I was going to carry on before he butted in. The guy in the funeral photos. He said with a stark realization. Yes, exactly. But here's the thing, Jeremy. Only I can see him. My family thinks I'm going fucking crazy. So you want me to take a picture of him to prove you're not going crazy? Jeremy said, nodding as he did. Precisely. I confirmed. Is that something you can do? I asked hopefully. Jeremy named his price and we agreed on it with a handshake. I didn't leave the house in the days leading up to Edward's birthday. Lillian already thought so little of me that she hardly questioned why the photographer from my father's funeral was sleeping in his car outside the house. For those days, I lived in a sort of smug ignorance, as though I knew this would end with my victory. I smirked, imagining the look on my wife's face when I would show her the picture of my tormentor. For once, I was hoping to see the man. I ached for it. Finally, the day came. Our car rolled across the gravel outside Edward's mansion. Out the window, I could see many other cars lined up outside. There were more people going than I first suspected. 
I hate to confess it, but part of me always envied Edward because of his house. It was admittedly gorgeous. It looked aged, but not in a bad way. It had aged like a fine wine. Vines crawled up the crimson bricks like veins. Lillian complimented their home as we approached the door. She knew it got under my skin. Jeremy followed closely behind, his huge camera swinging from his neck. Edward and his wife Susan greeted us at the door. As it opened, the sound of music and people laughing and generally mingling erupted in my ears. That caught me off guard, as I expected a much more intimate, family-oriented gathering, but it was a full-blown party. The bottom floor of the house was divided into three main areas. Beyond the entrance was what didn't look dissimilar to what you might be greeted by upon entering a hotel, with a tall, wide staircase running up the center, and a large glass chandelier hanging from the ceiling above, swaying ominously. A hallway to the right of the staircase led to the living room, an expansive room of which the walls were coated in a mixture of grey and brown paint. The room was home to many different arrangements of furniture that lay before a flickering fireplace with a northmost wall, almost entirely consisting of tall windows. Out of the windows you could see their garden, a huge grassy glade, surrounded by woodland. Alternatively, on the other side of the house, past the hallway on the left side of the lobby, was the kitchen, among other utilities. I dare not go in there while the cake was being prepared. After some small talk between our two couples, I pulled Edward aside. Who are all these people? I asked over the noise. Just friends, he replied. I know you always used to hate our little family meetups. This is much more up your street, George. I thought you'd be pleasantly surprised. I put on a fake smile and agreed. Yeah, this is much more fun, I said. And that part was true. But I wasn't here to have fun. A large amount of people would complicate things. If the grinning man was to appear, he would be much harder to spot amongst the crowd. Not to mention the trouble it would take to get a good picture of him. Just as I thought our conversation was over, he pulled me in closer. Say, George, I see you've brought the guy from the funeral here. You know this probably isn't a newsworthy occasion, he said, pointing to Jeremy, who had made himself comfortable in the corner of the living room, glass of kava in hand. I looked at him, then back at Edward. I just thought he should be here. Better safe than sorry, don't you agree? Edward smirked and nodded before patting me on the back and walking off. The interior of the house was spacious, but it still seemed crowded. Groups of shit-eating old men, and their trophy wives sipping on champagne everywhere I looked. Though, I suppose Edward was right. If I hadn't been burdened with the knowledge that I'm being haunted, then I might have actually had a good time. I glanced at a tray of drinks across the room, laying on one of the many tables strewn about the living room. Admittedly, I was tempted to take a couple, but I refrained. I had to stay focused. I walked over to Jeremy, still stood in the corner. As I approached, he grabbed his camera instinctively. I gestured him to put it down. No, not yet, I son. But do you mind if you can try and stay away from the drinks, please? If he appears, I'm going to need you to be concentrated, okay? Jeremy's stern poise loosened up. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Clay. But it's just what you said got me worried is all. <laughs> Which part? I chuckled nervously. Well, you were saying how this guy only appears before bad things happen, right? He said. I nodded in response. Well, in that case, if he were to appear, then isn't there a chance someone could get hurt or something? Jeremy's right leg was quivering slightly now. Trying to put on a brave face, I placed a hand on his shoulder. Listen, Jeremy, it's not like that. The worst I've seen happen is, uh, well, I started in my attempt to conjure up a lie. One time I saw him then a bird took a shit on my head. I think when we were talking at Danny's, I might have made it sound worse than it really is. I took my hand off his shoulder. You okay now? I asked comfortingly. Jeremy nodded. Good man, I said patting him on the back. I walked off and he followed me to the lobby in which more people were mingling. After that brief but telling interaction, my blind ignorance had dwindled entirely. It was instead a sense of hesitation and perturbed distress, which came over me during my hasty journey to the foyer. I hadn't noticed it before, but the incidents in which he showed himself appeared to be getting more intense. The thought raced through my mind. First, it was the funeral. 
That was where I would consider the gradual decline of my family life began. That was subtle. But then it was the football game. Injury. Then the car crash, which almost ended the lives of three people. Me, Rodrigo, and the child. If I were a betting man, I would say death is next. The thought alarmed me. Once in the lobby, my haunted gaze turned to the chandelier, which at a closer glance appeared to be rocking subtly like an empty swing in the wind. Below it stood three strangers, blissfully unaware as to what threatened them. I turned to Jeremy and quickly gestured him to get his camera ready. He clutched it and held it up to his face. I looked all around for the man in every corner of the room. I was ready at any moment to see his grinning face amongst the crowded room, to see his black hat protruding out of the groups of people. I was certain that chandelier would fall, but alas, he was nowhere to be seen. But I did catch a glimpse of my brother. He was talking to a few of the other guests in the corner. I went to him and pulled him aside once more. Edward, does the way that chandelier is moving not alarm you? I said pointing up to it. He looked up at it and squinted his eyes. I don't see it moving, George. He responded confused. I looked up to it. He was right. It was still. Completely still. I looked down. My mind somewhat tangled. What's the matter with you, George? You seem disturbed. I was. You're still thinking of that story Dad told you, aren't you? I met his eye line. My vanquished expression told him all. Oh, Jesus, George. It's a tall tale. A story to scare you before bedtime. That's all it is. I knew it was more than that. But I couldn't go into it with him now. Listen. I think you should take this time to have fun. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? He said. He had no idea what the worst was, but he did have a point. It did cross my mind at that moment that the chance of the grinning man appearing at a birthday party was slim. I think the anticipation of the event led me to create a false expectation. After all, the grinning man only warns of misfortunes. He doesn't cause them. Or at least, that's what Dad used to say. Come on, Edward said. I think it's time for the cake. He announced eagerly, herding everyone into the living room as the muffled sound of women singing happy birthday started up in the kitchen. As I walked into the living room behind everyone, I felt a tap on my shoulder. I turned to see Jeremy. Mr. Clay, do you mind if I go number one quickly? I'm about to burst, he said. I smirked. Yeah, sure. Bathroom's up the stairs and to the right. You'll find it. He thanked me and darted up the long flight of stairs. All the guests squeezed into the living room as the cooks emerged from around the corner, one of them wheeling around a towering white cake. Soon after, everyone joined in on the song, wishing Edward a very happy birthday. I began singing too and for a brief moment there, I almost felt contempt. That was foolish of me, because, in the end, it's never that simple. As I sang at the very edge of my vision, I noticed an unwelcome disparity in the scenery out the window. I stopped singing and turned, facing the vast backyard, and in the darkness beyond the glass I saw it. On the very edge of the garden, where the glade met the forest, I made out the vague outline of a man, dressed all in black, his glistening white teeth calling out to me in the pale moonlight. My heart dropped. I pushed through the crowd violently. People gasped and stopped their singing. As I barged past and into the hallway, I sprinted to the lobby, calling up the stairs with all the power in my lungs. Jeremy, get down here. I continued to scream as I heard the hasty thud of footsteps grow louder from the second floor. Quickly, I bellowed desperately. Jeremy hurried around the corner into the top of the stairs. I didn't see it coming. How could I have? In his desperate rush, Jeremy tripped over his own feet, tumbling head first down the stairs. The camera, still around his neck, crunched under his weight as he fell. He landed violently on the ground by his neck, which cracked with a room-silencing snap. I was frozen. For a few moments after, his limbs twitched like a swatted fly before becoming motionless. Dead. An ambulance was called, but... Jeremy was dead the moment he hit the ground. The party was quickly ended. I left without saying a word. Lillian apparently stayed the night there with Edward and Susan as she never returned to the house that night. For a week, I stayed alone in my house, waiting for a call. Eventually it rang. 
I picked up to hear my wife's voice on the other end of the phone. I was glad to hear from her, but that short moment of happiness was quickly snuffed out as I noticed her tone. She wasn't calling me to give me good news. After a couple of minutes of unnecessary buildup, she finally told me the reason for her call, but I already knew what she was going to say, as the grinning man made his presence known again, smiling in the corner. She wanted a divorce. I didn't blame her. I didn't like being alone with me either. She had already arranged to stay at Edwards until the divorce was finalized. The following month had me feeling lachrymose, defeated, and utterly alone. Well, to be honest, it may have been more than a month, around a week or two, of staying indoors. I think I just lost track of time. One day, the lack of sleep finally got to me. That was no way to live. After the sun had sunken and the moon became bright, I finished the last of my brandy. Hours of contemplation later, I finally decided which room I would do it in. I retrieved a bottle of painkillers from the bathroom and entered my bedroom. I sat on the floor and leaned my drunken head on the wall with the bed facing me. I cracked open the bottle. Just as expected, there he was. He stood in the dark corner across the room, still grinning and still pleased. I looked at the bottle then back at him. I stared deep into his wide, piercing eyes. I looked back down. I smirked. Putting the bottle down, I stood up, looking the man up and down. No, I said. The man tilted his head, still grinning. No, I repeated, but louder this time. You don't warn of tragedies. You cause them. Dad may not have seen it, but I do. The man's grin slowly turned to a cartoonish frown as I continued to defy him. I know your endgame. Once I kill myself, you'll just move on to someone else. You think I'm going to let you get to me, but I won't. I'm a businessman. I'd rather see you lose than win myself. I'll lock myself away. Get institutionalized. Whatever it takes to keep you away from anyone else. For once, I felt as though I was winning. The man's bottom lip began to quiver, and his eyes became misty. I kicked the bottle of painkillers away, and they exploded all over the floor. And with that, the man burst into tears. A childlike tantrum. Anguish wails erupted from him. His voice was deep. Deeper than anything I'd heard before. The room shook violently as I cupped my ears. The sound was unbearable. Like a boat scraping against an iceberg. His cries turned into a tormented bellow. His jaw was now widened, swinging low. The bedroom window burst as he let out one last tortured roar before. Silence. I took my hands off my ears and scanned the room. Nothing. He was gone. I'd won. I'm going to be honest. My transition back to normalcy was complicated and a bit messy. I still didn't leave the house for about a week. As happy as I was, I was still shaken. I got someone to come and repair the window. I told the guy a uh, bird flew into it. The same day I got in contact with Jeremy's relatives. I knew it wouldn't compensate for what they'd been through, but I made sure to leave each of them a hefty sum of money. They were hesitant to take money at first, but after I told them who I was, and how I knew Jeremy, they accepted. Eventually, I started going back into work. If I hadn't owned the company, I'm sure I would have been fired for being absent for so long. After that, I hired a therapist. You can't go through what I went through without a little bit of mental trauma. The hardest part was yet to come, however. For a few weeks, Lillian still refused to speak to me. We were divorced though, so that was what I expected. But I had a good talk with Edward and I finally gave him a long overdue apology. He must have said something to Lillianne because after that conversation, she started paying me more attention. Before long, we were spending time together again. It's wonderful how long people can get on once you stop being a total ass. Two months after that, we started to become romantically involved again. And another two months after that, we remarried. And one year later, we were welcoming a beautiful baby boy into our lives. Arnold, we called him. Those times were nothing but bliss. We said hello to little baby Arnold five years ago now. Edward had recently fallen under tough times, so me and Lillian agreed to take him and five-year-old Arnold to Spain. A little family holiday. Our private plane churned and growled as we boarded. Once in the plane, we all took our seats. It was just us and the staff. 
So, we had anywhere to choose from. I sat behind the window, placing Arnold by my side. Lillianne sat opposite us, placing her purse on the table. Edward sat a little way down the plane by himself, silently reading a book. I gave Arnold some candy to suck on before we took off. Hey, hey, what do we say when someone gives you something? I said gently. Thank you, Arnold said, as he began munching down on the candy. Lillian chuckled at the cuteness of his reply. Shortly after, the plane took off and we were on our way. Out the window, the houses and buildings below us shrank and shrank as we lifted off. A few moments passed and I was so caught up in my conversation with Lillian that I almost didn't notice the confused look on Arnold's little face. I nudged him with my elbow. What's the matter, buddy? I asked. He looked up at me. Daddy, is he coming with us too? I tilted my head in confusion. Who, Arnold? I asked. He turned away from me. The happy man, he said, pointing to an empty seat across the plane. Trash man, trash man, that's who he is. Trash man, trash man, better be careful. Trash man, trash man, for if you litter. Trash man, trash man, trash is what you'll be. What are you singing? My attention from my brand new video game was given to my friend, Darian, who had begun to sing that strange song. Darian shrugged his shoulders. To be honest, I'm not sure. I overheard some guys singing it and for some reason it got stuck in my head. Don't you hate that? Yeah, that does suck. But who the hell is the trash man? Are they talking about the people who come collect the trash every Monday? Darian shrugged again. Like I said, I don't know. With that, I returned to my new game leaving Darian to his strange but soothing tune of a mysterious trash man. The next day after my shift from work, I decided to meet Darian at a local diner. We usually meet each other on Friday nights after work to sit back and chat while drinking. As I sat there waiting for Darian to show up like his usual five minutes later self, I indulged myself into random messages and posts on social media. Then, my attention was taken from that when I heard Darian entering the diner singing that strange but soothing tune. Trash man, trash man, that's who he is. Trash man, trash man. You're still singing that? I asked. Yeah, man, it's just so catchy. Darian sat down across from me. He reached for a menu quickly scrolling through. Alright, what should I get today? Why bother? You always pick the same. I son. Darian grinned. Yeah, yeah. He mutters a song under his breath as he looked through the menu. Trash man, trash man. Dude, come on. I know it's catchy, but how can you still be singing it? Darian didn't look up. He shrugged his shoulders. Can't help. I let out an annoyed sigh. I've known Darian for many years, and once he gets something stuck in his head, he can't let it go. Still, who was this trash man he keeps singing about? I tried searching on my phone as we waited for our server, but found nothing. Just who or what is the trash man? Darian continued to sing the song at a low tone, not wanting to bother the other patrons, when suddenly an old man who could barely walk without his cane stumbled over to us like a three-legged terrier. Excuse me, son, where did you happen to hear that song? He asked. Darian stopped his singing to look up at the man. He seems confused as to why this old man had approached him. I... He said. I overheard some guys singing it one day. Why? That is a tune I haven't heard in years. I'm surprised there are still those who sing of it. Though I shouldn't be surprised. Or that song is a warning. Wait, a warning? I asked. Darian raised an eyebrow. What, that if you litter, you'll get in trouble? I think everyone knows that. It's like a $500 bill. Fine, right? The old man waved a brittle hand in the air. No, boy, this isn't a fine. You wish it were. No, the trash man comes and collects those who dirty the street. Collects? So, he is a trash man. Darian shook his head. No, he collects the ones that litter, man. He's like a cop. The old man made his place at our table. He shoved Darian further into the wall while he eyes the two of us. You two need to be careful, he said. That trash man 
is not someone you can take lightly. For once you litter, he'll collect you. The old man lifted his head, his eyes pointing at the ceiling. Yeah, yeah. It looked as if he could see something that no one else could. Just like he did to Jim. Who's Jim? The old man brought down his eyes. Jim was a someone who didn't listen to the warnings. You see, one night after getting off work, Jim grabbed himself a nice cool beer, like most would after a hard day of work. Yet, he didn't just throw the can away into a trash can. No, Jim did like most would do and threw it on the ground. As he walked down drunkenly, his words slurring as he spoke to the air. He didn't hear the taps coming forth from the darkness. Taps? So, the trash man is a tap dancer? Man has qualifications, Darian said jokingly. It wasn't his feet making the tapping, it was his fingers. The old man held up his hands, wiggling his fingers. You see the trash man's face is covered completely by a black plastic trash bag. The only thing that's not covered is his nose. They say that the trash man litters himself, but was cursed to collect trash forever. Yet for his punishment, his smell was enhanced, so it is the only part of his face that isn't covered. And that has to do with his fingers? Darian asked. I'm getting to it. The old man rubbed his bushy chin. You see, though he can smell, he can't see, so he reaches out with his fingers searching and picking up any trash he can, but his fingers had touched the ground so much that they have been worn down to the bone, so his bony tips make tapping sounds as they search the ground. They were rubbed down to the bone? I stared at my fingers. The time I burnt my finger while grabbing a pot on the stove without a mitten brought back painful memories. That's insane. The old man nodded. Now, back to the story. Jim didn't hear the trash man's bony fingers tapping against the ground. Then, it is said when the trash man finds the toss, he can scream out a muffled yell. Jim didn't have a second to react. He was grabbed by the trash man and tossed into the large trash can that he carries on his back. Damn, guess you can say the trash man took out the trash, Darian said. The old man nodded. Yes, and that trash was never seen again, for whatever the trash man puts in the trash can on his back is never seen or heard from again. The trash can must be huge if it can fit a normal person, I said. The old man shook his head. It is bigger than a standard one, but not too much bigger. At times, I've heard he had to shove a person right into it, breaking every bone in their body. Darian shivered. Though he was a big horror fan, he had never been fond of seeing people's bones break, or even when bones are shown sticking out. It had come from a childhood memory of his when he fell out of a tree, and his left bone snapped. Ever since then, Darian never liked seeing or hearing about bones breaking. He covered his ears as the old man went on. Ah, uh, chill, chill. The old man gave a queer look. Sorry, just broken bones. He shivered. They freak me out. A wearily smile formed over Darian. The old man leads towards him, giving him a vile smile in response. The old man's crooked teeth were revealed during this exchange. Then, don't go littering, my boy. The man checked the time on his wristwatch. Oh, well, time to take my leave. Thanks for listening to an old coot story, boys. With that, he took his leave, but not without humming that tune of the trash man. Darian and I sat there going over the crazy story the old man had told us. To believe that the song Darian had been singing this whole time had been connected to a story of a missing person. I remember on our way home, I looked up articles for any missing people, but could not truly find anything connected. Darian turned to me, hands in his pockets. Hey... I was going to ask you a question. I glance up from my phone. Shocked, I stuffed my phone into my pocket. Sorry, man. I couldn't stop thinking about the story. What? Were you looking it up? I nodded. Yeah, but I can't find anything. I should ask that old man. Jimmy, last name. I let out a sigh. Yeah, I can't stop thinking about it either. Darian scratched the back of his head. But I guess that's one of those stories just to scare people. I mean, if they actually did happen, I'm sure people would talk about it. 
Darya then began to ponder something. I guess that's why some people know that song. Unless it's just catchy. I walked past Darian letting out a small chuckle and a smile. Yeah, guess you're right. Suddenly a group of five young teenagers of different heights came toward us. I stepped over putting myself in front of Darian, letting the teens walk past. One of the teens held a fast food cup in his hand. His lips pressed on the straw. He took a couple of sips before removing his lips to examine his cup. He shook it, then in a haste, tossed it onto the ground. I couldn't believe it. How could people just litter like that? I mean, I know there isn't a trash can around, but don't just throw it on the ground. Darian held out a hand toward the group. Hey kid, you shouldn't litter, man. It's not good for the environment. Besides, haven't you heard of the trash man? The group stopped to stare at us. Couldn't believe what Darian said. The group who threw the cup on the floor walked over to it and stomped on it, his fat foot pressing it deeper into the ground. The group laughed before walking off. Darian shook his head. Teenagers, man. Hey, we were like that too, my son. Though I never did throw trash on the ground. Darian shrugged. Yeah. He took a step past me and started a hum which soon became accompanied by words. Trash man, trash man. I turned to watch the group of teenagers around the corner as Darian sung that song. I felt a chill that day, but thinking it to be from the breeze at the time, I never expected what I would see on the news the next day. The teen that had tossed a cup on the ground had been killed. Or at least that's what his friend stated that day. Officials consider him to be missing and are conducting a search. The other teens described what had happened that night. They gather for some smokes at a park only to see a tall slender man coming toward them. He was draped in black torn dingy material that looked like a trash bag. He was hunched over searching over the ground as a horrible tap sound echoed from his fingers. Dirty chains and ropes were wrapped over his entire body that seemed to hold a trash can on his back. The teens thought it was some homeless man and tried to scare him away. The missing teen threw another cup at him to scare him away. Yet that caused the man to stop only to sniff the air. In a quickness, they couldn't believe the strange man reached at the boy. The other teens could see how horrifying his face and hands were. The missing teen screamed out, only for the strange man to stuff him into his trash can. With his screams and the gut-wrenching sound of bones cracking, the other teens ran off. With that, the news anchor went on to explain that the police were still going to search, hoping to find the missing teen. I couldn't believe what I heard. I mean, it couldn't be real, could it? It's just not possible. A knock came from my door. Hey Justin, it's me. Darian's voice echoed from the other side. I stood at the door, then back at my TV. A catchy, but strange song about the creepy trash man came into my mind. Trash man, trash man, that's who he is. Trash man, trash man, you better be careful. Trash man, trash man, for if you litter, trash man, trash man, trash is what you'll be. I was about 8 years old when my brother, Cash, started having nightmares. He was almost 2 years younger than me, and with our parents, he lived in a small Cape Cod house in a pretty normal suburb about 30 minutes east of a major city, 30 minutes west of rural farmland. For a while, Cash and I shared one bedroom while my parents occupied the other. Just a few steps down the hall, Cash didn't have typical nightmares. They weren't the kind where you wake up and quickly realize you're safe in your bed and you fall back to sleep. No. These were what doctors described as night terrors. He would wake up yelling so loud, it even woke up our neighbors on a few occasions. My parents would rush in, comfort him, and tell him that he was safe. There was nothing to worry about. He is here at home, and it was only a nightmare. You know, the whole spiel. This worked for a little while. He would fall back asleep and we would wake up the next morning as if it never happened. My parents never really talked about the nightly alarming wake-up calls from Cash, and I never really thought about them either, until one night, when he woke up like usual, but this time, he wasn't just crying. This time he sat upright with his mouth opened, as wide as it could go, screaming like a banshee, screaming over and over and over, frantically pulling at his sheets, 
and eyes darting back and forth from me to the door to the window in our bedroom. He kept saying, The Crow. Now let me give you some background. We have family who owns farms and spent a lot of our time outside playing. Naturally, we knew many different types of birds and animals and neither Cash nor I have ever been afraid of them. Plus, we had a dog, Zeus, that often slept in the room with us. He was our protector. A lovable, big old mutt my parents adopted at our local shelter before I was born. But he was really mine and Cash's dog. Zeus obviously woke up when Cash started screaming, and as I watched Cash, awaiting for the inevitable rush of mom and dad through the door, I noticed that Zeus was growling and staring at the window. His heckles were raised and his eyes were fixed. Normally, he would jump up in bed with my brother when the screaming started, but he was standing in front of the window with his teeth bared and salivating, as if waiting for a fight with the imaginary assailant on the other side of the glass. Before I had time to question it, my parents threw open the door, and my mom rushed over to hold Cash. He just kept repeating, The crow. The crow is going to get me. The night air was unusually warm for September in Pennsylvania, so we had left my bedroom window open. My dad took note of Zeus and moved to close the window and look outside. As soon as my dad got close to it, my brother lost his damn mind. I'm not kidding. He literally flung his tiny body out of my mother's arms and ran down the hallway to my parents' room and hid under the bed. I was left alone with Zeus after my dad locked the window and moved to follow my mom and brother down the hall. Zeus wasn't growling anymore, and it didn't seem as if my dad was concerned, so I let it go. When it was just me in the room, Zeus jumped up on my bed and put himself between me and the window. It was weird, something he had never purposefully done before. But sleep soon began to take back over, and I laid down to cuddle up with Zeus. The next morning, my mom and I ate breakfast alone with my dad and Cash stayed in bed. She told me that they had spent two hours trying to convince him that he was okay, but he wouldn't stop going on about some crow in his dream, and had been awake for most of the night. He told her it was crawling towards him, and he couldn't run away fast enough, and when he woke up, he thought he would be okay, but... Then he saw it staring at him through our open window. Naturally, my parents believed this was just a hallucination, a product of the nightmare-fueled haze clouding his mind and eyes, but I had never seen him react that way, and honestly, I never wanted to see it again, not to mention seeing how Zeus reacted. I'll admit, while I normally ignored Cash's nightmares, I was a little freaked out this time. It was Saturday, so my mom took us to the park to enjoy the warm weather while it still lasted. If you are at all familiar with southwestern Pennsylvania, you'll know we need to enjoy the sun when we can. Next to Seattle, we have the most days of cloud cover throughout the entire calendar year. It is literally gray and raining almost all year round, so a beautiful warm Saturday playing outside was exactly what we needed after such an eventful night. Cash and I played for a long time by ourselves, and when other kids started to arrive at the park, we all decided to play a game of release. If you're not familiar with that particular name, as it has many, it is essentially hide and seek, and tag put together, and with teams. One team are the seekers, and one is the hiders. The object is for all seekers to successfully locate the hiders, bring them to the designated jail spot, and hope to catch them all before any unlocated hiders are able to release their jailed compatriots by sneaking up to the jail and fleeing before being recaught. The park by our house is mostly surrounded by woods that are perfect for this game. They aren't big or even particularly thick woods, but to a young kid, they could be pretty freaky if you were alone and it was easy to get turned around. As the seekers started to count, the hiders all dashed for the trees, searching for the best spot. I told Cash to stay put as I carefully hid him behind a fallen tree before going back to look for my own hiding spot. He wasn't particularly fond of having to hide alone, but I didn't stick around to listen to him complain. I was more concerned with not getting caught. As I ran from Cash, I saw a perfect tree and began to climb, smiling to myself at how perfect my hiding spot would be. I wasn't up there long when I heard Cash scream. It chilled me to my core, as it sounded exactly like his screaming last night. He wasn't screaming because he was caught. He was terrified of something. Instinct kicked in, and I quickly made my way out of the tree and back in the direction I left him. I was closing in on the old fallen tree when I saw it, a large crow sitting atop the mossy bark, not five feet from Cash. 
Cash was lying in the fetal position with his hands covering his ears and screaming crow over and over like he did last night. The bird was huge. I'm not sure if you've ever been up close to a crow before, but they're bigger than you might first expect. Usually around one and a half feet peak to tail, and this one was even bigger than that. It was staring directly at Cash. I was completely frozen in place from sheer confusion when I started to hear the other kids make their way in our direction and snapped out of it. Picking up a rock, I took aim and fired at the bird's head. I missed. My rock landed pitifully far away, and the bird moved closer to my brother. I bent to pick up another, when the bird turned and looked straight at me. Cash was still laying on the ground, but had thankfully gone silent. Another rock flew from my hands, this time connecting with the tree where the bird was perched only seconds before. It dodged the rock. It knew what I was trying to do, and it dodged the rock. I was frozen with my arm half raised to throw my third rock, when three other hiders emerged from the bushes. Just as they approached me, the bird squawked and flew off, unfurling its massive wings the color of oil. It took me a moment to come back to my senses and drop the rock, and try to calm down Cash who was gently sobbing and still covering his ears. Some of the other kids were frightened by the scene and had run to get my mom. As she picked up Cash and grabbed my hand to leave, I heard the crow again, calling from somewhere in the treetops as it watched us leave the woods and head back to the park. We left and went home after that. Cash's nightmares continued on the same way for a few weeks, and each one involved the crow. Eventually, my parents chalked it up to the fact that stores and commercials had started to advertise Halloween decorations, and he must have seen the one that manifested itself in his nightmares. The nightmares were starting to take a toll on all of us. No one in the house was getting any sleep. Cash was becoming a gray, zombie-like shell of a little boy. The doctors told my parents it was a lack of sleep and suggested trying some pediatric dosed melatonin, but it wasn't working. Zeus had taken to avoiding our room completely. The only positive was that we hadn't seen the crows since that day at the park. The more I thought about it, the more wrong it felt. As an eight-year-old, I wasn't able to put into words what I was frightened of. I didn't want my parents to think that I was trying to get attention, but I was afraid to tell them that maybe Cash was afraid of something real. I hadn't told my mom about seeing the crow on the tree that day. I didn't intentionally not tell her, but I didn't know how to explain it. How could I explain that it seemed as if it were trying to scare Cash? Or how it stared at me with nothing short of disdain when I tried to scare it away? I decided it was best to keep it to myself. I woke up in the middle of the night one day in mid-October to hear my parents arguing in the kitchen. My parents never, ever argue with each other. Overcome with curiosity, I tiptoed my way to the top of the stairs that led into our kitchen, hoping to catch a snippet of their conversation. They were arguing about cash. My mother wanted to take him for a sleep study, and my father felt it unnecessary. They had taken cash to a few doctors since the nightmare started, hoping to find a solution for him, and maybe even more for them. Earlier that year, my parents found out they were again expecting and we were well underway in the construction of our house addition. My favorite part of the whole thing was being able to have my own room. My dad had designed the addition to be even larger than the original house, with enough bedrooms for my parents, me, Cash, the new baby, and even another one if they decided. Nearing the completion, my mom was growing even more concerned with the thought of Cash being in his room alone. Dad wasn't as concerned as she was. He grew up with the mentality of, Boys need to be tough, and well, he was a wonderful and loving father, he sometimes was a little harder than he needed to be. Being that Cash was only six years old, bored with their back and forth, I started to take my way back to my bed, stepping on the wrong floorboards, and alerting my parents to my eavesdropping. Caught red-handed, I shuffled into the kitchen and sat at the table with my parents. Honey, we aren't mad but we don't like it when you listen to private conversations between your dad and me. My mom said in a honey-sweet tone, she really was the best. I know I'm not, but I heard you talking about Cash and I was scared. And I didn't want to tell you, but the crow was real. I saw it. It was in the woods. And I think Zeus saw it in the window. And now he won't come in our room. And I don't want to sleep in there alone. I don't want to be scared like Cash. It all came spilling out of my mouth like word vomit. And I started to cry. Rye, sweetie, 
There is nothing to be afraid of. Cash's nightmares are just that. Nightmares. They are not real and they cannot hurt him. You or us. And the bird you guys saw in the woods? It's just a bird. There are thousands of them and you've been around birds hundreds of times. I promise I won't let anything, or any bird, hurt you or Cash. My dad rolled his eyes at the or any bird part and hugged me tight. Okay, if you promise. I didn't know what else to say, so I sighed, hugged them both, and went back up to my bed. Zeus was standing in front of our room, pawing at the door, and whining when I got back upstairs. I was just so happy that he wanted to come back in with us, that I didn't think twice before opening the door and hopping in bed, expecting Zeus to follow, but he didn't follow me in. He stood at the threshold watching our window. It wasn't open tonight and our blinds were shut, so there is no way he could have seen anything, but he sensed it. He knew something wrong was on the other side of the glass, and he did not want to go near it. I called him once, twice, five times before getting out of bed to try and pull him into the room. The moment my feet hit the carpet, I heard a tap. Chills ran down my spine. I stopped and listened again. It had to have been my imagination, or the floor creaking. Our house was old and made lots of noises when it settled at night. Did a branch from our maple tree hit the window? Yeah, it was a branch. I took one step and heard another tap tap, then nothing. Tap tap. That wasn't the tree. Something was tapping the windows. Screaming, I ran back downstairs to my parents, still in the kitchen and still arguing over what to do with cash. It's back. It's outside the window and it's going to break in. My dad immediately flew upstairs to check my room, as my mom and I followed. Zeus was slowly backing his way down the hall, and never moving his eyes from our room. My dad lifted the blinds. Rye? It's just the wind making the tree hit the window. Nothing is out there. Cash, did you hear anything? Where's Cash? My dad's question caught me off guard. He was right there when I came back to Ben, wasn't he? Cash wasn't in our room. We checked every single room in the house, under my parents' bed, in the laundry room, basement, heck. I even looked inside the dirty clothes bin. He just wasn't there. Panic was etching lines into my mom's forehead as she ran from room to room yelling Cash's name. Just as she picked up the phone to call 911, we heard him scream. His scream was coming from outside. Dropping the phone, my mom ripped open the back porch's sliding door to a pitch black night. She and my dad ran outside in the direction of Cash's yells, and eventually found him. To this day, we cannot explain how he was found where he was. Cash was two houses away, in a tree about 25 feet in the air. The commotion of my parents, frantic calls, and my brother's panic screams alerted a few of our neighbors to call the police. My brother was so high up in the tree that my father couldn't climb it for fear of it snapping under his weight. We had to rely on a fire truck to eventually pluck him from the branches. Cash was dazed and seemed unaware of exactly what was happening when they finally brought him down. My parents sat at their kitchen table, Cash fast asleep in my father's arms, as my mother passed a cup of coffee to the two officers who had been dispatched. It was generally accepted that Cash had been sleepwalking and must have climbed up into the tree. But when asked how he could have gotten out of the house, unnoticed, no one had an answer. The officers left shortly after, and we were left alone to digest the past few hours events. When I woke up the next morning, I jumped into Cash's bed and made him wake up. I knew he hadn't slept much, but I wanted to ask him why he went outside and why he climbed the train. I was trying to get away from the crow, he said matter-of-factly. Cash, there is no crow. Dad even said so. The one at the park was just a regular old bird. I didn't know if I was more trying to convince him or convince myself. It was tapping on the window trying to get in, so I tried to hide but it was crawling on the window outside so I ran and climbed a tree because it can't get me because it was crawling and not flying. His explanation left me stunned. Not because he had managed to climb 25 plus feet into the air while seemingly sleepwalking. He heard the tapping. There's no way Cash was sleepwalking. I heard the tapping too and I was completely awake. Something was tapping on our window, and it wasn't the tree. Was it the crow from the park? No. That one could fly, and Cash said this one was crawling. That was just a regular bird. And I was letting Cash's nightmares invade my mind too. Right? Cash wasn't himself for days following that night's incident. He became withdrawn, 
quiet, afraid of the slightest noise. He didn't want to talk to me very much, but if he did, it always went back to the crow. Zeus was still not going anywhere near our bedroom, and I started to avoid cash as well. I missed playing with my brother. The leaves were falling, and we should be jumping into a big pile of them, instead of him clinging to either my mom or my dad's leg for every waking second. Zeus and I went outside in the front yard to watch my dad raking the grass and bagging the leaves. I wanted to go play, but I couldn't find it in me, so I was content to sit and watch. The sky was its usual Pittsburgh gray, and the wind was biting, shaking its way up and into my coat and making me shiver. I held on to Zeus and started to make my way back inside when I saw Cash peering out from behind a pillar on our front porch. I decided to try and make him happy, even if just for a second. Maybe he could forget he was afraid, and we could go back to normal. Grabbing Zeus's collar, I dashed towards the pile of leaves my dad was preparing to bag, and threw myself into it. I made a show of laughing and yelling with Zeus, asking Cash to come play with us. He looked apprehensive, as if going further from the confines of our house would cause him terrible pain, but a small glint in his eyes told me he wanted to join in on the fun. I think my dad noticed too, laughing. He scooped me up into his arms and ran around the yard. Zeus hot on his heels. I could see Cash smiling. It was working. I jumped from my dad's arms and ran to Cash, taking his hand and pulling him into the yard with us. We played hard. We ran and ran and ran, until all three of us collapsed on the ground in fits of laughter. My dad hugging and wrestling with us in the cold November ground. My mom holding her very pregnant belly with one hand while snapping out of focus pictures with her new Polaroid in the other hand. It is a bittersweet memory. Sweet because of the innocence of the moment. The sheer joy of two children playing with their dad. The love of their mother watching her husband make beautiful memories with their children. Bitter because it was the last time it would ever happen again. Zeus noticed it first. A large black crow standing across the street in the center of our neighbor's lawn. It was staring at Cash. Cash and I both realized something was wrong when Zeus stopped wrestling with us and adopted a protective stance, pacing himself between us and the street, us and the crow. Dad was calling him, trying to get his attention off the strange bird across the street. Zeus, not moving a muscle, forced my dad to return to the house in search of the leash. While we lived in a quiet neighborhood, our street had a lot of traffic and he didn't want Zeus taking off and getting hit by a car. The crow started walking towards us. I don't know how I knew, but I knew. This was the same one from the park. The same one who made Cash leave our house in the middle of the night. The same one that had been tapping on our window. I started to back up. Cash was still frozen. His face was completely white. Hands trembling. Eyes wide and fixed on the crow. I tried to grab him, but he wouldn't budge. A dark stain started to form on his pants. His fear causing him to lose control of his bladder. Dad? I called out. Not really sure what I was hoping he would do, but I couldn't think of anything else. I watched as it walked into the street, and only four feet from our yard. Zeus started to try and go after the crow, and my dad was struggling to hold on to his collar. Cash, still frozen still, started to emit the loudest, most high-pitched scream I have or ever will experience. He didn't sound human, his primal fear overriding any semblance of coherent thought. His nose started to bleed, and blood vessels in his neck were bulging out. Just then, I saw a car turn onto the road out of the corner of my eye. It was going fast. Faster than it should be. Three houses. Two houses. One house away. The sound of the car's bumper colliding with the crow was loud and hard and heavy, as if the bird had more weight to it than it appeared. Zeus stopped and we all stood there watching the car speed down the road without a single brake light to be seen. Just as fast as it appeared, it was out of sight. I turned my gaze back to the spot on the road where the crow became all too familiar with the feeling of metal. It was there, a massive black clump of feathers, its wings and legs broken in strange angles. I took a step forward, needing to get a closer look when it moved. Its head lifted and turned to Cash, and started to crawl in his direction. All the while its broken beak, irreparably twisted open, began to mimic the exact same sound as Cash. It was crawling at him, just as he had dreamed of for months on end. My dad's shovel swiftly cut through the crow's neck, severing the head and allowing it to roll away in its broken and mangled body. Its eyes landing on my brother once more as Cash fell to the ground. 
Cash was never the same after that. He attended therapy four days a week, every week since that day. I still have no idea what really happened, and I get chills thinking about it now, even 27 years later. Cash killed himself when he was 19. He moved out the day he turned 18 and never spoke to any of us again. He would write us letters and send them from various zip codes, so we never knew where he settled, if he even did. He never wrote about the incident or the crow, but when the police found his body, he had a backpack full of drawings, many of them depicting crows or demons or other variations of them. They were dark. You could feel the pain and anger he poured into them. See how tortured his mind was. I miss him so much. The therapy never gave us any insight to what, if any, connection there was between Cash and that stupid fucking burn. I really wish it had. I have a five-year-old daughter, Cassandra, Cass for short. She looks a lot like him. I wish she could have known him. So many things about her remind me of him. Lately, she's been having nightmares. And last night, I saw a crow on my mailbox when I got home from work. They filled Mason's shower, the faces, impressed into the tile patterns. The distended faces stared at him as though from coffins. Let me say my name, though. I'm Samantha. I was Mason's girlfriend at the time of all this. And it's important I share this mainly to ease my mind. I believe that sharing your horror diminishes the power it has. Listen to people's horrors. The first time Mason saw a face, I was brushing my teeth. Mason was humming in the shower, as he does. And the room was getting rather steamy. So, I smudged the mirror a bit after I spit out my toothpaste and looked at my face. Just a vain inspection. Hey, he said. There's a face in the tile. I looked toward the steamed up glass doors that hid Mason from my sight. Weird. What does it look like? I said. He described it as the profile of an elderly man. The man's nose ended in a sharp point that seemed to fade away into the tiles. Incomplete. His eye was present only through an absence, just space where the patterns were not. His thin wisps of hair trailed off into the tile's brown speckling, petering out in random blotches and splatters like old, dried blood. Mason peeked his head out from the shower and told me to come look. I feigned annoyance. I did not want to look for some face in the tiles, but I went over to see anyway. Leaning over, Mason squinted at the tiles. Ah, uh, can't find it again. After that first encounter, Mason made a game of locating faces in the shower tiles, and for a week or so, I played along. He had never seen the same face twice, and there was not always a face to be seen, but within that week, he could locate two or three at a time. I would listen, brushing my teeth or doing some skin care, while he described them. They were not always horrific, sometimes they were just elongated faces, made up animals. This one looks like a giraffe with a dog head or even bust that alluded to a fuller person. Morning after morning, he did this. I lost interest pretty quickly. Not that I ever felt overly interested, but I was willing to play along. It gave us something to bond over, but eventually, the face game turned private for Mason. I knew he still played it every morning because I'd hear him quietly say, Aha, whenever he found one. Weeks passed where Mason did not mention the face game, and his aha sound turned to white noise so it was strange when he stopped me before i left the bathroom one morning sam will you wait for me to finish showering why i asked there's this there's one face here i don't like for a moment i said nothing i just heard the water trickling to the floor running off his body while he stood behind the fog door waiting for my response i think that was the moment i knew something had gone wrong the garish face that revealed itself to Mason, that was a word he took to using, reveal, had transformed the tile, like sunburn transformed skin. The natural patterning of the tile appeared wrong to him. Rather than the usual splotches and speckles, this broken face yawned open the jagged lines of pain that creased across the faintly visible eyes. The eyes were two blank spots, tan patches surrounded by dark brown. A knotted ear, a hairless head, a gaping mouth, and the absence of a tongue. 
After he described it, he added in, It takes up four tiles, Sam. As if that was of some significance. For a little more than a week, Mason ended the face game by buying a waterproof case for his phone. With a suction cup, he mounted it on the wall and decided to catch up on the news whenever he showered. If he heard the weather, we would discuss what he should wear. If he saw them prepare meals, we would consider our dinner options. If he saw crime reports, we both listened with voyeuristic interest. The routine felt normal. Until they announced a missing person report. What we are going to show you is a graphic scene. The news anchor son. If you have children watching, we advise they turn away. I put down my face wipes and opened the shower so I could see the report. We both listened with rapt attention. A scene began to roll of a man walking around his house, a home security system recording him. Colin Rogers was at his home preparing to leave for work when an intruder broke in. Cracks of daylight bled through the curtains as a masked intruder entered the house through the unlocked front door. Colin, the homeowner, walked to the front door casually. Perhaps he thought the noise was a knock. Colin froze in place. The intruder held out a gun. With his hands up, Colin walked down a hallway and toward a closet door. He opened it up, then the intruder followed in behind him and shut the door, sealing off the view. A gagging noise and a muffled gunshot sounded from behind the closed bathroom door. Footage of the closed door rolled a few seconds longer, then stopped. Police were unable to identify the armed intruder. If you have any information that can lead to the arrest, Mason hastily closed the news stream, went to the web page, and played the video again and again. He did not recognize the intruder's face, but he swore he recognized Colin. The next day, Mason came over to me while I was on my laptop. He sat down beside me on the couch. I need to show you, he said. He pulled out his phone and scrolled through the photos while I waited. Here, look, you see? I looked at the photo, looked at Mason. His eyes were so dark, then looked back at the photo. It was a side-by-side -side comparison of Colin, from the news report, and the face in the shower. I saw no face. Afraid to look at him in the face. Afraid he would see my disbelief. I looked toward the floor while I handed back his phone. I mean, I understand how you could see a face there. I started. The wrong thing to say. Those words to him were a denial of the mutual reality we had. Until that moment, I had never hinted at my dislike or disbelief in the face game. You think I'm making this up? You think the faces aren't there? Our brains have this way of making faces when there are none. Pareidolia. I typed it into Google quick and started to turn my laptop toward him. There's plenty of examples. He pushed the laptop screen away, avoided looking at it. But it means something, he said. How is it just coincidence that I see a murder victim in the shower wall? He looked away, looked at the living room wall. You remember that huge face I told you about? I nodded. He pointed to his phone. It was Colin. I bet he's there still. He started walking towards the bathroom, then turned around. Noticed I was not following him. Come on, you'll see. Reluctantly, I followed behind. Was that the wrong thing to do? Was there even a right thing? Tile, more tile, brown patterning. A smudge kind of like a cloud, but just a smudge. Nothing. I bet. He paced around the bathroom, then stood still and started to take his shirt off. I bet they only appear when the shower is on. I need to be in the shower. I... I put my hand on his shoulder and he stopped. Looked down at the shirt on the floor. Looked at the shower. Okay. He son. And he reached down, picked up his shirt, put it back on. That touch, I thought, told him I cared for him. But my caring meant the face game was an issue. That the face game was not real. That he was alone. In a sense, I told him to shut up. Yeah, they can come over, Mason's son. You'll play charades with us. Yeah. Then he looked at me in the eyes. And drink? That last part almost made me reconsider the whole night. Mason had shut himself away from me. He started showering earlier in the morning. Multiple times a day, even. He started working from home. Because the company was changing. I think he just wanted to be closer to the shower. Whenever I heard the shower running, I would drink a glass of wine. It became my own private game. 
I just needed a way to cushion myself from the noises he made. Some days he would cry, laugh, or just be silent while the shower ran. It all frightened me. To break him out of that cycle, I decided to invite over some of our friends. Typically, they were busy, or we were busy, or feigning being busy because Mason did not want the company. There was a knock on the door. It was them. Well, let's just enjoy the night, I said. He nodded. I saw his eyes pointing towards the bathroom. I welcomed in Alice, Tony, and Michelle. They each had a bottle of wine they brought. Mason was already in the kitchen getting glasses. He had not said anything to them. Late into the night, we were all feeling joyful and talkative. Our charades game was progressing sloppily. Basically just improv. Tony finished his spider imitation where he crawled around and wrapped Alice in a blanket. She was playing the role of a very devout praying mantis. And then Michelle took the stage. No one correctly guessed Michelle's performance. I could not exactly say what it was, but she was leaning forward, peering at the wall, laughing and making ah, uh-uh noises. I watched on blankly. Alice was asleep on the floor, and Tony spouted off guesses like, mental patient, you're insane, a crazy painter, and so on. A surrealistic feeling came over me. The air took on a thick quality as if everyone was moving around inside a giant cube of water. I rubbed my eyes, thinking it was just because I was drunk, but the fog stayed. I worried the house was on fire, and turned to Mason to see what his reaction was. Mason was not next to me. Where did Mason go? I asked. Tony slurred a response to a different question, one that was not asked walked into the kitchen, and returned with two glasses of water. Michelle continued her act, had she forgotten who she was, and kept stammering and laughing and crying, and I heard the shower running in the distance. In a blink, I was sober. I think it's time we end this, I said. After a long period of coaxing and prodding, I got everyone into an Uber and on their way home. I wish I had let them stay. Maybe they would still be around. It was 2 p.m. when I woke up. The hangover was tremendous, and I headed right into the bathroom. Mason was sitting on the floor, his head resting on his knees, the shower running. His clothes were soaking wet. Mason? I shook him, groaned, lifted his head, crawled into the shower. I saw their faces. He said. The water beat down on his back. I could tell it was cold. There were so many, but I found theirs. I spent my hangover gathering up clothes and other necessities. I called my parents, told them Mason and I were arguing a lot. They agreed I could come to stay. Every day for a week I called Mason. He never answered and I never stopped worrying about him. So I decided to go knock on his door to ensure he was okay. When I arrived, the house looked different. I noticed the windows were walled off. Something solid blocked them. Smoke rose from the chimney in a steady misty stream. Mold covered the siding of the house. The door was moldy too, and soggy. I reached out to knock and my fist slapped against the door making a mushing sound. Rotted. I could have pulled the door away in chunks if I wanted to get in. It was not locked though, so I gently opened it up. A billow of steam poured out at me, a wall of humidity. The hole was dark as a cave and all I could hear was the spray of water. I stepped in and my shoes thudded against the tile. The carpet had been replaced. The walls, too, were tiled. Tile covered the spaces where the windows were, sealing off the outside world, turning the house into a giant shower. I pulled out my phone, turned on the flashlight. Faces were everywhere. Police searched Mason's house and found no sign that he was still living there. It has since been condemned. Alice, Tony, Michelle, I have not heard from them. Neither have their families. But the faces, the face game. I play it now without trying. I see them whenever I shower. I tell you all this in an effort to alleviate my fear or miraculously cure me of whatever this is. Perhaps Mason was trying to do the same thing. It was almost summer break when my cousins took me to the art museum. Well, I took them. I live in a fairly small town in the US, and we were close enough to the art museum to walk. 
I will refer to my cousins as Thomas and Elaine. Elaine is in high school, and Thomas was just about to enter freshman year at the end of the school year. Elaine is kind of a goth, and she gets that from her mom. Thomas is a computer geek, and he likes memes and video games and such. They live a few blocks away from me, and we saw each other often. It was May 16th when I walked over to their home, and Elaine told me she had one final assignment on the ancient Egyptian mummies. So, I had an idea. Instead of browsing the internet for information, and then watching some black butler, I told her that we should go to the art museum. The art museum had an exhibit all about mummies. They were both hesitant at first, but when I urged them on, they agreed. Their mom said that it was fine, but that she wasn't driving us. She already had to go to work in about an hour. I spoke up before anyone else. We'll be fine walking, I said gladly. My cousins didn't argue, and they got their shoes on. Making our way to the museum by memory, we talked about some of the politics going around. I'm a really big movie buff, and I gave them my views on some of the newer movies coming out. 10 o'clock rolled around as we got to the art museum. We went through some medieval armor, and then saw the African mask exhibit. Elaine reminded us of the assignment, and we went up some stairs to the new mummy area. I had been the year before, with my school, and showed my cousins the cool new features. Elaine and Thomas took notes, and before we knew it, the time was around 4pm. We stayed around another hour, admiring the more modern art, and left at 4.45. I had bought granola bars, and when I took them out we realized how hungry we were. I proposed rolling down the big hill in front of the building, and Elaine agreed. Thomas stayed behind at the steps because he didn't want to get dirty. He said it was fun, but he didn't want to take a million showers. We all played and joked around together for a little while, and five rolled around. We really should get home, since it was about a 40 minute walk, maybe longer in the dark. Elaine was feeling extra rebellious, and wanted to travel through the backwoods to the museum. I said heck no, because I had listened to tons of horror stories and encounters like this one. And like I said, I'm a pretty big movie buff. And I take my horror movies seriously. Thomas said he didn't care. So, with two thirds of the party in agreement, we did. We took a few steps, not before a screech erupted from, well, somewhere. We stopped and looked at each other. Probably an owl, Elaine's son. Hell no, it wasn't. That was some scary crap right there, Thomas said. You're all freaking out. Take a chill pill. Guys, shut up. Stop arguing, I said. Me being the film nerd that I am, started to talk a lot more. Elaine, think of it like a horror film. That's not what you say when a sound like that is heard. In fact, the people who say that stuff are killed right off the bat. Plus, arguing always gets the protagonist nowhere. I know, right? Totally the rules. It had to be a bird. This is a wildlife area, but also a small park. There isn't going to be any kind of wild animal. We heard another screech, and I start to jog. Thomas follows my lead, and so does Elaine. Trust me, she isn't dumb. Even if she said that stuff about the noise, I ran faster and that's when I fell. This would be fine if we were on a flat path, but I fell into a creek, and it was kind of deep, with the edges all slippery and muddy. Thomas and Elaine called out to me, and I said I was fine. I told them it would be better if they kept running. I would find my way out. They left, and I turned to the phone in my pocket. I switched the flashlight on and walked a little. It started to rain lightly. I could swear I heard a whole lot of creepy things in the woods, but nothing as creepy as what I was about to encounter. I found a vine thingy inside the walls of the ditch, and I proceeded to climb it. I thought it would be cool, climbing vertically on the wall. Then, I heard this raspy breathing. It was horrible, and sounded empty. Bear. The voice said my name. The vine snapped, and I fell into the shallow rocks. My phone screen had cracked, and the flashlight buzzed off. The scary thing is that my cousins called me by my middle name, Bear. Not like how most people call me by my first. I sat up and looked over the top of the creek wall. Nothing. I turned and found a shadow. My eyes adjusted to the light, and Thomas was there. Then, when I focused more, I was terrified. It was anything, but not Thomas. The creature looked like it was wearing Thomas's flesh. Its eye sockets drooped, and the lips were cracked. 
There was no color in the skin, and the monster's limbs were thin as a starving man's stomach. I saw tears in the flesh soon that only showed the white and red of bone. I felt chills down my spine, and I backed away. I heard faint whispering, but the voice saying it was talking too fast. I turned to run, and then, before my eyes, I stood there. Except it wasn't me, because the same kind of skin-wearing creature stood there, with the same distinct features. Its mouth, though, was torn right off, and instead there were these sharp fangs protruding from the skin mask it was wearing. The whispering grew louder, but not slower. It started to storm violently in the sky above. Then, my doppelganger monster did something that haunts me to this day. It started to cry. This was not the salty water that inhabits our everyday bodies. It was blood. I let out a few tears myself, but before breaking down, I turned to find that the Thomas monster was gone. I ran in the darkness and encountered an incline in the terrain. I moved fast, with sweat and tears blocking my vision. When I looked back, I saw a creature that looked just like Elaine, but was covered in blood, and her skin was bursting at the seams, with veins spluttering all over the place. She was fast, and she bounded at me in one leap. I was clumsy, and apparently lucky enough to trip on a log, and I plummeted to the ground. The monster headed straight into the open air, and landed on something. I heard a ringing in my ears as a howling screech was let out. When it stopped, I looked over, and found that not only had the monster missed, but by chance, it landed enough on the stump of a rotted tree that had some wood sticking out, strong enough to impale the creature. Its body oozed a silvery liquid, running down and burning the body. I bolted off, and I came out of the edge of the woods. I almost ran into the traffic of a rush hour road, but stopped. It had begun to rain lighter, pattering on the sidewalk, and blowing the trees. I heard one last screech from the woods. I headed to the nearest bus stop pavilion. I saw two sitting figures, and slowly approached Thomas and Elaine. I swear, I wanted to take Thomas down with a tackle, but my instincts failed. I made a mixed face, happy, and still terrified because of what I saw in the woods. I sat next to them and they told me some important things. We saw a woman in the woods. She had an art museum uniform, but her legs were missing. We got closer, but then she got up with her arms and faced us. Her eyes were gone. The holes where the eyes should be were bleeding, and her neck had a giant slice through the middle, going from one end to the other. We ran like hell and hid in the woods. It breathed so hard. It sounded close and far away all at the same time. We tried to stay quiet, but it found us and we had to run again. We did make it out though, and here we are. We all made it back after this incident. I tried to do research on missing people in the area, and I found the lady Thomas and Elaine saw in the woods. She had worked at the art museum, and obviously met a fate that we could have. The reason I posted all this is because the other night, I was hanging out at their place, when their parents weren't home. We were playing some video games and we heard a tapping at the window. When we looked outside, no one was there. But in the parking lot across their yard, someone was watching us. We all went to bed shortly after. When we woke up this morning, there were entrails all across the streets and yards in our town. The police were called, but no evidence was left by anyone coming on the porch and leaving a wheelbarrow's amount of guts. We are also getting a news report that the zoo, which is right next to our art museum, was broken into overnight, with most of the animals dead. I mean, the monkeys, snakes, bears, lions. This must have been executed by the creature that we ran into. Doing research now, we may have come across skinwalkers, but that doesn't completely fit. Sure, skinwalkers have a costume-like appearance, but the victims are taken over, not copied off of a physical form. They don't seem paranormal, but possibly demons. None of us are sure, but it is either a special kind of cryptid or a demon. All of this time, I thought those creepypastas were just urban legends, or just some really creative writing. How many of these creatures are there? Where do they come from? I hear screaming outside. We're locking the doors and heading to the basement. I'm posting this now before it's too late. I can't believe we still have internet access. This is for whoever is out there. You can refer to me as Bear. I'm using this laptop to send out a warning. If it's not too late, my neighborhood 
has become run over by horrifying creatures. These monsters take the form of the mutilated bodies of friends, family, pets, even complete strangers. If you see someone with pale skin, scratches, missing body parts, or worse, run, hide. It has been two weeks ever since we encountered them in the woods behind the art museum. I'm surprised to say that my friends and I are still alive and far away from my hometown, but I know why. Last time I wrote, we were in the basement, with our zoo animals ripped apart and the town left in a rotting stench of bodily fluids. We stayed in the basement for a week, and on Friday, we heard a knocking. It was quiet at first, but it became aggressive. It seemed to come from everywhere outside the house, testing our sanity. We stood still with the weapons we had grabbed from around the house. For the past week, there had been no noise, except for the screaming on Monday. There were no birds, no cars, not a single soul. The banging stopped after two hours. The banging had lasted that long, but as far as we could tell, nothing got into the house. After five minutes of relief, we heard a tapping. After looking around, Elaine found the source. It was coming from the window of the basement, on ground level. We slowly approached, and when we got to the window, we could see five of my friends, two of which had bikes. They all had come to my house to find me, and remembered my cousin's house. I was glad they were all alive, and not just decaying doppelgangers. After letting them in, we had eight people in our party. My cousins and I were already low on food, so me and my two friends, Elijah and Sam, left to find a grocery store. Once we got in, after finding the streets empty, we grabbed two bags and all of the necessary food and vitamins we needed. We also looked out for any pharmaceutical drugs in case of an accident. Then we heard a crash from the front of the store. We ducked in the aisle and then peeked up to see what was happening. Two hulking figures covered in blood and torn skin were stalking the checkout lines. In desperation, we hid in the freezers in the dairy section, relatively close to us. When we hid behind the milk and egg cartons, the door closed with a smack. Crouching behind the shelves of food, we could see the two creatures slowly crawl over to the doors. When they crawled, there was something off about their limbs. They seemed cracked and bent in all the wrong places, like someone had beaten them repeatedly with a metal rod. Their chests were ripped apart and had insides hanging out of the torso. They came right up to the doors, and one of the creatures started sniffing, using two holes where its nose should be. It put its rotting hand up to the glass and shrieked so loud we had to cover our ears. Both creatures ran towards the exit and then right towards the new figure standing in the produce aisle. He raised a crossbow and shot one dead in an instant. The other monster snarled and leaped at the man. He took out a dagger and sliced at its eyes. There was a gush at the same liquid that oozed from Helene's doppelganger and its body slowly disintegrated through the tiled floor. The man turned from the monster to us, and I mean us, like he saw us. We clumsily got out of the freezer and walked towards him cautiously. Who are you? I asked. Call me Claudius, he responded. I've been hunting these things for a while and have never seen a wave this big. What are they? Sam asked him. He turned to Sam saying, They are monsters from a kind of alternate dimension. One where we exist is slightly different. They have been leaking into our universe slowly. At least, that's what I know based off of certain evidence. I still do not know what they do here. Holy crap. This was a whole lot. We were able to make it clear that there were more people in our party. And he said that if we got them, we could get out of here. And that's what we did. After getting in his van, he handed us some equipment. It all looked so medieval, with crossbows and potion bottles full of little details straight out of the supernatural show. So you're a monster hunter? Elaine asked. What do you hunt? I usually spend my time up north, with wendigos, skinwalkers. I even took down a hellhound once. I'm not the best, but I can get you out of here. So all of this shit is real? Sam asked. Claudius gave a subtle nod. As we were driving, I noticed the doppelganger monsters were starting to chase us. Claudius immediately handed the wheel over to Elaine and told her to drive north. The closer we got to a cold climate, the less creatures we will have to deal with. He pulled out five crossbows and made sure he had certain arrows. 
which he said were tipped with freezing iron, one of their weaknesses. He started shooting at them, and so did me and my friends. All of us didn't have the most precise aim, and most arrows missed. I remember hitting one of the things right on the forehead and having a little mini victory. Then we all heard a thumping on the roof. Even Claudius looked up, and the next thing we knew, the creature had burst its way through the ceiling. It grabbed Thomas, but was quickly dispatched. We hauled it out of one of the windows before its body melted the floor of the van. The more we rode, the less we saw, until eventually all of them were gone. As far as I know, we are still heading north to a more secure base. I was able to figure out that most people got out of town on evacuating buses before being torn to shreds, but we don't exactly know where the monsters are going. If you see one of these creatures, run, hide. God knows what they want, and God might as well know what they will do to you. I stand at the edge holding onto this long neck bottle of my remaining alcohol. After having been sober for four years, I had to return to this vile form as my mind lately has been a wreck with all types of images. Just what could compel my friend of nearly 20 years to do such a thing? Why did something so innocent turn ugly? My mind is so badly damaged. I do not even know if I'm writing this all down or if this is all in my head. Whatever the case, once you'll find me, the truth will be revealed, I suppose. It all began a day after the new year. My friend had come over in a frantic daze, speaking nonsense of some ramblings. I remember fondly asking questions of what he was going on and on about. But to no avail, he went on with the rambling. Then after taking quite some time, he sat down on my sofa, resting his head between his hands. His eyes darting past me, staring at the wall, yet those eyes even went past those walls as if they were still searching, searching for the answer to his ramblings. My friend gave me a queer look, along with a shaking smile. He rose up, motioning me to come with him. For about four hours we drove, only stopping outside a white two-story house. It was one of those houses that looked brand new, but you could tell upon close inspection that it was actually much older than it let out. Just like people, houses can get a facelift once and again. My friend turned off the engine, sitting with his hands on his lap, his eyes focused on the house. I asked my friend what we were doing at the house. He only replied with, He knows. I raised a suspicious eyebrow to my friend. Who is he? My friend pointed to the house. I followed his finger. My eyes locked onto a large glass window that was the front of the house. Inside, I could see a man in his mid-forties walk over to his chair, getting ready to watch some television. So, who is this? I inquired. My friend jumped out of the car, slamming the door behind him. I watched him walk to his trunk. He dug around there for two minutes. I felt the car shake when he slammed the trunk with a full force. Concerned about what was going on, I stepped out of the car, resting my left shoulder on the hood. What are you doing? I saw my friend pause for a moment. He had a large black bag slung around his shoulders. When he looked at me, I could see there was just a void of nothingness in his eyes. Hey, are you okay? My friend's eyes darted downward as if they were looking at his door handle. I knew they weren't. He just didn't want me to see the void of nothingness in his eyes anymore. Come on, it's time to end this. End? End what? My friend started his way to the man's front door. I rushed after my friend. Hey, Randy. Randy, I know you can hear me. Before I could grasp Randy's shoulder, he had already knocked on the door. I stumbled there with my hand in the air. My friend continued to knock on the door. I could hear the man inside walk his way to the door well spouting. I'm coming, I'm coming. The man opened the door to see my friend and I standing at his step. Before I could even say anything that could give us purpose, my friend reached out towards the man with both hands. He grabbed the man's throat, pushing him against the wall. The man reached out for my friend to push him off. I too reached out to stop my friend. However, my friend showed strength I've never seen in him before. And before I knew it, threw us both to the floor. He threw us inside, shutting and locking the man's door. The man writhed on the ground into his living room. I watched as my friend pulled out a sledgehammer from his bag. He walked over to the man, smacking him in the back of the legs. He hit him once more in the middle of his back, then on his left side. The man cried and moaned in pain. 
My friend threw the man's phone across the room. I walked over to my friend who pushed me away. I fell to the ground, but looking up fearing my friend would bring the hammer down on me. He didn't. He stood over the now beaten, crying man with the hammer in his hand. Randy, what are you doing? I asked. It's fine, Oscar. I'll finally know. My friend bent down to the man. He turned him over so their eyes met. The eyes of nothing meeting the eyes of fear. I bet it surely was something strange. I couldn't begin to understand the thoughts that man had swirling in his mind. Tell me, asked Randy. I know you received my letters. Letters? I watched as Randy continued to ask the man the same questions. I know you know, so tell me. Wait. The man breathing and shifting from calm to horror. You're the one who sent me those letters? Yes, I need to know. I need you to tell me. I answered you in the first letter, the man shouted. Randy shook his head. I know you were lying. You need to be honest and tell me the truth. Randy. I walked over to my friend, placing a calming hand on his shoulder. What do you need to know? He knows. Only he knows the answer. Randy. The man shook his head. It's just a book. A simple book for children. There isn't much to it. The man shouted. What? I turned to Randy, grabbing him by his collar. Randy, are you doing this over a children's book? What has gotten into you? Randy shoved me away. If you won't tell me... Then I'll just do that. A deep smile came over him. Like the voice said, I know what to do. I know that's the only way I'll know. Voice? What voice? Randy pulled out a wide range of weapons from his bag. Myself and the man freaked upon seeing those weapons. Randy grabbed his sledgehammer. He turned to me and held up a finger to his lips. Just stay there once I'm done. I'll know everything. I watched as Randy beat the man to a pulp before my eyes. I did nothing but watch. I pressed my back against the wall and slumped down on the floor. The blood, the man's screams, the sounds of the hammer smacking into the man. The worst yet, my friend's eyes were still in that void of nothingness. Blood and bile scattered the floor and walls. The man had been beaten and cracked open in every possible way. I watched as my friend pulled off the man's face pushing through the muscles and other juices to his skull. My friend reached for a small hammer. He gave swift careful taps over the man's skull. Randy cracked open the man's skull, pulling it apart as he did. He held the man's brain in his hands. It's here. It's here. I can finally know it. I held my hand over my mouth. The action to vomit was within reach, but I wished not to add to the scene fearing that whatever the police would come to investigate, I could come up as a suspect. Damn, I am a suspect. Hell, I'm going to be tried with my friend. I used all my might to hold back my vomit. Then my friend did one thing I never thought possible. Upon seeing it, I released a steam of vomit that could make the Mississippi River look like a simple piss stream. Randy held that brain in both hands, and just like one would do with an orange, I watched him bend it on both sides, ripping it apart. With the vomit still fresh on my lips, I watched my friend search through the brain. He searched and searched for whatever he was searching for. Where? He lifted his head his eyes of nothingness staring at the ceiling. He brought his brain-soaked fingers to his face. Where is it? I have to know. It had to be there. It had to be. Where is it? It looked like he was rambling at nothing, but I felt another presence. An invisible presence. It was what my friend was talking to. That must have been the voice he had mentioned. I managed to get myself up. I reached out to my friend, staring at the remains on that man. Randy? Do you know what you have done? My friend stared at me. Now, now, I know. Hours after that, I called the police reporting the incident. Luckily, my friend informed the police I wasn't a part of it. He was given life for the gruesome murder, and a month as his imprisonment, I heard he committed suicide. My friend of so many years had gone insane, committed murder, then suicide. It's a bad joke to know how fast things can change. It was as if some force had ordered my friend to do such things. But why? I eventually went to my former friend's home. At the request of his parents, I helped get rid of his belongings. Inside, memories of us hanging out played out. Memories that did nothing but bring sadness to never seeing my friend again. 
as I stumbled around the home, as his parents gathered the more sentimental objects. I came to reach his small little office, which had just been a small closet space he rearranged. I dug through his random stack of papers and files, coming to find a small bright red children's book. Was this the book he had questioned the man about? I flipped through the book. It was just a standard children's book, nothing but colorful pages with a few words. I must have stood there mudding over the book when my friend's mother stepped into the room. She surprised me with such fright that I almost toppled over the desk. I hid the book behind my back. I don't know why I did, but maybe I was embarrassed to have someone see me reading a children's book. With everything taken care of at my friend's place, I took my leave. That night I began to read the children's book, wishing to understand why my friend's mind took such a radical turn. Why did he write those letters to that man? Why did he take me to that man's house? And why did he murder him the way he did? Who was the voice he was speaking to? That is why I'm standing here on the edge of this roof. It's why I have this bottle in my hand for the drink is the only way I can stay sane. What another bad joke. The reason I stopped drinking was to let my mind get clear of drunken thoughts. But now, I desire those thoughts. They are the only thing that stop what I learned because of that book. Just one more gulp left in the bottle. I could go to the local store down the street for more. But the thoughts from that book come fast after my mind clears itself of drunkenness. I'll do what I can to stop myself from becoming like my friend. For unlike him, who can I go to to get answers for that book? That simple children's book. The writer is dead. All I can do is just sit in the dark questioning myself daily. Questioning that book. I don't know what. I don't want to go insane from questioning. I don't. I don't. The air feels great against myself. I thought going at this speed the wind would at least cut me. But it's not. It's actually quite relaxing. Well, whatever. I won't have to deal with that voice making me question that book anymore. That damn book. Why? Why was that puppy so happy? I've always loved solitude and hiking, so naturally when I went on a six week vacation to New Zealand, I went on a fair number of hikes. The most memorable one by far was the Abel Tasman Inland Track. Unfortunately, it wasn't my most memorable hike ever, for its beautiful views of the surrounding nature. The reason I will never forget this hike is because it terrified me and has forever changed the way I look at the world. It all started when all of my family and friends chipped in to give me a six week vacation in New Zealand for my 25th birthday. I'd always wanted to go there but I was the type who never acted out on such fantasies. Therefore, my sweet sister organized the fundraising to force me to fulfill my dream. I love my friends and family dearly for this gift. My sister most of all of course. Hell, despite everything, I still love all of them dearly for it. My first weeks in New Zealand were absolutely fantastic. I saw all of the Northern Ireland, in New Zealand, everywhere you look, or indeed snap a photo, you see the most breathtaking views of nature. The forests are huge and filled with an enormous diversity of trees, from pines to oaks and palm trees, and any sort of tree in between. The cities are great too, like Auckland, where more than one third of the population of New Zealand lives, or the unique city called Rotoro, which always smells like rotten eggs because of all the active volcanic geysers. I hiked through many of these forests and visited all the cities. I also did the touristy thing and visited Hobbiton and saw Mount Doom on the Tangariro Alpine track. That last one also featured the most beautiful, oddly colored lakes I've ever seen and a smoke-blowing active volcano, but I digress. I'm not writing this to tell you all about my vacation. My ordeal started after a couple of nights in Wellington, a great place to party. I woke up with an enormous hangover and missed my boat to the southern island of New Zealand. I took the next boat, but now I'd also missed the bus on the southern island, a bus that only came twice a day. To make a long story short, I had to start my hike the next day wholly unprepared with my full 45 pounds of gear on my back and only one bottle of water. The Abel Tasman Inland Track starts at the same point as the Abel Tasman Coastal Track, 
the latter of which is one of the most popular hikes in New Zealand. The coastal track takes you around the mountain and beautiful forest over the beaches. The inland track, however, takes you right through the forest over the mountain and is as obscure as its coastal sibling is popular. It sounded right up my alley. I started the hike, and after about an hour of walking, I reached the split into the inland track. Within half an hour, I started to think I had made a mistake. The inland track was one long difficult path upwards. The sun was blazing and the 45 pounds on my back felt heavier by the minute. One hour in, I finished my last drop of water. At least I had the beautiful vistas to power on, or so I thought. Soon, I stepped into the forest. It was beautiful as well, of course. It felt like you were walking through Jurassic Park, but still, after a while you got used to it. Dehydrated, sweaty, and sore all over, I plowed through. To make matters worse, I now had to hike through the thickest mist I had ever seen. They say the human body is made up of 60% water. Between all the fog and sweat, my body felt like it contained at least 80% of water. Yet I was still dying of thirst too. I seriously started to question my love of hiking. How? I was on vacation. I could be in a nice hot spring or cozy hotel room right now. After hours of hiking uphill, while cursing myself, I finally reached the first hut. This wasn't the shelter where I could sleep for the night, mind you. But it was a clear spot with a breathtaking view, and there was water. I eagerly boiled some water over my camping stove, while taking a rest and enjoying the view. After the water had been boiled and cooled down enough, I filled up my bottle and drank the rest until the final drop. Re-energized by the water, sun, and rest, I felt better about hiking again. Within another half hour, I hated hiking again. Once more, I was climbing through the misty forest and the climb was getting steeper and steeper. Eventually, I even had to climb a few parts of trees. The only time I've ever had to do that on a hike. Sore and almost broken, I hardly noticed the path finally becoming straighter again. I did, however, notice the shelter at the end of the path. It almost looked like a mirage. So relieved was I to see it. As I came closer, I was even hit with a love of her hiking harder than ever before. Never had a hike been so painful, but never had reaching a shelter felt so rewarding afterwards. You only remember the good stuff afterwards, right? How wrong I could be. The hut itself was very basic. It had eight mattresses, a wood fire stove, a door, a window, and a chair. Simple and adequate, perfect for the night. It was on a beautiful spot on top of the mountains. Felt like one of the most beautiful places on earth. And I had it all for myself. How I'll come to think of it. When this night would be, I wouldn't have been around any other human being for a full 24 hours. All the earlier hardships seemed to be worth the effort by far. I gathered some firewood and enjoyed a well-deserved rest in the last hour of sunlight. Afterwards, I made a fire in the stove and heated up some beans and instant noodles. I went outside. I have never seen so many stars in the sky as I saw on top of that mountain that night. Mesmerized, I gazed at them for probably hours. When I finally got out of my trance, I decided to take a piss and go to bed. When I was outside taking a piss, alone and free out in nature, I was about to finish when I was startled by a rustling of some trees close by. My heart beat so fast, I thought I was having a heart attack. Frozen, I peered into the darkness in the direction of the trees that made the rustling noise. There wasn't any noise anymore. It stayed eerily quiet. When my heart reached a somewhat normal rate again, I pulled up my pants and quickly went inside. I couldn't fall asleep. Although it had remained quiet, I still felt uneasy. Suddenly I heard the faint noise of footsteps and cracking wood. The sounds came closer. Must be an animal. Even though New Zealand doesn't have much animals, you can still find cats, possums, and deer all around, as well as a huge variety of birds, some of which, like their national pride, the kiwi, are quite big and walk instead of fly. So it must be an animal, I told myself. I caught my own lie instantly. Never been a good liar. The footsteps slowly circled around the house. It sounded heavier than most animals, and it sounded bipedal. I was really getting nervous now. Who could be here at this time of night? There's only one way here. Well, two if you count the road onward towards the next hut, of course. 
but still, it is a very remote area, and that is definitely not easy to reach. No one would reach the place this late at night, unless, yes, that had to be it. Someone else must have chosen the inland track like me, but probably got lost in the woods, because the track is so hard to follow. I almost got lost a couple of times as well, so yeah, someone must have been lost and has finally managed to reach the shelter. I managed to somewhat convince myself of the lie this time. The best lies always contain a grain of truth, they say. A soft footstep stopped, frozen in bed. I strained my ears for the faintest sound. All my senses seemed oversensitive. For a while it remained quiet, and the footsteps started again, this time accompanied by a scraping sound against the side of the shelter. It was one continuous scrape that sounded like multiple things at once. The sound was horrible. It sounded like a set of claws. Petrified, I huddled under the blankets like a little kid. For an agonizing while, the scraping around the shelter continued, and it just stopped. After a while, I mustered up the courage to peer over the blankets. Slowly, I started to scan the room. It was very dark, but it seemed okay, and the sounds had stopped for a while. I guess it was gone. Whatever it was. I hadn't noticed it with my first look around, but as I relaxed and looked around once more, I saw it. Someone was staring at me through the window. It was so dark and the figure stood so still, it was hard to make out at first. But when I did see it, I could not unsee it. There it was. The silhouette of a face, its features almost indistinguishable, but for the eyes. The horrible piercing eyes with their ink black pupils. They were staring right at me. They seemed inhuman, and they seemed to smile. Once more, I ducked under my covers like I was five years old. Like the covers would do me any good against whatever was staring at me outside the shelter. Still, it remained quiet. It is at times like these that the relativity of time becomes more evident than ever. Because I have absolutely no idea how long I waited this time. It may have been minutes, but could also have been hours, before I dared to peek through the blanket. When I did, there was nothing outside of the window. There were no more sounds. I wasn't going to sleep anymore this night. As soon as the first sunbeams of dawn would arise, I would get the hell out and hike on. If I would press on enough, and I certainly had the incentive to, I would make it past the next shelter and all the way to the end, back to civilization. I guess this prospect made me feel a lot better, because next I remember is waking up and immediately realizing I slept in pretty late. Quickly I gathered all my stuff and got the hell out. Scratch marks were all over the side of the cabin. Long lines, none of them straight, but I could still make out five lines in a row each time. Four lines close to each other, the fifth one slightly higher. I moved on and didn't look back. At first, I still had the faint hope I could still reach the end of the trail that day, but the trail was even steeper and harder to climb than the hike of the previous day, not to mention the horrible night. Had made me so sore, progress was hard and slow. I soon realized I would have to sleep in the next cabin. Later, I realized how stupid I had been. I'm always so goal-oriented. I only had the end of the trail in my mind. I should have just come back to the beginning. It would have been a downhill hike. I probably would have checked into a hostel or hotel before dinner. Angry at myself, I pushed on. What else could I do? Great. Even more trees to climb. This was the toughest hike I'd ever been on. Still, it did help to take my mind off the proceedings of the previous night. Also, truth be told, during daytime the forest didn't feel eerie. It felt peaceful, and every now and then there was a clearing and I was treated with a view worthy of a postcard in a tourist gift shop. After a while, I even began to rationalize. Perhaps it had just been a possum. The bastards are bold and have claws. Then my mind probably played tricks on me when I looked at the window. I sort of convinced myself that it happened. Besides, the forest felt peaceful now, so even if it was something else, it couldn't be following me now through this hard trail during daytime. I finally felt more at ease and climbed the hard trail. It was almost dusk when I finally reached the second shelter. The shelter was larger than the first one. It wasn't placed on a clearing on top of a mountain. This one was sheltered between huge and beautiful trees. I had dinner and put some extra wood in the stove which also functioned as a heater. For a while, I stared at the flames, hypnotized by their flickering patterns. 
as it turned dark, my faint hope for some fellow hikers to show up dissipated. in. I had looked forward to the solitude of this hike before I started it, but as the night turned darker, fear slowly crept back into me, and I really could have used some company. Thankfully, it remained quiet, however. Exhausted, I plunged into bed. I have no idea what time it was when I woke up, but I couldn't already hear my elevated heart beating in the silence. It was coming again. I could feel it. Sure enough, it didn't take long before I heard footsteps approaching in the distance. As they slowly neared the cabin, breaking twigs along the way, I braced myself for the scraping. But this time, there was no scraping sound. The sound that followed was even worse. I was startled by the sound of a creaking door. The sound of the door of the cabin being opened. Scared to death? I stared at the doorway. I saw the outline of a silhouette. I couldn't quite make out its features, but it seemed human. Maybe this was just another hiker arriving late. Please be another hiker. Whoever it was, just stood there in the doorway for the longest time. As my eyes adjusted a little, it seemed less human than I initially thought. It was very tall and lanky. Its legs were very long and thin, compared to its relatively short torso. Its arms were also thin and long like the arms of a primate. Suddenly, it started to move inside the shelter. Petrified, I turned around, shaking and facing the wall. I heard the footsteps move closer as the floorboards creaked. Very close to me, I heard more creaking of wood. Then, it was silent again. I was so scared, I seriously thought I was going to faint. I wish I had. At least I would have escaped this living nightmare. I never did faint, though. I just kept shivering, staring at the wall, and my heart kept beating through my chest, like it was trying to break a record. All the while, it remained quiet. Once more, I lost track of time, but it felt like hours when I finally resolved to take a quick peek. I slowly turned my head around to scan the room. I didn't have to look around for long. It sat in a chair right next to me. I was so startled and petrified, both my body and mind froze. I could do nothing but stare at it. In the dim light of the glowing embers in the stove, I could finally see some of its features. It was not human. The creature was certainly akin to a human, but its thin bony body was covered in leathery skin. Its long face was ghastly, with a long crooked nose, pointy ears, a long chin and huge eyes, with piercing dark pupils. But worst of all, was its mouth. It was enormous and filled with way too many pointed teeth. Even worse was that it smiled at me. It didn't move, it didn't make a sound, it just sat there in the chair right next to me, staring and smiling at me. I felt like I was losing my sanity and could do nothing but stare back in shock at this demon or whatever creature this was. Then it startled me even more. The smile disappeared and the thing stared at me, menacingly. It slowly hunched forward towards me and reached out its hand. I closed my eyes and braced for the worst. It touched my head and started to stroke it. I could feel its bony, leathery fingers crawl through my hair and all over the skin of my head. I could also feel its razor-sharp claws at the end of its fingertips, yet the strokes were so gentle and soft. It managed not to leave a single scratch. Somehow, that made this whole ordeal feel even worse. What did it want from me? The creature stopped stroking my head and I slowly opened my eyes. As it pulled back its hand, it smiled at me again. It slowly got up and walked to the door. As it walked out, it stood still in the doorway once more. It turned its head around to face me one last time. It looked at me even more menacing than before, and put his finger in front of his lips. Then made the only sound I heard it utter. In a raspy voice it went, Shh. It smiled at me once more, but this time the smile was very menacing as well. Then it walked away, frozen in the same position. I stared at the doorway for the rest of the night. Thankfully, it never came back. As soon as the sun started to set, I got up and sped out of the shelter. The hike was a lot easier because I had to descend the mountain again, and in record time I reached the end. Never have I been so glad to see other people again. I checked into an eight-person room in a hostel and stayed away from hikes for the rest of that vacation. As years have gone by and nothing alike has ever happened to me again, my fear has thankfully grown less. Believe it or not, I even started hiking again after a few years, although nowadays I only do popular hikes. I still like some solitude during the daytime in nature, but
but before dusk, I want to reach a shelter and be amongst other people. No more being alone in the wild at night for me. Not now, not ever. I am an atheist, and even though I really like the paranormal, I don't really believe in any of that stuff. I think there's a rational explanation for everything, but hard as I try, I can't think of any rational explanation for what happened to me in New Zealand. I have no idea what the creature or thing was, and moreover, what it wanted. Was it truly a kind demon, some misunderstood creature longing for companionship, or perhaps more likely something sinister? Whatever it was, it scared the shit out of me. Never before or since have I been so scared, nor had I known such fear was possible. Hell, even now I'm writing this in the hope of giving it a resting place. Yet so far it has only helped me to feel scared all over again. So scared, in fact, that my mind is playing tricks on me. Because I've had the feeling something has been circling my house for a while, and right now I could swear I'm hearing the scraping sound again. Something has gone terribly wrong inside my house. I can't explain how or why. I barely even believe that it has happened at all. Frankly, I have nowhere to turn. No one who would believe me even if I did. So I'm typing this up and posting it here. It's the only option I have. My name is Eric. I'm nobody special. Early 30s, single, trapped in a dead-end job trying away inside a cubicle. I've lived in this house for nearly five years now. A nice, two-story suburban place within a clean and safe community. The neighbors are friendly, but I keep to myself. Always have. Nothing special. Until now. This is my story. I woke up on a dreary gray Saturday morning, clouds hanging low in the sky and threatening to unleash a dismal drizzle at their slightest whim. The sour weather kept the street quiet. Normally, Saturday mornings were punctuated with the sounds of playing children and the ring of bicycle bells. But today... It seems everyone was content to stay within their homes and watch the rain roll above town. As I swing my legs over the side of the bed and wipe the sleep from my eyes, I shoot a glance at my dull digital alarm clock. 9 a.m. I let out a short sigh. There's really no point in sleeping in, really no point to getting up. I have no plans, no responsibilities, until the work week starts anew. I sit for a few minutes, spaced out on the edge of my bed. Finally, I rise and wander to the kitchen to start the coffee pot. As I tiredly walk through the hall and down the stairs, I hear the rain start to patter against the shingles above. Going through the motions like a robot with a failing battery, I prepare the coffee maker, half listening to the streaming putt 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 as the percolator does its daily work. After a moment of staring blankly, my sleep-addled mind begins to wander, becoming jealous of the little machine. At least it always has something to do. Some kind of purpose, no matter how mundane. Who knows how long I stood there blankly, half asleep, and debating the metaphysical purpose of the kitchen appliance. By the time I shifted my eyes downward, the carafe was full of hot black coffee. Halfway coming to my senses, I reached to the cupboard and produced my favorite mug, a single white ceramic thing printed on one side with the phrase, coffee time, in plain black lettering filling the mug to the brim with scalding hot coffee and a heaping spoonful of sugar, I drowsily turn around to place my drink on the kitchen table behind me. As I place the mug down, it loses its balance on the edge, plummeting down. I'm struck with dull surprise as my sleep battled brain tries to process what is happening to spur my reflexes into action, but there is no shattering crash. My bare feet are not bombarded by a spray of splintered ceramic glass and boiling liquid. In fact, there is nothing at all. I blink rapidly, shaking myself to my senses. My mug had fallen off the edge into the middle of the table. In the center of the kitchen table, there is a large, perfectly circular hole, probably just under three feet in diameter. I stare in confused disbelief as I take in the sight. The hole is dark, inky blackness oppressive, even up to the lip of the drop, defiant of the weak gray light that filters through my rain-spattered kitchen windows. Though it's impossible to tell for sure just how deep it is due to the choking shadows within, the hole seems to expand deeper than my eyes constrained to see. Shocked and confused, I lean down to look under the table to get a better look at the pit. Stooping under the table, I see nothing but my kitchen floor. No hole, no coffee mug, 
Just some crumbs of some past meal I had neglected to sweep up. I craned my neck to look at the underside of the tabletop from below. It is perfectly intact. Thinking I must be losing my mind, I rise back up to my feet. The hole is still there, a black fissure in the center of my table. I slowly lean over the edge to take a tentative look at the depths. The darkness is impenetrable, hiding anything that could be below. I wave my hand past the threshold of the pit, expecting to impact with the wooden tabletop. My fingers sink into the hole. The hair inside is frigid cold and heavy with sticky moisture. As I recoil from the shock of freezing temperatures and putting my hand through a void in my own table, my hand brushes against the edge of the hole. Though the table is wooden, the edges of the hole have the feel of smooth porcelain or textureless hard plastic. I pull back my arm, bringing it up to my face. My hand is shaking from fear, and the cold it had just been plunged into. Rivulets of icy dew have formed on my fingertips, running down past my wrist as I hold my digits before my eyes. I... is all I managed to dumbly mumble as I try to process the absurd situation I now find myself in. Outside, the rain intensified to the sound of distant thunder, shifting from a weeping drizzle to a hard pattering shower. It is only then that I notice the shift in the air. A subtle, gentle breeze pulls at the tiny hairs on my arms. No window should be open. I check every night before I go to sleep, especially if rain is in the forecast. The AC isn't running. It isn't even switched on, and yet the air still moves within my kitchen. Pull in, pause, push out, pause, pull in, pause, push out. My guts twist inside me as I understand. The hole, or something inside it, is breathing. I take a tiny step backwards as thunder rolls overhead. The hole continues to breathe. Panic starts to well inside me. A primal misunderstanding of what lay before me inside my own home. I reel back, raising my leg to kick at the offense to physics in some impotent, animalistic way. I slam my bare heel into the edge of the table, a heavy pushing blow to skid the piece of furniture away from me. The kick connects with all the force I can muster. My knee jams and creaks under the pressure, screaming with pain. I feel my foot bend and pop. Bruises surely already forming. Crashing back to support myself on the counter that holds my faithful coffee maker, I stare down the pit in my table. I wince as I put weight back on the foot I used to kick. I used to play soccer in high school. That was good form on that kick. The table was just some crappy IKEA model, lightweight, particle board, and some screws. It couldn't have weighed more than a handful of pounds, but there it was, defiant in its immobility. Still the hole breathed, unperturbed by my attack. Slowly creeping forward, I approached the table again. Thunder rolled above my house, shaking the windows in their frames. The hole waited there patiently. Leaning over the table, I craned my neck to stare down into the void once more. The inexplicable pocket of nothing located in the middle of my kitchen. Well, not nothing presumably. Something that breathes, and my coffee mug. I peer into the blackness below squinting to catch a glimpse of anything at all. As I stare, condensation forms on the smooth edges of the hole, the chill air within forcing the rampant humidity to cling to and run down the sides. It reminded me of that footage you see of a micro camera fed down an old pipe. No, not quite. Perhaps it was closer to the film shot within a body during surgery, or an anatomical study. The dripping sides moved ever so slightly with a breeze of breaths, undulating almost imperceptibly, like an esophagus. Hello? I call feebly into the hole, almost immediately feeling extremely foolish. This was an inexplicable pit in my kitchen table. Why would there be anything that would speak to me inside of it? And even if there was, would I really want to? There was a long moment of silence, with only the noise of the rain outside echoing through the house. Hello? My blood turned to ice, and my breath caught in my throat. A small voice echoed up from the hole, seemingly from some considerable distance. My voice. An echo? It had to be. It made more sense than anything else this morning. With all the courage I could muster, I spoke again. I... Anyone down there? A second of silence. Then a voice. My voice. Ah, uh, yeah. 
Hello? The words drifted up from the hole, not an echo but a true response. My heart began to race. What the hell was down there? It sounded like me, but there's no way that could be true. Shaking, I brought myself to speak. Uh, hey, I'm Eric. Who are you? My name's Eric too. We sound a lot alike, came the voice from my table. Yeah, we really do. I slowly responded, unsure of exactly what I was speaking with. Could this really be me? Another me? Or even the same me? So, what are you doing in my kitchen table? My voice in the hole seemed perplexed. In your table? I was just about to ask you what you're doing in my ceiling. Wait, what? Your ceiling? Yeah, the other me responded. You're in a hole about three feet across the ceiling of my kitchen, right next to the red stain. My eyes wandered upwards, above my kitchen table. Offset from the hole was an old faded red stain. It was the only reminder of a desperate battle I had waged against a jar of spaghetti sauce nearly three years ago. I could never be bothered to clean it all the way off. You threw a mug of coffee at me, busted all over my kitchen table, scared the hell out of me when it hit. That's when I noticed the hole. My mind was racing. Was this really another me? In a another of my house? In another of my world? The possibilities were maddening. Why had this hole appeared in my house? My table? I wasn't anyone special. Hey, you still there, Eric? The voice from below echoed up. Yeah, I'm here. I responded, snapped out of my contemplation. If what I'm thinking is true, and I think it is, then you and I are very similar, and I think we're thinking the same thing. I think. I took a second to process that. Yeah, I think. So this could be big, right? My voice tentatively asked from the hole. Yeah, this could be big. We should meet. Make this real. Make it make sense. Yeah, I suppose. You could come down here, Eric. The other Eric asked quietly. The question sent a chill down my spine. Climbed down a hole out of space and time in the center of my kitchen, for what I knew, could be an utterly deadly, alternate place. The proposition didn't sit right. I wasn't even entirely sure who I was talking to. I don't know about that, I responded. We don't know how long this hole, or whatever it is, actually is. It could be dangerous, you know. If I slip, I could fall for miles for all we know. The voice was quiet for a while. The rain continued its endless assault on the glass of my windows as thunder bellowed above. That's okay, Eric. I can come up there. I... Okay. I guess. I shuddered, caught off guard. Yeah, don't worry, Eric. I can make the climb. The voice shifted from side to side in the hole as if the source was moving within it. Yeah. Alright. I took a step back away from my table. This didn't feel right. None of this made sense, but this felt very, very wrong. My pulse quickened. Within the hole, the sound of squirming movement began. The noise of something dragging itself up the chill and moisture slick sides of the void. The slithering climb grew closer by the moment. Below, I could see only blackness. My voice spoke again within the hole, closer this time. I'm excited to see you, Eric. I think we'll have a lot in common. I'm excited to meet your side of this hole. It seemed strained with effort as it worked its way upwards. Yeah, I'm sure we will. I responded, absent-mindedly. My mind was racing with indecision. Maybe we can have some coffee together, Eric. Black with lots of sugar. My voice was ascending ever closer. In the darkness below, I could just barely begin to make out a shape moving in the hole. Worming its way upward, the inky shadows hid the details of Eric as he climbed towards me. Something snapped in my head as I realized what was bothering me. Whatever was in the hole had told me its name was Eric after I told it that was mine. Mentioned its kitchen after I brought up mine. Could see the stain on the ceiling by looking up through the hole. Could taste how I took my coffee by lapping up what I had dropped. Whatever was down there, it wasn't me. Don't worry, Eric. I'm almost there. Can't wait to meet you. The voice was close now. Mine, but 
different, wrong. I hurriedly glanced down the hole in my table. The shape was almost close enough to see in the oppressive dark. An undulating and writhing thing oozing upwards from the cold, wet place that waited below. Its thin, probing tendrils began to breach into the dim gray lights of my home. I spun about, looking for anything I could use to fend off the thing that used my name. My eyes landed on the only thing within arm's reach. Eric, it's time for me to meet you. Eric. The thing slithering from the hole wasn't even attempting to use my voice anymore, its words spilling forth in an awful, gurgling rasp. I spun back towards the hole in my kitchen table, coffee maker in hand. I raised it high above my head before bringing it down in a mighty arc. It sailed from my grasp, plunging down into the void and impacting the thing below with the sound of shattering glass and metal against soft flesh. With a hissing howl, the thing screeched as it fell, plunging back down the pit. I never heard it hit the bottom. I slumped back against the counter that once held my loyal coffee maker, sliding to the floor. I gasped for breath, adrenaline purging itself from my system. More sounds had begun to emanate from the hole, slithering, writhing, dozens of voices calling my name, beginning their cramped climb upwards. I know that these will be my final few minutes, quiet solace amongst the sounds of the storm outside. I only hope that these words find someone who can help, who can come close the hole in my kitchen table for good, before whatever is on the other side spills over completely. I sit here and think of my purpose, the purpose of all of us. The things in the hole, my coffee maker, are getting closer now. Eric, Eric, they whisper. Their tendrils are reaching out for our world. I could really go for that cup of coffee about now. The sound of crunching gravel quietened as the small bus slowed to a crawl at the foot of the campsite. The old metal doors opened with a wheeze, and the reluctant campers exited into the ancient wood. The last two exit the bus. Elliot stepped onto the stone and dirt. Shortly after he did so, the bus rolled back down the woodland trail out of sight. Howdy campers, announced an all too enthusiastic man as he jogged up to the group. Elliot rolled his eyes. The man was wearing brown, baggy shorts and a bright blue t-shirt, a red whistle hanging from his neck. He also donned a gray baseball cap, the words Camp Counselor sewn into the front. Similarly dressed adults wandered through the campsite in the background, carrying mattresses to and from the two low wooden cabins on either side of a small fire pit. I'm Matt, your head camp counselor, and this is Camp Disconnect. The man shouted to the crowd of unimpressed teens. Elliot scoffed at the ridiculousness of his tone. After an uncomfortable silence, the man continued. Now, the first rule of camp disconnect is that you gotta disconnect, he said with a grin, holding out a plastic tray. Come on, kids. Phone's in the tray. The group moaned before complying. After everyone, including Elliot, threw their phones in the tray, Matt handed off to another counselor. Now before you are shown to your beds, let me go over the rules. Number one, bedtime is 10. Gotta be in bed by then, okay? Number two, no wandering off into the woods. We wouldn't want you to get lost, would we? And number three, no communication with the outside world, hence the phone tray. Now lucky for you guys, however, we will allow relatives and friends to send you letters, which we will give to you as soon as they get to us. You will not be able to respond though. This is Camp Disconnect, remember? Now let's get you folks settled in. After a brief and unmemorable tour, Elliot and the rest of the campers were shown to their respective beds. It was clear just from this short introduction that Elliot was not going to have an enjoyable four weeks. Elliot woke up in the morning on his fifth day at Camp Disconnect. He sat up with a groan. The stiff springs on the mattress had been digging into his back all night. The past four days had been tough for him. And not just because he had no phone. The place stunk of rotted wood and excrement. It was infested with flies and other swarms of bugs. And the food. Oh god, the food. Gruel is what it was. Elliot had no clue what was in it. Aside from the occasional hair. The ingredients were a mystery. He rubbed his eyes as flakes of dead skin fell from his face. Elliot Peters 
called a man in the center of the rows of beds. Elliot looked up and squinted. He hadn't noticed him before. He was large, donning a familiar blue attire. However, he appeared to be a good deal older than the rest of the staff. Elliot Peters? He repeated, but louder this time. Yeah, over here. Elliot stuck his hand up. The large man marched over to him. A letter for you, he growled, handing Elliot a sealed white envelope. Thanks, Elliot murmured as the man wandered back outside. He opened the envelope to find a single piece of paper. Writing scrawled on either side. Elliot smirked. He already knew who it was. He read as such. Yo, Elliot, it's Ollie. Sucks that you have to stay at that camp for the summer. It's been pretty sucky back here since you've been gone. But I gotta tell you something. It might just be nothing, or it could just turn out to be a pig fucking deal. So last night, I got really bored and couldn't sleep, so... You remember when we used to search the deep web on your dad's old computer? Yeah, I did that, but on my computer. I couldn't quite remember how to get in at first, but eventually it came back to me. After a bit of searching once I was on the hidden wiki, I found this creepy ass website. Soon after, I learned it was full of tutorials on how to summon demons and monsters, and all types of creepy shit like that. It was kind of getting too cliche for me though, so I was about to click off until I saw one which sounded interesting. The Raggedy Man Ritual. I clicked on it and read the description. It said something about a game for depraved souls and some other weird stuff I can't remember. It was creepy though. At the bottom of the page it gave me a list. Two mirrors, salt, darkness, and something to prop the mirrors up. It then went on to explain how to summon the Raggedy Man to begin the game. I followed what it said. Propping the two mirrors, I found up facing each other, and sprinkling salt in a circle around them. After it was done, I turned off the lights and sat in between the mirrors and read a poem from the website. I had to memorize it, cause I couldn't leave the computer on. It said I needed pitch darkness. As I'm writing this, I realize I'm sounding pretty crazy, but you get it. Anyway, I closed my eyes and recited the poem. Raggedy man, raggedy man. Won't you come out and play? Raggedy man, raggedy man, or else you cannot stay. Raggedy man, raggedy man, as quiet as a mouse. Raggedy man, raggedy man, awaken from your dark house. After saying it, I just sat there for a moment. Nothing really happened, so I checked the website again. I probably should have read the whole thing before I did the ritual. It said that once completed, you are trapped in a game with the raggedy man. He will appear in anywhere, in any form to stalk you. He can take the shape of someone you know, or a complete stranger. For whoever performs the ritual, the objective is to not let the raggedy man touch you, but he cannot use force to do so. The website? This is because the raggedy man prefers to work more discreetly, whatever the hell that means. It didn't go much into detail about what happens if you lose the game, but I assume you just tie or whatever. I don't know. Anyway, I'll keep posted if anything creepy happens. Thought you might be interested. From Ollie. Elliot had been friends with Ollie since their first year of school. This certainly wasn't the strangest thing he's done. Elliot chuckled as he finished the letter. This kid. He giggled under his breath as he placed it down beside him. The next few days were just as agonizing as the first four, if not more so. Elliot was usually fond of the outdoors, but... Something in that hollow wood unsettled him. He woke up once more on the ninth day of his summer camp extravaganza to the sound of a familiar voice. Elliot Peters? The same large camp counselor said. Elliot rubbed his crusty eyes. Yep, he called out. The man stomped over and dropped a letter on his lap. Thanks. Elliot sighed as the man wandered out of the cabin door. Assuming the letter was just an update from Ollie, Elliot ripped open the envelope and began to read. Yo, Elliot, it's me again. Something's not right, man. Some real scary stuff has been happening. The ritual, it worked. No joke, I'm freaking out right now. Let me explain. I woke up the other day after I sent you that letter and heard my mom calling me from downstairs so I get halfway down the stairs to see what she wants. Then I remembered. She's been on a business trip to Budapest for the past five days. 
She told me she wouldn't be back for a week. I ran back upstairs. Obviously scared out of my mind, I pushed my back against my bedroom door so whoever was in my house couldn't get to me. I thought of what it said on the website. The raggedy men can take any form. So I just stand there for like half an hour, just trying to figure out if I was dreaming or not. I tell you, man, longest 30 minutes of my life. Anyway, after a while, I finally managed to calm myself down, just figuring I must have imagined it. So I opened the door and crept downstairs to make sure there was no one there. There wasn't. I called my dad to tell him to come home straight away. I think he could tell I was shaken by my voice because he was at the house not 10 minutes later. That helped a lot. The rest of the day went without incident, but that unsettled me even more in a way. I told my dad what happened, and he agreed that I must have just imagined it. I didn't tell him about the ritual though. If he found out I'd been on the deep web again, he would have kicked my ass. The day passed and I got into bed, but no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't fall asleep. It must have been 3 in the morning when, as soon as I was about to finally drift off, I heard a knock at my door. I lay there for a few moments, not saying a word. Then I heard a second set of knocks, but much louder that time. Finally, I managed to squeeze out a week. Who was there? There was a pause before I heard my dad's voice on the other side. I want to talk about what happened earlier. Can you open the door, please? Something about his tone was just, I don't know the word, uncanny. I knew that something was wrong. No, dad, I'm trying to get some sleep. After I said that, there was just silence. It felt like ages before I heard the sound of footsteps slowly walking back down the hallway. I was shaken to my core. That night, I stayed up until my eyelids just fell. I must have passed out because the next morning I woke up aching on my bedroom floor, but what I dreamt of, I shudder to remember. All I can recall was that I found myself in a dirty, decrepit hallway with no end in sight. The walls were a disgusting, creamy shade of yellow, with moss crawling up them. The hallway was dimly lit by a row of rusted chandeliers, the wax of their candles dripping into the metal. I walked for what felt like miles, I just kept going, then I heard it. The sound of heavy boots slamming on the floor echoed out from behind me. I turned to see a tall figure stood motionless in the hallway, no more than 10 feet away from me. A raggedy man. He was large, with brown, saggy trousers, and a similarly colored jacket covered in filth. His face was unkempt, and just like the rest of him, was covered in brown and black dirt. Thick dreadlocks draped over his shoulders, crawling with lice and other insects. His piercing eyes a similar, sickening yellow to the walls. His mouth unmoving, he spoke to me. As if he were in my head, he growled a phrase which has haunted me since. You're going to have to try harder than that. With that, I woke up. Just as I said, on the floor and dripping with sweat, Elliot, I'm not okay. I asked my dad and he said he never came to my door. But don't worry, I'm working on a way to end the game. I'll keep you posted, Ollie. Elliot put the letter down. He shook his head in confusion. He must be fucking with me, he muttered. Slightly disgruntled by his friend's tasteless joke, Elliot crawled out of his stiff bed with a groan. That place made him feel 30 years older. Noticing the rest of the kids in the cabin getting ready, he threw on his outdoor clothes and trudged outside behind the rest of the troop. The subsequent day passed slowly. First, a hiking trip then a series of monotonous activities in the woods, and finally, an excruciating song time around the campfire, until the sky was black and blue and filled with stars. Elliot got to sleep very quickly that night. He woke up the next morning to the sound of his name being called once again. Elliot Peters, the same man called, again stood centered between the rows of beds. Elliot sat up, somewhat surprised. He wasn't expecting an update this soon. How had the letter even gotten there so soon? He thought. Before the man could call again, Elliot waved his hand in the air. Over here. The man walked over to him, handing him the third letter. Elliot thanked him once more as he left. For a moment, he contemplated not reading it, not willing to entertain it, but he caved in. Too curious to ignore it, he tore off the envelope and read. Elliot, I have some good news. This will be the last letter I will send you regarding this whole raggedy man situation. I ended the game, however, 
I may not have been completely truthful with you in the past two letters. Let me explain. The night of the ritual, when I told you that I couldn't quite remember what the article said, well, I did remember. In fact, I've read it many times now. I just wasn't sure if you were ready to hear it. To be as brief as possible, it said the game cannot be ended, only passed on to new players. Through the use of a separate ritual, the details of which I'll spare you. You can transfer the curse of the Raggedy Man to someone else. According to the site, there are many ways of passing on the game, but the least complicated one, and the one I've used, involves tricking someone else into talking to the Raggedy Man three times. I'm sure if you're reading this letter, then you probably have. I know how you are. Always thanking people. Always so polite. Depending on the form he has taken, he may have just left, but he'll be back. I'm sorry, Elliot. Your friend, Ollie. I have a friend, Susan, that loves to travel, and she'll send me various oddities that she finds in markets. I like to collect rare and unusual items. It's mostly fossils, but she sent me a shrunken head, pieces of pottery, and jewelry that's supposedly cursed. There are many other bits and pieces to my collection that would take too much time to list. The most unusual item so far was an unhatched egg. The reason this egg was unusual was that no one has ever seen such an egg. It's about the size of an ostrich egg, and a weird green color that almost seems to glow in the dark. Susan told me that the merchant that sold her the egg told her that he'd found it while hiking in the mountains. He said that he tripped over something buried in the ground, and when he started looking at the ground, he saw a weird sort of glowing where he'd tripped. He said that he decided to dig around to see if he could find what was glowing. A few inches from the surface, he unearthed an egg. He said he'd never seen anything like it. The merchant took the egg home, and he left it on a table for a while. When nothing happened, the merchant put the egg in his closet. He said that he forgot about the egg until he had to move. He told Susan that it was most likely a fossil, and he didn't want it anymore. So the merchant took it with him when he made his weekly market run to sell it to someone who was into fossils. This is when Susan found his stall. She told me her eyes were drawn to the egg because of its unnatural color. The merchant couldn't tell her much about the egg because he never took it to anyone to get it checked out. He assured her though that it was just a fossil. She decided that the egg was safe, so she bought it from the merchant. When Susan got back to her hometown, she brought the egg over to me. She told me everything that the merchant had told her. I eagerly took the egg from her and I looked it over. There were no obvious signs of damage, and the shell was smooth and slightly warm. I asked my friend about the warmth. Susan brushed it off, saying that it was warm because she'd had it in her purse. I accepted that explanation, and we visited for a while before she left to go home. This is where my story picks up. I set the egg on a holder so it wouldn't roll off. I put this holder on a shelf in my living room where I kept most of my other fossils. What I didn't think about at the time was that this shelf was next to the fireplace. It was beginning to get colder, and I used my fireplace as much as I could to save on utility bills. I have many shelves around my living room. At the time, I didn't even think about putting the egg somewhere else. The egg sat on that shelf for about a month before I noticed something was wrong. I'd been dusting my living room because of all the items I had on shelves. It's amazing how much dust can gather in a month. I had just finished dusting the shelf that was to the right of my fossil shelf. I heard a very soft cracking sound, and I dismissed it at first as my dog playing with one of her toys. Then as I was dusting the fossil shelf, I heard the sound again. I stopped what I was doing, and I looked closer at the shelf wondering if I had accidentally broken something. It was then that I saw there was a hairline crack in the egg's shell. I frowned as I picked the egg up. I looked it over, and I found another smaller crack, not far from the first. I put down my cleaning rag and I carried the egg over to my dining room table, where there was more light. I sat the egg gently on the table. As I was watching the egg, my dog, Pepper, came over to see what I was doing. I felt her press against my leg and I automatically reached down to pet her. The whole time, I didn't take my eyes off the egg. After a minute of nothing else happening, I decided to get me something to drink. While I was doing that, I also grabbed my phone so that I could record anything that might happen. 
once I had my tea and phone, I went back to the dining room table. As I sat down, I saw that another crack had appeared. I pulled up the camera on my phone and started recording. For a while, nothing happened. I was wondering if maybe something had changed in the environment, and that was what was causing the egg to crack. That thought was put to rest when there was more cracking from the egg. As the cracks got bigger, the process sped up. I watched with no idea what was going to come out of the egg. After an hour of watching and taking breaks from recording, the egg started opening. I leaned forward, eagerly thinking about what kind of bird I was going to see. Not once did it enter my mind that something other than a bird could be inside that egg. So I kept watching the only sound in the room was my dog snoring and the faint sounds from the egg. After about 10 minutes of the opening getting bigger, I finally got my first look at what the egg had been hiding. The first thing I saw was a long spindly leg that was completely black, a kind of black I'd never seen before. At the sight of the leg, I quickly got up from my chair and backed away in horror. Morbid curiosity kept me rooted to the spot as more of the egg started falling away. Pepper, seeming to sense that something was wrong, had joined me against the wall. I put my hand down and grabbed her collar. I was ready to run if whatever was in the egg was dangerous. Not long after, the other leg came two more just like the first. I could feel myself starting to shake. I'm one of the many people that have a fear of spiders, and if this was a spider, I wasn't sticking around. Then with three legs outside of the shell, I could see the egg starting to shake. It looked like the creature was struggling to get free. As the shaking happened, a thick, yellow fluid started seeping out of the opening. I gagged as the smell reached me, and I could hear Pepper whimpering as she tried to hide behind me. I had about decided to quit recording, and to leave the house when there was a much louder crack. I looked on horrified at what was coming out of the egg now. There weren't eight legs like I thought there would be. Instead, I saw six spindly legs now standing on the table. The egg was still covering the creature's body, but from what I could see, it was about the size of a cat. The next thing I saw was the rest of the egg being shaken off. There standing in front of me was the most hideous thing I'd ever seen. Unlike its legs, the creature's body was a mixture of brown and red. It had a shape vaguely resembling a spider on its back half, and the rest of the body had a long thorax covered in slimy hairs. This led up to the head that was like something out of a horror movie. I saw a row of sharp teeth dripping the same yellow fluid that had come out of the egg. Then there were bulging red eyes, and a strange spike coming out of the top of its head. The spike had barbs sprouting out of it, and it looked like this was to hold something in place. I had the nauseating thought that the creature would spear something on that spike. With the way the barbs were facing, it looked like whatever was speared would have to tear itself off of the spike. We stared at each other for what seemed like a moment frozen in time. Then the creature let out a spine-chilling hiss and started moving toward me. I remained frozen in terror, and I could only watch as it moved across the table. Then it slipped in the yellow fluid from its egg. This was enough to get me moving, and I grabbed Pepper and ran from the house. Pepper was a mutt that weighed 50 pounds, and usually, I could barely pick her up. With adrenaline running through me, she felt like she only weighed a few pounds. When I got outside, I realized that I didn't have my car keys. I turned around and I saw that the creature had followed me. I dropped Pepper on the ground so that she would follow me, and I took off running. I stopped a few blocks later, breathing heavily and hoping that I wasn't followed. I slowly turned around to look behind me. I sagged in relief when I only saw Pepper standing behind me. Feeling that I was safe, I called Susan for help. She didn't live far from me, so it only took about 10 minutes for her to show up. When I got into the car, she looked at me in concern. Lily? Is everything all right? Susan asked as she looked at me. We were sitting by the sidewalk, and I felt that the longer we sat there, the more danger we were in. I shook my head. I'll tell you when we get back to your house. Susan frowned, but she didn't press me. Instead, she put the car in drive, and we drove in silence to her house. When we got to Susan's house, I let Pepper out to run around for a bit. As I was standing there watching Pepper and trying to come to terms with what I'd seen, Susan walked around the car to join me. Now, will you tell me what's wrong? I've never seen you that scared before. I swallowed and I pulled out my phone. I'm sure you remember that egg you gave me after your last trip. 
Susan nodded, looking at me expectantly. I sighed and opened up the camera on my phone. I brought up the recording I had made, and I passed the phone to Susan. After I found the footage of the egg hatching, as I handed her the phone, I started telling her about the egg. Well, you and the merchant that you bought the egg from were wrong about it being a fossil. Really? Susan asked, sounding surprised. I nodded to the phone in her hand. Watch the video. You'll see for yourself. We fell silent as the video played. I glanced at Susan a couple of times to see her reaction. It didn't take long for an expression of horror to pass over her face. After the relevant part of the video was done, Susan looked at me. I'm so sorry. I had no idea. I know, but that doesn't change the fact that thing is now on the loose. Susan nodded. You're right. Let's call animal control to come out. We need to find out if the creature is still in your house. I had my doubts that animal control could help with this particular situation. I didn't protest though, as Susan made the call. She didn't tell them what kind of animal it was, only that she had a video she wanted to show them. After she hung up the phone, she turned to me. They're going to stop by here first to get the video. Alright, I said with a sigh. I wasn't comfortable sending someone else to deal with the creature, but I knew I wasn't going to go back there. I called Pepper to me, and we followed Susan inside. She got both of us something to drink, and she put down a bowl of water for Pepper. We sat on the couch, but there wasn't much talking because we were trying to come to terms about the creature in the house. It took about an hour, but eventually, someone from animal control showed up. Susan went to answer the door when we saw him pull up outside the living room window. She came back with a heavy set man, and Pepper ran over to greet the newcomer. The man smiled and bent down to give Pepper some attention. With that done, he stood back up and looked at me. Hi, I'm Jerry Reed. The man said to me as he walked closer and held his hand out. I shook his slightly damp hand. Nice to meet you. I'm Lily Thompson. He nodded, and Susan directed him to sit beside me. He sat down, and I had to fight not to fall into him. I looked the man over and I was even more worried about him going to my house. Once Jerry was comfortable, he turned to me. Now, what seems to be the problem? Your friend didn't give me any details. I picked up my phone from the coffee table and handed it to Jerry. I had already set the video up so that I could show it to him. Jerry frowned, but he took the phone and pressed play. The look on his face was the same as Susan's had been. After the video stopped, he sat, looking at me in surprise. Okay. Are you two playing a prank on me? I have other things to do with my day. He snapped as he looked between us. He handed my phone back to me and got up from the couch. Wait, I cried, afraid that he was going to walk out. Please, I need your help. This isn't a prank. It happened to me an hour and a half ago. He still looked skeptical, but he sat back down. Okay, I'm listening. But you have five minutes. So I told him about Susan bringing the egg back from Turkey, and how it had been sitting in a merchant's closet for several years. Then I explained where I had the egg. I told him that we all thought the egg was a fossil, and not something dangerous. He looked at me in disbelief. So, she bought an unknown egg from a merchant she didn't know. You took the egg and put it on a shelf. At no point did either of you think to get the egg identified. I don't know how your friend got it through customs. But something like this needs to be tested. For all you two knew, it could have had dangerous toxins in it. I felt my face flush in shame. And when I looked at Susan, I saw she was doing the same thing. He paused for a bit before he sighed. Sorry about losing my temper. I've seen too many things in the wrong person's hands. Before either of us could say anything, Jerry got up from the couch again. Never mind. I can see that neither of you thought about that. We shook our heads. And Jerry sighed. All right, give me your address, and I'll go and see if the creature is still there. I wrote my address down on a sheet of paper and handed it to Jerry. He nodded in thanks as he took the address from me. Then he told us he'd be back soon. I saw him pull out his phone and make a call. Now we had to wait for him to come back. As we were waiting, Susan left me in the living room to fix us something to eat. I wasn't really hungry, but it would give me something to do while we wait in. It took about two hours before Jerry came back. He wasn't alone this time. Following behind him were two people in dark colored suits. They looked like some kind of government employees to me. 
What did you find? I asked eagerly. I wanted to know if it was safe for me to go home or not. My colleagues will go over that with you. Jerry told me as he stepped to the side out of the way. One of the people in a dark suit walked over to me. He sat down beside me, and the woman with him stayed back like Jerry. You don't have to worry, ma'am. Your house was clean when we arrived. We cleaned up the mess and looked around outside. Whatever that creature was, it's gone now. Are you sure? I asked. I knew there was something they weren't telling me. The man nodded. Very sure. Now, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to get a copy of that video for our records. I frowned, but handed my phone over thinking that they were just going to make a copy. After fiddling with both phones for a bit, the man handed my phone back. I pressed on the power button, and I saw that he'd turned my phone off. I looked up to ask why he'd done that, but he and his partner were already heading to the door. I watched stunned at how quick the visit had been. When the front door slammed closed, Jerry stepped forward to talk to me. I'm sorry about that. I didn't know they were going to join me. I called for police backup, but they showed up instead. Did they tell you who they worked for? Jerry shook his head. No, my boss called me and told me to cooperate with whatever they needed. I looked at Susan in confusion. That's strange. Jerry nodded in agreement. The first time I've ever had government officials join me, but this was also one of my strangest calls. What did you find? I was wanting to ask them some questions, but they left so fast. I was told not to tell you anything for security reasons. It's your house, though, and you deserve some answers. By now, Jerry had moved over to sit in the chair across from me. Indeed, nothing was there. But there was something strange. On the table where the egg hatched, there was only an eggshell left. I gasped. Do you mean all the nasty liquid was gone? He nodded. Yes. And the eggshell looked like it had been gnawed on. The strangest thing, though, was the size of the prints left behind. What about them? I asked, leaning forward in eagerness. Jerry rubbed his chin for a bit, then he frowned. I saw the prints the creature made when it followed you to the door. It was the prints from the table to the back of the house that concerned me. Those prints were noticeably different from the front door. How were they different? Susan asked, jumping into the conversation. Jerry frowned at us. If you would quit interrupting, I can finish the story. We both mumbled apologies, and Jerry started talking again. The prints leading toward the back of the house were much bigger than the first prints. As far as we could tell, the creature is growing at an alarming rate. That was all I could see before the government people said that they were done looking. They rushed me out of the house before I could see anything else. The woman went back in after I was let out, and she came back out with a paper bag. I guess that she took the eggshells with her. That's all I know right now. There was silence when Jerry finished speaking. I was shocked that the creature could be even bigger than what it was when I ran. So that's it? Are they going to let that thing run loose? What if it kills someone? I asked, feeling frustrated that seemingly nothing had been done. Jerry shrugged. I'm sorry, I don't have answers. Even what I told you could get me fired if it got back to my boss. I slumped back against the couch and remembered that my phone had been turned off. I held down the power button. As the phone started up, it loaded the new phone screen. I looked at my phone in disbelief. The man had done a factory reset. Susan saw the look on my face. Lily, are you alright? I snorted. No, I'm not. Not only do I have to be afraid of my own house, I have now lost everything that was on my phone that isn't backed up. Susan looked as stunned as I felt. What the hell? You can't do that. She cried in outrage. I sighed. Not only have they erased my phone, but we don't know where they came from. Susan deflated. Damn it. This is ridiculous. There's got to be something we could do. Jerry, who had been watching us, pushed himself up from the chair with a grunt. I'm sorry, ladies. I have other runs to make before my shift ends. Of course. I'm sorry for keeping you so long. I apologized. I stood up from the couch. I walked Jerry to the door, and before he stepped through the open door, he turned to me. He held out a piece of paper. Here's my number. If you have any more problems, give me a call took the paper. Thank you. I said with a smile of thanks. You're welcome, and I hope I don't have to tell you to keep this to yourself. I nodded, and when Jerry left, I closed and locked the door. I headed back into the living room. 
I told Susan about Jerry giving me his number, and that he asked me to keep quiet. She wasn't happy with the request, but we both knew it was better to keep quiet for now. That was six months ago, and I have since moved from that house. I couldn't bear to go back without knowing for sure where the creature had gone. I had movers pack up and move for me. I also donated my collection to a museum. Susan stopped buying things from markets for the same reason. I also got a new table not wanting to use something that had strange fluid on it. I'm telling this story because I can't keep silent any longer. I was also spurred on by the recent reports of pets going missing, and there's been at least one report of a child missing. I don't know if it's connected to the creature or not. I hope the child went missing some other way. Otherwise, I feel responsible for letting the creature roam free. That's all I know for now. I'll leave you with the name I have come up with for the creature. I've been calling it Ancient Evil. Although, I don't know how old the egg was before it hatched. As per the college curriculum, I'm required to take some science classes for my general education credits. Considering all the horror stories of how bad biology and chemistry classes were, I figured geography would be one of the easier classes to take. Well, I didn't research into the exact geography class I was taking, so by the time I realized it was a decently tough class, it was too late. However, the starting stench of it wore off after a while, especially after getting help from my professor. Dr. Carter. Unlike most professors at my school, Dr. Carter tried to take the class as easy as possible, and he was more than willing to take time out of his day to sit with students and help teach the material. I met with him during his office hours once or twice every month to get help on the material, and each time he made it so much easier to understand the work before me. Throughout our six or so meetings, I got to know Dr. Carter quite well. Even though he was small and a skinny middle-aged man, he was heavy into outdoor stuff. He had told us in class some of his adventures hiking in national parks, deep sea diving, and exploring out into areas none of us had even heard of. It was very evident he was passionate about his hobbies. I have a strong feeling that he would have done it full-time had he not become a teacher. Also in our meetings, as we would wrap up going over material, Dr. Carter would ask me how things were going. He always liked to hear how his students were handling other classes, and just college life in general. He would share what he was currently trying to do at the moment, which was mostly exploring. During our last meeting in person together, he told me that he was having trouble searching for some mine shaft out in a desert-like area, way out on the outskirts of the university's town. I've been trying to find it for a month now, he told me. I've been exploring and hiking in that area for a while, and not once did I ever see it. But on that one day, I found it there. I don't know how to describe it. What did you say it was again? I asked him. It was a mine shaft or cave, he said. I think it was the former because its entrance was a large hole in the ground, and the only way to go down inside it was by using a connected ladder. I know that area like the back of my hand, and I've been there every weekend since I've seen it, but I haven't seen it since. So why do you keep looking for it? I asked. It might have been a mirage or something like that. I felt something while I was there. This feeling of bliss. Like, whatever was down there was nothing but amazing. I know it sounds weird, but I had never felt a feeling like that before in my life, and I want to feel it again. I looked at him when he said that. His gray eyes were full of fascination and desperation. If it wasn't evident how much he wanted to find it by how he was speaking, the look in his eyes made it crystal clear. Look, that might be a bad idea, I said. I don't know why, but I felt that something was off about this mine shaft. Oh, I know, he said. The whole thing sounds sketchy for sure, but I have to prove to myself that what I saw was in fact real, and I really want to experience that feeling again and explore what is down there. Both perplexed and creeped out by his fascination for this mysterious mine shaft, I decided to leave. I told Dr. Carter to be careful, and that if he ever found it again, to let me know. He told me he would, and I walked out of his office. That was the last time I saw Dr. Carter before our school shut down due to the pandemic. Later that week, he sent us an email, stating that he was going to post all our remaining homework and class activities online, 
and that he would be available via video conference in case we needed help with anything. Since I just wanted to get everything over with, I decided to complete all of the homework way before the end of the year. After doing so, all that was left to do was to wait for the final exam. We had taken our latest exam the day before the official shutdown, so this would be the only exam being given online for the class. I found last part of the material pretty understandable, so I felt no need to ever contact Dr. Carter, and the story of that mine shaft fell into the back compartment of my brain. Dr. Carter would email us once or twice a week, letting us know of any errors or updates to any remaining homework and such. He also sent a link to use in order to contact him in case we had any questions or concerns regarding the class. However, he sent his last email to the class two weeks ago. I wasn't the only one who noticed. Some of the other students in our class group chat also mentioned that they noticed Dr. Carter hadn't been answering any emails or video calls for a while now. With the exam inching closer and closer, many of the students began to freak out more and more. He had told us early on what the exam would be on, but of course, there would be other students who wanted to talk to him just one more time before the exam took place. A part of me did worry a bit for Dr. Carter. In fact, after remembering our last meeting, I began wondering if he indeed had found the mind shaft, but either got hurt or stuck without alerting anyone beforehand. It's not like I could do much to help. He never told me where exactly he had seen this place, and I lived in another city, so I had no clue where to even look. Still, I did send an email to both Dr. Carter and the head of the geography department at my school. The department had responded very quickly, saying that she had been hearing about him not replying back, and that if she didn't hear back within 24 hours, then she would be calling the police to perform a wellness check. She promised to update me if she heard back, and I told her I would do the same. This morning, I heard the phone ding with an email notification. I looked to see I had received an email from Dr. Carter. I let out a sigh of relief as I opened it, expecting to see another update about the exam or an email from him personally saying that he was okay. Instead, all that it contained was a link. I checked back to his older emails, and it was the same link he had used for people to video call him with. I did feel slightly concerned when I noticed that. Why would he send just a link to his students? But then, I noticed that I seemed to be the only person receiving this email. To clarify, the to bar in each of his emails would be jam-packed with 100 other email addresses, as he always sent out his emails in one large group. In this email, however, it was just me. I don't know why, but something felt very, very wrong about this email. Yet... And I still wanted to make sure he was at least alive, so I decided to click the link and call him. I sat in the waiting room for about five minutes, and just when I was about to leave, I heard the other end pick up. Hello? Dr. Carter said in a weird, almost completely different voice. I looked up and felt chills go down my spine. Dr. Carter was staring at me through the computer with this large smile plastered on his face. But then I noticed some other peculiarities. Part of his hair looked like it had been ripped out of his scalp. Some of his front teeth were now gone. And he had several bruises on his face. His eyes were also open as wide as possible. Uh, hi doctor. I said. So good to see you again. He responded, a smile still wide on his lips. Did, did you find that place you were looking for? I asked him. Oh indeed. He responded gleefully. I went down there, and can you guess what I found? I remained silent, not finding the ability to open my mouth and speak out of fear. Go on, yes, he said. That feeling you felt? I said, a quiver of fear in my voice. Yeah, but not only that, I even found a gift for my troubles. I found some new friends. Wait, what? I said. You know, I kind of wished others could have come with me, because they all wanted to leave. I could bring only one home, though. I couldn't fit the rest. The remaining ones still need a new home, but more people need to come visit them for that to happen. It would be quite the adventure indeed. I was petrified as I watched him gleefully say this, his eyes and smile seemingly getting wider. I truly thought Dr. Carter had lost his mind, and what I was experiencing before me 
was a Class A breakdown. I even found it on a map so I can show it to you. He said. That way, you can go on your own if you want. Dr. Carter got up from his chair and began walking to a closet behind him. That's when things got scarier. His walk was so deformed. I can't even describe it correctly, but the closest thing I can think of is if all the bones in his legs were broken, but he could still manage to hold all of his weight. I looked at his pants, and I noticed what appeared to be claw marks running up and down them. I even noticed that the back of his shirt was also ripped, and a major open wound was visible inside the holes. He then turned back to the camera while carrying the map. I became fixated on the crazy look in his eyes. That's when I noticed something I had missed earlier that made my stomach drop and all the blood inside me turned to ice. His once gray eyes were now the color blue. Uh, doctor? What happened to your eyes? I asked as I moved my cursor over to the end call button, anticipating the worst. Dr. Carter stopped walking and dropped the map to the ground. He looked up at me and I discovered his smile had disappeared. His face began contorting into one of extreme anger and astonishment, like I had discovered his darkest secret. Then, Dr. Carter opened his mouth almost twice as large as any human could, and let out the most unhuman, ear-piercing shriek I'd ever heard. I threw my headphones away from my head while I clicked the uncall button, just as Dr. Carter lunged toward the screen. I sat in my chair, catching my breath for a few minutes. I then called the police to let them know what had just happened. The dispatcher told me that she would be sending an officer over to my house to take my statement, and that she would be contacting Dr. Carter's town's police department to check on him. Since I lived a bit of the way outside my town, I knew it would take some time for the police to arrive to my house. I called my mom, whose place of employment was still open despite the pandemic, to let her know what just happened. Given how distressed I was on the phone, she told me she was on her way home and would let me know when she got into the neighborhood. I sat in my room, practically shaking from the fear inside of me. About ten minutes later, I heard a knock on the door, and a muffled voice sang, Police. I got up, and quickly approached the door. As I passed by the main window, I saw both my mom's car and the police car parked in the driveway. I checked my phone, but the last text I had gotten from my mom was the day prior. She always texted me when she got in the neighborhood, yet her car was parked and empty in our driveway. I then heard the voice say, Police. Again. And I felt my entire world collapse around me when I realized that it was the same voice I had first heard come from Dr. Carter. Be careful on the internet because some of the sick stuff out there will scar your soul. It all happened when I was just browsing the internet, scrolling through different posts and things like that. I was watching YouTube and an ad appeared to the left of my screen. It was some sort of skeleton mask and words underneath saying, Want a good scare? Click here. I ignored it like I do with every other advertisement and moved on. I then saw it back again on another video I clicked on. So my curiosity peaked and I clicked on the damn skeleton. I wish I never clicked on that damn skeleton. It brought me to this website that really didn't have much on it, except a About Us section and a phone number for contact. So I clicked on the About Us section and it brought up a chat box. It said, What can I help you with? Thinking it was some dumb robot, I said, What do you guys do? I hit enter on my keyboard and I waited for a response. The person replied and said, We are an extreme scare group that will scare you or your friends for nothing in return. We have groups located in every U.S. state. Please contact this phone number for more information. Goodbye now. So, that is all the info they could give me. I did the only thing anyone else would have done. Called the phone. I called it, and it didn't pick up. Someone then texted me from that number. Hello, I am your skeleton associate. How may I help? I thought that this had to be some scam or something. Like, when are they going to ask for my credit card number or something? Anyways, I texted back, scare me. Easy two words that I never put too much thought into. He replied with, yes, we have a team in North Carolina waiting approval. I said, what approval? He sent three different waivers. He said, fill these out and we shall start. 
I was really interested now and filled them out, reading some of it over, but thought to myself how bad could it be. This probably would be the best example on why you should always read the fine print, he said. Great, confirmation is complete. They are on their way now, I replied with. What do you mean, on their way? He ended the messages with, enjoy your time, SM. Well, that was a waste of time. What did he mean by on their way? Like, who was on their way? It's weird that he got my state, but that's from my postal code. Maybe he just is trying to scare me. I looked up the phone number online and nothing came up. Zero information. It was like a ghost. I quickly called back the phone number that I called earlier, and with my luck it said, This line has been disconnected. Please call back later. Thank you. Oh shit. Later that night, I was walking my dog. We went around the block like always, so nothing different except there was. The strange thing that night, there was a van parked a little bit away from my house. A car or two away. It was a black van with someone in it. I couldn't make out anything because it was very far away. I told my dog to hurry up and I started walking back to my house. As I was walking back to my house, I saw who was in the van. It was a man dressed in all black with a skeleton skull mask that wrapped all the way around his head. There was black covering his eyes so I couldn't see who was wearing it. He was just staring at me, walking back to my house. My stomach dropped as I saw this. Remembering what I clicked on earlier with the skeleton ad, and how they were on their way to me. Fuck. I really didn't think he was telling the truth. How did this group even find me so quick? Maybe it was because of my stupid mistake of clicking on that stupid ad in the first place. I was looking over my shoulder until I got back in my house, closed the front door and locked it. I never was so shaken up about anything until this point. I knew that they were here for me. I didn't know if I should call the cops or not. Like, why were they just sitting out there? There was a spotlight on their car from the streetlight that I could see from my window. I was peeking out my bedroom blinds, and all of a sudden the streetlight went out. It just sparked up, and blew a socket or something. Then I saw three men get out of the back of the van. They were all wearing the same damn mask. Skeleton. I was freaking out at this point. I had no idea what to do. I had a couple of knives that I had collected over the years, and took one from my closet. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, I heard a crash of breaking glass downstairs. Fuck, fuck, fuck. They're in the house. They broke the living room window, and I heard them walking around downstairs. They were also talking, saying something about, don't hurt him, just bring him with us. I couldn't make out everything they were saying, but I was relieved for a second, and then heard one coming up the steps. My adrenaline shot back up, and I was in fight or flight mode now. I felt so damn ready for one of these pricks to just come into my room, and I was going to stab them so fast they wouldn't even see it coming. Then all I saw from the corner of my eye, a man wearing a skeleton mask holding an axe. He screamed at me, get down, I won't hurt you if you just listen. The other man that was coming up the stairs had jumped on me, throwing the knife away from me. We wrestled until the other man in the room came over and put a plastic bag around my head. Suffocating, I passed out and fell unconscious. I woke up somewhere. I had no clue where I was. I was strapped to this chair in the middle of this concrete building. There was nothing except concrete. I then heard they had kidnapped me. And I could be miles from home now. Hell, I could be miles from civilization now. This place looked like it had been abandoned for years. All of a sudden, I heard a noise. It came from behind me and it was a loud bang. Like something had dropped on the ground. It echoed through the building. Hello? Peter? Are you ready to play our game? Get the fuck out of here, you sick fuck. I was so pissed that he thought kidnapping someone was a game. I said, you're a psychopath, you know. He replied laughing. Oh, I've known that for years. Tell me something new. I was in a bad situation and had to think how to get out. He said, do you like swimming? As soon as he said that, the three men came back out. One of them kicked the chair down so I was laying on my back with my hands and feet still tied. They laid a dirty rag over my face and started pouring gallons of water on me. If this is the worst, I don't know what is. They waterboarded me for what seemed to be like hours. To my knowledge, it was only a couple minutes. I passed out from the loss of oxygen. Felt like I was drowning. I couldn't do anything but take it. I later woke up in a dark room. It had six walls of concrete and a ultraviolet light. There was a message on the wall written in some type of paint, only viewed in the purple light. It glue, 
welcome to hell. I thought to myself that there isn't much I could say that wouldn't make this place seem like hell. Someone came in and kneed me in my face. My nose bleeding, I fell on the ground. It was a cold, hard ground, he said. Let's go play, shall we, Peter? It was the same skeleton man. He picked me up and threw a black mask over my face so I couldn't see anything. I was dropped in a dark room that was very gross and smelled awful. I couldn't see anything in there. But the smell made me want to puke. I gagged a couple of times. I then heard a whisper. It was very faint, but I made it out to be an old man. He was saying something like, Help me. And it was coming from the corner of the room. I crawled over, and what I saw terrifies me to this day. It was an old man with a giant gash slice across his stomach. He had his hands on it. Blood was everywhere. I can still imagine that sight to this day. He said one other thing to me. Run. There was a bang and a door opened. I smelt gasoline and heard a chainsaw start up. The humming of the engine ripping in my ears. And I was shoved away from the giant man. He had a skeleton mask on and had a chainsaw in his hands. He went at the old man lying on the ground. I heard him scream. That scream haunts me to this day. I ran out of that room as fast as I could. I ran into a hallway that was made of concrete to no windows. Multiples of the same exact room. It was like tiny little torture rooms. It was horrifying. I knew if I stopped running that I would be dead. I came to two turns. I went left, and someone was standing in the middle of the hallway. I turned around as quick as possible, and that man with the chainsaw grabbed me with his bloody hands and took me to the ground. I hit my head against the concrete, and that man put a syringe in my neck. I fell asleep instantly. I was violently awoken by someone throwing me in the back of a van. The doors were shut and locked. No windows. This was the same exact van that was out front of my house the other night. It was shaky. There were tons of bumps along the way. It was like we were on a gravel road or something. I had my head covered with a bag and my mouth taped shut. There were cable ties around my hands and feet. I was sliding all over the place in the back of that van. The sunlight shone through the bag as the door was opened. Someone said, Grab him, and took me outside. I was pushed down on my hands on what felt like sand. It made sense, and all I kind of lived near the outer banks. I was familiar with the feel of that sand, and someone violently took the bag off and ripped off the tape from my mouth. I said crying, I just want to go home. Please don't kill me. Looking down, I started to break down. There was an empty coffin made of wood dug out from the sand of the beach. I looked around and no one was to be seen for miles. There were also four shovels and four men standing around me all wearing the same skeleton mask. I cried once again. You don't have to do this. I have a family. At that point, I was sobbing and couldn't stop. Someone took me by my arms and said get in. They pushed me down into the coffin. Someone quickly closed the coffin and I was stuck in it. There was a video camera that had a red blinking light above me. These sick fucks are recording me. My hands still zip-tied. I was hopeless. I heard sand being poured over the coffin. Little by little, I felt the oxygen leaving the coffin. I was being buried alive. I knew if I started to panic, that I would lose air more quickly by hyperventilating. I started to breathe very slowly, waiting for my death. Waiting for my last hopeless breath of life to leave me. I then took my last breath. I felt my soul leave at that moment. I thought I was dead. I guess I just passed out. I awoke with my hands and feet free. I was in a ditch down the street from my house. No bag over my head or tape on my mouth. There was one thing though. A grey skeleton mask beside me. It had a note in it. It said, Hope you enjoyed our once in a lifetime opportunity to be scared by the best. S.M. I knew exactly what S.M. stood for too. Skeleton man. Look, if you could learn anything from this story, I would want one thing and one thing only. Be careful on the internet. Never click anything that doesn't have anything to do with you. If you think something is suspicious online, then you're probably right. All websites give up information on you. Some just exploit that and things can go very bad. If you ever see a skeleton man ad on the internet, or anything that has to do with scaring people with a skeleton, just do yourself a favor and don't click it. The thing that watched me in my slumber. Retiring to my bed drunk and tired, 
With all the lights in my house snuffed and the only visibility provided was the vague streetlight outside, a dim shade of amber, my bed resides on its long side against my window and at either end draped my black curtains. In my drunken state of obnoxious grogginess, I was mildly aroused by slight movement. My intoxicated mind picked up from the curtain by my head. Rising from my laying position, I examined the black fabric, searching behind it for any home invaders hiding maliciously. There was nothing. I slumped back into my bed, returning to my drunkenness, petty thoughts and old memories loitering within my foolish mind. Again, more movement from the curtain. I was somewhat unnerved now rather than curious and grabbed the curtain, flinging it left and right in an attempt to discard of any bugs that might be disturbing it. Yet again, I was met with nothing. For fuck's sake, I just want to sleep, I groaned. After a few minutes, I eventually fell into a deep, drunken slumber. I had a strange dream that night, probably from the alcohol. Glimmering eyes peered down at me from the curtain, as if itself was watching me. A long black appendage grew from the broad fabric and reached down to me with lengthy fingers, darker than night that entered through my mouth and descended down my throat, touching my soul. Such a vivid and peculiar dream. I could see a diabolical glee in the eyes amidst the black curtain. It felt disturbingly real, awakening to the golden morning light illuminating my face and drowning my sight in a cloak of yellow. I inhaled heavily and rubbed the sleep from my eyes. I sat up, my mouth was dry, my head vaguely sore, and my throat was also somewhat raw. Confused, I massaged it with my hand and rose from the bed. I peered at the curtain suspiciously. It draped down the wall as it usually did, while glimpses of the nightmare returned. A vague chill ran down my spine, as if it were attempting to skedaddle from some nearby danger unknown to me. I went on with my day as usual. Over the next few days, I grew wary of my curtain. Ever since that nightmare, strange occurrences would happen involving the length of fabric. I awoke one morning, half asleep as I screamed while jolting up from my bed in fear. At first, I thought a tall man in a black suit was staring down at me from the wall. I came to and realized it was nothing but my curtain. I feared I was going mad. I would come home to the curtain move slightly, giving me an overall uncomfortable vibe. One day the paranoia grew overwhelming, causing me to charge at the curtain with a knife. In a fit of rage, I stabbed at it while screaming like a madman. Halfway into my vicious attack on the fabric, goosebumps rose from my skin, and amidst the madness, I couldn't help but feel I was aggravating something I shouldn't be. I vacated my room, and decided to sleep on the sofa from then on. The dreams were not halting. One unforgettable night. I vividly dreamt I was naked and bound to the living room floor on my stomach by some invisible force. In front of me was my bedroom door. It began to open, emitting a chilling creak as it did so. Appearing from behind the door was an inky black shapeless thing. It glided over to me and laid close to my face. A pair of eternally dark eyes materialized from the blackness, burning through my eyes and into my soul. It began to rise and enshrouded my whole body. I felt a cold, smoke-like sensation rise up my leg. An elongated appendage of some sort grew and invaded me. I could feel it in my body, unable to move or fight back. I was helpless and fell into impotent weeping. I could do nothing but wait for this infernal nightmare to end. My closed eyelids were illuminated by the dawn. I opened my groggy eyes, adjusted to my surroundings gradually. And at the realization of where I lay, I became utterly horrified. I was laying on my stomach, nude and facing my bedroom door which stood halfway open. With the cursed black curtain in the distance behind it, I looked around helplessly, hoping it was just a mere nightmare. I curled up into a ball and wept. Enough was enough. I couldn't be in that house anymore. Not with that thing. The sheer claustrophobic paranoia was crushing my very existence. In a rush, I gathered what I could, spending as little time around the bastard curtain as possible, all the while feeling its eyes on me. Exiting the house and slamming the door behind me, I drove to the closest bar. Whilst driving, I gradually became more awake, and the sheer horror of last night's happenings began to truly set in. 
almost as if my mind was summoning a protection of sorts for my mental well-being. It muffled the scenes and sensations as best it could. At the bar, somewhat uncomfortable resting my weights on my backside upon the stool, I ordered a straight whiskey. Down the hatch it went, stinging my coarse throat from the screaming. A single tear of melancholy fell from my right eye. I felt dirty, violated, utterly and horrifyingly perplexed. Another whiskey, please, I ordered with a meek voice. About 9 p.m. I rocked up in the driveway, astounded at how I returned in one piece, as I could hardly stand, and distinguished three versions of everything. A wave of confidence fueled by rage bewitched me by the gift of alcohol. I slammed open the door and screamed demon. In my right hand was a canister of patrol I had picked up on the way back, and in my left was the cigarette I had been toking on during the ride home. Stumbling through the living room, and entering my room I stood face to face with the abominable, draping black curtain and stared the evil thing down. Treading over, I opened the canister and began drenching the fabric in patrol while cursing at it with malice. I'm gonna burn you, motherfucker. I turned to my bedroom door. Turning around, I faced down the curtain once more, taking one last drag of my cigarette before flicking it onto the curtain. It roared up in flames, an ear-piercing wail sounded, a sound best described as hate. I witnessed and perplexed as the curtain began twisting and screaming, the metallic rings clacking against the rail while it rapidly writhed in pain. Among the red flames spawned those two familiar diabolical eyes within the fabric, filled with animosity. Still watching in terror, the curtain tore off the rail violently and morphed into black shapes drenched in flames. The demonic thing flew from each end of the room with such velocity, all the while shrieking with truly frightening, otherworldly roars. It landed on my bedroom floor in front of me for a split second before tearing its gaze back to me. Whilst fearful the thing would pounce for a final onslaught, we shared detestable eye contact before it swiftly hurled itself out through my window and into the dark night sky, the flame still shrouding its inky form. To this day, I am devoid of any idea of what that thing was, but whatever it was, it's evil. If it could take the form of my curtain, it could possibly morph into anything. To those reading this, please take dire caution. And always check your curtains. My fiance loved the spooky stories of the world. From horror video games or slasher flicks of the early 90s, he was hooked. He especially loved to explore abandoned places that had a history of spooky upbringings. One of his biggest achievements was spending the whole night in a haunted hotel in our area. He even had a blog where he documented all the mysteries he uncovered exploring. I use the word had lightly. It wasn't the same after our trip to Bear Bridge. We weren't the same. I think something is off with him, but I can't put my finger on it. We've been drifting apart. The guy I once loved to talk to turned cold and unwilling to do anything. The only things he does do are eat, sleep, and watch. Watch the woods in the backyard to be more specific. Vinny wanted to try and find the mysterious and elusive bear man that supposedly lived there. I knew it wasn't real, but it was my job to humor him and tag along just to get away from the city for a bit. And hey, what could be better than spending the day in the woods with the man I loved, right? Just us this weekend, right? I said to him, sliding out of the passenger seat, my boots hitting the dirt. Oh, for sure. Just me, you, and Bear Man. He smiled and laughed to himself. Right, nothing like a romantic evening with two scary monsters. He punched my arm as we began to unpack the car. The drive up was calm with images of evergreen and brush clouding my sight. As I looked out the window, the wind sang a mysterious tune as Vin and I stood and looked at the campground. Not a single person was there, which was out of the ordinary for this time of year. Spooky stuff, huh, Bon? Vincent said from behind me as a truck pulled into our campsite. I turned around to look at him right as the man stepped out of his vehicle. How do you two? He introduced, looking at us up and down. What brings a happy couple like you to Bear Bridge? Looking to get a little roughed up? He laughed to himself and then added, I'm joking with you kids. I know why you're here. I'm Mr. Cassidy. 
You fellas want to look for that bear man, don't you? Vincent looked at me and back to the old man. Yeah, he said. And what about it? What about it? What about it? Sonny, you and your little bow here are looking for a death wish. The man looked at Vinny with cold eyes and then to me. It seemed like he was staring into my soul. His light blue eyes seemed like oceans crashing, never ending. It was like a trance. I couldn't break it until Vin came over and put his hand on my shoulder. He always knew how to make me feel better. Listen, the old man began. I don't want no trouble here. I just want to make sure you kids are safe. Many people haven't been around here no more since the sightings. Sightings? Vincent said. The man leaned up against his truck and tipped the faded blue snapback he wore as he began to speak. When I was a little boy, my mom and pops moved up here to get away from city folk. We didn't fit in much around industrial people. We liked to fish and hunt, keep to ourselves. But when we got here, pops knew better than to let his little boy go out. He said there's more than just bear and mountain lion in these here woods. Something not from this world. Nothing like your bear man. That serial killer is long dead, son. Something else. Something sinister. He paused and looked at us again. Kind of longing. Not like how he was before. He seemed almost sad. What does your story have to do with us being here? Vinny snapped. I hit his shoulder and looked at him disgusted. I didn't know if he knew that I wanted to hear what the man had to say. Something about him interested me, and I sort of believed him. I couldn't place my finger on it then, but looking back at it now, he was trying to warn us. Fine. I was going to be all sappy to get you to listen, but I'll cut to the chase. My mom and pop died in these here woods. No, not from some claw. Natural causes is all. Old age catches up to a person in lightning speed. My pop's last words were, William, you make sure anyone that comes into these woods makes it out alive. But when they died, couldn't find their bodies. It was strange. Even my mother's prized pearls were gone. They up and left me. He left me. She left me. Everyone left, boy, and they're never coming back. So I want you and your girl here to get out of my woods and never come back. Go find your bear man somewhere else. He looked at us in a sort of rage, the sadness and sincerity in his eyes before he left, and he actually pegged me as someone who wanted us to get out. Vin wasn't having any of what Mr. Cassidy was saying, though, and eventually threatened to call the cops on him for evasion of privacy. I didn't think he could do that, but it drove the poor man away. Kind of felt bad for him. I was actually kind of interested in what he was saying, even though I didn't believe in the unknown. Eventually, we both got settled in and started up a fire. The cold April air danced on my cheeks as the wind's tune became a chorus of song, rising and falling with the flames of our amateur fire. It died as soon as the rustling started. I was getting ready for bed when a twig snapped in the distance. I turned behind me and looked into the pitch black woods. It was weird. I just now noticed that when I got to the site that there were no animals, no birds, deer, squirrels, chipmunks, not even crickets. Hey, Vin, I said looking around. Vin? I turned around again, but he wasn't anywhere to be seen. I looked into the trees, the trees that loomed above me like skyscrapers. I thought he was right by the fire. Or was it the tent? I couldn't remember. I began to walk around the site and look for him. Vincent? I called. Vinny? I kept calling his name over and over and over and over until the beat-up red truck pulled into our sight again. Mr. Cassidy stepped out of his truck and made his way towards me. I assume they got him, huh? He began as he finally got closer. I told you kids to leave. I was just trying to do what my pops told me to do. But nobody listens to old men, do they? You kids need to learn to listen instead of getting into things you have no business getting into. I don't know where he is or what happened. I croaked. Tears began to well in my eyes, and I just wanted to go home. I wanted to find Vincent and leave. I wanted to get out, but the worst was still yet to come. Okay, okay, don't get all hysterical. We'll find him. Mr. Cassidy became sincere and understanding. It was strange how his personality changed so quickly. We got into his truck and drove down the beaten path deep into the woods. 
The trees soared above us as the radio crackled in old 50s tune. Mr. Cassidy hummed along and turned it up. I looked in front of us into the night, just as a finger stumbled onto the dirt path. The old man slammed on the brakes as the headlights illuminated Vincent covered in dirt. Green eyes wide. They reminded me of an owl's, searching for prey. Oh my god, Vin! I screamed and bolted out of the car. Mr. Cassidy was right behind me cursing and came to my side. I bent down and touched Vinny's face looking at the cuts he got from running through the woods. What happened? I said pleading. These things, Bon. They chased me out of the sight when I turned my back for a second. I heard whispers. These creatures. He was right. Vincent's voice cracked and he began to sob. I had never seen him cry before. We have to get out of here. The fear in his voice and expression turned to seriousness at his last statement. Okay, let's go. Mr. Cassidy, can you please get us out of here? I pleaded. I don't think that's a good idea, girl. When they've got eyes on someone, they don't let go. What the hell are you talking about? Can't you see he's hurt? Please help me. I started to lift Vincent up and drag him towards the car. Finally, the old man helped and we got Vinny into the back. As we drove away from the scene, I couldn't help but get the feeling I was being watched. Driving down the darkened road, Vincent groaned in the back. I didn't realize how hurt he actually was until we got him into the truck. I turned around to look at him and came face to face with yellow eyes. In the bed of the pickup stood a creature, no taller than four feet, and arms down to the floor. It looked like a chimp without hair. Its skinniness made it cruel looking. Its ears and nose were like a bat, and it blinked as it looked at me. As my eyes met its yellow lemon-shaped ones, it smiled a sharp-toothed grin and raised its long claw to tap on the glass. Tap, tap, tap it went, and then pointed at Vin, writhing in the back seat. It raised its talon to its disgusting blood-covered mouth in a shh motion and jumped off the bed like a jaguar. I turned quickly to Mr. Cassidy and whispered, Floor it. What are you talking about? He began as he turned towards me, taking his eyes off the road for a split second. And the second he did, he slammed into the new creature standing right in front of us. We felt a bump under us as the car stopped abruptly. Oh God, no, Mr. Cassidy said. I need to check the tires. This truck is old. I don't know if they're blown or not. It will only take a minute. He got out of the car stumbling, and I watched him bend down in front of the right tire, then to the left. This time it took longer. His body was out of sight and by the wheel. I looked forward into the night and saw dozens of eyes, different shades of yellow, orange, red, and purple staring at the truck from in the dark, and it hit me. The creature committed suicide to get us to stop, so they could come. I rolled down the window as fast as I could and yelled at the old man to get him back into the car. He stood up and looked at me. I was too slow as one of the purple-eyed monsters jumped out from the bushes onto Mr. Cassidy's back and ripped into him like a child on Christmas morning. It opened his jaws and bit into the old man with so much force he almost split in two. The pearls around its neck were the last thing I saw before the truck was swarmed with creatures of all shapes and sizes. The only thing similar was the lack of hair and grayness of their bodies. They looked like they lacked the nutrients of a person alive. They seemed almost dead. As they approached, I scrambled into the driver's seat and stepped on the gas. Flying through the woods, we made it halfway through the forest. As I drove, I kept looking behind and around me to see tons of eyes staring at us from the darkness. They didn't attack, though. Not like they did with Mr. Cassidy. They just observed. As we neared the main road, I turned back one more time to look at Vinny, and then turned forward to see a creature, about six feet, standing in front of the truck. Its skin wasn't a faded gray like the others. It was fresh and light. Its claws touched the grass beneath it, and it raised an arm to adjust the blue snapback on its head to reveal a pair of bright blue eyes staring into my soul. I drove, not caring if I killed him or not. All I cared about was Vin and getting him help. I was about 10 feet away from the creature as he jumped out of sight and back into the woods. He just let us pass. Mr. Cassidy let us leave. I breathed a sigh of relief as the dirt road became paved and the light of the stars became city scrapers and the quiet noises of the forest became the bustling noises of people. I got Vincent to the hospital and he was treated. 
with a sprained ankle and a concussion. The doctor said he was alright to go home in a few days. We told the doctors he got lost and tripped while midnight hiking. They seemed like they believed us. But I couldn't stop thinking about the old man and how he just let us go. At home now, it's different. Vinny doesn't do anything he used to love. He's a sack. He just eats, sleeps, and watches the backyard. I try to ask him what he's looking for, but he never gives me a real response. Just some muttering of, the skinned. I really hope he isn't talking about the creatures we saw in the woods. I want to leave all of that in the past. I want to believe it wasn't real. I want to believe it was all our imagination. But with the way he's acting, I don't know if I can. Something changed today as the wind howled and the weather forecast spoke of a thunderstorm rolling in from up north. Vincent got up from the couch and stood at the back door for the first time since we got back from the trip. He smiled as the sky turned gray and the clouds became dark. Vin, what are you doing? I asked, moving to stand next to him, coffee in hand, looking out the door too. Pony, he whispered, staring at me. They're here. The little grin he had before turned into a wild smile as my mouth dropped. There in the backyard of our house stood dozens upon dozens of creatures, once big and small, with eye colors different shades of the rainbow all staring into my soul, and in the middle of them all stood the tallest one, a creature with the bluest eyes I had ever seen, with the same color snapback he had on the day he died. The woods around my town are haunted by an unspeakable evil, a monster that lurks in the darkest hollows of the dead oaks. Growing up, I always heard stories, savage tales of lost children turning up weeks later in varying states of decaying pieces. I never truly believed them. I mean, why would you? After all, spooky stories are just that, stories. That was, till I was 17. The local news erupted with a story. A boy of 10, named Tommy, had wandered into the woods one day, maybe in search of slow worms and other critters. He had gone around 1pm and not returned for his curfew of 6pm. He was searched for by many of the town's folks, but to no avail. His body was never found, well, was never found whole. Three weeks after the disappearance, parts of his body were recovered from the part of the woods known as the Grove, a thickly grown part of the woods where sunlight never reached. The grove was avoided by all the townsfolk. I had once walked near and heard such strange noises that I ran away fast. Many of the locals didn't believe in the monster in the woods, but I couldn't help but think there was some truth in it. The running theory was the boy had been taken by a very human killer. My morbid curiosity led me to read up on the subject in the local news archive. The cases began in 1990. 30 years had gone by, and in that time, there had been 15 cases. That was 15 children of the local area who had gone missing in the woods and turned up in pieces weeks later. That very fact gave me a chilling feeling. My heart broke when I'd seen the many pictures of them. The ages ranged from 5 to 12. They all went missing in the same sort of area. After so many hours, my mind and heart could not take any more of the research. It was horrifying to think of a small child so lost and afraid in the woods, lured to its demise. A few months had passed and I occasionally dipped back into the research. It never truly went anywhere. I had hit a wall. Evidence of any kind of human killer was thin on the ground. No one had ever been suspected of the crimes, ever. In fact, no real evidence had ever come to light. It was truly a mystery. I brought up maps on my laptop, zoomed into my town, and then into the woods. I found a grove on the aerial view. The dense tree lines stood out from the rest immensely. The dark foreboding patch of green and black gave me the creeps, as if its evil oozed from every pixel on my screen. I sat thinking for a while, staring at the screen transfixed by the dark patches. I had to visit this area. That in and of itself was a bad idea. Whatever lay within the confines of the grove's tangled roots, be it man or monster, surely would take me too. The next day, I packed a torch, survival kit, and knife, and my phone with a power bank. It was spring and the weather was fair, so I decided to wear a hoodie and jeans. I grabbed my stuff and left my house, and headed towards the woods. 
It took me about 30 minutes to get to the tree line. The first trees were the youngest saplings. As I traveled deeper, the trees got older and thicker. I followed one of the many trails. They all entwined somewhere along the line. Until I arrived on the outskirts of the grove. I knew I had arrived by the difference in the light. Everything was darker here. The birds didn't come to this part of the woods. The sunlight stayed away too. I felt the hairs on my neck stand on end. An eerie feeling washed over me. I was being watched. I found a relatively clear part of the thick bush and trees and broke through. The grove was dark. The smell of rot hung in the air. The total area was no more than the size of half a football field. Many trees dotted around. Most were big, beastly specimens with a canopy that engulfed the sky, blocking the light. I looked around myself. If I had seen a picture of my viewpoint, I'd believe it to be of any wood in the country. Yet in person, the malevolent atmosphere was oppressive. The trees in the grove had all black trunks. The scattered boulders were thickly covered in mosses of greens and browns. I began to walk around, using the torch to see in the dim light. There was nothing disturbing in the area. As I walked past a particularly large tree, I spotted something blue in the decaying leaves and dirt of the ground. I picked it up. A scrap of fabric, most likely clothing. An image flashed back to me of the children. He had been wearing a blue jersey in the picture. My stomach dropped. Somehow. The situation had just become terribly real to me now. I walked further past a large boulder. Beyond the boulder, hidden by bushes of holly, I noticed a dark mouth to a cave. My nerves had all but left me by now. The deathly silence of the grove somehow managed to crush my spirit. It was as if the trees themselves sapped my heart of all the goodness to be had in the world, growing new branches on the desolation of man. I stood and looked at the mouth of the cave like a hungry monster beckoning me further to be its latest meal. A cool breeze was coming from the cave, yet no trees or leaves moved in its exhale. I took my first step towards the opening. Fear was building the closer I got. When I stood a meter away, I could make out a few steps into the gloom. The rest was a scarlet sheet of unknown darkness. A cold breeze had now shifted its direction, inhaling me into its mouth, the unnatural force of the wind, pushing my back, made me stumble forward towards the opening. As I entered the cave, darkness swallowed my world. I was greeted by a disgusting smell, ammonia and sulfur. I recognized it from the chemical works in town. I started to root in my bag until I found my torch. My hand rested on the handle of the bowie knife I had brought with me. It was probably a good idea to keep it in my hand ready. Around me was dirt and rocks. It looked as if someone had tunneled into the ground through the rocks and dirt to create a cave. I turned the light on. My meager circle of light illuminated small sections of the walls and floor. I was on edge, waiting for whatever lurked in the dark to jump out at me and take me from the mortal world into the next plains of suffering, but nothing did. Instead, the stench of the cave grew more horrific as I descended into the unknown. The chemical smells infused with the unmistakable stench of death. As I reached the end of the tunnel, a sudden noise penetrated the silent darkness. Movement ahead of me. I wasn't alone. I slowly moved the lights around in front of me, trying to find the source of the noise. My hand shook slightly, making the beam of light shake. Shadows danced around the visible portion of the cave. From what I could see, the tunnel opened up into a small cavern. I took a step forward. My foot crushed something on the floor with a sickening, snapping noise. I shone the light down at my feet in a panic. Under my foot, snapped clean in two was a bone. A small thigh bone to be exact. I shit myself. Terror had been steadily since I entered the cave, but now my panic levels were maxed out. I gave a cry of horror at the sight of the small bone. It was definitely from one of the children who had gone missing. Lost in the pure terror and grief of the situation, I was brought back to reality as I heard a noise behind me. A scuttling noise, like you would expect from a vermin in a back alley dumpster. Only the noise was being made by something much larger. I wheeled around, brought both hands up in instinct. The knife poised in my hand, aimed into the darkness. I used the torch to scan the area. Nothing. I heard the scuttle again, behind me deeper into the cavern. 
I spun around, using the torch to see. My heart was beating fast and hard in my chest. I was convinced at any point, it would give out, and I would collapse in the dark to the putrid cave and never be found. Shaking the thoughts from my head, I stepped forward, again crunching a bone on the floor. The scuttle came closer to me. I moved the torch to the point of the noise. What I saw has never left me. Four white-skinned spidery limbs, attached in impossible ways to a torso that looked faintly human. Sifting atop the monstrosity was a head. It was completely bald with a slit for a mouth and two large eyes the color of snow. I gave a shriek of terror, began to slash in vain at the air in front of me with the knife. The thing looked at me and opened its mouth to an unimaginable size. It let out an unworldly screeching noise. The sound made my eardrums hurt. My head shook with the reverberations as did the cave. Trying to keep my light steady on the monster, I lunged towards it with the knife outstretched. I felt the knife hit something fleshy and heavy. In a frenzy, I began to hack and slash. The monster shrieked and thrashed before me as each of my attacks found their home in its devilish body. I don't know how I managed to fight the denizen. I had been overcome with panic and fear one moment, and the next, a unending fury that led me to attack until my foe fell in a heap on the floor. I dropped to my knees, exhausted. With the light, I examined the beast in front of me. The white skin stretched over the many bones of its skeleton. The blank face that displayed malice now looked strangely peaceful. I was shaking hard, and the words, get out, screamed in every part of my body. My feet took control of the situation. I stood up and made for the entrance of the tunnel. As I got to the opening in the wall, I heard a noise that made me scream in panic and fear. The scuttling. I turned the light back around to see the heaped form of the beast moving. Sickening, crunching noises came from the corpse. It wasn't dead. It began to get back on all fours. My legs carried me faster than ever before in my life. I ran through the darkness towards the pale patch of light coming from the cave's mouth. Soon, I had cleared the opening. Back into the grove, I felt free. I didn't stop running until I had cleared the woods and was back on my street. I looked around me. So many people were milling around their houses in a state of blissful ignorance at the true horror that lay within the woods. That night, I didn't sleep. The images of the beast haunted my closed eyes. I had been sure it was dead yet, as I left it, stood back up. I know if I had never run, I would have been part of the statistic of unexplained deaths in the forest. Part of me felt lucky, but the majority felt unlucky. I had seen death and escaped, but the many children hadn't been so lucky. I felt sick, thinking about the disgusting monster devouring the small legs and arms of a child, cleaning the flesh from the bone, and spitting out the gristle. I write this now in an attempt to warn others, locals, and tourists. The woods that surround Allerhurst are evil. They hold many forgotten evils, many twisted truths. If you go walking in the woods, you may never return. At best, only a small part of you will get lost, like myself. But your body will be whole, unlike so many others. So be warned, dear reader. The woods hold the truest horrors of our earth. And they're hungry. Tales have been told about the vast, unknown wild since humans had gathered around the fires of prehistory. Fables and myths about what lay beyond the smoldering mountains and dark forests, lands of ice and desert wastes, to creatures demonic lingering beneath the waves of salt-thrashed seas. People believe that since the earth was young, dark and terrible beasts have dwelt in its uncharted wilderness. My wife was one such believer. Days were never boring with her. Sailing, rock climbing, scuba diving, bungee jumping, she'd done it all. But there was nothing my dear Veronica loved more than camping. So, every year, on the anniversary of when we first met, we would drive up to the Birch Creek Forest, the largest forest in eastern Scotland. The road was usually long and empty, but we didn't mind, because we knew our patience would be rewarded. Once at the edge of the great woods, we would hop out of the car and begin our long quest to the very center of it all. Each time it took days to reach our special little spot, so we would often set up camp between the winding hazel thickets and sun-touched trees. 
An awe-inspired Veronica would spend this downtime gazing through the reedy gaps in the leaves above. I don't know what she was looking for. A sign, perhaps. After another day of hiking, we would reach the center. A small and empty gap in the trees, perfectly circular and brilliantly constructed. By who? I don't know. But that was never a concern of mine. The undisturbed dirt which lay inside the ring of hollow trees was unlike any of the other filth everywhere else in the forest. It was a light and polished brown, almost golden substance which sparkled under the sun that hung closely to the heavens. As if it were closer there than anywhere else in the world, you could nearly see it bubbling and boiling in the rich blue nothingness of a cloudless sky. The most beautiful place on earth, she called it. Many legends of the significance of the place circulated around the local towns. If we ever found ourselves in one of those dainty places, Veronica would always inquire about it, and each time we would hear a different answer, as if every resident had their own little mythology. One tale says that the Birch Creek Forest is the home of an ancient hag known as the Washerwoman. She gets her name from the action she is always seen performing, washing blood off her wrinkled old hands stood in a stream. We never saw any such stream, however. Others told stories of a shape-shifting fairy who would float through the forest, and of a highland spirit with one leg and one hand protruding from a ridge in its chest. One man even claimed it to be the birthplace of the devil. I thought they were gratuitous, but Veronica seemed to like them, so I let her be. If it wasn't for the sickness, she would have been with me on that day. Well, I suppose she was with me, in a way, in a small glass jar hanging loosely from my backpack. Her final wish was to have her ashes spread across that fell, befinned circle, which lies blaspheming at the center of the accursed forest, and I intended to honor that wish. My car rolled across the gravel and into the dirt which bordered the trees, marking the spot where the forest met the countryside. I stumbled out and opened the boot where my large mountain backpack lay, Veronica's remains dangling off the side. I slung it around my back and crossed the threshold into the great wood, and I wandered and pushed through the foliage. I thought of my wife and how much we used to enjoy these little adventures. After all, she was the one who introduced me to the Birch Creek Forest to begin with. She had always been fascinated by its mysterious reputation. Sometimes, when we set up our camp at the center, she would just wander off alone. Without a light, and without warning, she would just up and walk away into the forest. I learned not to ask her why. The one and only time I did inquire about this mysterious tradition, she just ignored me. But she was a bit of a hippie, just like me. I figured she was just connecting with nature, or something like that. Through the branches and leaves above, I noticed the blue sky slowly turn into a fiery orange, and rays of golden light seeped through the trees. I found a spot where the forest was not so dense, and set up camp before the wood was consumed in black and blue. As the sun descended past the wild forest, I sparked a match and set alight the pile of sticks I had constructed in the center of a small opening. Before long, the whole thing was ablaze and flickering in the pale moonlight. I unrolled my sleeping bag and snuggled up beside the fire to the sounds of sticks snapping in the flames. As I lay there, my eyes closed and facing the sky, I felt an uneasiness seep in. It was an unfamiliar sensation, as if there were eyes glaring at me from in between the trees. It sounds silly, I know, but I just had to look. The twigs in the fire continued to crack. I knew there was nothing there, but just to put my mind at ease, I sat up and opened my eyes. Darkness. The fire was out. I stood up quickly and scrabbled for my backpack. I pulled out my torch and shone it into the blackened wood to see nothing but shrubbery and hollow tree trunks. I was not going to sleep there. Fatigued and weary, I collected my bearings as hastily as my body would allow, but as I did, I noticed a peculiar detail around my campsite. I shone my light on the dirt floor. Snapped twigs lay broken on the ground, almost as if they had been stepped on. A thought did cross my mind that it was me who broke the sticks as I waded deeper into the wood, but it wasn't just that. The ground itself had been smothered. Whatever did it must have been large. Larger than me, that was for sure. Eventually I was exhausted. I sat myself up against a tree, almost collapsing against the thing as I slowly slipped away into sleep. 
I woke to the hot sun beating down on my face. My mouth was dry. Without hesitation, I opened my flask and drank. I was so tired the previous night that I failed to recall how far I had gone, but I figured I could not have gone far from my destination. I wasn't. After no more than two hours journey under the golden sun I found it, a perfect circular opening in the forest, the most beautiful place on earth. But as I approached that prodigious and remarkable transformation of scenery, I began to make out a strange disparity from between the trees. There was something there. My pace quickened, and I burst through the foliage into the glade. I paused. There, in the center of the clearing, a tall wooden effigy constructed from sticks and logs. I ogled at the thing. It took the form of a humanoid creature, slender and looming over the space it was. Tusks curled upwards out of its wooden mouth. Its face was long like a horse, yet its mouth was wide and gaping. I stared up at it, horrified by its unnatural proportions. Its arms hung low down to its skins, which arched forward like the forelegs of a tiger and at the end of its narrow appendages, talon-like claws. But before I could notice its finer details, I caught sight of something white and rectangular stapled to the effigy's base. A letter. I knelt down and tore it off. Matthew. The envelope read. My name. I ripped it open to reveal the folded sheet of paper inside. In my wife's handwriting, it read as follows. Dearest Matthew, if you're reading this, then you have honored my last wish. I knew you would. Thank you. But I haven't been entirely honest with you. Now it's time you learn the truth, the truth of this place, and why I have brought you here. I know you will hate me for this, but I have chosen you as, in the end, I know you will do the right thing. I know you've always found my fascination with monsters and myths peculiar. I know you didn't like me hearing stories from those Scotsmen. I always thought it was quite cute. My grandfather was one such Scotsman. I never talked to you about him much. He used to take me to Birch Creek Forest when I was just a girl. That's how I know about it. Every year on my birthday until his death, he would take me there, and we would do what me and you used to do. Hike to the clearing you are stood in now, and stargaze until our eyelids became heavy. But every now and again, he would wander off back into the wood, leaving me alone in the dark with nothing but my own mind to keep me company. I know you know a little bit of what that's like. I always would ask him why he didn't, but it wasn't until my 18th when he finally told me. From the heavenly sun which bubbles and boils above the wood fell an angel, cast down from a mighty kingdom. Like a meteor, he crashed onto the young world out of the sky, and when he arose in the nucleus of the Birch Creek Forest, he arose a beast, crowned in blackness with a gaping, tusked mouth riddled with vile gnaw and cursed with an endless hunger which can never be fed. Hairless limbs, dripping with callous slime, to saturate his ashen skin. His crooked legs lurched through the accursed wood to tear and shred at flesh, until you turn red and maim to be dragged back down to the weeds, where your shredded body will lay for eternity beneath his endless sway. To avoid such a dreadful fate, the dread ruler must be entertained, whether with a song or a dance. Let him play to the vile rhythm of slithering, monotonous melodies. A tradition passed down through generations to tame the beast. Matthew, without something to entertain the him, his hunger will turn to the rest of the world where he will bring death and destruction. You must continue our ritual. But here's the thing. In recent years, his hunger has grown. It is getting harder and harder to satiate him, which is why you're here. What was it you said when you wanted us to get a dog? Until one has loved an animal, a part of one's soul remains unawakened. I think that may be true now. That will be your purpose. To stay within the forest. To be the pet of a god. You know what will happen if you do not comply. Yours always, Veronica. I stepped backwards. I didn't know what to think. I stared up at the motionless effigy, betrayed and heartbroken. I hauled my backpack off my back and onto the floor. I unzipped it and pulled out my box of matches, dropping the letter to the dirt in the process. I was barely thinking, as if I were on autopilot and consumed in a blind rage. I lit the match with my trembling hands. I wasn't going to be a goddamn pet, but as I did, I heard something in the woods behind me. 
I turned but saw nothing. Yet the forest was bustling with noise, leaves rustling, and trees crashing behind earthy, bellowing footsteps. It was approaching. I shouted something which I cannot recall in its direction, and for a moment, it stopped. But the silence was shortly interrupted by a fiendish, breathy growl, which shook the ground below me. And with that, the thumping steps continued like heartbeats. I looked up at the wooden idol which loomed over me. Almost instinctively, I held the burning match against it, setting the back of its twisted legs ablaze. As the flames crawled up the wood, the creature in the forest let out an anguished bellow. After that, its pace quickened. Frequent blows struck the ground as the sound of collapsing trees shook the ancient wood. The flames now up to the monument's waist, I darted behind it and clutched the base of it, my fingers digging into the dirt. Flames tickled my face as I lifted the back part of the base, and with an adrenaline, fueled hull, I tipped the abhorrent thing into the adjacent wood. It crashed into the trees with tremendous force, fire shooting at the bottom as it did. Over the cackles of wood, the creature bellowed once more. Flames spread through the forest hastily, creating an impenetrable wall of fire in its wake. I turned and ran back into the forest. Agonizing roars cried out behind him as I ran. That night, I didn't stop to rest in the Birch Creek Forest. I assumed the fire must have withered out at some point, otherwise the entire place would have been burnt to a cinder. But the monster was gone. Whatever it was. I jogged through the forest until my bones were on the verge of snapping, but eventually, I was out and onto the adjacent road with the great Scottish countryside behind it. I found my car a little way down, right where I had left it. As I shot down the road, I reached for the jar of ashes in the passenger seats and... I've got to be honest, I didn't feel remorse after hurling it out the window. That was a month ago. I didn't tell anyone what happened. Though my friends could see I was visibly shaken for days after my fateful trip to Scotland. But eventually, I came to terms with the events that had transpired in that cursed wood. It hasn't stopped the nightmares though. I was going to go to a support group next Saturday, which could have helped. But after last night, I fear nothing can help me anymore. I woke from a nightmare sweating and panting. It was the same one I had been having for weeks. In the dream, I found myself once again in the forest, but every tree is twisted and contorted to the shape of the beast. I try to run but my legs sink into the ground, and before my face can be engorged in the dirt, I awake. Usually I awake in the morning, the sun shining through my window. But last night was different. It was pitch black outside my window. I reached for my phone in the nightstand to check the time. 2.37 in the morning, it read. I was about to put it down when I noticed a notification from my Sky News app. I swiped it and read the headline. Entire population of Scottish village brutally massacred. Over 300 confirmed deaths. I worked for my local pizza shop for about 8 months. I would bring people food that were either too lazy or too afraid to go out on their own. It's not like I wasn't afraid to, but I was smart enough to know that if I followed the appropriate steps, I could make a nice bit of money for myself. Of course, I had to take the necessary precautions to avoid infection, but that didn't prove to be too difficult. I made sure to wash my hands well and often. I always wore an uncomfortably large mask but it was worth the hassle to ensure my own and other safety. I always carried a generous amount of hand sanitizer on me at all times, just in case. My other duties, besides deliveries, included taking inventory. I also had to go out and buy the groceries for the restaurant. This meant I had to go to the one place where everyone dreaded going during these times. Grocery stores. Costco. As well as numerous other large stores. It wasn't difficult work, however, I got paid very well for it. This was because I got paid extra for the risk I was taking, on top of stimulus checks. I felt bad that I was making more money than ever, while the rest of the population suffered, but it didn't bother me too much, as I had always struggled financially. Friday was business as usual. Take inventory in the morning, check for deliveries, and jot down my shopping list. Often I had such a long list that I had to fill up two huge carts. Friday was the last day before my three whole days off. I couldn't wait to finally relax. 
I was even planning to have a large dinner party with my friends. Despite the current circumstances, I knew we shouldn't be doing so, but I hadn't seen them in months. I couldn't wait. I finished up my list, got in my van, and headed to the first store. Each stop went business as usual. I said hello to each of the employees who I would see regularly. I even learned their names. I remember Steve particularly because he always says hello to me, and my girlfriend when we go shopping together. I was alone this time, however. I thank the heavens for that now. I arrived at my final stop, Smart Food Service, possibly my favorite store on the list. This was the only store that required me to go into their back warehouse, labeled employees only. However, I was permitted back there. Everyone that worked in the store knew who I was at this point. I always went into the back first to get the heavy stuff. I waved hello to the cashier, Ashley, when I walked in. On my way to the back of the store, I noticed it was almost empty. This was strange considering it was a Friday, and Friday afternoons and evenings are always very busy. I saw a few workers, and one or two customers. There was a man with his two daughters, and one older gentleman by himself. I strolled past the employees only sign, and walked right into the warehouse. The entrance was made of a metal door that always remained open during store hours, and closed at night, I assumed. Come to think of it, at the time I had never seen it closed. They stored the pizza boxes I needed in the back of the warehouse. Sometimes I had trouble finding them, but most of the time they were in the same spot. Sometimes they were stacked so high that I had to play gigantic Jenga to get one out. I could carry one, maybe two cases at a time. I walked to the back of the warehouse searching for the stash of boxes, but for some reason I couldn't find them. I stood up straight and looked around the warehouse. I didn't fully realize how massive it truly is until now, bigger than the entire store even. I whistled loudly, hoping an employee would hear me and offer me assistance, but all I heard in response was dead silence, apart from the hum of the fluorescent lights hanging above. I was alone. I headed back towards the front of the warehouse, deciding to go back into the store to ask for help. The walk back to the front seemed to go on for an eternity. I was tired and sore from the long work week. The only other thing on my mind was excitement for the party that I was throwing. I couldn't wait to see all my friends again. I turned the corner to the metal door and found it closed. Not once in my whole eight months of shopping at the store have I seen that door closed. I went to open it, only to find it locked. Damn it. I sighed under my breath. I pounded on the door. To my knowledge, that was the only way in and out of the warehouse, apart from the gates for semi-trucks, which were currently closed. I searched the store for an alternative exit, but instead found the crate of pizza boxes I had been looking for. It was right where it was a few days ago. Was someone messing with me? I swear I had already checked there. Not only was it where it was before, but there were even more crates next to it. Confused, I pulled out my phone, which is what I should have done in the first place. No service. Typical. I checked the time. 7.30pm. I should be back at the shop unloading groceries at this point. I couldn't believe I was still stuck in there. I wandered around the warehouse for what felt like an eternity. I checked my phone again. I saw two bars of service. I immediately dialed the number for the grocery store and was about to call when my phone rang. It was my girlfriend, Kayla. I answered. Kayla? Where are you? You should have been home ages ago. She said, obviously annoyed. What? can't be later than 8.30. It's 12.30. There was a silence. Look, I'm locked in the... Then the call dropped. Damn it! I yelled this time. I stormed back to the door and furiously kicked it. My kick sent me off balance and I hit the ground hard. I woke up with a blinding headache. Accompanied by the screech of the fluorescent lights, I pulled myself up off the floor and leaned on a nearby box. I could see the door. I walked slowly toward it and checked the handle. Still locked. I collapsed to the floor. When you have a concussion, you're not supposed to fall asleep. Alone, I had no one else to keep me awake. I fell asleep. For how long, I don't know. But when I woke up, I was in a daze. I couldn't think straight, much less stand. I surveyed my surroundings. I still had my phone and I checked the time. 2.30 a.m. Why didn't anyone come looking for me? The store had to be empty by now, and didn't open until 6am. I was just about ready to give up when I saw a set of keys glistening on a hook on the wall. 
I struggled to my feet. I slowly stumbled towards the keys and grabbed them off the wall. I put one of the keys in the door and turned it. The store was just as quiet as the warehouse. I slowly walked to the front door and tried different keys until I found the one that fit. I stuck the final key in the lock and twisted. I heard an unlocking sound. Finally, I limped towards my car and got in. I knew I shouldn't drive in my current state, so I pulled out my phone to find that I had service. I dialed 911 and fell back asleep. I awoke in the back of an ambulance, taking me to the hospital. I couldn't speak. The EMT noticed I was awake and said something to me, but I couldn't hear him. I fell back asleep. I woke in a hospital, handcuffed to the bed. They must have thought I broke into the store. I explained the situation and was sent home after recovering. I laid in bed, having missed the party. I couldn't believe what had happened. I drifted off to sleep in my bed next to my girlfriend. When I woke up, I could hear the hum of fluorescent lights. I was on the floor back in the warehouse. I screamed. I jumped to my feet, my head pounding, adrenaline coursing through my veins. I ran back to the door and furiously turned the knob, still locked. There were no keys on the wall. I ran the perimeter of the warehouse, frantically searching for an exit, when I found another door that I had missed before. Not learning from before, I slammed into it and ended up on the other side. I was outside. I was in a fenced off section behind the grocery store. I attempted to climb the fence. It was a struggle. It was a tall fence and I was injured. I pulled myself up over the other side, then fell back down to, then fell down the back of the fence, closed my eyes. Surprisingly, I felt concrete sooner than I expected and felt no pain. I opened my eyes. I was back in the goddamn warehouse, at the top of some stairs I didn't even know existed. I was beyond confused. I got to my feet and pulled out my phone and dialed 911. I didn't even check if I had service or not. 911. What's your emergency? The operator spoke. Please help me. I'm locked in the warehouse at Smart Food Service on Jefferson Street. I've been in here for so long. An officer is on their way. Will you please stay on the line? She interrupted. Please hurry. I hit my head. I was cut off once more. My phone died. I waited for the officer and waited in and waited in. I finally heard someone open the door of the store, and I banged on the exit of the warehouse and screamed. I heard banging on the door, and it finally gave way after extended effort. A tall police officer walked through. I explained what happened. Well, I'll give you a ride home, just to be safe, he said. What about my van? I asked. I'll have someone tow it tomorrow, he replied. I followed him out to his car and got in the passenger side. I was so relieved. I just wanted to go home. The officer asked me where I lived and I directed him. He took me home, dropped me off, and drove away. I looked on at my house. I dreaded going inside. What if I walked in and found myself back in that godforsaken warehouse? But that never happened. I slowly walked into my house and up to my bedroom. Kayla was asleep. I quietly got in bed and laid next to her. How did the shopping go? She mumbled. Don't you remember our call? Weren't you worried? I asked, confused. I never called you. I was worried, but I thought you'd be fine. She stayed in. I checked my call logs. No outgoing or incoming calls. Not even my call to 911. I thought. I got out of bed to go check if my van was there. Sure was. What the hell was going on? Confused, I went to sleep. I woke up still in my bed. God, I'm too afraid to go outside now, just like everyone else. I'll be in quarantine long after the virus is gone. My grandfather has owned his 100-acre hunting property in northern Michigan for close to 30 years now, and my family uses it from everything from family reunions to 4th of July celebrations, a shooting range, and of course, hunting. It's mostly swamp, but has large patches of dry ground, enough to ride quads and have cookouts in the center of the small camp we had set up. Since before I was even old enough to carry a gun, I would go out with my dad on chilly fall mornings and just sit in silence, watching the woods around me with saucered eyes, waiting to catch a glimpse of brown fur 
or dull white antlers moving through the brush. When I was 15, my father finally agreed that I was old enough to find my own hunting spot and hunt on my own, and I picked a spot in the far back corner of the property, a small piece of high ground surrounded by thick, thorn-filled swamp, setting up my stand in an old, strong white pine. I had a view of the small clearing and could see through the branches of the surrounding trees far into the swamp around me. Being in the middle of nowhere, the property didn't have many neighbors, save for a middle-aged man with a drinking problem that lived across the street that kept an eye on the place while we weren't there and an old man that owned a cattle farm behind the property. The man across the street was Dan, and was a nice enough guy, as long as you caught him before he hit the halfway mark on his daily bottle of rum. But I always got uneasy when talking to the farmer from the cattle farm. He seemed okay. No reason outright not to like him, but he was quiet, with a purse look on his face at all times. His visits to the property were usually brief, just to inform us about repairs along our shared fence or to come asking if we had seen a cow that had gotten out. At the edge of one of his pastures, 100 yards or so from his tree line, was a small building, no bigger than a storage shed, with a single window opposite side on the wall of the door, facing the trees. In and of itself, this isn't particularly unusual, except for the strange patterns painted on it, hieroglyph looking markings mixed with geometric shapes and surrounded with stunted apple trees hunched stumps, and gnarled branches poking out of the otherwise empty field. During one of his visits, I asked him about it, and what he was doing there so late at night, as the light from the window could be seen from the edge of our property long after dark. I didn't ask to be nosy, just trying to make conversation and get to know him better, and even tried to ask in a somewhat joking tone. I still remember his voice, deep and rough, lips barely moving as the words slipped through his beard. Just making sure this place stays safe. Laughing, I asked what he meant. You never know what's out there. This was a few years ago. I'm 23 now, and this past summer my grandfather got a call from Dan, saying the old farmer had died. Police had found him on his bed, holding a small leather book filled with ramblings and symbols. Everybody marked it up to a poor old man losing his mind after living alone for so many years. Yesterday... I decided I would go out hunting, and being early bow season, I was the first one since the old man had passed to visit the hunting property. I got here last night, and after unlocking the outhouse, checking the trail cam, and setting up my bed in the small, one-room cabin, I walked to the edge of the property, looking out over the empty pastures and the setting sun, and gaze falling on the small shed. The window dark for the first time I can remember, I went to bed early. I always have trouble getting up early, and needed to sleep if I wanted to be in the stand before the deer started to move. I woke once in the night to pee, and standing out in the cold October air, I felt uneasy. The woods were completely silent, no owls, no barking of coyotes, no crickets. I quickly finished my business and returned to my bed. I woke this morning, made some eggs and toast, packed my lunch and my hunting pack, and walked out to my stand. Cutting through the farm pastures, I wouldn't have to trudge through the swamp, not like the farmer would mind anymore. I situated myself in a seat high above the ground and poured some coffee from the thermos as I scanned the still dark forest. Through the silhouetted branches, back in the swamp I caught quick movement, just for a moment, darting behind some scrub brush, much too fast to be a deer and not making any noise. Damn squirrels. Then I realized, it wasn't just that the animal in the swamp didn't make any noise. Nothing was making noise. No birds, no squirrels, no wind. The air hung, stagnant. The cold from my breath slowly rising straight up as it dissipated. The same feeling of unease crept over me, raising the skin buried beneath my warm clothing. I sat in silence as the sun rose and began to bathe everything in light. I realized I was holding my coffee and I had been staring at the same place I had seen the movement. With the sun came the birds, slowly growing into a symphony. The rest of the morning went uneventfully. Seeing nothing more than a red-headed woodpecker doing its best to give itself a concussion and a raccoon, slowly waddling back to its hollow log somewhere. Quietly ate my lunch, scanning for movement and listening for the distinct sound of hesitant hooves over dead leaves. 
As the sun moved overhead and began to set, I became more focused. Something had to be making its way toward me, and I could feel it. As dusk lengthened the shadows, I heard cows coming from the fields behind me. Somebody must have taken over looking after the cows in the absence of the farmer. Crimson light from the sunset turned to darkness. Disappointed at the lack of deer, I climbed down and switched on my headlamp. Not wanting to disturb the cows, I bit the bullet, and elected to cut through the swamp back to camp. It was a more direct route anyway. As I reached the end of the brush, something stopped me from going in. That feeling of uneasiness. When something isn't right but you can't figure out what, I brushed it off, fed up with this weird feeling that I didn't see any deer, and the fact I had to go through this damn swamp. As I pushed my way through the brush, dark water swirling around just inches below the top of my boots, branches slapping across my face, I heard a rustle behind me. I spun, the small cone of light from my headlamp doing little to illuminate more than a few feet into the bushes. Or did the noise come from my left? I slowly turned, straining my ears to see past the light into the darkness. I realized again, the woods had fallen silent. I couldn't even hear the cows that were out less than an hour before. Only the sounds of my short breaths and pounding of my heartbeat in my ears. It was then that I remembered the words that my father had said once, in my first time out hunting with him. Deer don't come out when the woods is quiet. When everything goes silent, not even the birds are singing. It means a predator is near. This was the second night the woods had fallen completely silent around me. Was something following me? Another noise spun me around, and the beam of my light caught movement of something disappearing into a thicket. My breathing turned panicked, my heart hitting the inside of my ribs like a hammer. I moved quickly. Splashes of cold murky water jumped over the sides of my boots, chilling my legs and soaking my feet. The polished wooden handle of my hunting knife grew slick with the sweat from my palm. Another noise, closer this time. Did it come from the right or from behind me? The old farmer's words echoed in my head, just making sure this place stays safe. My pace quickened even more. I was all but running. A bundle of thorn bushes smacked against my right side, scratching down my face and piercing my right hand. I yelped and dropped the knife into the muddy water. I looked back to try and find it when another noise erupted from the brush. You never know what's out there. Fuck it. Run. The noises were definitely closer. Whatever was chasing me was easily keeping up, almost silently. I heard a rustle and looked up to see a shadow dart from the light. Leaving the tree branch, it was on gently bouncing. Just making sure this place stays safe. I burst from the swamp on a dry land and forced my waterlogged feet to move faster. A stick broke behind me. I whirled around to reveal nothing as leaves crunched from the direction I was just going. The dimming light from my headlamp shone on nothing but brown leaves settling back to the ground. You never know what's out there. Run. The bouncing light caught something in the clearing ahead. A cabin. The sounds emanating from whatever was chasing me grew more rapid. First above me, then behind, back to overhead. Just making sure this place stays safe. I reached the cabin door, slamming the heavy oak door behind me and locking the deadbolt. The blood from my hand had made my palm sticky. I leapt to the gas lamp at the peak of the ceiling, turned the knob to open the propane line, and clicked my lighter. The lamp stayed dark. A thunderous noise came from the front door as something heavy hurled itself at it. I flicked the lighter again. The black charred glass stared back at me mockingly. The door shuddered as it was slammed into again. I sprung to the propane tank and shook it. Empty. The door rattled again, this time accompanied by the faint sounds of wood beginning to splinter. I slowly sank to the floor, knocking an arrow to my bowstring. Whatever was out there, I had one chance at it, before it would be on top of me. I trained my dying headlamp on the door. The door heaved more splintering. The deadbolt was beginning to pull from its screws. You never know what's out there. There I was, lying in my cot, listening to the beautiful but deafening sounds of bugs and critters chirping in the woods of the Maryland mountains. The clock on my wrist told me it was about 3 a.m., 
and that had a serene quality to it. 3 a.m. A nice time in my opinion. No one needs you to do anything. And you can go alone with your thoughts. Why am I awake at this time? The answer is simple. I needed to piss. I already did that, got out of the tent, and took a steady stream on a nearby tree. The campfire still had glowing embers from the fire my friends and I were tending until about midnight. We then decided to go to sleep. I didn't fall asleep immediately after hitting my cot again. I chose to take the time to stay up a bit, listen to the bugs. The bugs are telling me so many stories and languages only they understand, and it has its perks to it. I heard the rustling from nearby tents, knowing it was just tossing and turning from my buddies nearby. We were three in total, Harry, Leo, and me, Jackie. Harry was of a good build, frequented the gym, a little taller than average, had an inexplicably expensive looking haircut, and had looks that would swoon many ladies over, and a couple men. He would totally have wanted to talk to them too, if he wasn't shyer than a six-year-old around other adults. Took a couple months of saying hello to him next to me in class before he actually responded with hello back. We eventually just got to talking, and about a year of knowing and being friendly to each other, he finally got comfortable around me, and then he wouldn't shut up. I still love that guy though. Then there is Leo, much smaller than the average person. Good looks, but none that were too impressive but had an attitude that made him get along with anyone. He didn't care about his looks. In five minutes with him, other people didn't care either. He was a genuinely nice person to be around, but he thinks that he's a dick. Me, I can't say too much. Taller than the rest of them, average looks, average build, pretty much average in every way. But running, I was the fastest mile, two mile, and 5K in the state, at least when I was in high school. Although I was able to bring those two numbers together into this friendship trio. And that has got to count for something. We've been unbreakable for about five years strong. Something rustled in the leaves outside of my tent. It's probably just a squirrel or something. Thought to myself. I normally don't get scared of these sounds, but I got an immediate unsettling feeling in my stomach. And then boom. Something basically punches the entry flap of my tent. Scaring the living shit out of me. It wasn't the sight of a fist-like thing intending and pushing on the flap of my tent that scared me, but the sudden different sound it made from the bugs. Like when a cat pounces on a paper or a plastic bag. Good thing I already pissed, because I definitely would have pissed myself. And then I heard the zipper opening, and in popped in Leo's face. Holy fuck, you gotta be less ominous out there. I was terrified, I told him after I gained my breath. But then I looked at his face, and he did not look right. Not at all. He was more scared than me. You didn't hear it then? He asked. Hear what? The yelp outside. Not even two minutes ago? He angrily whispered. No, but I was just pissing out there. Maybe it was me. It wasn't me. I didn't make a sound other than the piss hitting the ground. For the exact reason of not waking them up. Leo looked around and then closed the zipper. We both heard it this time. Oh my god, someone please help me. It was faint, and it seemed to come from far away, probably another campsite. The other sites. Someone needs help. I got to my feet, but Leo forced me down. No, someone else can do it, not us. Are you not telling me this doesn't feel absolutely 100% wrong to you? He looked at me dead in the eyes. I knew he was right. I was feeling what I felt before, but so much worse now. I just wanted to vomit. Vomit, and then leave the campsite. Right at that moment, the zipper opened again. We both screamed like children as Harry entered the increasingly crowded tent. Damn, now I know how you felt. Leo said as he playfully nudged my arm. Did you guys hear that too? It sounds like someone needs help from another camp. Harry told us as he zipped the tent back up. Should that zipper open one more time? I was going to shit myself. It does, but I'm sure someone else will hear it and help. Besides, I'm too fucking... I started before Leo cut me off. Shut the fuck up, Jackie. I stopped talking immediately and thought he heard another cry for help. I didn't know what to say, besides ask. What did you hear? Well, let me ask you this. What do you hear now? He said in an extremely alarmed tone. Nothing. I hear nothing. Harry chimed, 
And then my guts immediately receded into my being as I realized exactly what caused Leo to get shaken up. The bugs stop chirping and the forest never gets this silent unless a predator, please help me, came from just outside the tent. Everyone in the tent went dead silent as we heard the voice, sounding really wounded and, well, concerning. We just looked at each other in paralyzing fear, none of us moving or making a sound. Please, I'm hurt, I'm so hurt, and the thing is coming. We could all hear the proper noun status of the word thing. Our eyes confirmed it to one another. We sat still for what felt like hours, and then we heard the crunching of leaves outside, indicating something moving away. None of us slept until enough daylight shone on our tent at about 8 a.m. I silently stepped out of the tent and took a brief look around. When I saw no immediate danger of the thing, I signaled the boys and we ran to the car and locked the doors. I took a second to look around the car from the inside through the windows. It was someone that needed help. And they were here. We could help them. What in fucking God's name are you doing? Start the damn car! Harry quietly yelled at me over my shoulder, and then I turned on the ignition. It was as if the roaring of the truck is what caused the thing to jump out from behind a tree, and honestly, it probably was. The thing was hideous. It was humanoid in shape, but easily twice as tall as the average man, around 11 feet. It had pale, fleshy skin that, upon closer look, was covered in hives, like that of bees and hornets. There were green pus coming out of some of the holes as well. It was lanky and skinny, and its face had no eyes, no nose, no hair, and no ears. All of it was just a head-shaped ball with a massive mouth. And oh god, the teeth were the worst part of it all. They weren't razor sharp, they weren't needles, and they were only a little pointy, but they were all human canines, and there were hundreds of them. Each tooth seemed to not belong in the mouth of any other tooth. Fucking had three tongues and all deformed and piled gorily on top of each other. As if it was a kid trying to make a monster out of Play-Doh. Couldn't see us, hear us, or smell us. But it could feel us, probably from the car starting, sending vibrations to the ground. And it could taste us, and we knew tasting us was exactly what the thing wanted. Go, go! Leo started yelling and was cut off as I stepped full throttle on the gas. The car started moving, but before it actually gained speed, the thing was on top of us and slammed its fist into the car door. Leo's car door. Well, fist wasn't the right word. It opened up its hand and closed all the fingers together, as if it was about to palm something. And then I realized that a hand now looked sharp. It went straight through the car door. The fingers opened out to get a grip from the inside. And then the door was yanked off the car, leaving Leo exposed. Oh fuck. He started before the thing did the same thing as the car door but to Leo's side, and it exited right above Leo's belly button. He extended his fingers, and landed Leo out of the car. Leo! Harry and I both screamed, but we knew it was too late. The car started to pick up speed, and Leo was now but a memory. Only thing left from him was the blood-soaked passenger seat. I looked back through the rear window to see if Leo was somehow okay, knowing full well that wouldn't be the case. It was only for three seconds. But I saw the thing stopped with Leo in his hand and take two massive bites. One on the neck that was so large that there was almost no neck left, leaving the head connected to the body by means of a small amount of bloodied skin, and one on the mouth that took off his complete jaw and his nose as well. I continued driving, not feeling sorrow, as I was in total shock and total fear. Harry, call 911 and tell them where we are. Say our friend was attacked by a bear and was left behind, and we are trying to find the nearest police station. A bear? That wasn't a fucking bear. We can't say giant monster now, can we? They would lock us up in a mental hospital or think we were lying, and lock us up for his death. The fuck was that thing? I don't know, Harry. Now call the cops. It killed Leo. He started, and then we heard the most horrifying thing we ever thought we could hear. The thing we heard is what will forever give it its title of, not the thing, but of the imitator. Guys, please, help me. Jackie, Harry, don't leave me behind. I didn't look back, but I knew that Leo didn't say that, even though it was in his voice, perfectly. There was no way he survived those bites. The thing? No. 
The imitator said that. Against my best judgment, I decided to look back anyway. The thing was still standing tall, not moving, until I looked at him. Then he moved. Then I got a fresh dose of pure fear running through my entire body. Wait, no, that's not right. It was fear, and then it turned its head directly towards me and started running towards the car. And it was gaining on us. Harry turned to look out the back and I heard a yelp from him as he turned back forward. I looked in the rear view and saw the imitator turn its head ever so slightly, but definitely in Harry's direction. And my theory was basically confirmed. The imitator had only three senses left. His taste, his sense of feeling, and another sense only fitting for a monster like him. The sense of fear. As long as we were afraid of the imitator, it knew exactly where we were. And that's horrifying if anything ever was. Just imagine for a second, a monster that could sense where you were by your fear reeking off of you. And it looked like that horrible, disgusting thing. If seeing it didn't make you afraid, you were sort of safe. But no one wouldn't feel afraid. And at that fear, it will start chasing you, adding new fear. And then it will gain, adding more fear. A never-ending loop that eventually does end in you being its next prey. The Imitator. It uses the cries of help from its previous victims to start the fear. That's why we heard it far the first time, and then close the second time. But why didn't it attack? Well, probably because we were more shocked and concerned than afraid, or someone else was more afraid somewhere else. Eventually, the imitator lost its ground and veered off into the woods. And we got to the police station. We went in, talked to the officers, and people were sent off. Eventually, after hours of us standing there shocked, they brought us into a room to talk to us. It was a bear. We didn't see it really, just heard it. Why? Did you guys see something? Harry asked. I'm not sure you boys are ready to hear this right now. Later, a news report came across televisions all over the mountains to take extra precautions when going out camping. Reports just came in about many, many dead campers all over the mountains from bear attacks, although no one has seen anything quite like it. The only thing missing from the victims were the teeth, tongues, and the flesh around it. And, wait, this can't be right. Well, anyways, the victims also seem to be missing their vocal cords. I'm a certified coroner who works with a very skilled team of biohazard cleaners and mortuary assistants. My crew is usually called in after the police have ruled the cause of death is natural, accidental, or suicide. Anything else is handled by an unaffiliated crew. As you'd expect, I've seen my fair share of gruesome and harrowing things in my line of work. The first thing that comes to mind is a case I took on in early June of last year. An elderly man had slipped in the bathtub and splits a nice curve open in his head. He tripped and ironically brained himself on one of the metal handrails he had installed in the bathroom to keep him from slipping. It was a clean split from the frontal bone to the occipital bone. He was frozen in a prone position with blood bubbling up like snot from a fancy new smile opened up on his scalp. The faucet kept filling and the water kept rising at a snail's pace, overtaking the lime scale rings in the tub one by one. He struggled to pull his head above the water's surface for minutes. If only that fresh new ravine in the back of his head could have sucked air down into his lungs. Maybe then he'd have lived to take another bath. But that story ends exactly how you'd imagine it did. With a wrinkled old corpse with skin stained rose black. Laying face down in an overflowing tub of blood water. That was the worst case I'd ever seen. Until last week when I took a call from dispatch about an apparent suicide the police had just finished picking the bones clean on. The report said it was a 24-year-old Caucasian female. She was carrying along just fine in her second trimester when she decided to slit her own throat in the middle of the living room after the father unceremoniously decided to step out of the picture. We arrived in two sleek white vans, one loaded up with cleaning supplies and the other equipped to load corpses in and then them out. The lawn was peppered with strips of police tape and the occasional disposable latex glove. Police are often sloppy at cleanup in my experience. A patrol car across the street that was monitoring the house 
Waiting for our arrival gave us a veiled wave, and then sped off down the stream. The home oozed out ominousness, like an unseen gas leak. The front door gave a shrill protest as it eased open. Immediately, I felt dread close in around me like a weighted blanket. There she was, laying face up on a lattice blue rug. Her skin was a sickly pallor of mutin, well interrupted by the sleek black tangled of her hair and the blotches of carmine blood pooled around her neck and dried in the deep curves of her collarbones. Her belly was horribly distended, bubbled out by rising bloat and the cold fetus inside her womb. The expressiveness waning in the milky crescents of her eyes sent a coarse shiver down my spine, but we had a job to do. And so we got to work, as respectfully as we could. We pulled a black body bag around the rigor mortis wooden framework of her body. Me and my assistant Mike then shifted her into the gurney and wheeled her out to the van. As we pulled up to the back of the van from behind our lead biohazard cleaner Kai, came huffing out of the building after us. He was dressed in the usual neon yellow jumpsuit, and I could see the ripe flex of an islander muscles beneath the plastic, sweatless and balmy, and dripping from the bow of his massive forehead. So, you guys are just gonna leave the body back there or what? Where are you two going? I looked at Kai with a skeptical bewilderment, and rolling my eyes, I unzipped the body bag so Kai could see the gruesome contents within. As soon as I opened the bag, the strong hinted outline of her body dissolved, and the bag settled down flat. What the fuck, Kai? Is this some sort of a sick joke? I asked impatiently. A look of terror glazed across the murky brown turbulence of his eyes, and instantly I knew it was not a joke. A wave of nausea overtook me, and I felt an army of invisible ants prickle up across my skin on my back. The two of us ran back into the building with Mike following close behind us in his hooded jumpsuit. We reached the family room, and there she was, lying perfectly posed on the floor, in the exact same position we'd found her in. I nearly vomited that morning's breakfast all over the hardwood next to the rug. Go get the gurney now. Mike rushed out. Kai stared down at the corpse with a wrinkle of unease settled on his brow. I watched him switching his balance from foot to foot with an uneasy, awkward gait. It terrified me to see this tank of a man so offset. A minute later, I heard the gurney's wheels thumping determinedly back up the porch steps. We once again loaded her inside the body bag, dragged the gurney over, and heaved her onto it. This time, I cinched her body in with the heavy straps dangling off the side of the gurney, and I buckled her in. I pulled them so tight, I heard the soft tendons and ribs beneath the woman's chest twist and then crack. We wheeled her out towards the van once more. I nodded towards Kai and motioned for him to carefully wash the pool of blood on the rug. We had gotten only as far as the sidewalk when Kai started screaming. I quickly unzipped the top corner of the bag and the second I had done so, it deflated like a balloon. We relayed back inside to find Kai mumbling in Tongan. The man must have weighed 300 odd pounds and yet there he was sitting with his ass to the floor, his face racked with affliction. His thick sausage fingers were clutched around a handful of his shirt fabric. He'd peeled his body out of the top half of the jumpsuit, which bundled around his hips. He was soaked with sweat. I could hear the convulsive manner of his breathing, and the panic in his eyes reminded me of the time I accidentally swallowed a marble as a child. I rushed over to Kai, sidestepping the corpse which was back in her usual position in the middle of the floor. Something caught my eye at a passing glance. Was that a grin I saw on her face? Kai's skin was quickly blotching with purple spots beneath the crooks of his eyes, which looked swollen near to, bursting right out of his skull. Mike rushed in, and we took the wide-set man under our arms and dragged him out of the house and took all the effort we could muster, but we wrangled him out onto the front lawn. Call a fucking ambulance, Mike. Mike rushed away to retrieve his cell phone, and I watched two little rivulets of blood trace down the soft corners of Kai's tear ducts. All at once, he convulsed, croaked, and then he fell still. I caught up with Mike and pulled him towards the lawn by the sleeve of his jumper. I was planning on just loading Kai up into the van to drive him myself to the emergency room, but when I turned around, Kai was gone. I took a few hesitant steps towards the door, but was stopped dead in my tracks. 
The woman's body was laid in the exact same manner it wasn't before, with one obvious exception. Her mouth was now curled into a sinister grin wide enough to show her rows of faded tombstone teeth. My eyes diverted to her side, and I saw it then. Propped against the wall, just a few feet from her, was Kai, rigid, dead, and still weeping blood from his eyes. I stood outside a large tan building on East 43rd Street, Manhattan, my shoes on the verge of soaking through to my thin black socks. Ma'am and Milton attorneys at law, the silver lettering on the door read, when my grandma died, I knew I'd have to come collect her affairs, seeing as she had no other family. Her husband, dead of cancer just like her. Her daughter, my mother, dead from suicide. And her son, presumed dead for the last 20 years after a tragic hiking accident. Grandma's life had been filled with tragedy and, therefore, it made sense she was such a tragic person. We never got along well. And I hadn't seen her for over a decade when she passed. The phone rang and the unknown number turned me off at first. The voicemail, however, struck a strange chord deep within my mind. Even though I had felt alone for the last ten years, it was very strange to be, truly, by myself in this world, the last member of my family. My own parents had both had me young. My mother committed suicide after years of struggling, and just a year and a half later, my father passed away as well. Grandma outlived them both. As a child, I always loathed trips to my grandmother's house. She had a small three-bedroom place in Poughkeepsie. It smelled like it had been dipped in water and left to dry out. The yard was small, and the street was too dangerous to play near. I spent most of my time there watching an old black and white TV set with my grandmother next to me ever quick to make a nasty remark, or scold me for trying to change the channel when she appeared to be sleeping. Yeah, those trips to Grandma June's house were never a highlight of my early childhood memories, but they paled in comparison to the trips we took to my grandmother's vacation home. This house was way up in the Adirondack Forest, so far that it was always hard to keep yourself from falling asleep at some point. The roads all looking the same for hundreds of miles, until you finally found the old, unmarked stone driveway that cut into the black woods and disappeared from the street just a few yards after. The house itself was very large, an early 20th century, three-story gothic revival with a small second floor balcony and a large L-shaped porch at the bottom. The dark black roof, somehow black enough to provide a stark contrast to the dark red brick facade visible from the driveway. The house loomed eerily against the dark backdrop of trees. The place had a vast green sea of a yard and quite a bit of wood surrounding it. Here I played outside all day long. I hated being in that house. The building itself certainly looked creepy, and it was beyond out of place out here in the Adirondack Mountains. But the interior held its own horrors to my young, fearful mind. Every room was cold. Even in the hot summers, when we often went to visit, they always held a strange, unwelcome chill. There were always odd noises from the pipes and within the walls. Many nights I lay on the verge of tears, trying to convince myself the sounds I was hearing were mechanical in nature. I often struggled in this persuasion, the closet and dumbwaiter doors, always somehow just discernible through the darkness, waiting to unleash some unknown hidden terrors. The basement and attic were naturally the scariest of all. The basement was made of stone and always dark in the corners, the dull exposed bulbs eerily hanging from the chains not enough to illuminate the space fully. There were cobwebs and old shelves with nothing on them as well as other displaced or broken furniture. There were also crawl spaces so small and filled with dirt and broken rock it was a wonder anyone could fit in them. I remember watching my dad's feet hanging out of the wall as he set the rat traps one summer, the house looking like it had finally come alive and ate him like it always intended to with me waiting in line to be next. The attic was equally creepy. There was no shed, and unfortunately, other than the large kayaks, this was where we stored any of our gear for the lake. I would form a line with my mom and dad handing down chairs, umbrellas, goggles, and other equipment. Occasionally, I would be the one rummaging around at top and taking in the scenery. The attic reminded me a lot of the basements other than the fact that it was made of wood and in many places you couldn't stand. There were cobwebs and rat traps 
and displaced furniture, as well as another small crawl space that unnerved me more than the one down in the basement. This one was always locked. I wiped my feet on the large mat at the first floor entrance to the Muhammad Milton Law Office and eyed the secretary. She was quite cute in a black dress with glasses and a tight ponytail perfectly assembled. No chance of falling askew. Maybe a little young for me, now that I'm pushing 40. But when you are recently divorced, you wonder about the possibility with any woman. That's just the nature of it. It was also the nature of why my financial situation was so dire. My ex-wife got the house in the divorce, and I lost most of my savings trying to stay afloat the next few years after. In the fashion of a classic struggling writer, I was only weeks away from being evicted from my shitty apartment. I needed anything I was going to get from good old Gran, even if it wasn't much. Anna, as the secretary's name turned out to be, led me up to the second floor where I waited for Mr. Maham to finish his phone call and usher me in. Mr. Alston, good to meet you. Please come in. Have a seat right there. Maham took my hand firmly and pointed to a large red leather chair sitting next to a small end table and facing his huge wooden desk. My condolences regarding your grandmother. It's fine. Thank you. I replied, perhaps slightly awkwardly. This really won't take long. Just need you to sign a few papers. Now, your grandmother owned a home in the Adirondacks. Are you aware? Have you been there? Yes, I replied, my body tensing a bit at the thought. I was always intending to just sell it, hoping to see it or hear about it as little as possible. And her permanent residence in Poughkeepsie? Says here that she sold the Poughkeepsie home in the late 2000s. Her permanent residence has been in the Adirondacks for the last decade or so. House on Milburn Avenue. Fuck. I said aloud. As it turns out, Grandma had sold her home for reasons unbeknownst to me. I had been intending to live there, at least until I got back on my feet, so I was in quite a state of shock. The thought of permanently living in the house up in the mountains. The house that I hated for my whole life. A house so far in the middle of nowhere, it took over an hour to get to a real supermarket and back, with no cable or internet, in a town with barely 200 people in it. Not to mention a house that, frankly, scared the shit out of me. Had my head swimming. I was on I-87, nearing the outskirts of civilization, making my way up towards the house I hated so. Obviously, I had no other option. The house and what was in it was, by a large margin, the bulk of her estate. The money I received was enough to pay off a few outstanding credit card bills, and then get my account to a level I felt safer. But it wasn't enough to rent with no income. Not when there was a roof already waiting for me. The dead was going on the radio. I sipped the last of my coffee. I was probably going to need more. I was already falling asleep. I still had hours to go. The rest of the drive I spent thinking a lot, trying to find new book ideas. Maybe a haunted house. I laughed to myself. I thought about how I was going to make money so I could support myself since I was, after all, by myself. And I thought about my life here growing up, my grandmother always scowling and muttering to herself, puttering around the house and the garden out back, my mom and her brother always fighting. He was not a good person. Multiple arrests, and at one point, even assaulted my mother and cut her arm with a knife. I often blame him for much of the mental anguish that drove my mother to take her own life. Well, and my grandma, of course. I thought of the creaks and the noises in the basement, the woods, black and silent. The pure isolation indicative of my situation in life. I wondered if I'd ever be able to adapt and to really consider this place home. I wondered, but I doubted. As I pulled into the driveway, the stones crushing underneath the tires, I began to feel very uneasy. The house suddenly becoming all too real and my mind playing tricks on me. Around at the bend, and there it was. Just as daunting as it had been when I was a small child. In fact, more. I parked my car and surveyed the outside property. There was an abundance of crabgrass and dandelions growing in the once pristine yard. A wooden bench swing sat just a few feet away out of the front yard. It was intact, but rusty and possibly not secured. The entrance to an old walking path was barely visible at the wood line. It was almost dark and although it needed some TLC, I thought to myself how the property actually was quite nice. That first night, I decided to try and get some writing done. 
I sat at my laptop in the downstairs study, struggling to find my muse. After about two hours of timid stop-and-go narrative, my writing reached a halt. I poured myself another shot of whiskey and sat back in my armchair. Tap, tap, tap. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. The liquor was burning in my throat and gut as I felt the twinges of hot fear. I looked out through the open door into the dimly lit living room. The sound came again. It was clear now. It was coming from above. Tap, tap, tap. The noises seemed steady, those three taps, coming every so often. There was also a strange whooshing sound and a few bumps. I quickly settled myself down. The noises might have scared me a bit at first, but I soon chalked it up to bad memories. It was an old house. These noises happen, I told myself. Not to mention I had turned the heat and the water on when I arrived, so I was sure it was just that. I tried to continue writing, but I could feel my brain stalling and my eyes drooping. As I was just on the verge of sleep, something jerked me awake and left my body petrified for longer than I'd cared to admit. Just out of the corner of my eye, barely distinguishable in the dim light, the kitchen shone into the living room. I could have sworn I saw something. Someone, perhaps, move. It was so dark and the room so large, I couldn't be certain for sure, but the thing was, whatever I think I saw, it was extremely pale. The light almost reflected off the blur as it moved from my peripheral vision. I got up as soon as my body would let me, my legs locking in protest. I walked through the door and flipped the lights. There was nothing in the living room or the kitchen. I spent the next half an hour painstakingly searching each room in the house. There was nothing. I felt stupid. Here I was, a grown man, scared of his granny's old house, like he was a little lad, seeing ghosts out of the corner of his eye. Was I going to cry as well? After another shot or two of whiskey and a little TV, I made my way to bed. Standing in the master bedroom on the third floor, I heard the wind whip through the old creaky windows. The shutter somewhere on the second floor banged against the house, and the old swing creaked on its rusty chains. Fuck this place, I thought out loud. The next few months passed by slowly. I spent as much time as I could writing, and the rest fixing up the old house. The yard was looking almost perfect again. The damn swing was gone. I had a few bird feeders and a bird bath that attracted an assortment of beautiful species. I even had grandma's old garden blooming again. During one of these hot summer days, as I was washing my car, I was astonished to hear a car slowly trolling down the driveway. I turned off the hose and wiped my brow, using the same hand to shield the sun. Through squinted eyes, I could see the sheriff's patrol car making its way up towards me. Sorry to bother you, Mr. Elston, he said, extending an old, fragile hand. No bother. To what do I owe the pleasure, Sheriff? I came to find out, by way of the closest local bar, that Sheriff Dewey Redman was an old friend and fishing partner of my grandfather's. I didn't remember my grandfather much, but I always remembered what I did fondly. We had met and made the connection while drinking one night, and I often saw him there on his off hours. He would always explain how my grandpa had been an excellent fisherman, but even better company. Sheriff Redman had never been to the house, though. I truly wondered what he could want. There's a woman went missing. Redman said this as he wiped sweat from his brow. Third one this last year. Name's Judy Anderson. She's 31. Blonde, about 5 foot 8. I don't know how much she weighs, but here's this. The sheriff handed me a picture of an attractive woman in a yellow sundress. We found her bike about half a mile up the road from here, just now. I wanted to make sure you hadn't seen anything or heard anything, and to let you know that's what all the fuss is about. Gonna be some helicopters and quite a bit of commotion. Ah, oh, Jesus. Okay, sheriff. Thanks for letting me know. I haven't seen anything, though. I wish I could help. This was the honest truth, of course. I didn't recognize the woman in the photo. Well, we're organizing a search party right now. You can join that if you'd like to help. I spent the rest of the day with the search party searching the woods and the surrounding area. It was extremely thick woods, and every hundred yards or so, you seemed to reach a sheer cliff. The trees and brush were so thick in most places. It had to be cut or pulled away with thick gloves. The heat was suffocating as well. I didn't think anyone without proper gear would really be able to get very far. 
We searched the creek and the surrounding small caves. There was no sign of the woman, but the police did find evidence of a small abandoned campsite and took what remained to be tested. Being summer, the search lasted right until 9 p.m., when the blackness was slowly too great to overcome. I headed home for the night, and the helicopters and police continued the search, bright lights shining in and out of the windows as I drifted to sleep. One thing I noticed right away about living here, where I thought I'd be afraid trying to sleep, the way I had been so plagued as a boy, almost every night here, I seemed to drift into an easy, deep sleep. Things for me started to get a little strange around town the following week. I had been getting funny looks from people at the market. People stared and whispered at the local bar. I would even gotten a cold stare from Joe, the local mechanic who I had previously only had good interactions with. I wondered what the hell could have happened and why. I found out on Friday night at the YMCA where I played pickup basketball every week. As I walked into the gym, the yellow-white glow hurting my eyes. I could see a few of my friends and some other regulars on the court playing. I shouted a greeting and was totally ignored. This was getting old fast. I wished I had a real friend to call and to ask if they'd heard anything. But other than the people who were ignoring me now, I had no real friends. Run it back. The game had finished, but they played a new one. Three other people on the bench next to me swapped in, but I wasn't even given a chance or a heads up. Guys, what the hell? I asked confused. Get out of here, freak. I didn't know the man's name who said this. Caught me off guard. I stood there most likely looking awfully stupid as I wondered what was happening. Davis, leave him. A sweaty stranger barked. Jim Davis was one of, if not the closest thing I had to a true friend in this town. He was the one that got me started playing these pickup games and introduced me to some of these guys. Jim was jogging over towards me, the look on his face. Like he had to say something he didn't know how to say. Jim, I'm so goddamn confused. What did I do? What's happening? Look, man, I'm sorry, but you gotta get out of here. These guys aren't gonna want to play with you. Yeah? Why? It's that girl, Judy Anderson. You moved into that super old, creepy place up in the woods. And she goes missing right off the road. Not even a mile from your place. She's the third girl in like, I don't know, two years? A year and a half? the hell? You think I did something? I didn't even live here until after those two first girls. And I've never even seen this Anderson girl until the sheriff showed me the picture. I mean, Jesus. Who's spreading this shit around town? My 90-year-old grandmother was living in the house when those other girls went missing. I mean, come on. I was nearly shouting by now. This was just so unbelievable. Look, some of these guys knew Judy. He cocked his head towards the group of men, no longer playing basketball standing under one of the hoops. They were all sending death glares in his direction. They're pissed off, and they're looking for someone to blame. I'm sorry, it's you. You really think I would do something like this? Sadly, you know me better than anyone in this place. I don't know what I think, to be honest, man. I'm just saying, for now, maybe it's best you just go. I was honestly hurt, and more than a little angry. I wanted to yell some insults and choice expletives towards the guys, but decided against it due to the likelihood of appearing more crazy. Although tough to pacify all the emotions swimming in my head, I simply sighed and turned away from Jim. As I walked to my car, I felt myself on the verge of tears. I couldn't believe this was happening. Somehow, even though I assumed it wouldn't be possible, I felt even more alone than ever before. I sat at my desk that night and poured myself a shot of whiskey. I was going to have to cut back soon. Realistically, I should stop. I drank here almost every night. The alcohol, I lied to myself, helped my creativity, helped me write. It also helped to numb the pain of my divorce, of my loneliness, and the despaired feeling that inevitably accompanies it. I had poured a few more and was looking at the same page I'd been working on for over an hour when I heard my name. Carter. The voice was scratchy, almost ethereal. It did not sound like a person. Not anyone that I knew, at least. Carter. The voice repeated my name over and over, a few times putting extra emphasis on the R. Every once in a while, I would hear a shifting boom moving from the bottom floor until it was coming from the attic. I was frozen with a painful, throat-closing fear. Eventually, I stood and grabbed the handle to my desk drawer and pulled out my Smith & Wesson 367 Magnum revolver. 
and made sure it was loaded. As quietly as I could, I walked up the stairs and made my way towards the attic. The voice stopped when I had started up the first flight of stairs, but I could still hear bumping noises. Bang. This noise was extremely loud, and it caught me off guard. My throat lumped even harder, and I pointed the gun directly in front of me. Who's there? Hello? I said, my voice clearly shaking. Then there was no noise. I kept walking until I reached the attic door. There was no trap door or pull-out ladder. Just a door at the end of a long hallway that housed a small flight of stairs leading to the old dusty attic. I flipped the light switch and made my way up the stairs. The attic was just as creepy as ever. I dreaded looking into the two black corners, the only unexposed locations from where I stood. I walked a few steps painstakingly slowly until I had covered enough group to check both spots. They were empty. A cold chill raced its way down my spine. I turned to look at the crawl space floor. Please. I begged to, no one in particular. Please still be locked. I walked over to the crawl space door, just a two foot by two foot square of wood, cut into the side of the wall. The keyhole almost seemed to be looking at me as I made my way ever so slowly over, it containing the information that would either put my nerves at ease or cause them to explode. I grabbed the handle and pulled. Nothing happened. Thank God. I thought to myself, letting out a sigh of relief. Fuck, maybe the house was haunted, but at least there wasn't any strange person crawling around in the attic. Not long after, I was in the bathroom brushing my teeth. My eyelids had been long drooping, and the need to sleep was apparent as I had been trying to finish up a bit of writing. I was still tremendously frightened by the whole ordeal, but as there was no clear overt threat to my life, I did my best to put the whole spectral situation behind me. I will admit, however, the fact that whatever it was said my name had me extremely disconcerted. What is happening to me? I wondered, as I got into bed and pulled the covers up to get some sleep. As I did though, I swear I felt some form of resistance, like something had pulled back just slightly, just enough that I had noticed. I pulled the covers back up again and felt the same slight resistance. I grabbed my phone and shone it down to my feet immediately, expecting to see some form of horrible demon. Instead there was course nothing. I pulled my covers up again, this time realizing my feet were relaxing as I went to sleep, each time causing the sensation of my cover being pulled from my neck without me noticing. I had scared the shit out of myself. I cursed and rolled over, sleep ready to overtake me. I went to bed that night wondering if my isolation and drinking were the cause of all this insanity. That night, I woke suddenly to a smell I'll never be able to get out of my head. It was the smell of death, like when an animal is dead and rotting somewhere in the woods but close by. Only this smell was too strong. It made my body rigid with terror. I knew it had to be coming from inside the house. As quickly as my body would let me, I got out of bed and flicked on the lights, screaming in horror as the bright light bathed the room. There were bloody footprints and smears leading in and out of my room, as well as under the bed. I nearly gagged remembering the covers earlier that night. What the hell? I whispered as I ran from the room to get my gun downstairs. Mercifully, it hadn't been taken. I made it back to the room and took a deep breath. I was going to have to look under my bed. I knew this, but every fiber of my being was protesting. I crept to my knees and closed my eyes for just a second. When I opened them, I used the back of my phone to flip the bed sheet up and checked. Gun first. It was empty. There were, however, more blood smears on the hardwood floor. I had realized on my way downstairs that the smell was diminishing as I descended. This could only mean one thing. The smell must be coming from the attic. The emanating smell of death held its origins in the place that fitted it most. My fight or flight response kicked in, and I quickly ran from my room down the dark hall and through the attic door. I flipped the switch and marched up the steps, yelling with my gun drawn. When my eyes broke the plane of the attic floor, and my light shone brightly illuminating the room, I immediately vomited on the floor and moaned in abject terror. There, standing not ten feet away from me, was my dead grandmother. She looked like how I remembered her, only somehow one hundred years older. Her gown was white and ragged. It was her hair. The skin appeared damaged in unearthly ways, and her hands and feet were basically just bones. I looked into her black eyes and saw nothing back. They were just holes, devoid of life. 
I couldn't believe what was happening. I didn't want to believe. The tears were streaming from my face as I croaked out a simple... How? Saying nothing, my grandmother's ghost extended one long, haggard arm. When her arm was out straight in front of her, she turned bald up and then deliberately pointed down. No sooner had she done this, I heard a massive crash coming from down the basement. Go, the spirit whispered. And then just like that, she was gone. I was weeping openly now, but my adrenaline and fight or flight was still in full effect. I had to find the source of the noise in the basement. There could be no more mystery. I flew down the stairs in the basement like a wild man and flailed around the light bulb cord. When I found it, I yanked hard. Lucky it didn't break. There on the ground were two spilled cans of paint and a ladder. They sat next to the open crawl space door. The paint smeared and revealed footprints. I followed them with my gun pointed into the corner of the basement, where the light could just barely touch. There, sitting hunched on the floor and mumbling to himself, was a man. The person in front of me looked barely human. His skin was so strikingly pale, it gave the man an albino appearance. Long gray facial hair surrounded a mouth missing several teeth and lips that were cracked and swollen. The man himself was covered in blood, almost from head to toe. Although he was so severely disfigured by time and a lack of exposure to any light, I was just able to recognize the man as my uncle. My uncle who I hadn't seen in 20 years. A man who had been presumed dead for over a decade, in a way, the second ghost I had seen that night. As I stepped closer, my face contorted in question and terror. I realized what he was saying over and over to himself. I let you live. I let you live. As fast as a cat. And before I even had time to react, my uncle lunged at me. I tried to shoot, but he was too quick. And he slashed at my gut with a large bloody knife concealed within his shirt. I dropped the gun and held in pain. My stomach opening. And hot blood flowing immediately through my shirt onto my pants. My uncle swung the knife again this time. I was able to deflect the knife away from my stomach and it stuck halfway into my leg. More pain exploded through my terrorized body and I screamed. The third blow came to my stomach again as I was just able to move backwards and absorb some of it rather than allow the knife to fully penetrate, which surely would have killed me. I fell to the ground, my uncle tumbling with me. He withdrew the knife and brought it down once again. This time it missed its target and ended up in my arm. In the moment, my left hand wrapped around the 357 that had been lying on the floor. As my uncle pulled the knife from my arm and extended his hand above his head to plunge it into my chest, I swung the gun up and pulled the trigger. The blast was deafening. My ears rang and my eyes burned intensely. They had blood in them. I wiped my face and stood up. The carnage was enormous. My uncle's body lay crumpled, nearly headless in front of me. There was blood on every wall on every surface of the basement. A huge pool of blood was spreading rapidly across the stone floor until it melted with the spilled paint and the two began to slowly mix together. I realized how much blood I was losing and although my mind processed it, I collapsed to the floor right next to my uncle's body. Just before losing consciousness, I was able to phone the sheriff's office. 22 Milburn Avenue, dead uncle, was what I was able to croak out before I fell into blackness. I spent the next two months recovering in the hospital. As soon as I was awake and coherent, I was bombarded by what looked like hundreds of cops. I spoke mainly with two detectives, one with homicide and another with missing persons. With my permission, they totally tore apart the house. They found the freshly deceased corpse of Judy Anderson, as well as the almost fully decomposed bodies of the other two women missing from the area. After conducting a ground survey, they found two more bodies buried deep under the garden plot. Both women were identified and described as transients from out of state. The police presumed these women were killed before my uncle disappeared. Inside the crawl spaces, they found my uncle had developed a system using saws to cut through the wood that allowed him access to climb successfully from the basement up through the house to the attic. There were thousands of old food wrappers, bottles of piss, and plenty of other disturbing stuff up there. There were discarded needles everywhere. The police told me he used to keep Judy and the other women drugged. My uncle had been living in the crawl space for over 20 years, using them in the old cord from the dumb waiter to shimmy throughout the walls of the house. Whether or not my grandmother knew this, and for whatever reason allowed it, or whether she was as oblivious as anyone else, I will never know. 
I came to find out, after offering Sheriff Redman a shot unfortunately, that my whiskey was also being drugged. The effects of the drug powerful enough to cause the old man to stumble and drop his glass. It was really just dumb luck my uncle's sick, twisted, hidden life was discovered. I had been painting earlier that day, and left the ladder and paint cans in front of the basement crawl space. When the police found the body of Judy Anderson, they also found the keyhole to the attic crawl space. Had an old rusty key broken off in the hole, stuck up there, and with the corpse rotting, my uncle had come through the dumb waiter into my room and hid under my bed, presumably with the intention of killing me. I have no idea why he decided to spare me, but he did. When I woke up and went to retrieve my gun, he hid, and ran to the basement as I ran to the attic. While trying to gain access to the crawl space in the dark, my uncle had knocked over the ladder and the paint cans. I doubt I will ever fully recover. Fully. I mean, how could you? I often told myself the ghost of my grandmother was just a trick my mind played on me. That I was just overly tired and seeing things from the drugs. But I knew the truth. I knew I had seen my grandmother that night. Although I moved from that house, and even across the country to the west coast, I still had many nights that I laid awake, terrified, half expecting to roll over and see my grandmother's lifeless black eyes staring back at me from an inch away. With being stuck inside, there isn't much to do. Yesterday I asked my grandfather about his time in the military. I walked into the kitchen while he was eating breakfast. When I initially asked him, he was silent and started acting funny. He went kind of white in the face. He told me to sit down on the couch in the living room. My parents were at the store, so it was just him and me. He said, Well boy, it was 1966. I had just graduated high school and was just a little older than you. I enlisted to impress my girlfriend, your grandma. My big brother Joel also enlisted. I went to basic training, and because of how I handled my rifle, they wanted me to teach the other recruits how to shoot a rifle, and some other simple stuff. I was not happy with the thought of Joel getting killed by some damn commie, while well, I sat here teaching those boys how to pull a trigger, but I didn't really have a say in the matter, so I had to keep at it. At this point he started to move a little bit in his seat. He went to go get a glass of water. He sat back down and continued. So one night, I'm walking back to my barracks at my usual time, when some officer walks up to me. He says, Hey son, how would you like to be deployed in combat alongside some of the most skilled men on the planet? And of course, I said sure. So after a couple of days of being briefed about what my work would be, I met two more boys who were in my unit, 17th Marine Special Operations Unit. It was later dissolved, I believe. Anyway, there was Rodney Slickers, Thomas Saganegua, and myself. We were under the command of Sergeant Henry Dale. I'll spare you the details of training. Let's get to deployment. It was about six weeks later when we landed in Vietnam. So there we were, riding in a chopper, going to some camp in the middle of the jungle. I got to know Rodney and Thomas pretty well. When the chopper landed, we got out with our bags and were greeted by six other men. The unit was smaller than we expected. Sergeant Dale greeted us kindly, though he was real tough looking from his beard and scars. The other men there were Jeremiah Motters, a support gunner, Timothy Freet, a radio man, James Smith, a rifleman, and Sergeant Dale's right hand man, Kyle Richards, a medic, and Ernest Jenkins, who carried our ordinance. I remember them so well. We bonded over the first few weeks. The first time Rodney, Thomas, and I went on patrol with everyone, it didn't go well. We were a single unit because we were special forces. We turned by this small creek when a bullet made impact right in front of Kyle. Kyle jumped and got into cover behind a downed tree, while the rest of us scrambled to a small bank. The Viet Cong were shooting pretty inaccurately at us, but we were still pinned. Sergeant Dale yelled, Jeremiah! Start hitting them with the 60. Jeremiah was a big guy. He carried an M60 machine gun. He coughed and stopped talking for a minute. He resumed. Anyway, Jeremiah started hitting them pretty good. Rodney and Thomas started shooting in the direction of the enemy. 
I joined and started firing too. Before I knew it, we were shooting more than they were, and after an hour, we had them dead. We checked their bodies, sent radio to command that we took out some bad guys, then we headed back to camp. My grandfather stood up and said, that's all I want to say. An hour later, he walked back in and asked if I wanted to hear the rest of the story, and he told me that if I heard it, I needed a strong mind. He made me swear to him that I was ready. All right. After a few weeks, we got a distress call from a unit just south of us. We mobilized. It took us maybe half an hour to get there, and it was night, so pretty creepy out there in the jungle. We went south towards their coordinates, and before too long, the sound of gunfire was getting louder. Then, when we seemed to be just a little bit away, it went silent. Silence in the middle of the jungle at night is haunting, to say the least. Anyway, we got right up on their position and couldn't see anything with our flashlights. Something ain't right, is what Ernest said right before we found a body. Kyle shines his light at two stumps. He was one of our guys. He adjusted his seat. Now, boy, are you ready to hear the rest? He asked me. I said, of course. Okay. We all said things under our breath. It looked like the soldier was blown up because there was a tree over his chest. We picked it up off of him and set it aside. That's when we noticed that he wasn't blown up. There were scratches all the way up his face. Whoever or whatever did that was big too. We chalked it off to a bayonet wound. We expected an ambush, so we got behind the down tree and waited for it a little bit. Then a voice came through our radio. Somebody help us, whispered through the radio. Then the voice gave us coordinates. We headed there. We came over to the coordinates and we couldn't find anything. We all got up against another downed tree and waited. Then we heard a voice. In the cave, said a really raspy voice. We shined our flashlights in the direction of the voice. It was a wounded Vietnamese boy. He was one of the ones helping us. He died very shortly after, but it looked like it was an animal that killed him. We walked into the cave cautiously. We shined our flashlights along the blood-stained walls of the cave until we came across more bodies. Some were ours, some were NVA, and some were Viet Cong. They all had one thing in common. They were destroyed. And as we took a few more steps, I heard the scariest sound I've ever heard. It was the scream of a demon. We all jumped and backed up, shining our flashlights at the noise. There stood an eight-foot-tall beast with long claws, monstrous teeth, and was all dark green. It had spikes all down its back and had what seemed to be scaled skin. He took a second to gain composure. We all ran, except for Jeremiah, who opened fire on the thing. The bullet seemed to only go barely into the beast. It just screamed louder and then grabbed Jeremiah. He began to become visibly nervous. As we ran, we heard Jeremiah yell and then a crunch. We all knew that Jeremiah was dead. We ran deeper into the cave until we hit a dead end. We heard the beast looking for us in the cave. Kyle accidentally turned his flashlight on, and there stood Joel and some other troops. I couldn't believe it was Joel. Joel and I made eye contact and immediately ran to hug each other. We were both shocked to learn that we were stationed so close to each other. We started to tear up. We sat for a few minutes until the beast found us. It grabbed a couple of the other soldiers, and the rest of us ran. We tried to find the exit to the cave, but had no luck. Then we were unpleasantly surprised by the beast being right in front of us. It must have gone through a route we didn't see. It grabbed James and Thomas. We shot into the beast as it killed them. The big son of a bitch ate them up like cookies. My grandfather exhaled deeply. We started running. Now just Joel, Sergeant Dale, Kyle, Ernest, Rodney, Timothy, and myself. We managed to get to where we could see the moonlight down the cave. Mind you, we were navigating the caves with just flashlights, and bad ones too. We ran towards the exit and heard the beast right behind us. Sergeant Dale told us to run like hell. We heard him throw his gun down and pull out a grenade. See you guys on the other side, he yelled. We heard a loud boom and the beast screech. But we didn't dare look back. We weren't going to take the risk. It didn't take long before we were almost out of the cave. We then heard the beast behind us. He paused and bit his lip and closed his eyes before continuing. We emerged from the cave and opened fire towards the entrance. 
where the beast was. It ran through our bullets like nothing, and then killed Kyle. We started running the other ways we heard it eating him up. We got up to an open field, Ernest told us to keep running, and that he was going to hold it off. We told him not to, but we knew what would happen if he didn't. Run, boys. I'm going to bust this shithead, was the last thing we heard as we ran, until the deafening sound of all of Ernest's custom-made explosives. We hit the dirt and turned around to see a massive plume of smoke and a fireball, and the beast which was also on fire. It recovered fast and limped towards us. Fast. Then Timothy got up, dropped his radio, and ran right at the beast. I know that he did that so Joel and I could escape. He started to get choked up, but still continued. Timothy stuck a flare in the beast's nose. Before being eaten almost whole, Joel and I took off running. I could barely hear anything because of my ears ringing, but I heard Joel tell me to run. Joel ran over to the radio and called for air support. He said that there was something big hunting us, and we needed napalm as soon as possible. He pulled out a flare and placed it on the ground next to him and told command to hit the flare location with napalm. I watched as Joel loaded up a magazine with explosive ammunition. He opened fire as the beast charged towards us. Run, little brother, and tell mom and dad I love them, is the last thing he said to me. I was about 350 feet away from him. The air support must have been in the area already, because it got there fast, in about a minute and a half. The beast was right on top of Joel almost. Tears ran down his face as he recomposed himself. They didn't drop napalm. They dropped a whole lot of explosives on the beast and Joel. I know that it was instant for Joel, but it wasn't for the beast. It took another hit of ordnance to kill it. It didn't take long before I heard choppers. A bunch of Hueys landed and some CIA guys got off of them. They told me that Joel's sacrifice saved many lives. They told me that I would be going home. He began subtly crying, but continued. It took a month for me to get home. I was told that what happened shouldn't be spread around everywhere and that I would receive some financial compensation. Apparently Joel killed the Kai Thu Kwa Hang Dong, which means the beast of the caves. That's the whole reason that we were in the area in the first place, to kill that big green asshole. He paused. Please, boy, tell this story to your kids so that our actions on that day aren't forgotten. I agreed. I drove my truck for more than 40 years through the Rocky Mountains, delivering goods, making my money. Never had there been any troubles on my journeys other than one or two breakdowns. But the story that I want to get off my chest at this moment, at the eve of my life, happened exactly as I am about to write it down about 30 years ago, I swear. When my mind will soon find its final rest, I will at least not be able to hear the laughter of the people who read this. It is probably best to start from the very beginning. My life as a trucker might have been a lonely one from time to time, but I could always count on my colleagues. In silent moments, their voices over the radio gave me company in my isolated driver cab. Never would I have even remotely been able to dream up the unsettling situation I would experience. It was the summer of 1976. The month, however, I am not sure about anymore. Maybe June? The journey had led me and my loyal truck over Olive Ridge, at the rims of the National Park, and I gazed upon a crystal clear lake that sparkled down below the road, at the foot of a grassy hill. I still remember the cloudless sapphire sky, filling me with a feeling of comfort and carefreeness. The rhythmic sound of my truck's engine, that had been my sole constant companion for the past years, felt soothing, almost hypnotic. The leather seat that had adapted itself to the shape of my back gave me comfort and peace. Perhaps it gave me too much peace, for I noticed the man jumping onto the road in front of me almost too late. My reflexes allowed me to hit the brakes just in time stopping the truck so that the old vehicle came to a screeching halt only a few steps away from the madman. I must have gotten out of the driver cab and started marching towards him, because nowadays, I only remember standing right in front of the man, ready to rip him a new one. When I stood there, I suddenly noticed something metallic. The lunatic had a gun. Angrily, I stopped all movements and took a closer look at the man. The guy had to be in his late thirties, had blonde, disheveled hair. A crazy look in his eyes and torn, smelly clothes. You, over there, stay still, exactly where you are, he demanded with a croaky voice. I made my peace with God. 
Assuming the lunatic would shoot me, just to get a hold of my truck. Silently, I cursed myself for my stupidity. Why hadn't I stayed inside the truck, where it would have been a little safer? After all, everybody knew that people at the roadside never meant good news. Calm down, dude. I must have tried to talk to the madman. You, you are not him. I thought... The guy stuttered, perplexed. What is your name? What do you want from me? If you want to kill me, just do it already. I tried to distract him. My name? I... My name is Stanley. Or Stan. I had a breakdown. Must have gone too fast. Too hectic. He introduced himself, pointing behind his back with his free hand. Only now, I noticed the old jeep, having been run up against the mini trees at the hillside, apparently by a confused Stan. That calmed me down a bit. Perhaps he was content with hitching a ride. Where to? I asked. Just forward. Just forward. Stanley whispered and looked up and down the road, apparently searching for someone. Suddenly, he took down his weapon and started crying, shaking. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I'm just not myself anymore. Please, take me with you. Please, I beg of you. I will give you all of my money, everything I have, everything you want. Please, I beg of you. If I were to stay. Confused? I took a closer look at the poor sob and started thinking about knocking him out cold. However, the strange, deep fear in Stanley's eyes made me hesitate. Additionally, some extra money was always a nice thing, especially in my line of work. Are you on the run from the cops? I wanted to know. Helping a wanted man was not my cup of tea, after all. The police? No. I would have been happy to meet a sheriff or a deputy around here. Perhaps they could have helped me. No... Don't worry, but I need to leave now. He shouted agitatedly, whilst flailing around the gun. Alright, alright, get in, get in. I hastily said. It would be easier to knock him out as an emergency measure, when he was sitting right next to me. This is why I let him climb onto the passenger side, with a grumpy mumble. I took my place behind the wheel again. Please, I'm sorry, but my life is at stake here. Stanley started apologetically, after some minutes of unpleasant silence. Hmm? I said. What is your name? He wanted to know, probably to calm the situation down a bit. Bert, I said. Well, Bert, I'm really sorry for my behavior, but I'm just terrified. He might get me. Stanley looked down at the ground, terrified. He? Don't be so vague. I barked at him. You would never believe me, Stanley's son. I've heard my fair share of crazy stuff. One of my colleagues tells me of his Bigfoot sightings at least once a week. Your story can't be more unbearable. I informed him, nodding my head towards the radio. My tale is so crazy, even I wouldn't believe it, had I not just lived through it. Stanley admitted with a gulp. And hurry up, tell me, my son, admittedly getting a bit excited. I had always liked a good story, and that way this poor guy at least wouldn't accidentally shoot me in the head. So be it. It all started yesterday. Everything. Yesterday, when my life was still normal and boring, I never would have guessed saying this one day, but I missed my bleak job as a desk worker, my little box. Well, it was around midday, and I took a walk during my break time as I did every day. You know, I met many people that think of Salt Lake City skyline as something that closes you in. But for me, it has always been home, a place of safety. I have lived my whole life there, never having known anything else. Poor guy, I remarked. How could one ignore the call of this huge world, the call to adventure? I know myself, that I am just a man from this city, but my life was great, until yesterday. I walked on hurriedly through downtown, enjoying my break. Then it happened, a car crash, right next to me on the main street. An old van hit a school bus. Perhaps the driver had a stroke. Anyway, you might understand the shock I was in. The bang, the smoke, and I don't know why, but moments later the bus was ablaze. Horrible. All those people just... Stanley stopped and looked into the void, trembling. Everyone would be shocked. That still does not explain your behavior, I remarked. But on the inside, I couldn't wait for him to go on. No, no, of course not. If it had only been that, a shock would have been easier to cope with. 
everything burning ablaze, and then I spotted him. He was standing on the other side of the street and observed the gruesome happenings, completely unmoved by the screams and the smell of burning flesh and melting metal. This man, expressionless he stood there, letting his gaze trail over the parts of the bus that were disappearing in flames. His dark gray pinstripe suit did not have a single mote of ash on it, and his dark shoes shimmered in the light of the midday sun, sinister and alien. His skin was pale and strangely coarse his white hand gripping an old suitcase. That thing looked hideously out of place and out of time. I firstly could not get a look at his face due to the smoke, and today, I wish it had stayed that way. I, I can't describe this grimace. I just can't. My throat won't let the words out. And when I looked at the man, I suddenly felt his icy gaze resting on me from those eyes. I don't know why I fled, but I only came to my senses back at my office, back in my box. That's all. A face. A man. Perhaps he fought in a war and got disfigured. Surely you can't just... I tried to argue. Stanley, however, was quick to silence me. His face was not scarred. No, it was something different. It was... I just can't. And that was not the last encounter I had with that man. When I tried to distract myself with work, I didn't notice the passing of time. It had already started to get dark and my colleagues had gone home one after another. I stayed, trying to digest what I had witnessed. From one moment to the other, I started to get terribly sick. I felt his gaze resting on me again, and there he stood, directly in front of me, in the box next to mine. He started moving in my direction, slowly, steadily. And then, I asked, not believing what I heard. I did not feel well. Stanley apparently had lost his mind due to the accident, probably had gotten a concussion, who knew what he was capable of doing at the moment? What do you think? I ran away, out of the building, onto the street down below, and he was standing there as well. How did he get there? I had to flee, flee from this thing, away into safety. I took my car and drove, drove away, just away. I had been going the whole night long, and again and again I saw him in the rearview mirror, driving a dark car, following me, chasing me. Every time I managed to shake him off, then I must have momentarily nodded off due to the exhaustion. Hit the tree, then you found me, and I had to take that chance. I had to. I had to go on. What if he had caught up to me? I looked at the shaking Stanley in disbelief. Seriously? Yeah, of course. Do you think I'm kidding around? Fortunately, I had the gun inside of my car. He whispered. I said nothing and looked at the tank meter. We would not get far with what we had left. On the next occasion, I steered my truck down a side road, towards one of the many service stations located in the mountains, where I finally parked next to a fuel pump. What, what the hell are you doing? Stanley stuttered, having turned even more pale. We cannot stop. He'll catch up to us. Yeah, well, if the tank is run dry in a few miles, we will be even more screwed. And stop with this man. You're under shock and stress. I barked at him and got out of the truck to refill the tank. Just as I was about to take the fueling hose, a horrid scream pierced the air, shaking me to the core. It was Stanley's voice. The poor lad had finally gone crazy and with terror, I heard the roaring of my old truck's engine. Seconds afterwards, the vehicle was speeding past me, leaving me behind in a cloud of dust. Confused, the guy had screwed me over, telling tall tales. Or he had been madder than I had thought in the beginning. It didn't matter, for I had neither the promised money nor my truck. I cursed again. How could I have been so stupid? Why had I let him into my truck in the first place with this laughable story? Why did I... Moments later, I heard the sound of another car zooming past me, and my heart almost stopped. Behind the wheel of the black vehicle sat a being so horrendous that I could not even have dreamt it up out of my worst nightmare. A man, pale as a corpse wearing a dark gray pinstripe suit and a big black top hat. His inhuman face burned itself into my memory, despite me having seen it only for a few moments. The eyes seemed big, lidless, and slit-shaped. His wide grinning mouth ran from one ear to the other. That smile looked like a part of hell itself. Staring, the creature sped past me in its car, not having noticed me, and I will forever thank the Lord that it didn't. It sped past me.
after my truck and disappeared into the distance. I am not sure whether I hallucinated all of the set encounter, whether the story of poor Mad Stanley had shaken me more than I had meant. However, I cannot believe that such a hellish smile has been produced by just my own imagination. My old truck was found on the same day. Someone had run it against a rock wall, yet the driver was never found. Only the bullet holes deeply piercing the passenger seat. This situation took place about five months ago. I'm an 18 year old, 5 foot 3 female, about 120 pounds, and at the time I was living with my boyfriend and roommate. On this particular night, I had the apartment all to myself, as I had the night off work, and my roommate was staying at her boyfriend's place. Now my boyfriend and I were running low on weed because the plugs in this town are super awful at their job, so he had given me a phone number to a guy he wanted to buy from. Just for the record, I felt completely comfortable doing this as I do it all the time. I would like to add here that this particular day, I hadn't smoked much at all. Not to mention smoking weed has never made me hallucinate once in my life. So with that being said, I'll continue. It was around 11 or 12 when I hit up the dune. Soon after, he replied something along the lines of, about to head your way. I told him I'd meet him by the mailboxes, by the leasing office because no one actually gets into the complex without a key card or passcode, or at least no vehicle, as you can still get in by walking through an unlocked side gate. So I made my way from my unit to the mailboxes to wait for him. I was scrolling through Reddit as I waited, in, when all of a sudden, I heard the squeakiest vehicle drive in. I looked up to see an old brown Chevy truck. At first, I assumed he was just going to pull through the gate, and that would be that. But instead, almost as soon as the person saw me standing there, they turned off their headlights and then pulled up to the closest possible parking spot to me. Which at first, I thought that this was the guy I was supposed to meet, but just kept looking down at my phone because I was unsure and hadn't received any texts from the guy. I felt extremely uncomfortable by this random ass truck just sitting there with his headlights off right in front of me. But I just ignored the person until I noticed the window closest to me it was now rolled all the way down. I look up for a split second to see a homeless man looking middle-aged with yellow instead of whites in his eyes. We make eye contact and I immediately force my eyes back to my phone screen. Just looking at him made me feel a sinking sensation in my belly. I decided I was going to call my friend Ashley. I just wanted to make sure the dude didn't try to interact with me or anything. As I hold the phone up to my face, I look back at the man still right in front of me staring at me, but now. I notice his lips are moving. He was talking or more like murmuring to himself. At this point, I decided I was done waiting for this guy, so I'm gonna walk back home. Still on the phone with Ashley, making half-assed conversation like, how's your mother? And OMG, that's so crazy. I start walking away from the mailboxes as I unlatch and walk through the tall metal gate. I make it about five feet from the gate before I hear a car door slam shut. I look back to see. Yep. You guessed it. The man walking up to the gates I had just passed through seconds before. Keep in mind, you're not allowed to park at the front office parking, unless you're meeting with the landlord or checking your mail. So why would he be leaving his vehicle there at 12 a.m. to come in through the side entrance gate? As this is happening, I'm telling Ashley everything that's going on. I tell her, I'm scared, that this dude is definitely following me. My heart is racing. I don't have time to say anything else before I notice just how much space he had filled since I last looked back at him. I decided that I would walk off the sidewalk and just cut through the parking area, making a straight line to my apartment. Which mind you, it's kind of odd to walk on the sidewalk, but I knew if he followed my trail off the sidewalk, I needed to run. So when I noticed him stepping off the sidewalk almost exactly when I did, which mind you at this point he had followed me down the right entrance path past the pool and the laundromat, so in my mind, I was more than certain that this man was trying to follow me. I spoke softly into the phone, I'm going to run for it, more saying it to mentally prepare myself, so with that, I tarted away from the dune, crossing through the grassy areas and passing one of the dumpsters until my unit is in eyesight. I feel as if I've put enough distance between me and the man. I look back to see the man with both arms up, as if to say, where are you going? 
He looked exhausted with his chest moving up and down with every breath. I continued to run until I make it inside my apartment, locked every single lock on the front door, I run upstairs, and lock myself with my three small dogs in my room. I immediately hang up on Ashley to call my boyfriend to tell him what just happened. I remember pausing and just thinking to myself, wow, did that really just happen? He ended up texting the plug telling him some freak just chased me all the way home. As I was on the phone with my boyfriend, I started to hear something. At first, I thought I was just tripping, but then I hear it once more, knocking on my front door. But my dogs didn't even start barking before the knocking on my front door stopped. The feeling of relief of hearing it stop is immediately replaced by fear stinging through my body, as I remember that I have a large glass sliding door downstairs in my dining room, and I couldn't remember if it was locked or unlocked. My roommate had a habit of leaving it unlocked when she let her dog out. And I would like to say, I went down there and rushed to lock it, but instead, I just turned off my lights in my bedroom and locked my bedroom door. I know, not the brightest idea, but I was just so scared. So I just turned my bedroom light off and hid in there for a good while. Nothing else ever happened that night. I ended up checking out all my windows for the man and nothing. Judge me if you must but I eventually did go back out there to the mailboxes to meet the weed man later that night, but I took my car this time, along with my roommate's biggest kitchen knife. Weeks go by without incident. Weeks go by, me never seeing this man or his truck ever again. And trust me, I looked for it often in the complex. So just stay safe out there, because apparently there are freaks literally just waiting to chase you home in the middle of the night. Living in an urban landscape, there aren't any nice park trails near my house. In fact, the nearest walkable park is about a 30 minute drive away, so instead of driving for an hour whenever I want to get some fresh air, I've taken to walking my neighborhood. Well, today was a particularly lovely and bright day, so I decided that it was a wonderful idea to take a walk and enjoy the breeze. As I stepped outside, the cheerful songs and strange noises of the local songbirds filled my ears and I took in the angelic sight of the sunlight reflecting off of the bright green leaves that covered the trees. My eyes took a moment to adjust to the world's bright complexion. Damn it, I had forgotten my sunglasses again. As I started walking down the decently sized hill that separated my cul-de-sac from the rest of my neighborhood, I realized that I was the only one on my street, not like no one else was walking. There was literally no sign of any other human life besides myself. None of my neighbors even had their window blinds or garage doors open. Normally this wasn't too strange of an occurrence, but for such a beautiful day, it was pretty weird. Suddenly gray clouds started to move in at an unnatural rate, and under a minute the sky went from completely clear to smothered with a thick layer of dark clouds. As the sky lost color, the world also lost something. Sound. In the same moment that gray clouds completely filled the sky, all sound had disappeared. By the end of the minute, I was screaming and trying everything to do to make noise. And yet I heard nothing but silence. Then a head popped up out of the curb drain. It was huge, gray, misshapen, and lacked eyes, ears, or a nose. Its only facial feature was a mouth full of large, crooked teeth. Two large hands emerged next with unusually long, tentacle-like fingers. And I finally started running away from the thing. As I sprinted down the street, I realized that the world looked wrong. It lacked all color. Instead, being made up of various shades of white, gray, and black. It looked like the world was from an old black and white photo. As I ran towards my house, I made the fatal mistake of looking back. The thing had fully emerged now and it was at least 20 feet tall. The whole body was gray and horribly misshapen. The worst parts were its arms and hands. The arms hanging down halfway through its calves and its tentacle-like fingers dragging along the street. The creature lumbered forward and I turned around to continue fleeing, but I never got far. I hadn't even covered 15 feet when giant tentacles started to fall around me. They fell as to make a sort of box shape. I looked around to try and find an exit, but there were none. Right before they fully enclosed me, I looked behind myself at the creature. Its fingers had grown to enormous lengths. 
and it was the dozens upon dozens of tentacles branching off of the original ten digits that were currently trapping me. After I was fully enclosed, the tentacles started to merge together. They melted into one structure like hot candle wax until I was left in a blank white landscape that offered a panorama as far as the eye could see. It's kind of like that one Harry Potter limbo scene, except it lacks any of the architecture and essentially everything else present in this strange world of white. As I type this on my phone, this place provides a strangely good cellular connection. I wonder what will become of me. Another late night at the little bottle and I'm standing here zoning out to the hum of the shitty old neon sign that hangs out in front of the place. The store has a nice, grungy feel to it. It's dimly lit, and you can hear dogs barking maniacally in the distance. I mean, Christ, what an atmosphere. I often wonder why I still work in a place like this. And I suppose I just stay because I'm used to it. I often feel like some sort of a drug dealer for the government. Boy, oh boy. I think anyone would be shocked by the sort of people that come through these parts. I look up to the clock on the wall, 10.37pm. What a nice sight to see. At 11pm, I can lock the bloody place up, give the floor a quick mop, and then I can get the fuck out of here. There's always one customer though, every single night, that just has to sneak right on in just before closing time to buy something. I get that people aren't psychic, but by around 9pm, I'm already sick to death of serving the inebriated clop heads that wander in. Customers are just the last thing I want to be dealing with in the midst of the evening. The neon light that glows in a nice radiant blue against the pavement out front of the shop serves as my indicator of an incoming drunkard. I can always spot their silhouettes stumbling towards the shop door, and I hastily summon up a smile to greet them. It's a load of BS on my part though, of course. I really couldn't be asked to greet some drunk all nice and cheerfully, but the last thing you want to do is piss off some drunk, and I guess my smiles keep the manager happy. You've just gotta do what you've gotta do. Just my luck. Here I am checking stock, and out of the corner of my eye there's a silhouette. The shadowy figure disappears quickly, and I'm met with some bearded bum in a tattered old overcoat, wandering in through the entrance. He looks out of his damn mind. He's pacing around the store, muttering to himself. I speak up. Anything I can help you with, sir? No reply. He looks as though he is composing himself. He's taking long, drawn-out breaths. Now, finally, he too speaks up. Mind if I have a quick look around the cooler room? Sure thing, man. Take your time. I respond belatedly. For my own sake, I really hope this bloke hurries up and gets whatever it is he wants. I can't help but notice the way he keeps checking over his shoulder as he walks into the cooler room. The guy seems real paranoid, just real on edge. Time keeps moving forward. The hum of the neon sign can only keep me occupied for so long. I look up at the clock. 11.04 PM. Damn, I really got a close shop. I'll give the guy a few more minutes max. I sigh out of frustration and look to the neon light. That's strange. An idle shadow figure is there in the light of the neon. I suppose it could just be someone waiting out front, but something about their figure irks me. Its arms are out to its sides, fingers spread, and its fingers are long, head tilted, with its knees bent like it's waiting to pounce. What in the hell? I've seen one too many horror movies. There's no way I'm going outside to look at whoever or whatever this is. It must just be someone that's completely off their face. Fuck's sake. I just want to go home now. And this guy is still in the cooler room. I want to go back and check on the guy, but that shadowy figure is seriously freaking me out. Its fingers are moving, bending about strangely. Could this just be someone waiting to play a joke on the guy? Screw it. I go to walk into the cooler room and suddenly the constant droning sound of the neon sign stops. I turn back around, and I can just barely see the pavement outside the front of the store's glass door. No more shadowy figure. But what if it's still there? How could I tell now? Could still be standing there out of my sight. Is he gone? I hear a voice say from behind me. Excuse me? I say, stammering as I turn around to face the bum. Terror is strewn across his face. 
I was being followed by someone, I swear it. Someone trying to mug me, I think. Couldn't tell you what he wanted, really. Did you see him? He says, talking at a million miles per second. This guy is clearly some sort of a tweaker. No normal person's jaw smacks around like that while they speak. I saw a shadow out front, but the light went out. I think you should stay here. We should probably call the police. I responded. Police? Nah, nah, no police. No way. I've been there a damn near half hour. If that fellow wants something from me, he can come get it. The bum says. He looks pissed now. Addled and irritated. Hey, look, man. I really think you should hang tight. Before I could even finish. He had made his way out of the entrance. His figure disappeared into the night. Just moments after he left, the neon sign began to flicker. The hum droned in and out, and in the short burst of light I could see it. The thing was still there, and it was moving. Its shadow moved, and for a moment I could see it. It was a split second, but it felt like an eternity. Gray with black eyes, long, thin limbs. Its legs stretched unnaturally far, and in a singular moment under the neon light, I was able to gaze upon it. Then it was gone. The light continued to flicker for a few moments more, and it was back on as normal. I was riddled with fear. I didn't even know where the rest of the night went. In some confused stupor, I closed as usual and wandered home. I remained in this state of paranoia for days. I was finally brought back to reality by the headlines of all the papers. The murders continue. More homeless found dead. I flickered through the pages, and there he was. Raggedy beard and all. Pictured, Mark Rylan, has been missing since October 14th. If you have any information, please contact authorities. This is not my story, but my uncle's. The story has been passed around my family for some time now, but I thought I would post it on here to read other people's thoughts and opinions. This is a true story, according to my uncle. Years ago, my uncle, his wife, and all of their children were on a road trip to Pennsylvania. They were going to stay with a relative of ours for the weekend. My uncle was the one driving, and his wife was in the passenger seat. My aunt wasn't usually able to sleep in the car, so she was drifting in and out of sleep for the past hour or so. Their children were already fast asleep. It was late at night, and my uncle hadn't seen any other cars for a while. He saw a sign that said something along the lines of, Philadelphia, 100 miles. I can't recall the exact distance that I was told, but I do know they were probably a couple hours away from their destination. My uncle called the relative to let them know how far they were. As soon as he got off the phone, another car appeared in front of him. Naturally, he thought it was strange as he hadn't seen any cars for some time now. He was going to say something to his wife, but he did not want to wake or disturb her. He chalked it up to him being tired or just not paying attention. It was odd, but he continued driving anyway. He was driving with the car still in front of him for another 30 minutes or so. He looked to his right and saw a sign that said, Philadelphia, next right. My uncle knew immediately that something was wrong. He made the decision to ignore the sign. It did not make any sense that it would be the next right when, only 30 minutes ago, he was 100 miles away. At this point, his wife was awake, but just barely. He continued driving and saw that the car in front of him took the next exit. Knowing something was off, my uncle was curious, so he watched as the car drove off a cliff. He was stupefied. He asked his wife what the hell was that person thinking, and if they should pull over and call the cops. Only his wife responded with, What car are you talking about? My uncle didn't say anything, and continued driving to their destination. To this day, I am still scared of going on road trips late at night. I do not know what my uncle saw. My aunt did not see the car in front of them, and obviously did not see it driving off of a cliff. Why was my uncle the only one who saw it? Was my uncle just imagining the car and the sign? The names and places have been changed to protect my privacy. I'm a 19-year-old girl. I live in the northeast of the USA. And last year, my ex and cyber stalker was sentenced to five years in prison. I'm getting ahead of myself, though. 
The story starts in late 2014. I was 14, almost 15. I was laying in my best friend Melie's bed while she showed me an app she had found. It reminded me of Facebook in a way. However, instead of adding people you already know, you add people you don't know to make friends, like the newer app Yubo. I noticed that all the people in her feed lived in our area, and I had never met some of the people. It didn't take much convincing for her to get me to download it. So that day, we laid in her bed giggling about boys in her bed. Eventually, I came across this very attractive blonde, 17-year-old boy. He had the perfect emo hair for 14-year-old me, and he had sent me a friend request. I accepted, and showed Molly his pictures. She got excited for me, and I can still hear her saying, Get it. So, we started talking, and he was very sweet. He seemed almost perfect, except he lived over 1,000 miles away. I told Molly in disappointment, and questioned how he got into my recommended, as I had set the distance to a minimum of 30 miles. Her face soured, and she shrugged it off. He apologized for not telling me sooner, and wasting my time. I responded by telling him, I'm on here to meet people, it's okay. We can still be friends if you'd like. So, we continued speaking to each other. Eventually, we exchanged kicks, and decided to start talking on there. Soon after that, my parents picked me up, and I went home not paying attention to my phone for about half an hour, as my little brother wanted to play when I got home. After a couple rounds of hide and seek, I picked up my phone, and noticed I had multiple kick messages from who we will call Nick asking where I had gone. I know what you're thinking, red flag, but to me, this was normal. All my friends did this when I wasn't texting back. For weeks we talked every day until he asked me for my Skype. I didn't have a Skype, so I downloaded it on my laptop and made an account, then had him add me. He accidentally sent me a link to a random web page, then he Skyped me that night. That was the first time I saw his face. He was the person he claimed to be. I asked him about the link, but he just said he meant to send it to another friend and apologized, so I thought nothing of it. We laughed and talked for hours, until I asked him when his birthday was. He started crying. I mean, bawling his eyes out. Ugly crying. I was so confused. I just asked about his birthday. I kept asking what was wrong. He looked up and said, I lied to you. My heart sank in that moment, but I still had no idea what he was talking about. Not 17, 19. No, I was speechless. There was nothing I could say. I put the wrong year in on accident and forgot about it. I remembered a little bit ago, but I didn't think it would go this far. I didn't think I would fall in love with you. My head dropped. I had just turned 15. I'm old enough. He loves me. I looked back up at the monitor and said in the most stern voice I could conjure up, I'm not going to say that's okay. You should have told me sooner. Why wouldn't you have just said something? It's just two years. I mean, I love you too. From then on, I dated him for almost three years. Throughout those years, he would send me gifts to my house, love letters, anything I wanted. We talked all day, every day. At first, it was sweet, but it started to get frustrating. It didn't matter if I was at school or with my friends. I had to text him back immediately, or he would freak out and question my loyalty to him. It got to the point where he would make fake profiles to see if I would cheat on him. I tried to take these opportunities to break up with him, but I was so naive. I believed I had to save him. The first occasion he Skyped me, he wouldn't show me the bottle, but he took these pill capsules, opened them up, dumped them in water, and drank it. I know now that it was nothing toxic. The next time he used liquid latex and fake blood to send me a picture of him, slitting his wrists. He sent a picture with a needle in his arm, then a picture with a fake gun painted black to his head. And I eventually broke down and went to my guidance counselor in school. She got the police involved, who then got his county involved. Once they searched his computer, they found not only many pictures and videos of me that were taken of me changing without my consent, as that link I had mentioned earlier turned on my camera, but he had other girls he had done this to and he had thousands of downloaded content. Someone who used to talk to him recently contacted me and warned me that he was still out on bail and made terrifying claims. The friend said, You were the only one who stayed as long as you did, and he's obsessed with you. He told me when he gets out, he's gonna come for you, and spray paint heartograms on your house just to mess with you. Don't forget, he does know where you live, he said. She's the first and the last I'll never forget. 
He's never going to leave you alone. I know. I was very naive. I'm about to delete all my social media. I'm going to make my parents aware of what was said to me closer to the time he is to be released, as they are aware of the incident, but not in detail. I don't know how to protect myself. He has nothing to think about me until 2024. Then, he's free to come see me. That is, if he doesn't get out early on parole. My name is Skylar, and I'm 17. My family and I moved from our old house to the one we currently live in about two years ago, and I have some scary stories to share. My family consists of who we will call K, an 11-year-old stepbrother, R, a 16-year-old full brother, N, my stepfather, and M, my mother. When we moved into the old house back in 2011 or 2012, it was thrashed. I had a bad feeling right away, but I thought it was just because I was young. The vinyl flooring in the kitchen was torn up, and there was mold in the windows. We fixed up the house and ended up all living there for a year or so. At that point, my mom and stepfather had a falling out, and we, my mother, brother, and I, moved into a trailer for another year. Although we didn't live there, within a few months, we started going over to the house on the weekends. I believe this first story happened during one of those weekend visits in around 2013 or 2014. My brothers and I were sitting in one of the bedrooms playing some new video game that was out at the time. I believe it was one of the first Skylander games, as that's what my then 5 or 6 year old stepbrother was into. We were called into the kitchen for breakfast. The two boys ran out while I wanted to finish something in the game. The room became almost completely silent at that point, as I believe the TV was muted. Then. I heard what sounded like a grown man saying, Katie, as if he was calling or taunting someone. It didn't necessarily scare me. I was purely confused. In my naive mind, I said to myself, my name's not Katie. I believe this response was due to me not being introduced to the paranormal. The next story happened years later when we had been fully moved into the house, maybe around 2016 or so. I was sitting in our kitchen at the table. For this one, I will need to give you a little bit of context as to how the kitchen was set up. I was sitting sort of sideways at our kitchen table. If I looked to my left, I saw the sliding glass door of which was open, to where it was just the screen separating me and our wooden back porch. If I looked in front of me, though I could see my mom's bedroom door to the right, and further down were the basement stairs to the left. Anyway, I was sitting at the table filming a video on my iPod, making some kind of cringy update video for whatever YouTube channel I had at the time. I was talking to the camera, of which was pointing downwards facing the table, and all of a sudden, I heard what sounded like, ba ba ba, but slower and more drawn out. I stopped talking and almost stopped recording. The kitchen was completely silent when I heard the exact same noise. I screamed out of fear, somehow upping further into the tiny chair I was sitting in. My mom came out of her room angry as can be, as she was asleep. It was mid-afternoon by the way. She worked night shift at the time, and my neighbor yelled over asking if everything was okay. My brothers and I were friends with his granddaughters, who were around our same age, so we knew him pretty well. Creepy experiences to say the least. I should have learned this lesson four years ago, when it would have made a difference, but I was young and foolish. And I was on exchange in a foreign country, and like much of what I learned at the time, it slid into half-forgotten memory, only to be painfully jolted back into consciousness at the most inopportune moments, because it has become too easy to forget the things I should remember. Four years ago, I was in Germany doing a thesis on brick gothic architecture. The university there had been kind enough to arrange accommodation for us Americans, too illiterate to go through the system and I ended up in a beautiful pre-war building that had been subdivided into residential units. Now only the old German lettering on the facade pointed out its original purpose. Kinderheim. It means children's home, but it actually means more like orphanage, said my flatmate. I had five flatmates in total, and he was the one kind enough to give me a tour when I arrived. It was an immense building and the necessary of the tour had become self-evident when he took me to the basement. As is common in buildings of this scale, 
Its basement was a maze-like network of subterranean corridors, snaking around maintenance rooms and what I assumed were other apartments, as a couple doors led to side exits in the building. My flatmate led me around an impossible number of turns before we got to the grand finale, a large room with industrial washers and dryers. Here, you can wash and hang up, he had said. This interaction encapsulated all the interactions I had with my roommates, quick and functional. We had no animosity that I could detect, but they were all German and I think they were self-conscious about their English, though I couldn't find much wrong with it when we did speak. I, on the other hand, did my utmost to fulfill the American stereotype by not bothering to learn their language. Why did it matter if I was back home in a few months? I had a quiet existence which was more or less how I liked it. On occasion, I did get drunk with that group of Americans that invariably forms when we leave our natural habitat, but I preferred to wander the old town streets and pour over references in the library. In the apartment, I rarely left the confines of my room except to use the bathroom or the kitchen, so it was only a little bit strange when December rolled around and everyone left for Christmas. We were all students or apprentices in that apartment and we all had parents to go back to, apart from me, who was too broke for an intercontinental round trip. I elected to stay alone in that apartment for six, or the three weeks, which made up the most wonderful time of the year. I loved it. For these three weeks, the apartment became my house. I spread myself into the kitchen, left my boots in the hallway, and I populated the freezer with chicken in preparation for the long supermarket holiday. I even left my toothbrush in one of the two bathrooms, the smaller one right by the apartment door, whose windows looked down on a side entrance to the building. With so much freedom, my pattern became irregular. Some days I spent cooking, others I spent in bed, only to leave the apartment sometime past midnight on a directionless wander. The town would be beautifully empty, and I was free to go where my boots would take me. This regular irregularity eventually congealed into one blissfully monotonous static. So, it was especially jarring when the doorbell rang in the middle of the night. I was asleep, and when I was awoken I hadn't bothered to check the time. My first response was to be annoyed. It was more a buzzer than a bell, and a loud one at that. Still, it took another ring for me to convince myself I wasn't dreaming. It was a longer one this time, more insistent. At this time of night, I slid out from the covers, dressed only in my underwear. Possibilities rushed through my mind. Was it one of my flatmates who came back early? Had he forgotten his key? My bare feet padded down the long hallway. At the end of it, next to the apartment door, was the intercom system that communicated with the front entrance. I picked up the receiver and put it to my ear. Hello? Involuntarily looked over my shoulder. I hadn't turned on the lights perhaps out of habit from when I wasn't alone in the apartment, but I was alone. No response came from the other end of the intercom, just static interference. I tried again. Hello? Is there anybody there? Then I could hear the sound of a voice, a woman's voice, crying. I froze, unprepared for this eventuality. Two of my flatmates were women. Could something have happened? The crying voice further materialized into words. German words. It was a stream of desperate syllables. I couldn't understand anything. Mentally, I cursed myself for not making more of an effort to learn the language before launching into the only German I knew. Anna? Is that you? Confused. Huh. Came from the other end. Or was it a sob? I tried again. Franzi? There was a pause. Then as if spurred by the list of two unfamiliar names, the crying started again. It was louder. Another barrage of unintelligible syllables through the sobbing. Frustration at not being understood, crescendoing her voice into a shout. But this time, I could pick out one word, even with my limited understanding. Help. I then realized that I wasn't hearing her voice solely through the intercom. I took a step into the bathroom. I could hear her sobbing coming in through the bathroom window the one that looked down on the side door of the basement. That meant she wasn't at the front entrance, where the intercom was. Maybe it was because of this detail that I didn't open the door immediately. I was sure that the intercom was 
only at the front entrance. The cord was already stretched to its limit, so I set the receiver down to look out the window. It slipped from my cold fingers and clattered down to the tile floor. I left it there, opening the window to crane my head. It was no use. Too dark, and the window was too far out to see the side door. I closed the window. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe there was an intercom at the side entrance. I went back to press the button that would let her in, but I stopped. She was crying really loudly, obviously desperate, and I was a half-naked foreigner. I ran back to my room to put on some clothes. It took much longer than it should have to find the sweatpants I discarded on the floor, and there wasn't a clean t-shirt in the closet. I dug one out of the dirty laundry hamper, and as I came back into the hallway, I knew that I must have taken too much time. No crying woman would wait this long at a stranger's door before moving on to other options. I got to the intercom and pressed the button. The buzzer sounded, signifying the front door was unlocked, but it was too far away for me to hear whether someone opened it, and if the woman was indeed at the side entrance to the basement, I definitely would not hear it open. I turned the knob and stuck my head out. The hallway was dark. She was gone. She must be. If she had come in, she would have flicked on the house lights, unless she was distraught, vision blurred by tears, and didn't know where the switch was because she was in a strange apartment building. Come on, man. Think. I swung the door open. But again, I stopped. I didn't have the key on me, and the door would lock automatically. I was alone in the apartment, so if I locked myself out, I wouldn't be able to help myself, much less a woman suffering from God knows what. I needed to get back to my room. Just then, I heard voices. They ricocheted off the hard concrete walls of the stairway. I couldn't tell if they came from upstairs or downstairs. There were two of them. One was the woman, sobs still in her voice, but she was calmer now, in conversation. She sniffled as she spoke. The other was also female, but lower pitched and calmer. Her questions seemed confused, as if she had just been woken up. I eavesdropped further, but the muffled echoes just sounded like German to me. I went back inside, closed the door behind me. This was probably for the better. Not only did she find someone to help, but someone to actually understand her. It wasn't a job for me. When I slid back into the warmth of my bed, I realized I had been shivering. Strange events on a cold night. I did not expect myself to find sleep anytime soon, but I did. And when I woke up in the morning, I had already forgotten the incident. It became one of those dreams that fell between fantasy and nightmare. The one so slightly bizarre that the waking mind forgets them until strange details are triggered by moments of deja vu. Even then, it's unclear whether this fragment of the past is real or just a half-remembered dream. I had a Skype call with my parents scheduled that next afternoon. Their morning. It was just to say hi, Merry Christmas, wish I could be there. They like to make Christmas into an all-day thing, and catching them for a moment before they started ended up far less tiring than being there in person. After I hung up, my brain occupied itself with other matters of waking life. What movie to wash a day? Whether or not to roast the chicken I had in the freezer? How to enjoy the last six days of being alone in the apartment? I did not remember the incident from the night before. Even when everyone came back for the new semester, and an ambulance took the body away. I decided to walk home from a morning class that day. The ice underfoot hadn't yet been melted by the winter sun. I only looked up in time to see it pulled out of the driveway. There was a group of neighbors standing at the front entrance, gossiping. One seemed to be crying. In the fray, I noticed my flatmate, the one who had given me the tour on my first day. He beckoned me over. It's good that it's a cold winter this year, he said in his German accent. What do you mean? Mary from upstairs. Her flatmate came back today and found her. She was dead since a week. Nobody could give a straight answer to how Mary from upstairs had died. She suffocated in the night, someone's son. No, it was suicide. She did it in the bathtub. It certainly couldn't be murder because in the months I remained in the apartment, no cop came knocking, and being one of the few actually in the building at the time, I would be a person of interest. I was as morbidly curious as the next, but it never seemed a good time to ask. Excuse me. Do you speak English? Can you tell me how that girl died? Nobody asked those questions. Not even the police. 
seemed. As time passed, so did the curiosity. Until she was just the girl who died. Death happened all the time. Today, tomorrow, and so on. It was sad and shocking, but explainable. I didn't attend the funeral. Instead, I started an affair with a classmate of mine, an American girl. Then went back to Indiana to complete my thesis. I got an A, got a car, got a job, got more debt. I rented a small apartment on the cheaper side of town so Lauren could come over when she could make the six hour drive. Life was good, but every time the doorbell rang, I would start to shiver. It was Lauren that noticed it the first time she came to visit. She had parked her car and rung the bell and I came downstairs to pull her into a kiss. She grabbed my hand. You're shivering. Are you nervous? Am I? I guess I'm just cold. Come here. I know how to warm you up. She really did. We decided to stay in bed all day and order in. When the doorbell rang, I was too tired and naked to answer, so she put on a t-shirt and got the pizza. When she came back in, she stared at me. Are you okay? I think it was at this moment that started her habit of studying me. Every now and then, I would catch her staring at me while I was preoccupied with whatever I was doing. It wasn't the way a girlfriend would look at her boyfriend, more like an eye through a microscope, watching a bacteria culture, wondering how it moved, and why it wasn't moving now. We broke up when the lockdown hit. According to her, we broke up because I was inattentive and emotionally distant, but she had been cold for a few weeks. And the virus was a convenient catalyst for ending things. With her gone, I was once again left to my own devices. I got laid off. I had nobody to adjust my schedule to. I spent my days cooking and sitting on the couch, chasing every nostalgia that came to me. With her gone, I had nobody to ring my doorbell, to come up and remind me of distant memories, of a time that must have been important to somebody, somewhere. But now a memory is emerging to the surface, forgotten dream that has to be written down before it slips the mind again, the kind that can only be recalled through a passing moment of deja vu. And now that I can remember more and more, I'm starting to be scared, because the doorbell has been ringing every night. Before this virus kicked me out of my dorm, I had a scarring experience. I hate living in dorms. Because people never be quiet, my college makes all freshmen live in a dorm. The people that live right next to me seem like they were always making noise. They are the only thing that I do not miss from college, but I'm not here to rant about that. It seems like it all started back in August after I moved in. Their loudness first started off sounding like it was a bunch of people having a loud conversation, along with even louder laughing. Of course this annoyed me, but I was able to play some video games and tune them out. There would be times where I'm about to sleep, and I hear a loud pounding noise, along with some moaning. Whenever this happened, I would listen to music until I fell asleep. I had to deal with this for a few months up until around 1am on January 12th. It was quiet before I heard the people next to me being even louder than they had previously been. It sounded like a male and a female were arguing about something. Oh my god, here we go again, I said in my mind. I put my ear against the wall. I was able to clearly hear what was being said. The guy's voice sounded familiar. I eventually recognized it to be one of my classmates named John. Do you think this is funny? Do you think this is a game? John's son. It was an accident, I swear. I can't remember what the girl's name was, but I'll call her Sarah. I can't tolerate this anymore. After I heard this, I felt the wall vibrate as I heard Sarah yell in pain and being pushed into the wall. Then it sounded like he was beating the life out of her. I have to stop this, I thought. As I was at my door to intervene, I got a text from Xander, a friend of mine who lives directly across from the dorm where this is taking place. Hey, do you hear all that noise that is coming from Sarah's room? Yeah, I was actually about to put a stop to it. John is pretty dangerous. I think you should stay out of it. I don't care. I'm tired. And these people are always loud when I want to sleep. Good luck careful. After that brief conversation, I went over to the dorm and before I was able to pound the door, I saw the door shake as Sarah was being pushed on it. No, oh, please, Sarah shouted, begging for mercy. Instantly after that was said, a hole went through the door. 
I heard a bullet whistle past my ear, and the bullet went through Xander's door, and I heard him shout, ah, fuck, as later I learned that he was hitting the foot. I froze, I don't think anyone else heard the gun, because I think it had a suppressor on it, as it was fairly quiet. I stared at the door for quite some time until I saw blood pouring from under the door. I didn't have time to see anything else. I quickly ran back into my dorm and went to hide under my bed. I then heard John yell, I didn't mean to do this. After that, I heard John screaming, and then bullet holes started to appear in my dorm. I called the police and they quickly arrived. I first heard police pound on John's door. This is when I opened the door and saw John get tackled by a cop. While the other cop told me to get back into my dorm, I heard John yell that he didn't shoot Sarah and how it told him to shoot her. The cops weren't having it. Everyone eventually had to leave their dorms. I walked past the now pool of Sarah's blood as I was leaving. I kept hearing Sarah's voice. No, please. Xander was okay, and the doctor said he will make a full recovery. This event just happened, and I'm assuming Josh is in jail waiting for his trial. The university I attended was quick to fix the holes in my walls, but every time I walked past Sarah's dorm, there's police tape that says, Police do not cross. I just can't believe I almost died in this. If I were just a few inches to the right, I would have met the same fate as Sarah. I have lived on a reserve since birth. It was located near a big city in Ontario. My reserve was quite small, but it was still able to house a ton of people. I lived by a store that always smelled like bread. I have never been able to sit straight, so I go to the house whenever I can. This was due to the fact that it was cramped, and I was helping with everything all the time. My favorite part of every day was when my friend would come to get me out of the house. I have been close with them ever since I remembered. My grandpa was a big part of my life and how I was taught everything. I was always happy when I saw him, even when I was in a bad mood, until one day, he just up and disappeared. This was hard to deal with because I didn't have anybody to comfort me, but I moved on. My reserve was like a fairy tale, everyone knew everyone. With that being said, it got annoying sometimes when I went for a walk. Yes, it is all good and fun, except for one part of it, the abandoned village. The village near us scared me a whole bunch. It was creepy, run down, and unsettling. I heard stories of people disappearing without a trace. I felt uneasy whenever I played near it, because I heard something. Not just the houses settling, not the animals there. Voices of my grandpa. It sounded like he was calling me. He was trying to draw me there. My mother told me the stories of the skinwalker. She was a traditionally native woman, so she did believe in this stuff. I was always forced to wear a special necklace that would ward them off. It was made of a leather band, with a metal carving of a deer skull on a triangle template. It said something on the back. It was in Ojibwe. I didn't know much, but I didn't care. Thought it looked cool. I always shrugged it off as just a fairy tale though, except that night. I was around 14 when this happened. My best friend was the guy named Noah. I was also friends with some others named Terrell and Michael. We were your adventurous, outdoorsy kids. So we thought going to camp near the village was an amazing idea. I was packing some clothes because Noah told us we would be sleeping there for a couple days. This was during the summer, so it wasn't out of the ordinary to our parents. I was walking down my stairs when my mom walked into the door and told me to be extra careful. I told her, yeah, I will, while questioning myself if I would. I found myself at the table picking up some food for the camping trip. I was miss grabbing supplies for s'mores when I was interrupted by a knock on my door. I opened it, and surprise, surprise, it was my friends. I let them come in while I was getting my bag prepped. Noah called out to me. Hey, when are we going? I responded in an annoyed tone. We go and we go. Before the sun went down, we were on our bikes pedaling down a trail that led into the forest. I was ahead to see if there was any potholes or rocks. It was a clean road. Michael was abruptly stopped when he hit a rock that wasn't there before. I must have missed it. While Noah and Terrell were helping Michael up, I was looking down the dim lit trail. thought I saw a bear, but it must have been my imagination. That was when I looked closer. A bear the size of a truck was stood on its hind legs, staring into my eyes. 
They were disturbingly human and dead. I pedaled back to my friends that I left down the trail. I made it to them breathing so heavily it would be heard from a mile away. Noah asked me, Hey Chuck, are you good? I responded with only a nod. It was getting darker so we continued on our path. I forgot about the bear and was about to warn them when a tree fell down in front of us. We were so startled we all jumped off our bikes. Michael inspected it and told us, the roots must have been loose. We believed him because we were stupid 14 year old kids and climbed over with our bikes. We finally reached the end of the trail and followed the more compact, hastily made trail for kids who wanted to drink in secret. Felt like miles when we were walking, but we continued forward. Noah interrupted our conversation saying he needed to go to the bathroom. While waiting for him, we played a good old game of would you rather. Halfway through Michael's, Noah came back looking sick. His eyes were done, similar to the bear's. His skin was pale. He looked as if he was staring off miles into dead air. I felt uneasy when I saw him, but nobody else seemed to notice. Even though he looked different, he acted as usual. I was talking to Terrell about some problems at home. While we were making our way to the spot, Michael said, Now, when we get there, I'm going to make a good fire, and it's going to be a blaze. Michael then revealed a small bong, along with some weed. Noah's son, where did you get that? Michael then told us, I yoinked it from my brother. He won't notice it's gone. I was at the front of the trail when it opened up to a large clearing, and off behind some trees directly parallel was the village. I felt a chill run up my spine when I seen it. Michael shot me a look that said the same. I walked over to a spot with a fire pit and yelled, This looks like a good spot. Terrell barreled over to me with his tent gear in his hand and told me, Is no one looking different? I was shocked. I thought only I noticed it. Yeah, he makes me feel uncomfortable when I look at him. At the same time, I said that Noah was walking towards us and shot me a look that was so unsettling my stomach crumpled up. I then noticed that Michael was nowhere to be seen. I then asked Terrell, Where's Michael? Unsurprisingly, he didn't know either. It was pitch black when we set up the fire. It was blazing up the pit with its flames. I felt a wave of heat when it sparked up. I seen Michael over in the distance jogging towards us. I only noticed when he shot a loud shout at us. I was startled by it so much that my phone fell into the fire. I was both pissed and relieved, he told us. I dropped my phone back there. I couldn't find it for an hour, but here it is. When he said that, he pulled it out of his pocket and shook it with a smile on his face. It wasn't even a minute when Michael pulled out his bong. It started to smoke. I was a good kid, so I passed on it. So did Noah. Terrell and Michael were giggling over on their side of the fire, while me and Noah were talking about space. I felt uneasy when I looked off in the distance and seen a light inside the tree line. It was shaking so violently that I couldn't pinpoint the location. It was then cut off abruptly when I stood up. I thought it might just be a couple teenagers goofing around, so I went back to talking. I felt really tired, so I zipped open my yellow tent and went to bed. In the middle of the night, I was awake. I seen my tent's flap opening. I couldn't move in case it was someone trying to prank me, but it wasn't that at all. I took a peek to see what it was, and from the dim lit fire, I made out a distorted, deformed face peering into my tent, grotesquely large human teeth. It noticed I was awake and grinned at me. I felt something sharp touch my leg. I woke up to myself cutting my arm with a knife. I threw the knife to the side and called for my friends. Noah woke up and came to my tent with a light. He looked at me with cold, lifeless eyes. I felt that same feeling as before. He started to bandage my arm, but Noah called out from his tent. I felt the most intense panic rush through my body. This Noah that was in front of me wasn't Noah. I ran out of my tent and was abruptly stopped by this imposter. My leg felt the most intense pain I have ever felt. I was so scared. I watched in horror as this thing's face deformed into darkness. I couldn't explain what I was seeing. Its mouth opened while its eyes rolled back into its head. It inched closer to my face. Its skin was tore up. Cuts and bruises covered its body. Skin as pale as a vampire. My body only then started moving. I was kicking and screaming at it. Terrell, Michael, and Noah came out of their tents to see a towering creature lumber closer to me. I felt a moment of adrenaline and screamed for my friends to run towards the village. He did as told. We sprinted as fast as our legs could bear. 
Michael tripped over a stump. I wanted to help him. I wish I did something heroic, but I kept running. We all hid in horror, listening to our friends scream until it was cut off, and all we heard was fast moving footsteps. We all held our breath when it got closer and closer, until nothing. We felt a moment of tranquility. We all looked at each other with relief in our eyes, until we heard Michael call out our names. Noah, where are you? Terrell, the thing left. It disappeared. Chucky, help me. I felt tears run down my cheek. I balled up and started crying. Terrell walked outside and said, Where did it go? No motion for him to come back, but it was too late. The creature took form and picked him up. Its mouth opened to reveal those horrific teeth. The thing bit down on his head. We watched in horror as our friend's lifeless corpse fell to the ground. Sprawled out in the grass, blood pouring from his head. I crawled up some stairs. Noah didn't follow. I heard the monster kick down doors of other houses. The pitch black blinded me. I could only hear the creature's deafening scream. It sounded human. Too human. I was huddled in a corner with my knife trembling in my hands. The door was then kicked in downstairs. I heard it crawl towards Noah screaming and clacking its teeth. I heard him scream and cry for it to let him go. I started biting down on him. I heard his screams end. I felt hopeless. I wanted it to stop. I turned on my phone's light and seen my grandpa's hat on a chair. This monster took him. I started crying. I was hitting the wall. I wanted for it to kill me. I heard it crawl up the stairs. I was sitting on the chair with that hat in my hands. I was then face to face with the monster. And I could tell, truly tell what it was. I was staring at a skinwalker. It picked me up, tears running down my face. I seen that it was wearing Michael's shirt. Its mouth stained with my friends. I wanted it to end. I closed my eyes and waited. But it didn't. I opened them and I was on the chair. I looked outside of a window and seen it scamper off into the distance. I looked down and I was wearing my special necklace. I walked home alone that morning, my clothes dirty, my pant leg ripped up. I just told my mom it was a fox, but I knew that she knew. Reports of people missing were almost monthly. My friend's parents were trying desperately to find their boys, but I knew it was all for nothing. I moved away when I grew older, got a job in a city, never stayed long. I got a wife and kids now, but every time I feel like I lost it, I always seen it, stalking me, wondering what happened that night. Wherever I went, it followed. Saturday nights were our favorite nights, and the only time we really had to ourselves. Mark went to school on the other side of town. Abe only visited from Seabrook once a month. Jared worked after school and only had weekends off. My basement was our haven for blasting Queen on the radio, playing Super Mario until our eyes practically bolted out of our heads, and passing around Dad's tobacco pipe. It was the beginning of 1989 and the first Saturday of the year. That meant a basement celebration. Despite me hating the basement, and my entire house for that matter, it was the only spot we had. Around 8.30pm, I heard Jared's keys tapping on my window, opened up the door to see Jared, a six pack in his hand, with Mark and Abe right behind him. We all took a seat on the Davenport that was stained with cigarette ashes and time. Going about usual business, Mark cracked open the beers and said, cheers to what hopefully won't be a shitty year fellas. The night unraveled into conversations about upcoming tests, Jared's new girlfriend, and Mark kicking ass at Super Mario as I watched in disbelief, having taken weeks to get the levels that he aced in minutes. The basement was stuffy and smelled of cigarette smoke, weed, sweat, and Jared's cheap cologne that he doused himself in earlier that day as an attempt to impress the new girl. The basement was a familiar place, but a place where no matter how much we were enjoying ourselves, I always felt off. After an hour or so, my sister, Cynthia, walked down the basement steps to greet us and to tell us she was heading out to work and wouldn't be home until her usual time. Cynthia's footsteps creaked on the old shabby boards as she walked back up the steps and said, see you pathetic losers later. 
Super Mario started to bore us after a while, and around 11pm, Mark suggested we go to Margaret's Diner and order a nightmare breakfast of eggs and hash browns. We agreed, we got our jackets, and set out to all pile into Jared's 1984 Volkswagen Rabbit, a smell of stale gym clothes and dried up fried chicken. His car was filled with junk, but Jared hadn't just gotten his license, so he was our only ride. The four of us packed ourselves in tight, shoulders squishing, and trying to avoid stepping on the nasty treasures beneath our feet. I realized just then, after already being crammed in tight, that I had forgotten the money on top of the radio in the basement. I thought to myself, God damn it, I don't want to go back into the basement alone now that the house is empty. Because that's something I absolutely never do if I'm in the house alone. As I said already, the basement is the most dreaded place in my entire house for me. It seems to always give the feeling that someone is watching. It seems to harbor some sort of inexplainable phenomena, some sort of evil. It was the least inviting of rooms. Chipped 70s wallpaper, shaggy carpet painted with stains and watermarks, grandpa's old radio in the corner, and constant bone chilling cold. Even in summertime, the basement was always cold. I got out of the car, zipped my windbreaker and told myself, fuck, just down and up the steps and you'll be fine. It's just a basement, but the basement preys upon you when you're alone. Once inside the house, it was quiet and dark as it usually is at night, and I made my way to the basement door. The basement is completely visible from the street and my driveway, and the staircase can easily be spotted through the window. I creaked the door open, pulled on the light switch cable to illuminate the stairs, and instantly felt the biting cold sink its teeth into my skin. Hastily, I made my way down, and Ninja grabbed my wallet on top of the radio, and immediately made my way back up the steps, turning the light off on the way out. The same feeling I always had was present. Someone is there. Someone is watching. Something sinister. I knew it the moment I opened the basement door, and still felt its tight, cold grip as I walked out. Walled in hand, I scurried across the lawn and back into Jared's clown car, buckled myself in, patted the roof of the car and said, Alright, ready to go. In my head, I was thinking of how overjoyed I felt to be in the presence of my friends instead of that horrendous basement for even a nanosecond longer. Jared started the engine, but before pulling out of the driveway he asked, Hey man, what about Cynthia? I raised an eyebrow and said, What about her? Doesn't she want to come with us? Confused, I replied. Cynthia left over an hour ago for work. Her car isn't here. Mark and Abe turned and looked at each other. Eyebrows furled in bewilderment. Then looked at me. Abe's voice shook a little as he spoke. If Cynthia left an hour ago, then who was the woman in the white dress following up the basement stairs? I got into urban exploration in my early teens, and ever since, it was pretty much my go-to activity whenever my free time coincided with decent weather. Despite multiple forums and videos on the topic, incessantly suggesting that one should go with a group, I usually went alone, since I had very few friends and most of them lived in other states. Much to my surprise, in my first year of college I finally met someone who was also into this exploration thing. Damien and I had little in common aside from our weird fascination with decaying empty structures, so I wouldn't exactly call us best friends. I even harbored a slight, latent resentment to him sometimes, since he looked like the typical upper middle class hipster, always with a fresh haircut, wearing a dapper business casual outfit, whereas I was perpetually broke. Frankly, I was skeptical that someone like Damien would actually enjoy urban exploration, but all our differences aside, I could at least count on him to show up on time at the specified location. And this time was no different. It was an abandoned psychiatric asylum in an isolated semi-forested part of the suburbs, relatively easy to access, yet less popular than most other spots around the city. In other words, perfect location. After getting off the train and walking for about 15 minutes along a desolate road, we turned onto a narrow trail which led into the surrounding forest. We had to make our way through thorny bushes and mud before finally seeing a dark gray silhouette of a six-story stone building. Everything inside me was tingling with anticipation as we approached the gloomy structure and I reveled in the bleak atmosphere of the place. 
My companion, however, was a bit twitchy. On our way through the forest, he cut himself a few times, which, judging by the sounds he was making, was quite painful. Man, are you sure there's no other way to get to this hospital or whatever it is? I mean, you can try to walk through the backyards of adjacent properties and get arrested for trespassing. Either that or you follow me. I briefly turned around to see if Damien was keeping up with me. Okay, fine. I'm just asking. Because all these thorns, you know? We finally arrived at a paved parking lot in front of the asylum. All doors had padlocks on them, but we managed to slip in through a window. Inside the place was dark and moist. The walls glistening in the scarce gray light that made it in through mostly boarded up windows. An occasional drop of water from the ceiling sent high-pitched ringing echoes down the empty hallways and rooms and pieces of broken glass and tiles cracked under our feet, announcing every step and making it almost impossible to move around silently. The heavy cold air moved reluctantly in and out of my lungs, filling my nose with a bitter, earthy smell of mold and rotting wood. I heard Damien cough several times as he pulled up the collar of his jacket, leaving only his eyes exposed. A moment of awkward silence passed, and I was finally reassured that we are the only ones in the asylum, which meant I could stop listening for any suspicious sounds for the time being. I pulled out my cheap digital camcorder and hit record. Move out of the frame, will you? I theatrically waved to Damien, observing his startled expression. Seeing his reactions to my nonchalant attitude was oddly amusing, but I did my best to maintain civil appearances. We slowly moved in and out of rooms and through hallways, exchanging sparse, meaningless sentences in the process, until we reached the stairs on the far end of the west wing. The staircase was drowning in darkness, somehow impenetrable for the weak sunlight from the hall, and even the flashlight on Damien's phone could barely break the darkness, giving only faint outlines of the next couple of steps right below our feet. It is now that I realize that much less light was coming in from outside than I expected, and that was the reason I decided flashlights were unnecessary this time. By my logic, no one should bother boarding up windows this heavily on a building that's barely even known among local residents. Whatever the case was, we slowly started making our way upstairs, holding onto the walls, guided by a thin sliver of light escaping from under the door to the next floor upstairs. As my fingers traced the rough brickwork, I could feel something wet and vicious on it. I was briefly grossed out, but I thought, I'd rather soil my hands than smash into the wall head first. The door to the second floor luckily wasn't locked, but it still took a few good pushes to crack it open. To our relief, the second floor was not as dark, and not nearly as much windows were covered. At this moment, I finally looked down at my left hand, the one that touched the wall. A thick, brownish liquid was covering my fingertips, hitting my nose with a putrid stench as I brought my hand closer to my face. A thick lump rose up in my throat from the depths of my stomach, and I instinctively tried to wipe the unknown substance off my hand on the nearest relatively clean surface. What's up, Jerry? Damien faked a concerned voice, seeing how I frantically rubbed my palm against one of the plywood boards lying around. Just got some muck on my hands. No big deal. And stop calling me that. I'm not even sure why, but hearing Damien call me by my nickname was extremely irritating. And despite initially hoping that he would just forget it, I now regretted letting him in on the nickname at all. Jerry was a thing for close friends and maybe some family members, not him. My camcorder was still rolling, so I tried to reduce shaking to a minimum as we walked further down the hallway, poking our heads into the patients' rooms that we passed. Most of them were completely empty, aside from the occasional broken chair or a metal IV stand on tiny wheels. At the end of the hallway was a wide, open area that looked like it could have once been a common living room, and it too was mostly empty and poorly illuminated. My eyes instantly caught a single hospital bed positioned right in the center of the room. It was stripped down to its metal frame, all rusted and covered in small dents. Impossible to tell, man-made or not. The springs, which once held up the mattress, now sagged in the middle, corroded by age and weather. A pair of handcuffs hanging from the top rail of the headboard. Slightly less rusty than the bed itself, more edgy than creepy, I scoffed to myself. Maybe some other explorers who've been here before us left them as a kind of scare prank, but I couldn't say I wasn't into it. Hey, can you take a picture of me on this bed? 
A half question, half demand came from Damien. I shrugged, put away the camcorder, and stretched my hand out to get my friend's iPhone as he was making himself comfortable in the bed. Do you want me to get the whole room in, or just yourself? I don't know. A couple of takes each. I took a few pictures of Damien doing poses on the bed from where I stood, capturing him as well as some graffiti in the background, and then headed towards the foot of the bed. He thought he was being funny by making faces and such. Taking a few more high-angle shots of Damien, I placed the sole of my boots against the metal frame right in between where his feet were resting, as if claiming the bed my trophy. Can you stop doing that? Damien frowned. Doing what? Standing like that over me. No offense, dude. It's just weird. Whatever. Would this do? I shrugged. Handing over the phone and secretly hoping that my companion is satisfied with the pictures and doesn't ask me to take more, he sat up and started swiping through the camera roll. I remained standing next to him, using the opportunity to quickly review the footage on my camcorder. Surprisingly enough, it wasn't as dark as I feared it would be. I get to the part where we enter the staircase and decided that since there was probably nothing to see anyway, I can skip a few seconds. But when I pause the video, the staircase didn't exactly look right in the freeze frame. I went back a few frames in there, half flight, down towards where I assumed was the basement, loomed a dark silhouette that looked too much like a human, but couldn't have been any of our shadows. The sickening feeling and the numbness from before came back. I felt the tips of my fingers grow cold. Nausea crept up as I processed what I saw in that frame. The person saw us, but just stood there motionlessly. They let us walk right past them without making a single noise and devil knows for how long they've been standing like that. That's not what one does when exploring. I had no clue how we could have missed it on our way there, but now I felt trapped. My only hope was that the opposite wing of the building had another open and undamaged staircase. At that point, I no longer cared about getting more footage or further exploring that place. As calmly as I could, I called out to Damien, showing him the still frame from my recording and telling him that we should get out before the staircase stranger confronts us. For a brief moment, he suspected me of bullshitting him, then tried to rationalize it away, but eventually came to the same unsettling conclusion that I did, gradually descending into quiet panic. We slowly got up, straining our ears to pick up sounds that would signify someone's approach, but the whole building suddenly fell dead silent. We made a few cautious steps in the direction of the eastern wing, and stopped again to listen. The plan was to walk at a normal pace like we didn't notice anything. And as soon as we got out of the building, we were going to run to the train station. Just as I was about to make another step, the silence was shattered by a raspy, metallic screech that came from the same direction we did ten minutes earlier. It sounded like chunks of corroded metal grinding against each other. Suddenly I felt like my guts were suspended in zero gravity, cold beads of sweat forming on the back of my neck. I shot a quick glance at Damien. And at that same instant, we took off through the damp, dark corridors, nearly tripping over various trash scattered about. I could still hear the intermittent dragging, or I thought I could hear it. I don't know. Maybe I was hearing things in between Damien's and my own heavy, uneven breathing. I desperately fought the nagging desire to turn around and look back, but I couldn't risk tripping and falling. After a couple turns, a door with a staircase sign appeared further ahead, slightly ajar. This gave us a small but much needed burst of energy. We squeezed through the narrow opening and stumbled down the steps, skipping two at a time as some of them were missing. Not bothering with trying to find our original entry point, we burst out through the nearest open window, landing awkwardly onto the wet, cracked pavement overgrown with weeds. Tearing my way through thick undergrowth, I ran in the direction of the road, not paying attention to thorns and branches slitting my skin listening to Damien's footsteps close behind me. Shaking and out of breath, we eventually reached the train station. It looked like we were the only people there, and I wasn't even sure if security cameras were working, but we were lucky to see a train slowly roll up to the platform just moments later. We tried to talk on our way home, but neither of us could hold up the conversation, so we ended up spending most of the train ride in silence. Somewhere in the back of my mind, I made a half-conscious decision to not get in touch with Damien for a while after I get home. I wasn't exactly looking for another you ruined my day whining session anytime soon. Fast forward to several days later, I received a message from Damien on Facebook, but I didn't open or read it. 
You probably blamed me for ruining our little exploration trip, and although I myself felt responsible, I didn't need any of his opinion on this. Not today. No. Not in the mood. And so the message has escaped my memory for the next couple of days. Sitting in class, I noticed the empty seat where I'd usually see my friend. But other than that, I didn't pay much attention to my surroundings or the lecture. That is, until our professor announced that Damien was reported missing, and asked anyone who knew anything about his disappearance to come forward with information. A weird mixture of emotions washed over me, ranging from guilt to a passive, melancholic dread, all while I struggled to hold my poker face. But there was no way on earth this would be related to our weekend visit at the asylum. It couldn't be. We ran out of there together. The message from earlier came to the forefront of my mind again. The lecture ended. And as soon as I left the auditorium, I grabbed my phone and opened the messenger app. I noticed just now that the message, in fact, was a link to some obscure file sharing website. It opened to a single picture of Damien, the one I took in the asylum. The high angle shot from the foot of the hospital bed, Damien lying on it with a smug look on his face. Timestamp on the message indicated that it was sent yesterday at 2.37 a.m. At this point, I was starting to get nervous, but this text unsettling as it was, proved no clue as to what happened or where Damien was. I could report it to the cops, but just as I was about to put the phone away, it buzzed in my hand. Another message from Damien, another link to the same website. I tapped on it with a shaky finger. Another picture. It looks almost identical to my shot from before, except this one is darker and somewhat blurrier, and Damien gagged and handcuffed to the bed. His swollen, bruised face contorted into a painful grimace with bulging bloodshot eyes, unnaturally rolled up. Below, a massive gash in his abdomen, spilling blood on his naked body and partially revealing the intestines. But as gruesome as it was, the remarkable similarity between it and my photo made it so much worse. Same room, same goddamn bed, same angle and shot composition, and I swear I could even see at the very bottom a cropped off part of someone's foot propped against the rusted frame. Then I noticed something else. Unlike the first one, this photo had a caption below it. This is how you take a picture, Jerry. I used to live right next to a park where I would take my dog for walks. The park was comprised of two walking paths. I was taking my dog for a long stroll through the park one night at about 10 o'clock when I decided to stop for a moment at one of the seating areas. As I sat down on the bench, I noticed an unusual stillness over the park. Normally, there would be people out in the parks this hour, maybe the occasional jogger, bicyclist, or someone like myself out walking their dog, but tonight, there wasn't a soul in sight. Where I was sitting, there were approximately 10 picnic tables. The structure covering this area was about 9 feet in height, and was constructed of 5 panels arranged in a zigzag pattern, like a row of pitched roofs edge to edge. As I sat taking in the view of the park, I started to hear an odd sound from the roof above me. My dog, also hearing the sound directed his attention behind us, where the noise seemed to be coming from. It was an odd shuffling sound against the metal panels of the structure. Not sure what to expect, or what to do. I stood up and held still for a few moments, listening to the movement above. Once the sound moved to the edge of the structure, it came to a sudden stop, and everything fell quiet once again. Just as I was about to exit the area, via the opposite direction, I heard a high-pitched screech. As I looked up, I saw the face of an old, decrepit man peering over the side of the structure. My dog barked and lunged towards the man, where he stayed motionless with a gigantic smile plastered across his face. Pulling my dog away, I ran faster than I have ever before or since out of that park. When I returned home, I immediately called the local police to inform them of a potentially dangerous homeless man in the park. The result of their search, I was sadly never made aware of due to the police never getting back to me. To this day, I've never forgotten the suffocating panic and fear that gripped my body in that moment, nor shall I ever be able to forget the inhumanly large smile of that man which is now forever burned into my memory. A 
I wanted to climb Mount Everest when I was a kid. Well, my mom and dad did. I heard them talking about it one night after I'd come home from school. Ever since then, the thought of it stuck in my head. I loved everything to do with snow. The texture, the crisp coolness of it, and the wave of heat you felt the second you stepped inside. Boots squeaking against the hardwood floor as you tracked the powder in behind you. But my favorite thing was the silence of it all. Somehow, the snow muted everything. You could shout as loud as possible, and all you'd hear is a whisper in response. It was magical. It really, truly was. I can't really say that had anything to do with Christmas, unlike most, though I am a fan of the holidays as well. But the fact remained, I adored the snow-covered peaks and valleys of Oregon, where I'd grown up. I'd head up to Timberland Lodge each winter with my parents, grab some hot apple cider at the cafe, and ski each day to my heart's content. It was my favorite time of the year. My parents, they passed away last month. I decided to carry the torch in their absence and booked a round trip to Nepal. I know, traveling at a time like this. Please don't judge me. The grieving process has been less than kind to me, and it was the only thing I could think of doing after the funeral. In terms of actual logistics, I'd be staying at a lodge near the base of the mountains, which, of course, resulted in quite a few signed waiver forms. I remember thinking that by the end of it all, I'd probably have to be seen for carpal tunnel. I knew that, should the weather be bad, my trip would be fruitless. Going up the mountain was already a dangerous feat by itself, made impossible by bad weather. Of course, what I didn't account for was the unpredictability of it all. You can already see where this is going. I wish I had. The day I arrived at the base of the mountain, I came prepared. A warm parka, two hats, two pairs of gloves, etc. Notably, I had some MREs in my backpack just in case. I didn't bother bringing fire starters due to the guide carrying them. Just a small camping stove and fuel for a few uses. This was all in case of emergency. Warm food was better than frigid, I remember thinking. I met up with my group, four others. Another woman and three men. Our guide, one of the men, was tall with a scruffy beard. My name is Jamie, he introduced himself. I'll be your guide on our hike for the next several days. It's long and grueling, and I want everyone to know that there is no shame in backing out now. He paused for a moment, nodding once he realized no one would be volunteering their resignation on this mission. There are six camps on the route to the top. We're currently stationed on the first one, at the very bottom. The entire trip can take up to two months, so I hope you all found really good babysitters. He joked, causing a few dry chuckles. He cleared his throat awkwardly tugging on his jacket. The rest of his speech was mostly explaining when we'd be stopping for breaks and where. You'll notice that the trip for me did not take two months. I left early last month, on the 8th. Nothing went as planned after a while. The first few weeks went as smoothly as possible. I slept in the chill each night, eating around a campfire and getting to know my group. Abigail was a mother of two who had just flown the nest. Luke had just dropped out of college and was seeking himself, he'd said. Dennis was a father who'd lost custody of his kids and simply had nothing better to do with his time. I heard that usually groups were bigger, but with everything going on in the world, they tightened up the reins significantly. Abigail called it quits at the second camp, bidding all of us a tearful farewell after exchanging numbers. That left three, and those three would stay with me until I was utterly and completely alone. But let's not skip ahead just yet. Things started to go haywire the third week. I'd woken up in the middle of the night to a knock on my cabin door. Upon opening it, I saw Luke. He shifted nervously in front of me, pale as a ghost. I opened my mouth, but before I could say anything, he'd bounded past me and inside the cabin. I poked my head out the door to see if anyone had followed him, but he'd come alone. So I pulled my sweater tighter around me and shut it. Something's wrong with this place. Luke was murmuring, pacing in my small assigned kitchen space. I saw something, out in the trees. Probably a snow leopard, or a bear. Jamie warned us about those. I reassured him as I started a fire. Why don't you have a seat? I'll make you some tea. It wasn't. I'm pretty sure it was a person. Oh, well, that's not abnormal. I commented as I put the kettle on. On Mount Everest? He asked, 
Still slightly panicked, I exhaled. He was worried over nothing. I thought to myself, here he was waking me up at an ungodly hour over what? A shadow? A mirage in the barren snow-covered peaks? Luke, we're in the middle of a densely populated camp. Of course there would be people wandering around. He opened his mouth to say something in response, but I cut him off once more. Even out of bounds, it's not uncommon. I just... It, it didn't feel right to me, he finally admitted, looking into the flames. I listened to the kettle whistle, moving to pour the tea, and then walking over to hand him a warm mug. Look, I'm sure everything is fine, but we can talk to Jamie about it in the morning if you're that concerned. I'll go with you, I offered, giving him a tired smile. This seemed to relieve him as he sank into the couch by the fire. He fell asleep there. I didn't bother moving him, and just decided to wake him up the next day. He went to voice his concerns to Jamie in the morning, but they were brushed off the same way I'd brushed them off the night before. Things only got worse from there. Luke continued to spot figures in the mountaintops, and even Dennis verified a couple of these sightings. I eventually just had to resign myself to believing them. Even though I hadn't witnessed anything myself, I'm not sure why it treated me differently. I still wonder what would have happened if it didn't. A storm hit that week. Terrible. It caught us completely off guard. We were given the chance of falling back, or of pressing forward. Dennis chose to backtrack to the previous camp, while Luke, Jamie, and I pressed onward. It was a terrible choice. I found myself staggering through a blizzard so violent, I couldn't see my hands in front of my face. It was just a white haze. Luke? Jamie? I'd call over the howling wind, hugging myself tightly as I walked. No response for a while. And then screams. I heard them that night over the wind. Though rescuers say I was delusional, they were terrible dreams of someone being completely mauled. I stumbled across Jamie's body not long after. Horribly disfigured, dark red blood splattered over the snow. I vomited bile into the snow next to my recent discovery, having already run out of MREs the previous few weeks. I hadn't eaten in a day. Sarah? I heard the next evening. A desperate cry over the wind. I followed it urgently, with cries of my own. Luke? I'd found him. Huddled under a shelf of rock, he was in a sorry state. His lips were cracked and stained with blood, and his fingertips were ice blue. He must have lost his gloves at some point. I gave him a pair of mine. He'd also managed to start a small fire in the time he'd been there. I wish later on I'd asked him how, but I never did. I won't get the chance to now. We'd spent the night holding one another, whispering reassurances and reveling in the warmth of human touch. He was dead when I woke up. Dehydration. I sat there for a long while staring at his corpse with such a hunger. Two days without food. I continued on, leaving it untouched. What other choice did I have? I spent the next two days wandering in the wind and the ice. Finally, I collapsed into the snow. It beat down on me. The wind cutting into my skin and leaving it raw, exposed or not, it didn't matter anymore. The last thing I felt was a warmth as I slipped into unconsciousness. The officials say they found me at the foot of the mountain, in better health than expected. I lost my left hand but managed to keep my other limbs intact. They said it was an unexplained miracle, and chalked the death of Jamie up to a bear mauling. It isn't uncommon, they explained. I told them I didn't know how I got down to the foot of the mountain. That's the partial truth. The real truth came in bits and pieces later on. It came in the memory of being dragged by something through the snow, into the makeshift hovel, in the middle of nowhere. It came in the memory of delirious fevers, and something kneeling over my hot body, slipping wet meat into my mouth, round meat that I ate desperately. It came in the memory of being dropped at the foot of the mountain, and of a sound from a creature that bellowed to alert anyone nearby. A sound just barely muted by the falling snow. I'm so hungry now. It doesn't matter what I eat. I know it isn't enough to sate my appetite. I don't know what happened on that mountain. But I know that it changed me irreversibly. I'm flying back next week. I have to find out the truth. And I have to eat. Me, being a 22-year-old alcoholic, I tend to hallucinate. 
The effects of alcohol can make my mind witness all sorts of things, some that seem completely unreal. Being an alcoholic, I never believed anything I saw while being hammered. I would give an example, but some are too embarrassing to share. I became an alcoholic when I became 21. On my birthday, I was immediately wired to drinking. I went to bars almost every Friday. Even though I'm an alcoholic, I still drink responsibly. But after one Friday night, I stopped drinking. The experience just made a spot in my brain click. And presently, we'll never drink a single sip of alcohol. I woke up after passing out on the bar counter. People still partying on the dance floor 10 feet away from the bar. The bartender stands in front of me on the opposite side of the counter. Boy, rough night, huh? The bartender gives a chuckle. I slowly lift myself up to look at the bartender. He was a stereotypical bartender, twirly mustache and bushy goatee. I slide my empty cup to the side and look back up, my eyes dilated. When I say responsible drinker, I mean I won't get a DWI or DUI. I may be hammered, but I still feel fear. <sighs> yeah, I slurred. I stumble out of my chair, and in my drunken mind, I plan to walk a block to my house and come back tomorrow to retrieve my keys and car. I give a little wave goodbye to the bartender and start to walk away from the bar counter, stumbling with every step. About six minutes, I finally get my equilibrium to walk normally. Even if I am piss drunk, I can still have the ability to gain my equilibrium and walk normally. I push the entrance door of the bar and step out into the cold night. Every breath I take becomes vaporized as I chatter my teeth. I start my walk home, with my hand holding myself up with the embankments of buildings. A week ago, I twisted my ankle after tripping on one of my morning runs, tripping on a poorly placed sidewalk slab. Twisting my ankle obviously altered the way of walking. I started my morning runs ever since my brother, to me, was diagnosed with cancer in his lungs. Since his diagnosis, I fell into a hole of worrisome. I love my brother to death, who played on the same football team in school, had the same interests for sports, and just got along really well. When a friend of mine got me into morning runs, it released my stress and worrisome. Since it released all my pressure I keep inside me, I started to run every morning, either alone or with a friend. Now what used to be stress is now hope for my brother. My hand continues to help me walk. As I get colder and colder by the minute, my breathing is more vaporized like I was smoking cigarettes, even though I never smoked. It was getting so cold that I slumped on the sidewalk next to an alleyway as my breathing gets heavier. I roll on my side to face the alleyway. Nothing but a dumpster and trash bags. I fell next to a 7-Eleven, brightly lighting my area, but I fell by an area nobody could see me from the inside. So I laid there staring down the empty alleyway that leads to possibly nowhere. I continued to gain strength to pick myself up and walk home. I laid there for about 10 minutes, and I finally gained my strength to pick myself up. Onward I continued home, until I hear footsteps. Footsteps from high heels. It was coming from the alleyway. My hammered self turned towards the alley, and my blurred vision gave me an outline of a broad woman. My vision starts to clear up. The woman was broad, wearing a black leather trench coat and surgical mask, with beautiful long black hair, and holding a pair of tailor shears. She was walking towards my direction slowly, as she stared me down like I was the food of a beast. In my drunken stupor, I walked towards the woman. In the back of my hammered mind, I knew it was a hallucination. Hey ma'am, lovely weather. I slurred my question but she just stood there staring at me. I walked towards the woman, which was so idiotic of me to do. I stumbled in front of her and gave her a little wave, saying hello to the woman. She grabbed my arm tightly and picked me up, placing me on my feet. I look up to her eyes, still staring me down like prey. At this moment, the fear started to build up. Drunk me finally became conscious of my well-being. Am I beautiful? She asked in a monotone voice. Drunk me starts to chuckle a little. Ma'am, you're beautiful. I slurred more of my words. I look at the woman, and with one of her hands, she starts to peel off her surgical mask. When she peeled the mask off her face, we made the most disturbing sound of crunching. 
What she was hiding behind her mouth, she had slits from ear to ear. It was an eerie, permanent smile. Uh, ma'am? Do you want me to call an ambulance? I ask with a slightly more clear voice. Her eyes were now blood red. Am I beautiful now? She asked in her monotone voice. Yeah, I say, not slurring, but trembling. But all tense started to fade away when she turned around and walked back down the darkened alleyway. And she disappeared into the dark. I watched her disappear into the dark and started to speed walk the rest of the way home. The rest of the walk home was just a black memory, which told me it was definitely a hallucination. I never knew exactly why anyone would do that in a treating manner and not harm me on the spot. I opened the front door to my apartment, finally feeling warm. I shuffled myself inside, shut the door, and lock it. My hammered mind put the entire experience in the back of my head. I couldn't make it into my bedroom with the comfort of my bed, so I plopped myself on the couch. I grabbed the remote I left on the floor and turned on the TV. I passed out on the couch, having a dream about the occurrence I had with the woman. But in the dream, I was killed, which woke me up stunned. It was still dark outside, but the moon is now shining in my living room window, which told me the sun will rise. In the window, something passed by swiftly. It looked like the silhouette of a person. The silhouette of the woman. I get nervous. But before I could do anything, I heard a window shatter. I jolted bolt upright, looking for a broken window. The window of the kitchen next to the living room was shattered, but no woman. I get off the couch and immediately stand on my two feet looking around, looking for the woman. I felt a pair of arms wrap around my chest, and my head was pushed against the shoulder of the woman. You said I was beautiful, so I want to make you beautiful. She said in her haunting, monotone voice. When I got a glimpse of her face, she looked terrifying. Her mouth was opened six times more than any human can open their mouth. Her eyes, now more bloodshot. Her tongue now slapping my face. I scream, which gave her the chance to shove her tailor shears in my mouth. She then clipped my mouth like hers, ever so slowly, which made me scream in agony and pain. When she finished, she threw me on the floor. Look. Now you're beautiful like me. Her monotone voice is now giving me chills up my spine. She throws her tailor shears, which poked into my abdomen. Her hand that holds the scissors started to pull the scissors up my stomach to my chest. It was like she had telekinesis, because when the scissors finished dragging through my torso, she retrieved them back into her hands. I woke up in my bed, sweating like I was drenched with a water hose. I sigh of relief. It's just a dream, I happily say, placing my hand on my forehead. I was filled with delight that what happened never happened. I walk into the bar, which was serving a drink to their morning customers. Hey dude, I'm here to receive my car and keys, I yelled, which made everyone and the bartender turn to me. Then everyone's jaw dropped to the floor, giving a shocked look. The bartender points at me and says, Your mouth. Now I know that wasn't a hallucination. Just wanted to get this out of the way right off the bat. I don't believe in ghosts, or souls, or poltergeists. Any of that afterlife hoo-ha. I'm agnostic, and really into empirical science. Not saying that to condescend anyone who does believe in those things. You do you. Just wanted to make it clear that I'm one of the biggest skeptics you can meet. Nonetheless, I do believe that weird stuff happens to people that appears otherwise inexplicable. And I've encountered several instances that many would call paranormal or ghostly encounters. One such occurrence permanently left a mark in my mind that still affects my mannerisms to this day, despite it happening 15 years ago. And that's the story I'm going to tell. This is 100% true. Couldn't make it up if I tried. I was six years old, and even back then, I would have told you that I didn't believe in ghosts, but that was more of a foolhardy attempt to sound mature and tough than a subscription to a particular set of scientific principles. In reality, ghosts, or the idea of ghosts, was the scariest thing besides death itself that I could conceptualize. 
Popular horror anthologies like Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark and Goosebumps spread around my grade school like a rash in those days. So, I can never get away from my fellow first graders. Conjectures about the dangerous world of evil spirits. Somewhere along the way, probably after hearing a specific rendition of Bloody Mary involving a staircase, I became extremely afraid of the stairwell leading up to the platform that cut about six feet worth of space between my room and my parents' room. At that age, my scared little self would haul it over those six feet at the speed of light every night so that I could sleep with my mom. I could never bring myself to look down the staircase in the dark, but it was impossible to avoid crossing paths with it. The bathroom was also on that same landing, perpendicular to my room, so I would have to encounter it to pee too. At some point, I must have gotten sick of being scared over a set of stairs, so I resolved one night to haul up my onesies and face my fears head on. I operated under the pretense, of course, that my fear of the staircase was based on nothing, and there was nothing about a dark set of steps to be afraid of. There's no such thing as ghosts. On this fateful night, I leveled with myself to not run across the landing. I told myself I would just walk across it like a normal person, and nothing would get me. No Bloody Mary, no Candyman, nothing was coming up those stairs. I was so emboldened by this aphorism that I even decided that I would stop dead in my tracks and just drink in the darkness. So I stood there, in the middle of the landing, halfway in between the two bedrooms, to prove to myself that there's no need to hide when it's dark outside. For a couple seconds, everything was great. Just dandy. I heard nothing and saw no one. I drank in my triumph and courage, and then, sure as shit, a man laughs. Like, listen, I don't know how to describe this to anyone whenever I tell this story. All I can tell you is, I was standing there on the landing at the top of the stairs. It was almost pitch black. My parents were fast asleep behind a closed door, and all the televisions in the house were off. It wasn't a distant or muffled laugh. It wasn't a, I think I heard it. But it was kind of whispery thing, crystal clear as day, loud as hell, sounding like it was both in my ear and coming from down the stairs at the same time. I think I was scared so shitless I couldn't even really process where it was coming from. Specifically, it was a deep voice, and it sounded as nefarious as a maniacal laugh can be. Like whoever it was waited for the moment I felt proud of myself for withstanding the darkness, before cackling like a supervillain just to mess me up. Well. Messed me up it did. I jetted across the landing to my parents' room, dove under their covers, and didn't speak of it until I entered my late teens. To give you an idea of how real this was to me, I, to this very day, cannot stand on that landing in the dark. If I'm staying at my parents' house and I have to pee in the middle of the night, I run or leap over the landing just like I did as a little kid. I'm a 22-year-old grown-ass adult. I know, rationally, that I must have imagined it or dreamt it or something. I'm almost certain that my imagination was so fixated on the possibility of encountering something that it generated an auditory hallucination. This notion brings me little comfort, however, because it just makes me afraid of what my own imagination is capable of. Even with the clarity of hindsight, I can't chalk it up to a dream. I was wide awake, and I'll probably die with this totally ridiculous notion that if I dare to stand on that landing in the dark, I'll hear that man's laughter again. In some way, I'll never be completely comfortable at night in the house I grew up in. It was a cold day in northern Nova Scotia, and me and my wife were taking our honeymoon here, a week after getting married. It was our dream to discover the world together, and we decided to start in Canada. It was about the third day here, when a blizzard came out of nowhere, so we decided to stock up and lock the cabin, trying our best to stay warm. We huddled on the couch with the fireplace up so hot, you couldn't cremate a body. A few hours pass, and an emergency broadcast comes over the radio, with a man saying, Don't step outside at all costs. Cover your windows with the sturdiest material you have, and don't look outside whatsoever, until we send a team to get you. We disregarded it, but still covered the windows and doors with towels so we wouldn't be blinded by the falling snow. A few more hours go by, and another broadcast with the same guy comes on saying, Make sure you have everyone with you, and put each other's eyes up to a flashlight to make sure it's really them. If the pupils aren't affected, 
try to kill them immediately. At this point, we got kind of freaked out and covered the windows with metal while blindfolding ourselves. As the men had said, we both didn't dare look outside. My wife took to the basement to make sure everything was, in fact, covered. I took to the bedroom with my radio and started going through the channels to see if anyone else was experiencing the same thing. It seemed all over Nova Scotia, people were getting this broadcast, and some people were even building refuges for them, homeless and poor. So me and my wife stocked up the car, blindfolded ourselves, and followed our mind maps. We made it after getting lost and retracing, but we eventually made it and came in with our resources, asking for refuge against the blizzard. The people welcomed us in, but right before I came in, it was like something or someone grabbed me and tried to pull me back to the snow and I tripped, spilling everything I had in my hands. I crawled inside and after they shut the door, they made us take off our blindfolds and put a flashlight up to our eyes. After a few minutes, they welcomed us into a big room of people all around. We decided to introduce ourselves to a few people in the group nearest the door, and we all stated our names. I went first. Hi, my name is James, and I'm here with my wife. That was my wife's cue to come in. Hello, my name is Mary, and like my husband said, we're here on our honeymoon. Then, a big ginger man went next. His name was Marshall. Then there was another girl named Courtney, then a man named Daniel, then another girl named Sydney. And it was declared then and there, we all had radios. We were a group now. As we started talking, I eventually heard frantic banging on the door. I decided to help this time and went to the door. But something was off though. They weren't opening the door. When I asked why, all they said was something along the lines of, we have enough. I got a flashlight and asked to check the door guards. They refused, so I pressured them. If you're not one of whatever these things are, then why not let me check you? It's harmless after all, and if you refuse again, I just might have to alert everyone here. He still refused, and so I went to my group and told everyone that we needed to check the door guards. They got confused until I told them I heard banging on the door, but they told me to ignore those. They son, those are fake cries for help. They got Katie already, so we learned from then. I questioned them about how they knew when it was a real person, Sydney's son. Most people don't expect this thing. It can happen at any time. If anyone becomes frantic, they've either looked at the outside or aren't human. It's just nature. Those who have experienced it before know what to do and how to survive. We just live with this in Nova Scotia. After getting a slightly elongated answer, I looked around. Then responded with, that still doesn't justify the guards refusing to get checked. It seemed to click for my wife, but Marshall shook his head. That's because they own this place. You have what I like to call a strike now. You've done something no one else would do. And that's being rational. Be careful. And just relax till the radio says it's safe. I didn't question anything else anymore. And just went back to talking. Eventually, we saw someone else come through the door. And everyone fell silent. I didn't know why until I realized his legs had huge gashes on them, and he proceeded to fall forward onto the floor. I rushed over to help the guy to the couch, checking for a pulse. He was still alive, by whatever miracle happened to him. I took off my shirt and put it around his left leg, as it had the biggest vein in the body, and called on Marshall to cover the other leg. We worked together to try and stabilize him enough so he could live another day. After a few hours of many people assisting him, we finally stopped the bleeding and relaxed. I still can't believe he's alive. It's been a couple of hours now, and Dan has opted to go outside to a store to get more supplies for the rest of us. The man is still unconscious, and the only sign of life he has is the shallow, raspy breathing filling the room behind the conversation. As Dan was walking out, I decided to give him a wrapping of his legs with metal, and just for extra measure, a length of rope. I hope he's going to be safe. I walked up to Sydney and decided to have a little talk, try to get my mind off of things. I started off by saying, well, what do we do now? She responded, that's up to you. Try to find something to do alone, with your wife, with anybody really, it doesn't matter. Just don't look outside and don't die. How are you supposed to die here? There's nothing to die from. No idea. 
Maybe. I don't know. Pissing someone off. You seem a little down that path already. Hey, I didn't know they owned this place. And I just helped save someone's life. Can you cut me a little slack here? Maybe. Just don't piss me off for the next 15 seconds and I'll let it slide. Well, do you want me to talk or not? After not getting a response for well over a minute, I walked away to talk to Marshall while my wife took my place with Sydney. Marshall starts off, and it revolves. Well, what do we have here? The closest thing to a doctor here is standing right in front of me. What do you want? I'm actually here to ask you what you were going to do, and if I could join you. I'm kind of bored. Well, I'm not really doing anything, but... It was at this moment that Dan crashed through the door, and no one heard knocking before. He had white things retreating from his legs and into the outside. I shut my eyes and the door closed. We did a check on Dan and learned he was safe. We're not sure from what, but in my head, my first thought was, what an entrance. Dan came back over and we all regrouped and made a plan to see whatever the hell had Dan by the legs. After a 30 minute discussion, it was decided that I would be the one to look and see what was in that snow. I went upstairs and peeled back the paper covering the windows. I didn't see anything for a few minutes, until I noticed the two cloudy eyes staring back at me from outside. Startled by my sudden discovery, I jumped back and let the paper back down. They asked what was wrong, and I told them to stay away from the windows. After regaining composure, I stood back up and looked outside again. I saw them again, but this time, there were six other pairs of eyes, and they all were looking right at me. I started to feel a bit paranoid, not like I am now, and kept looking. And they stood. They stood up on two legs with almost deformed bodies. They were skeletons with skin. I still can't get the image out of my head. It's still snowing, and I don't dare blink in case they make it inside. They're watching me. I know it. I know those are dead bodies out in the snow. And they are alive. I can't sleep. I can't blink. And with what sanity I have left, I have to let this out to the world. There are dead bodies out in the snow. I go hunting sometimes. I own a little piece of land in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina. Well, by little, I mean around 300 acres. I inherited this land from my great aunt Joanne. She used to tell me stories about the weird, almost paranormal phenomena that go on up here. She told me stories of beings made of soft, light rise from the trees at night, where tall, gray beings walked in packs aimlessly, walking through the forest. There was no end to her stories, of course. I didn't believe in any of them, but found them oddly interesting in their own way. After she passed, I inherited the land from her. I decided to live up there for a while. With the small fortune she left me, I could live up there comfortably for a while, occasionally going into town for groceries. The first few weeks of living up there were nice. I would have a daily routine of getting up extremely early and hunting. Now, hunting is a sacred tradition for me. After my father took me out hunting my first few times, he gave me a list he had received from his dad regarding rules our family needs to follow while hunting. 1. Respect the forest. 2. Never kill for sport. 3. Know what's behind your target before you shoot. 4. If the forest goes quiet, run. No, I never understood what that last rule meant, and neither did my dad, but I didn't let that discourage me from hunting. After a couple months, animals started to get less frequent. Like they knew I was the new apex predator for that area. The next couple times I went hunting, I didn't see anything. I mean, anything. I heard the same old cicadas, grasshoppers, or the occasional mating call from a buck or a doe, but never saw a thing. I gave up on hunting for a while. I just chalked it up to me going hunting too much. Weeks went by and winter rolled in. So did the snow. I usually love the snow, but this was different. It seemed to have snowed twice as much in my property than in town or anybody else's property. Weird. It snowed and snowed. Weeks went by and the snow never seemed to stop. In the beginning, I would shovel my front steps, but a new layer would blanket it the next day. I could barely take it. I was cold and miserable, and my food was running out. 
Since my food was running out, I thought it would be an excellent time to go out and hunt. It was midday, but there had to be some animals out wandering around. So I got all my gear together and trekked the two miles to my deer stand. I liked having my deer stand far away from my house so I could really be disconnected from all aspects of society. It wasn't a long ride to my stand. I'd usually park my vehicle a little ways from the stand so I didn't scare off any animals in the area. When I got to my deer stand, it was covered in snow. It took a while to clear the snow off my stand, but I got there in the end. I waited for a while. I waited and waited and eventually got nervous. What if I overhunted and ran all the animals from this area? Right when I was about to give up and do the walk of shame back to my vehicle, I heard it. It was a stick snapping under the weight of something stepping on it. My heartbeat started to quicken. I knew it had to have been close, and yet I didn't see a thing. I knew I heard something. I looked all around my front. Nothing. I turned my body so I could see around the tree my stand had been on. Nothing. I went to position my body straight again, and when I did, I saw it. It was a deer, or something resembling one. It was around the same size as a 12-point buck, but it looked gray in the distance. I sensed something wasn't right and zoomed in with my rifle. What I saw won't ever leave me. It looked like a deer, but it wasn't. Its skin was smooth gray. Alien, almost. It had deep black eyes, where its eyes and antlers should have been. It was smooth. Its teeth were like razors. They extended out of its mouth a good few inches. It looked terrifying. Nothing in my life prepared me for this moment. Absolutely nothing. My heart felt like it would beat out of my chest. My breathing was constant but erratic. My hands started to shake, and I had a difficulty keeping my sight on that thing. What was minutes felt like hours. It had to have been standing there motionless for at least five minutes. That's when it looked at me with its endless eyes, staring directly into my soul. Then, I shot it. I had been aiming at it this whole time. I don't know why I hadn't shot it earlier. It wailed in agony. It sounded like nothing I've ever heard before. It wailed and wailed as black liquid shot from the bullet hole. And just as quickly as it started wailing, it stopped and dropped on the ground. Right as it hit the snow, I darted down the deer stand and ran the opposite direction from the creature to my vehicle I had parked nearby. I had noticed not a single sound had been playing from earlier, like they just stopped out of nowhere. Then, out of nowhere, I could hear more of those screams, those terrible screams. I ignored them and ran as fast as the snow would let me to my vehicle. When I got to my vehicle, I threw my hunting bag and gun into the passenger seat. I jumped into my vehicle, slammed the door, and locked it. I threw the keys into the ignition, threw it into drive, and mashed the gas. The tire spun and I took off flying through the woods. I saw more of those things on the sides of the trails. They didn't all look like deer. Some looked like squirrels and raccoons, but they all had the same gray skin and smooth bodies. I got home and saw more of them surrounding the tree line of my house. I turned off my vehicle and bolted to the door of my house, their wails getting louder and louder. I burst open the door, turned around and slammed it shut. I thought it was over and slumped down the door with my back to it. It wasn't over, though. Those things started to crash into my house. It sounded like mini explosions going off each time one of the big ones would run into the side of it. They did this for hours and hours. It felt as if the house would come down any second, but this old wooden house stood strong. They wouldn't stop running into the house, though. They stopped after around two hours of non-stop running into it. I didn't dare go outside for a while, three days in fact. I tried to make sense of what those things were, but I have no idea. I have no idea anymore. I don't know if they're still there. I'm too scared to check. Please help me. The first story. A few decades ago, a tailor managed to shop around the south gate of ancient Beijing city. This tailor was so skillful and friendly, so his shop was famous in Beijing. One day, in the middle of the night, the tailor just went to bed but someone was calling him at this time. The tailor asked the visitor what he wanted, while well, the visitor said he just wanted to buy some needles and strings. The tailor was afraid that the visitor was probably a robber, 
So this tailor just opened a small window and handed the needles and strings out. At this point, the tailor attempted to see the customer's face but merely found there was a bracelet on the wrist of the customer. Afterwards, the customer paid and left, and the tailor also returned to his bed. Next day, some customers visited the tailor shop and discussed a story. In their words, a culprit who had been beheaded disappeared last night for a while. Surprisingly, when the body of the culprit was found, his head and main body were seamed together already. Also, the body was holding some needles and strings. Some people distinguished that these needles and strings were sold by this tailor. So they came here to inquire the tailor whether anything strange happened last night. This tailor dubitated and then came to see the body of the culprit. At first glance, the tailor saw his needles and strings, and then he saw there was the same bracelet he saw last night on the body's wrist. The tailor was out of his mind, and then narrated what happened to his neighborhood, a doctor who owned a pharmacy. After hearing the scary story last night, this doctor was not surprised but responded calmly. My friend, it's not a big deal. Every month, a few poor guys would visit my pharmacy to buy some vulnerary at midnight, as well as the man you met yesterday. The second story. If you ask me to name one of the most famous urban legends in China, I would like to introduce this story at first because almost everyone in China who was born after the 1980s has heard this story. I've read many different versions on the internet, but I would like to select one which seems more reliable. In 1995, one night, a bus was running in the suburb of Beijing, and the number of this bus was 375. Around the gate of a high school, a young man was waiting for this bus because only this bus could take him home. When he found this bus, he started to wave his hands instantly. After boarding the bus, the young man sat behind an old lady and found there were six people on the bus including himself, the driver, and conductor. Quickly, the young man attempted to have a break because he was exhausted already. A few minutes later, the bus stopped again, and two men got up. The young man glanced at the two men and found both of them were poker-faced. The two men did not talk, just sat down, kept silent. However, at this point, the old lady in front of the young man stood up suddenly and grabbed the young man tightly. Nasty guy, how dare you try to steal my wallet? This young man was confused but responded. I was sleeping just now, and I never touched your wallet. Why are you wronging me? The old lady did not buy this but asked the driver to stop the bus immediately because there was a police station not far away from there. It seems that the driver was not interested in what happened and stopped the bus to let the old lady and the young man leave this bus. After stepping out of this bus, this young man asked innocently, Dear lady, I never touched your pocket. Why are you doing this to me? I'm just a student. However, the response of this lady was so surprising. Handsome boy, I just saved your life just now. The young man did not understand. So the old lady continued to explain what happened and why she asked the driver to stop the bus. Handsome boy, have you noticed the two men boarded the bus at last? The young man nodded. The old lady then continued. When the two went through me, I found something strange. Neither of them had feet. Do you understand? In other words, instead of stepping on the bus, the two were floating just now. Therefore, I'm afraid they were not human beings. You know what I mean. The young man was scared and was determined to report this to the police. Because there was a police station around there. The young man told the police what the old lady told him. But, you can imagine, the police could not believe the young man's words. However, at this time, the radio in the police station reported the news that a 375 bus went down a cliff not far away from there a few minutes ago. And, there were four bodies on the bus, including the driver and the conductor. A third story. If you know something about China, I bet you must know a place named Babao Mountain. This mountain is famous because the graveyard of top Chinese politicians is located in this place. And this story is about Babao Mountain Station. One day, a man worked so late then came off work around 11.30pm while the subway had stopped at this moment. The man's home was so remote that he wanted to have to try to get on the tube because calling a taxi was so expensive. To his surprise, there was a train that would leave in the direction of his house, and the man got on happily. After sitting down, this man felt something slightly strange. Generally, now it was around 12am, 
while the train was full of people. Furthermore, these people seemed very tired, and their clothes were worn out. Even so, this man was exhausted, so he didn't think any more of it, because there would be an audio notification every station. He then closed his eyes and took a nap. A few minutes later, he heard an audio notification that this train had arrived at Babao Mountain Station, and he heard that many people got off. This man was so astonished why so many people got off here, because this was not a significant station. But, this man still closed his eyes, and the train started to run then. However, after a few minutes, he heard an audio notification which reported this train had arrived at Babao Mountain Station. This man was shocked now because he remembered that he had heard the same message just now. In addition, he found nobody on the train. He could not understand why he heard the report twice and why so many people disappeared so soon. I post this as a warning, learn from my mistake. I was in bed last night scrolling through Reddit, I'm a fan of horror, and strangely, I actually find it easier to sleep after a good scare. So I was browsing through these short stories, clips, and other horror based content, when I came across a post simply titled, Don't Rub Your Eyes. As I began reading, half drifting off to sleep, I heard a line that said, I feel a slight tingling sensation in my left eye. It's almost not even there, except for the fact that I know it is. The line took me by surprise as I laughed at this attempt to unsettle me. Only the thoughts wouldn't go away. I didn't feel anything in my left eye, did I? I couldn't tell if it was the brightness of the screen or the fact that the thought was placed in my head by what I was reading, but I felt a twitch in my left eye. At this point, any sensation on my face seemed amplified, as all my attention focused on what I was feeling. Even among being aware of all the sensations on my face, I normally tune out. I was most aware of my left eye. Before long, the faint sensation became difficult to ignore. As I continued to read this story, I thought of raising my hand towards my face. When my eyes diverted to the title once more, don't rub your eyes. My heart began to race, a sensation I would normally welcome, but this was different. This felt personal. I wanted to close my phone and just go to sleep, but I couldn't. The sensation in my left eye was growing. It felt like there was dust there, or perhaps a little hair. Nothing that couldn't be solved by just cleaning it away. Yet, I kept coming back to the title of the story that faced me, don't rub your eyes. But I couldn't simply leave the feeling be. I couldn't just ignore it. It was bothering me. So I made a decision. I raised my hand and rubbed my left eye, still continuing to read with my right. I could feel the irritating sensation ease up as I rubbed, and I smiled at my own trepidation a few seconds prior. It was just a story, nothing more. Whether it was dust, or hair, or imagined irritation, it was almost entirely faded away, when all of a sudden, I heard a pop. In fear, I dropped my phone and sat up. The bright screen looked up at me. As my left eye cleared, I looked down at my phone, and all seemed fine, except for a strange soreness on my face. I tried to explain it as an understandable byproduct of my efforts to clear my eye. The popping noise, meanwhile, was surely just something to do with plumbing. Yet the strange soreness on the left side of my face wouldn't let up, as a creeping suspicion overcame me. I closed my eyes and covered them with my hands, and I could feel it. I told myself I was imagining it, but I could feel it. My left eye felt further into my head than my right. In a panic, I turned on my bedside lamp. Even amidst the new lighting, my phone lay on the bed, on my leg, shining up at me. Don't rub your eyes. I checked my eyes again, hoping to be proven wrong this time, hoping I could just laugh at my momentary lapse in judgment and go to sleep. If only. My eyes felt more misaligned than before, as my left eye seemed to be retreating into my skull. Unsure of what to do, I tilted my head upward, once again facing the stupid post. The soreness did not seem to fade, and so I tapped the back of my head, hoping to coax the retreating eye back in its place. I don't know the science behind it, but at the time, it seemed a reasonable thing to try. But try as I might, the eye continued to sink. The pain was not significant which I found strange, only a tangible soreness that took over one side of my face. Perhaps it was the adrenaline rush I was feeling at the time, but by now, my vision began to distort. From my right eye, 
I could still see my phone looking up at me, but from the left, a strange circular border began to form around what I could see. I tried to close my left eye, but with nothing to hold there form around, my upper eyelid simply dangled when I tried. I'm not sure why, but I grabbed my phone before I jumped out of bed and ran to the nearest mirror. As I saw my reflection, I tried to scream, but the sound was stuck in my throat. The vision from my left eye began to darken as I felt it slide entirely out of its place and fall back, rolling inside my head. I could see from my remaining eye that all that remained was a dark, red, empty hole. I looked down at the phone I was still holding tightly. I read one final time, don't rub your eyes. It was around 10 at night, and I had just gotten off of work. I wasn't tired since I had slept all day, and only had a 5 hour shift. It's like that on Wednesdays. It had been a while since the last time I went hunting, and I've been itching to do it, but I just never had the time. I loaded up my rifle in my truck, not really expecting to get anything, just love the smell and feel of the forest. It was dark out, so I brought some night vision binoculars. I made my way out to the woods, which was just across town and hiked the rest of the way out to my usual hunting spot, where I also had built a platform and a tree to lay in while I hunt. To give you a picture of what I was looking at, there was a big open area in the middle of the forest with nothing but stumps and logs, because some trees had been cut down there. It was about the size of an acre, and was surrounded by trees, and I was in one of them. After about 20 minutes of sitting still and watching, I decided to eat the sandwich I'd packed, even though I planned to be there till midnight. I had barely even began to bite into the bread whenever I heard a loud moan out in the distance that echoed through the trees. I put down my sandwich and pulled out my binoculars. I scoped the area left and right, over and over again. Nothing. I decided to set one of the detachable opticals up on the scope of my rifle, which had already been mounted and weighted. I was hoping it was maybe a boar, or even better, a buck. I sat there with my finger hovering beside the trigger scanning the area. I finally saw some movement from behind one of the logs. I focused my aim on the spot where I saw the movement, then all of a sudden a deer ran up full sprint out into the open lining. Without even thinking, I fired two quick shots. Each one missed as I saw the dirt fly off the ground from the bullets, but before I took the third shot, I hesitated. The buck was tripping while running like hell. It was running away from something. It still had a while to go before it crossed the area, so I did a quick scan, but I didn't see anything. When I turned my gun back over towards the deer, it had stumbled and fell all the way down. It was probably bitten or something because it was limping hard. That's why I kept tripping. However, as soon as I put my finger on the trigger, I saw something leap out from behind one of the logs and attack the deer. When I got a good look at it, my heart nearly sunk into my chest. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. The thing was humanoid but with long limbs where the elbows and knees would be were backwards. Its mouth was wide open and it had long black hair on its head. The deer was still kicking for its life, but the thing had a firm grip on its neck. It maneuvered its long arms and legs around the deer kind of like a spider. Then it dropped its head onto the neck of the deer where I could only assume it was biting it. The deer's kicks started to pace slower and slower until it eventually died. I had never felt so much fear. Everything was silent except for the crickets. I was just watching this thing eat a full-sized buck. I had to get out of there. I started packing all my expensive gear and grabbed my keys, but before I left, I took one last look at the field to make sure that it was still there. I wanted to throw up. The creature was lower to the ground, kind of like a cat staring right into my scope. Beside it was the deer that looked like roadkill. I got a good look at its face. I saw four eyes and a mouth that could fit an entire tire in what was shaped into a smile. I left everything and just took my keys and ran for my life, pushing my way through the low hanging branches and leaves. I heard the same moan from earlier but louder. I practically slammed into the truck door, fumbling for my keys to unlock it. Off in the distance, I heard branches snapping and trees rustling. I unlocked my truck door hopped in, and jammed my keys into the ignition. I threw the truck into drive and was about to slam my door and take off till I looked into the trees that were probably 20 feet from the road. There it was, staring at me. 
It was huge, even bigger than my truck. I just waited in shock. The only sound that could be heard was the engine rumbling. I slowly closed my door and kept my eyes on it. It wouldn't move. It could clearly tear a hole through my door and grab me, but nothing. I finally snapped to my senses and stomped on the gas. Through my rearview mirror, I could see it staring at me from the same spot. I never told anyone what happened, except for here. I don't think anyone would believe me anyway. All I can say now is I'm never hunting in those woods again. Our town is small, and we have a tight-knit community. Nobody moves here, and nobody leaves here. It's the same families living in the same houses on the same land, generation after generation. We are old families living in an old town, and like most old towns, tradition is very important to us. People might say that our traditions are a little odd, but I think they're wonderful. My favorite is probably the Autumn Harvest Festival, where the entire town comes together and gives thanks for another bountiful crop. Throughout the celebration, the entire town center is covered with tables of food and beer as far as the eye can see. At the end of the night, we set fire to a great straw man constructed at the center of a field and dance in its burning light. Last year, my family's fields were selected for the burning man, and it was a great honor for us all. Some of our rituals may seem a little uncomfortable if you haven't grown up here, especially our funeral ceremonies. Every time somebody dies, we take a couple minutes to pay our respects and cast them off into the great beyond, before the body is even cold. The family brings their loved one back to their house, so that the proceedings can begin. The corpse is adorned in the finest garments that the family can afford, and it is considered a great honor for a family to dress one of their own in such extravagant clothing. My brother died in a tree cutting accident last week, and... It was a pity that his face was so disfigured. He was probably the most handsome boy in the entire village. For his ceremony, we dressed him in his best suit. The same one he wore to village ball. God, I've never seen mother so proud before. The way she and father stood there with their arms around each other, admiring my brother in his finest suit, almost brought a tear to my eye. You might notice that every wall in our house is covered in old portraits. Beautiful, vintage pictures from our family camera. Our family camera is the same one that's been passed down from generation to generation for 150 years. It's an old tin type. Every family has their own tin type, and every family's home is covered in beautiful photographs such as ours. After my brother was dressed in his finest suit, we moved him to our family couch and sat him up straight. We made him look nice and handsome just as he was in life. He was always so confident and self-assured. We twisted him at a little bit of an angle, almost as if he were looking off into another room, and we folded his hands on his lap. He looks wonderful, mother, I told her. We went into the basement to bring up our family's tintype, but to my horror, neither I, nor father, nor mother could find our tintype. It was gone, disappeared. I have never in my life seen my parents so upset. What will we ever do? They said. It was a terrible problem indeed. A family without their tintype? What a disgrace on us all. We would be shunned. Ostracized even. Nobody in the village would want to associate with us anymore. For a family as old and as proud as ours, to be caught without their tintype would be the greatest humiliation imaginable. I had a plan though. Hold on. I said to my parents. I'll fix this. My friend Lewis lived not even a mile away, and quick as I could, I ran over to his house. I knew that he could be trusted to keep a secret. I need your help, Lewis. Could I borrow your tintype tonight? Lewis was a good friend, and I had always loved his tintype. I had never seen a tintype so fine as his. I asked, could I borrow his magnificent tintype? And he said yes. He was such a good friend. He agreed not to tell anyone, and I promised Lewis I would return his tintype in the morning. I showed my parents the new tintype, and I told them that it was ours. We had simply misplaced it in the attic, I said, and oh how mother cried with happiness when she heard that. I've never seen her so happy. I know it was a lie to tell my parents that this was our tintype, and I should not tell lies, 
but I figured it was not a very big lie at least. And besides, wouldn't it be wonderful to try a tintype so fine as this one? I had wasted about an hour fetching Lewis's tintype, and thank god it was not too late. My brother was still fresh. We took the tintype and snapped a beautiful portrait of him. God, he looks so handsome in his finest suit. We took his portrait and hung it up with the rest of the family portraits, right at the top of the stairs so he could be closest to mother and father's room. It was even higher up on the wall than my Uncle Barry's portrait. I never thought I would live to see the day. My parents were so proud to hang it up there with the rest of them. It was so straight, and it had such an ornate frame, made out of cherry wood, I believe. The finest picture frame I had ever seen. Mother and father just sighed and looked at each other proudly. They then gave each other a peck on the cheek. I never saw mother and father kiss like that. I think this may be the best family portrait in 50 years. My mother decreed. I thought so too. The next day, we took my brother to the cemetery to bury him with the others, and it was a beautiful ceremony. Every single person in the town came, and we all stood around as my brother was lowered into his grave. I even got to throw a ceremonial fist of dirt on top of him. It was a great honor for me. I bless this holy earth in the name of God. May the dead rest and never wake. The priest instructed. Then... We buried my brother forever. Later that night, I took the tintype back to Lewis's house. I rung the doorbell, and his mother and father answered the door. I asked them if Lewis was home. No, they said. Lewis is dead. Inconceivable. My friend Lewis was dead. I had seen him just hours ago. I asked his parents how Lewis had died, and they explained to me that he had fallen down the stairs. A tragic accident, they said. It was such a pity that his body was so mangled. He was such a handsome boy. The most handsome boy in town, I agree. Of course, I thanked them for their hospitality and bid them a farewell. This was disappointing news indeed. But what should I do with Lewis's tintype? Surely, his family would be needing it soon. If his mother and father knew that I took their family's tintype, then I would be in great trouble. I decided to keep it for now. Maybe I should visit my brother. I reasoned. He always knew what to do in a situation such as this. He was so wise and intelligent, and handsome too. Perhaps talking to him would make me realize what I should do. It seemed like a good idea, so I decided to stop at the cemetery on my way home. But as I laid eyes on my brother's resting place, I realized that there was nothing left but a gigantic hole in the ground. All the dirt that we had buried him under was gone. Somebody must have robbed my brother's grave. Even the casket was totally empty. The wooden top had been so beautiful and regal looking when we buried him. A casket top made for a prince, I thought. Now it lay in splinters and the inside was empty. I ran back as fast as I could to tell my parents that some despicable person had robbed my brother's grave. Tin type in hand, I burst through the front door of our house and looked around for my mother and father. The house was empty. Hello? I shouted. A sound came from the basement. The cellar was dark and dank when I opened the door. I could only see a few steps down the stairs before the blackness swallowed the staircase hole. Is anybody home? I called. Yes. Mother and father called back. Come downstairs. Your brother is here with us. I didn't know what to do, so I ran away to my aunt and uncle's house. Did I make a mistake? Should I go back and follow them into the basement? I'm in the old Brimstone Inn. I know that because of the sign on the check and desk. There is a grandfather clock next to me and I am sitting on an old wooden bench waiting for... something. I'm not quite sure. Everything is still so foggy. I know I'm waiting for something. I've been waiting for a while. I know that. I know that my hand hurts and looks like it's burned. I haven't seen anyone. Then again, I haven't stood up. Why haven't I stood up? It's been hours at least. I stand up and I ring the bell on the neat orderly desk. It's wooden and has nothing but a binder, a stapler, and the bell I'm ringing on it. No one approaches. I try to open the door that says employees only, but the handle is scorching hot and burns my hand. I stumble back yelling an obscenity and clutching my hand, but I already burned my hand. Before, I know that I stare down at my open palm. 
The burn from the handle is in the exact position as the burn I had before. How strange. I sit back down to wait. It's been a day. I know that. I need to wait. I know that. Tick tock. Tick tock. The grandfather clock next to me ticks on incessantly. I begin to think of a tune to hum to pass the time, but can't think of a single song. Now that I can't make my mind up, that I cannot think of a song, I begin to panic as I realize I do not know my name. I don't know my family. I can't think of a single person I know. I stand up and walk back over to the bell and begin to ring it. I keep ringing it and ringing it for who knows how long. From behind me I hear the door open. An impending sense of doom and dread washes over me. I swallow hard as I start to turn around but there is nothing there. Finally fed up with wait time, I walk to the front door and try to pull it open. But just as the other door was, it was scolding hot. Once again I burn my hand. I yell more obscenities and kick over a coat rack. The burn from the handle is in the exact position as the burn I had before and the one I got from the employee's only door. How strange. I stare for a moment before giving up and sitting back down, deciding to wait. Tick tock, tick tock. The grandfather clock steadily marches on, letting me know every second that passes. I stand up and open the cabinet below the clock. I grab the pendulum and stop it from swinging. No more incessant ticking. My frustrations grow every second, but still I resolve to wait. I can tell I'm supposed to wait. I can tell that. It's been a week. I know that. I must wait. Surely there's a purpose to why I'm here. The brimstone in. I have never heard of such an establishment. And yet, now I find myself sitting in it. I do not know who I am. I do not know where I am. I'm a man without a purpose but to wait. So I wait. Tick tock. Tick tock. The grandfather clock ticks on. Unbroken. I look at the clock for a moment. I stopped it. I know I stopped it, but it ticks on. I stand up and open the cabinet below the clock. I grab the pendulum and stop it from swinging. No more incessant ticking. It has been a month. I know that. I have to wait. There is something great coming if I just wait. It must be good if they're making me wait this long. Maybe a fancy room or money. Fantastical gifts awaits me if I just wait. That's what I do. I know that. Tick tock. Tick tock. I stopped that clock twice, yet it ticks on. Did I stop it all? Am I even real? I have no memories. No name. Who am I? What am I? Panic creeps in on me. Deep in my chest, my heart pounds like a drum. I scream, but I do not hear it. I stand up, my legs shaky. I look into the glass of the grandfather clock and see my reflection. I do not recognize the face before me. I scream louder, and yet it sounds of but a whisper. I collapse. Everything swirls around me, a whirlpool of fear and nothingness. I am in the old brimstone inn. I know that because of the sign on the check-in desk. There is a grandfather clock next to me, and I am sitting on an old wooden bench waiting for... something. Not quite sure. Everything is still so foggy. I know I am waiting for something. I have been waiting for a while. I know that. I know that my hand hurts and looks like it's burned. I haven't seen anyone. And again, I haven't stood up. My name is Gary, and I've got a story about my time with the park rangers in Northern California and what I believe to be a cryptid of some kind. Oh, get right to it. It was December of last year when I was wandering the park and suddenly I hear a meowing. I thought, stray cat, it happens, and continued my rounds thinking nothing else of it. A bit later in the day, I hear it again. At this point, I'm getting ready to clock out, and I'm doing what we at my park refer to as final rounds. This is the same sort of checking for homeless, garbage, cleanup, morning detail stuff, but you do it before the end of your shift as well. At first, I ignored the sound yet again. Then, I heard it once more. I decided I'd check now, and make sure that the cat in question was okay. I figured, at worst, it gets spooked and leaves, and I'll know it's clearly still fine as it's moving. 
As I came upon the source area of the sound though, I saw nothing. Figuring it was a stray cat that left to the sound of my footsteps, I proceeded to walk back toward the path I was working and scan for trash for a bit longer to kill the rest of my shift. It was about 10 minutes from quitting time when I heard him meowing again. I ignored it and it happened once more. I continued ignoring it and it happened again. I decided what the hell, I'll give it one more check. So I climbed a short slope and looked for the sound. It was then I saw something that shocked me into freezing. Something standing on two feet and extremely muscular. Covered in fur stood in a clearing over the hill. It perked its ears and began to turn at which point I skedaddled down the hill as quickly as possible. Upon doing so, I heard a massive roar. I about pissed myself as I got to the bottom of the slope and onto the trail and began sprinting. I heard another loud roar. It was loud enough that I felt the trees around the trail shake and I had to clutch my ears to soften the sound. I ran and ran and ran some more and as I looked up, I could see something huge moving through the trees as well. Its fur was all black and it shook the trees above the trail. I tried to get a better view when it suddenly turned and vanished into the forest. I was perplexed by this, but thankful as it appeared to no longer be pursuing me. As I'm getting closer to the beginning of the trail and where our station is, I suddenly hear the massive pounding of the ground and see the trees shaking again. I'm about to run when this thing leaps from the slopes and lands in front of me. I fall in shock and terror, thinking it's the end of me. This thing has to stand at least 12 to 13 feet tall and had all black fur. Its eyes were white and it looked a bit like a wolf. It appeared to sniff the air and look around, but it quickly darted into the woods upon the sound of gunfire. One of my coworkers fired a warning shot off into the air and this thing simply ran into the woods. I never saw the thing again. I'm not even sure what it was. It didn't appear to see me while it sniffled around. That is to say, I think it may have been blind. I might have thought Dogman, but everything I've heard of those they can see. I'm not sure what it was, but it wasn't natural, and it certainly was not human. The signal of my car radio became weaker and weaker as my car roared over the desert road. Eventually, it withered away with a crackle, leaving me with the ambient sound of the seemingly endless waste and monotonous growl of my vehicle. Summer was just settling in over the barren country, yet I felt as though I was slowly being boiled in my metal tomb. I rolled a window down which helped somewhat, but regardless, I was eager to exit the lonely, scorched plains of Nevada. That is not to say, however, that I was eager to reach my destination either, the details of which I'll spare you, but it would surely be a drab affair. I drove for a little more than an hour without any music to accompany me. I really should have brought a CD. Still, keeping an eye on the straight and empty road, I reached for my phone in the glove compartment. Holding it in front of me, I turned it on and looked to the top left of the screen. No service. No oh, shit. I whispered. Rolling my aching eyes as I did, the big orange ball of Aferno was really taking its toll on me. No matter which angle I sat at, it always seemed to find me. I really needed to call my sister. She's the only person I know to have taken this journey before, and I was certain I must have taken a wrong turn earlier on. There was no way the desert went on for that long, though I didn't really mind long drives, but I would have dearly appreciated a change of scenery. The land outside my car was nothing but a flat, unchanging sea of sand and stone with no hills or dips of terrain to be seen. I was periodically gifted with the odd cactus here and there, which brought some warranted diversity to the place. My mother had always taught me to value the little things after all. I let my breath out with a long, sacerating huff of fatigue before taking a sip of water. The bottle had become warm in the creeping afternoon heat, but then, without warning my car began to slow. I hardly believed it at first. I was almost stunned by the exasperating level of unfortune that had just struck me. With a sluggish chugging, my car slowed to a crawl. No fucking way. I said aloud. I had made sure to fill my car with gas before the journey. I wasn't dull. I checked my blinking fuel gauge. Empty. I ogled at it confused. There was no way I could have depleted my meter that quickly. Once the car had halted completely, I turned the key. 
When I did so, the car breathed briefly before dying again. I pulled the key out and inserted it back in the ignition before trying the car again. I got nothing that time, not even a wheeze. I slammed my hands on the wheel and tried several more times with no luck. For a moment, I was stuck in denial. As if my favorite football team had just lost to a group of toddlers. And unluckily for me, I knew jack shit about fixing cars. After striking the wheel a few times, I pushed the door open and exited the vehicle into the harsh, asphyxiating heat of the desert waste. I held my phone to the clear sky and checked again for a signal. Nothing. I let out an anguished sigh before climbing atop the roof of my car and checking for a signal once more. Still nothing. I was furious. It would be hours, perhaps a day before another car would come up the road. I'd been driving across the wasteland for more than half a day and had not seen a single other vehicle. As my anger peaked, I hurled my phone into the desert and landed with a faint thud in the sand. After my pathetic tantrum, I regretted my decision to cast my only hope at leaving into the barren region. I clumsily scrambled off the top of my car and began walking to where I saw my phone land. On that short but shameful journey, I thought of my options. I did consider walking further up the road. I couldn't have been far from a gas station or a diner. I hadn't seen a single building on that road for hours. The last one I saw was some sort of shoddy rest stop, but it would be a gambit to attempt to make my way to that as I wasn't entirely sure if anyone still worked there. It looked run down when I passed it. I figured a car would pass sooner or later anyway. I was far too tired to begin a trek like that in the state I was in. The black case of my phone stood out in the sand like a sore thumb. I knelt down and picked it up, brushing the grid off the screen. I checked to see if I had broken it. To my relief, it appeared to be working fine. I turned to walk back to my stationary car, but as I did, I stopped. Before me was the visions of something which confused and equally terrified me. My car was still there, but the road? The road was gone. Vanished. As though it had never been there at all. I rubbed my eyes, convinced the heat had finally got to me. Was it a mirage? A trick of the light? I looked further down the road to see just more desert. Even the space under the car was still just sand. I ran over to behind my car, onto where the road should have been. I knelt and began brushing away the sand desperately, hoping to find the road underneath. It sounds silly, I know, to suggest that sand had blown onto the road completely in the time it took me to retrieve my phone. But you have to understand, I was stunned. I must have brushed away a whole beach's worth of sand before giving up. The road was really gone. I clambered back atop the car for a better view of my surroundings. Once there, I scanned the enveloping land, hoping to spot any disparity in the sand and any sign of civilization. It was hard to see as the shimmers of the heat in the distance almost obscured what lay beyond, but I could have sworn, for a brief moment, I saw the light of the sun sparkle off something, something metal or glass. I was too far away to tell. I hopped off the car and began running in its general direction. I ran frantically for what must have been 500 yards before the thing began to take shape in my eyes. A glimmer of light, which had lured me to the thing, came from a window. It was a car. In a desperate frenzy, I continued to run, screaming for help in between strained breaths. I can't stress enough how relieved I was to see another car. But nonetheless, I was at the same time terrified it would drive off before I could get to it. I was no more than 100 yards away when my soured relief turned to something different. Hopelessness, perhaps. There was no one in the car. Every single seat was empty. I paused to catch my breath. My shirt was dripping with sweat. I finished my journey with a defeated jog. The car was old. A model from the 70s or 60s. Once at the car, I placed my hand on the roof and peered through the window. Garbage was strewn over the floor and the seats. Candy wrappers and bottles littered the inside of the old vehicle, like someone had been living in there. To my delight, the key was still in the ignition. I tried the door, which opened stiffly with a crack. The car hadn't been used for years. I shuffled into the driver's seat and twisted the key. The car let out a sound which I half expected as I did. A chugging, aged wheeze, like a dying man letting out a final breath. Much like my car, the thing wasn't going to start. Too defeated and tired to be angry, I slumped back into the seat, wiping sweat off my forehead. I checked my watch. 6.47 it read. It would be turning dark soon. I got out of the car with a huff and slammed the door, but as I did, something caught my eye. My heart sank and my eyes widened with terror. 
I hadn't noticed it before. On the other side of the car, reaching out from behind a wheel was a hand, a human hand, but not one which belonged to anyone living. It was bony and cracked, with not a single shred of skin on it. Gawking in horror, I slowly crept around the car to get a better view. Before long, I could see the whole thing. The skeleton of a man lay twisted and bent beside the car. The bones had almost turned yellow from being in the sun too long. However, this person had died. It had not died peacefully. His skull had been caved in and was shattered around the edges. Sharp bristles of bone shot out from his snap legs, which awkwardly contorted sideways. The position in which the bones lay there was uncomfortable to look at. The left arm was strewn out with the hand facing the wrong way. The right arm was worse. It was almost completely devastated and barely resembled an arm at all. The ribs were cracked inwards, resting beside his twisted spine. It was at that moment, as I stared in morbid anguish at the warped pile of bones, I noticed another horrifying detail of the distorted desert. The place was silent, painfully so. I hadn't heard a single sound that didn't come from me. No gusts of wind, nor the croaking of crickets, or even the rustling of a tumbleweed. I backed away from the skeleton, so overwhelmed with terror, I did the only thing I could think of. I ran. Turning back to the vague visage of my car in the distance, I fled from the morbid scene. By the time I was back at my car, I was exhausted. I flung open the driver's side door and crept inside, crawling up on the seat. I slammed my sweating hands on the wheel once more, but not from anger. It was more pathetic than that. My legs were on fire after the journey. It was undoubtedly the best workout I'd had in a long time. Out of options and utterly hopeless, I rested my head back, defeated. I closed my eyes and began to slip away as the sun dipped below the horizon. Call it me falling asleep from exhaustion or a faint, I couldn't tell. I awoke with a jolt, sweat still dripping from my brow. The place was still uncomfortably silent. By the time I opened my eyes, the desert was cast in darkness, the only illumination coming from the pallid moon which shimmered above the plains. I reached for my phone in my pocket. I pressed the home button and turned on the flashlight feature before placing it in my shirt pocket, casting out a cone of light everywhere I turned. It shone through the windshield, appearing not dissimilar from a headlight. My watch read 1039, and I came up with a plan. I would wait in my car until the early hours of the morning around 3 or 4 o'clock, and I would begin walking the direction the road ahead should have been, but the reasonable part of me figured I was most likely never leaving that cursed waste. As I concluded with my plan, however, a stomach churning, banshee-like wail erupted in the distance behind my car. It shook my bones. It was a sharp, croaking howl, a sound which I did not recognize. I looked upwards to my rearview mirror, the light of my phone reflecting off it, revealing a small portion of the desert behind my car. I saw nothing but sand and dirt. Refusing to leave my car, I peered around my seat, taking my phone out of my shirt pocket and shining it through the back window. My blood froze as I made out the ambiguous silhouette of an animal not a hundred feet away from my car, but it was not like any animal I'd seen before. It was a tall, lurching creature which crept across the sand on two thin and hind legs. Its arms swung low, and its head was long like a horse. Its finer details I couldn't make out. I didn't want to. In the short time, I did look upon the creature. It appeared to be inching across the desert in my direction. A patient predator. After gazing at the thing briefly, I hastily turned off my makeshift flashlight and lay across the two front seats in a fruitless attempt to hide from whatever monster was lurking out in the wilderness outside my car. My heart pumped faster as its muffled steps and the sand grew louder and closer. I wasn't just sweating from the heat anymore. I covered my mouth as I heard a thin, veiled snarl from outside the car. It was close. Still laying in the seats, I felt the vehicle churn as talon-like claws gripped the back of it. I panicked as the car tilted horizontally. The creature was picking it up from behind. I sat up in a frenzy as it continued to lift. By now, the car stood vertically. I had to push back on the wheel as to not fall against the glass. The creature let out another screech as it heaved the car onto its back, and I fell with a thud onto the upturned roof. Without giving me a second to breathe, the creature's long, spindly arm crashed through one of the doors in the back. It blindly thrashed at the seats, tearing the leather to shreds with its nasty claws. While the creature was busy, I hastily kicked open the front door, 
and violently scrambled out into the blackened desert. Without looking back, I ran as I heard the monster pull its arm out of the car. It screamed again, shaking the sand as I ran on before it leaped after me on its hindmost legs. A sharp pain shot up my leg as I ran recklessly into the dark, barren land. I fell to the ground, loosely making out the outline of the rock I just tripped over. Sand burst onto my face as I crashed to the floor. I pushed myself onto my back to see the creature looming over me. It let out one final roar, and as it did, the desert erupted with the sound of blaring car alarms. The place was now lit by legions of headlights. Hundreds of cars, far and wide, blared and flickered. They might as well have been tombstones. Graves of those unlucky enough to stumble into the monster's dark dimension. There on my back, amidst the sand and dirt, looking up at whatever was about to tear me asunder, I thought of one thing, my destination, the reason for my journey. I never did tell you, did I? My mother died. It was her funeral today. Since her passing, I've been working through the stages of grief as one does, but I could never overcome the last acceptance. It was only then, on my back and faced with a visage of death, when I finally came to accept, I closed my eyes with the final thought that maybe, in 30 years, some poor soul would stumble across my corpse as well. When I was 13, I lived in an old town. It was a kind of town that would have yearly yard sales for every house. The one that you knew pretty much everyone, and most of them were older folks in the neighborhood. Do you know how every single town, no matter what kind of town they are, has a little secret? Well, mine has a much darker one. When I first moved there with my family, my mom and dad, we were told a small story after just moving in. Our neighbor told us of a dark figure that would come out at night and it would come to those that went near the mine. We thought it was all fun and games, until we saw the look in his eyes, the one of complete fear. Naturally, being a smart family, we listened to the neighbor. Now fast forward to a few years later, I'm now 16 and a junior in high school. I have a little brother who's already two years old. I was invited to a house party after school. I knew it was going to be a lot of stupid people, but I was a teen. Most people know that teens don't make the best decisions. Anyhow, I went to the party after school telling my family that it was a study group. Things got heated extremely fast. People were drinking constantly. I was watching people take down full cans of beer in a few seconds. I was one of the few that didn't have anything to drink. I was pretty much there just to make sure nothing went wrong. After a while, people started leaving until it was only a few people left. The people that were left started a game of truth or dare. I was still there because my friend was there, and I was worried about her. Eventually, things got escalated from kiss someone to more dirty things and more adult-like. I stayed out of this, but then I heard a dare go off to one of the girls that stood out from the rest of them. I dare you to go to the mine. I was surprised that this had to come up. Almost everyone knows in this town that you don't go there, though we don't have any proof to support the fact that the rumors are true. People were more scared of the fact that it could be true than the fact that it could be false. The girl stupidly accepted it, and then went to get in the car, and since I was the only one over there that was sober, I was forced to drive. I was also worried that my reputation at school would be drove down to the person that was too scared to go to the mine. I was a teen. What did you expect? We got there in less than 10 minutes. It wasn't too far from town. When we got there, the mine was dark, and there was hardly any tools left over time from people and homeless people grabbing them. But there were still a couple lying around. After we got out, the girl's son. She won the dare. But to the guy, it wasn't enough. He said for her to win the dare, she had to go inside of it. I immediately protested this idea, but he turned around and told me to shut up. This guy was drunk and obviously not thinking straight. I told everyone to get in the car, I'm driving you all home. This is a dumb dare and they shouldn't go any farther. A few listened, but two stayed behind the girl, and the other guy. They laughed at us calling us sissies as they turned around and walked into the mine. As soon as they walked in, I had a bad feeling. The darkness around them somehow closed them off from the headlights as soon as they walked in. I didn't know how it happened, but immediately after they walked in, I heard screams. You know how they say some screams have enjoyment and others have terror? This was another level of terror. 
This was screams of absolute, like staring into death's eyes. After hearing the screams, the other side is telling me to drive. I couldn't leave them behind, I just couldn't do it. I grabbed my flashlight and run in after them. I could instantly tell that something was wrong with the mine. It was too dark, the moonlight wouldn't come in, it was too quiet. There was nothing going on inside, even though I knew two people were in there. I walked in, putting my flashlight to the walls and the ground. Even though it didn't go far, I could see a bit ahead of me. After walking in for what seemed like a minute, I turned around and couldn't see outside. I thought I didn't go that far, but I guess I did. I turned around, and I immediately saw something red, like liquid, dripping from the ceiling. I stopped and just stared as I saw a corpse hanging from the ceiling. I knew immediately it was one of them. They were wearing the same clothes they had on before. I gagged in complete terror as their mangled body just hung there. I turned and sprinted out as fast as I possibly could, and I couldn't see. My flashlight was dimming for some reason, and that's when I tripped. I could feel something crawling over me, not like rats with their tiny feet, more like one giant body itself. It was cold to the touch. I could feel it through my jacket. Whenever it touched me, I just felt fear and pain. I quickly got back up and ran, knowing that it was close behind me. When I finally got outside, I turned around. I saw something dragging itself back into the darkness. I saw it. It looked like a human hand sticking out of its back. When I turned around, I saw the truck and everyone was inside, just completely shocked as I walked out. We drove back to the house in complete silence and called the police. We told them what happened, and they sent a squad car over there to investigate. In the morning, when they finally sent someone inside with lights, they said they couldn't find a body, no blood. Ever since that night, I've been terrified of the dark. My wife thinks I'm weird for sleeping with a nightlight in the room. She'll never understand how I felt when I had that thing on my back. I've since moved out of that little town. My town no longer has a dark secret to be shared with everyone, but I still remember the fact that the mind still stands to this day. I know what I saw that night, and I know whatever that thing was had killed two of my friends and had some help to dispose of the bodies. Someday, I'm going to return, and I'm going to go in there and face whatever my friends faced that night, and when I stare death in the eye, I'm going to laugh as he comes at me. Why the hell didn't I just get gas when I had the chance? What was I thinking trying to make it to the next town this late at night? Well, now I've gone and done it. Where the hell am I? The rain was coming down so heavy that I couldn't see anything outside, and all I could hear was the constant downpour. I hadn't seen any other drivers for the past two hours, and that last town was too far to walk. Damn it all. I struck my steering wheel and grabbed my umbrella and flashlight before getting out to see if I could spot any landmarks. I stepped out of my car and directly into a deep puddle that caused me to lose my balance and fall into my face. Damn it. As I stood, I felt my backside bump against the door slamming it shut. I tried to open it and realized it was locked. Through the window, I could see the keys dangling in the ignition. I kicked the car door in anger and screamed at the top of my lungs to the sky but the rain was still pouring and I choked on some water causing me to fall backward and land on my umbrella breaking it. After a brief coughing bout, I recovered but I still could see nothing through the darkness and the rain. I took out my flashlight and decided to see if I could find help before resorting to breaking my window. A flashlight was proving useless in this rain, so I left it turned on and set on the hood of my car so I could find my way back. A flash of light suddenly went across the sky. I heard no thunder and saw no additional flashes, so I ignored it and continued on my way. After walking for a few minutes, I saw a light in the distance ahead of me. Had I turned around somehow? I looked behind me and saw the flashlight I left on the hood now far behind me. I turned back to the new source of light and started to hasten my pace so I could get help out of this rain until morning. As I grew closer to the new source of light, I began to slow down until I eventually stopped. It looked exactly like my car, but it was under a street light which by itself was strange because it was the only street light I'd seen for hours now and the only one around. I focused my vision, and there was even a flashlight on the hood. What were the chances? Where was the owner? Were they stranded too? 
No sooner had the thought entered my mind that I saw someone get out of the driver's seat and take the flashlight from the hood. Hey, hey over here, I had yelled, because I didn't think they could hear me over the deafening rain. The person lifted their arm in acknowledgement and began to walk toward me. Suddenly, my heart began pounding and I felt fear begin to creep up in me. I took a step back and the person stopped. I could not see them clearly at all. Royenna? I heard the voice as if the stranger were right beside me. Impossible. This rain is too loud. The stranger took a step toward me. And I took two back. Don't know. This time, the voice sounded as if it were in my head. I turned and began to run back toward my car. As I grew closer, I could hear footsteps closing in quickly behind me. I grabbed my flashlight from the hood and used it to break the window and unlock the door. As I went inside, I felt someone grab my collar of my shirt. With such force, they ripped it while scraping my neck. I screamed and turned around to only see an open car door that I quickly closed before diving into the back seat and crawling onto the floor. The car began to shake and I desperately cried out for the stranger to leave me alone. This went on for what felt like hours, and when it finally stopped, I opened my eyes and saw the rain had stopped. It was now daylight outside. Hello? I didn't know what I expected to hear, but when there was no response, I sat up and peeked outside through the backseat window. I was on a street in a town I did not recognize. I opened the door and slowly exited, making sure to look all around me just in case the terrifying stranger was still around. When I was sure he was not, I ran to the nearest building which turned out to be a diner, and was relieved to find it filled with people. A hostess greeted me with a smile. Ais, yoi, tog, sroi? I didn't understand her, and had no time for pleasantries. Can you contact the police? I was assaulted last night. Her smile faded, and the rest of the diner fell completely silent. I turned to see every other person in the room staring at me. When I turned back to the hostess, she was on the phone and whispering something I could not hear. After around a minute of this, she hung up. Are the police on their way? She smiled and nodded her head. Wait, you, here, yes? Her speech was strange, and it made me think of the language she had first spoke when I entered. It was similar to what the stranger who attacked me had been speaking. I took a step back, and she looked over my shoulder and then nodded towards me. I followed her gaze and saw two large men who were sitting at a table begin to stand. I turned and ran out of the diner as fast as I could. As I ran down the street, I realized that I couldn't read any of the streets or store signs. They were in a strange language I had never seen before. I continued to run until I saw what looked to be the edge of town. There was a large sign that read, One Geneve Noat. As I approached it, I heard a car accelerating behind me, and when I turned I saw it was identical to my car, and the driver's seat was a man who looked almost exactly like me. I sprinted away so quickly I began to stumble and fell forward as I passed the sign. There was a flash of light in the sky, and I heard a guttural scream but turned to see nothing but an empty road. No man pursuing me, no strange sign, no town. I stood and began to walk down the road in the opposite direction of where the town had been. I don't know how much time had passed before a passerby stopped along the side of the road and asked if I was okay. Hearing someone speaking in a language I clearly understood caused me to stop walking and fall to my knees crying uncontrollably. I don't remember the trip to the hospital, but I was so grateful to be resting somewhere safe. A police officer entered my room and began asking me questions about who I was and how I ended up on a back road in the middle of nowhere. I told my story as best as I could, trying not to sound insane or begin crying. When I was done, she looked as if she were staring at a lunatic, and I couldn't blame her. So before she left, I blurted out that it all could have been due to dehydration or something, and she nodded, but I didn't know if she believed me. Because of her reaction, I never spoke about what I experienced ever again and always chose to take a plane when traveling anywhere outside of my hometown. Lately, though, I've noticed that I'll meet someone who speaks in a way that's a little off, similar to the way the hostess had spoken when she asked me to wait in the diner. I would only run into one every few months or so, but now, it seems to happen every other day.
Have you ever seen anything that goes beyond what is considered normal? Have you ever heard anything that your ears can't comprehend? Have you ever sat up in the dark of the night only to think that what had happened, maybe it was just a dream? Well, if you have, then you are just like Flint. You see, Flint had come across a strange fellow. Indeed, he was a strange fellow. So strange, in fact, that he is just the imagination of a little kid. Flint had taken a stroll one day, wishing to see the turning leaves of autumn fall to the ground, burning their colors that only once could be seen above the ground below. Flint had as a child loved collecting the many different leaves, a hobby that still lives within him to this day. That is when, during his collecting, he heard the crunch from nearby. Looking upward, he saw a child, no more than maybe five, or could he have been six, perhaps, standing under a tree. Whoa, the boy exclaimed. I've never seen a squirrel like that one. Look, Mr. Longbody, isn't his tail super fluffy? Mr. Longbody? Flint stared at the boy. He could see no one other than the boy himself. Then it hit him. An imaginary friend. Oh yeah, of course. Flint realized that the boy was talking to someone that no one other than the boy could see. Just like all children whose minds aren't restricted by the laws of adults, the boy could see, hear, and speak with someone that Flint couldn't. Though that side of Flint was gone, he could still enjoy his hobby of collecting fallen leaves, which is what he went back to doing. Flint hobbled along the fallen leaves, probably looking like a hopping pigeon to others who saw him, as he carefully picked each leaf without crumbling them into dust. A shadow soon loomed over Flint, a very long shadow. So long, in fact, he couldn't even see the face of the one who cast it. Flint turned around to see who the caster was, only to see the little boy. Oh, hello there, Flint said, still startled by the boy's sudden appearance. What you doing, mister? The boy knelt down, pressing his chin into his hands. He looked at all the leaves on the ground, and the ones in Flint's hands. Flint smiled. Oh, I'm collecting leaves. Why? Flint rests his arms on his knees. Mostly I love the different colors of the leaves, just something about them changing during this time that makes the world look less dull and much more beautiful. The boy tilted his head to the side. Flint felt embarrassed saying what he did. He knew a child his age, didn't understand what he had to say, but it was the truth. Flint loved seeing how the dull, cloudy days of fall got covered in the luscious colors of fallen leaves. Ironic that something that is dying can explode to life in a ray of colors. Flint took another glance behind him to see only the boy's shadow. The shadow from before must have been a trick of the light. So, what are you up to? Flint stared at the boy. I'm just exploring the park with Mr. Longbody. There was that name again. Flint raised an eyebrow. Who's that? Is that a friend of yours? Flint looked over the boy's shoulder, trying to find a sign of anyone that could be with him. The boy shook his head. Yeah, Mr. Longbody is my best friend in the whole world. He's always here with me. He always makes sure I'm okay. Oh, really? Well, that sounds like a really good friend. You shouldn't let a friendship like that disappear. I won't. Mr. Longbody promised to stay with me forever and ever. The boy smiled with a confidence so bright that not even the worst storm could have washed it away. That's the sign of a real friend, Flint said. The boy chuckled a bit, showing off that he was missing some of his front teeth. Flint reached down in the pile of leaves he had gathered, holding out a bright orange one to the boy. The boy's mouth hung open, stunned. For me? I know it's not much, but when I was little watching the leaves fall, their colors seemed to resonate within me. It... Flint trailed off a bit. It always reminds me that even when things look bad and everything starts falling around you, that in those dire times, beauty can be found. Flint grew red at speaking how he felt. Most would laugh him off, and he knew the kid didn't know what he meant, for when he looked up at the kid, his attention was only on the bright orange leaf. Thanks, mister. The boy held up his left. Look, Mr. Longbody, isn't it neat? The boy returned a smile back to Flint, his same smile that showed off his missing tooth. Mr. Longbody thinks it's neat too. Flint nodded. I'm glad. Well, it's getting late. Time for me to head back. You don't stay out too long, you and Mr. Longbody. Flint looked up in the sky, pretending to look at the Mr. Longbody. We won't. Come on, Mr. Longbody, the boy's son. As he darted past Flint, Flint could have sworn he felt a brush against his shoulder. He looked around to see nothing. 
He shrugged off the strange feeling as an acorn falling from the tree. Flint had to trek against the park to a tunnel that was separate from the pedestrians and vehicles within the vehicles up top and everyone on the bottom. It wasn't that long of a tunnel to go through, and Flint had come this way many times before, yet this time would turn out to be different. It would be here at this moment that caused Flint to question everything he thought he knew about reality. Give me all your money. Flint heard the grumpy old voice, along with the cool hard steel of a gun. He barely cocked his head when the voice ordered again, Give me all your money. Uh, okay, Flint said. It's in my back pocket. The voice said, Alright, now don't try any funny stuff. Mister... The boy's voice echoed from down the path. Flint turned around fully, only to meet with a pistol whip. He fell to the ground. He held on to his pounding face to see a shaggy-dressed old man with a balding head. I told you not to move, the man said. Mister, the boy pushed past the old man to Flint. Look, isn't this leaf neat? The boy held up a leaf, a mix of four colors, red, orange, green, and yellow. Mr. Logbody and I found it on the ground. We thought we could give it to you as a thanks, since you only have nothing but orange leaves. Then put a hand on the boy's shoulder. You have to get out of here. The boy cocked his head. Why, mister? Hey, little brat, what do you think you're doing? The old man said. You move it, or I'll shoot you. Get behind me. Flint said, pushing the boy to his back. Hey, I'll leave him out of this. You just want my money, right? Here. Flint tossed the money at the old man's feet. Sure. But how do I know that boy won't tell? The old man said. He won't. Flint turns to the boy. Right? It's okay, mister. Mr. Longbody says it'll be okay. Hey, this isn't the time. Who the hell is Mr. Longbody? The old man asked. It's... nothing. Flint's voice broke. From behind the old man... Slowly appearing before his eyes were the two stumpy legs, bright yellow with black spots. What soon followed was a long, tall body that reached the ceiling of the tunnel. The body was yellow, covered in the same black dots. The body was so long it had to wrap itself in loops to fit. Flint could make out two small hands void of no arms that stuck to the long body, then a round face with a long smile with a row of large teeth, a pointy nose, and two dots for eyes appeared. What is that? Flint mumbled. The fuck you mumbling about? The old man said following Flint's eyes. The old man frozen in horror at the sight of what he saw. His hands shook, causing him to drop his gun. The strange looking entity stood at the old man, its pointing nose hanging over him like a sickle. Then in a flash, it opens its long wide mouth biting down on the old man. All that was left was the lower half of the old man. It fell to the ground in the blood that came gushing out. Flint sat there, listening to the strange-looking entity munch down on the old man's upper half, blood and drool dripping down from its bizarre smile. The boy ran over to the entity. He gave it a small pat on its body before turning back to Flint. See? I told you. Mr. Longbody said it would be okay. The boy smiled that same smile that showed off his missing tooth. Flint sat there unsure of what to think of anymore. Mr. Longbody swallowed down the old man's remains in his mouth and stared into Flint's eyes, its smile rising up becoming more bizarre. Mr. Longbody lowered itself down to Flint, allowing its hands void of arms to drop a leaf in his lap. Oh yeah, Mr. Longbody wanted you to have this leaf as a thank you too. He hopes you like it. Flint looked down at the leaf that landed in his lap, a bright yellow leaf with small black dots. I have a hard time wondering if what I saw was real. I lived on an Air Force base in the middle of the desert. I didn't and still don't know the history of it. I guess I'm too scared to confirm what I saw. I was nine. Due to the high family population on the military base, there is an old school. Not huge, but a good size. The school was close. I could see it from my house. Every morning I would walk to class, cutting through two houses. The houses had brick fences and these houses had a huge gap that I would walk through. I would take a right, walking on the long sidewalk even though the school was right across the street. Even though I was out in the open, 
It was always silent. No other kids, because I always walked later than others due to laziness. No cars, because everyone was at work. Only a crossing guard far down the street. One day, I saw two kids, a boy and a girl, around my age, walking the opposite direction. Now, winters are cold in the desert. I had a jacket on, jeans, gloves. The girl had on a stripped skirt, a blouse with a ruffled collar. The boy, shorts with a button-up. Both had shoulder bags and weird lunch boxes with strings around them, wrapped around their wrists. I was walking toward the crosswalk, and I had to go between them. I ended up bumping into the girl. I turned around to say sorry. They were gone. I thought maybe they turned into the gap between the houses, even though it was a good 50 feet away. Whatever. I was nine. The next day I saw them again, dressed the same, even though there was a biting wind. But they looked odd. They had soot all over them, black ash spotting the pristine white of their shirts. I slowed my walk, wondering why they looked dirty, but kept walking. This time, I stepped aside, watching them as they walked away, watching them just walk straight down the long sidewalk until I decided that I was being creepy and continued walking until I decided to look back immediately. They were gone, when I know they shouldn't be. It happened again. The next day, they were dressed the same, but they looked even worse. Now their clothes were singed, but the glare was still there, like they just caught fire. When they walked by, I could smell smoke. What scared me though was this time, I decided to look at their faces. They looked blank, but when they walked by me, their heads snapped to the side to meet eyes. They seemed so scared. The next day, it was the worst for me. Same thing, same time, same clothes. I looked straight at them and I wanted to cry. Their skin was burnt. The girl's upper right side of her face was burnt, her eye missing. The boy's lower right side of his face was almost gone. I could see his teeth through his cheek. I could see burnt skin all over their body, bones here and there. I stopped walking. They walked faster toward me. I was frozen to my spot, until the girl was so close to my face I could smell burning skin. I met her eye, and my fear melted away to sadness. She looked so scared. Then, she let out an ear-piercing shriek. I knelt down, covering my ears. Suddenly, it stopped. I looked up, and they were gone. The final day was one of the happiest days of my life. I decided they deserved something more from this kid other than creepy stares and fear. As small as it was, I decided to take a rose from the vase my mother always had, and I walked, and I saw them. They hadn't changed. They were still burnt, and I could see the smoke coming off them. I stayed put. They walked toward me, and when they came in touching distance, I held out the rose. They stopped and looked at it. In what felt like eternity, the boy took it from me. He turned toward his sister holding the rose up to her. She reached up to touch the petals and she laughed and laughed and laughed. She got her brother laughing too. Before I knew it, I was laughing as well. She hugged her brother and they both looked at me, still giggling. I saw them turn gray and crumble, the ashes blowing away. The rose dropped to my feet and I picked it up. I walked toward the crosswalk. I really hope they made it home. I live a perfectly happy, if somewhat boring, suburban lifestyle. Far better than the poor urban lifestyle my wife, Elaine, and I grew up knowing. Although we are happy, it does not mean we are without any problems. Particularly, my son Daniel. Daniel had always been a handful. My wife and I adored him, don't get me wrong. But he always just needed a little more than my daughter, Mariah. Elaine and I feel almost responsible for the way Daniel was. He's our oldest. And we had absolutely no clue what we were doing as two young parents. By the time we got Mariah about four years later, our parenting skills had improved drastically. Plus, aside from his little quirks, Danny was a really good boy. Elaine had always been so happy to homeschool the kids, and they seemed equally happy in return. However, when the recession hit a few years ago, she had to return to work to help keep our community afloat. We're a tight-knit neighborhood, so if one family suffers, it hurts us all. We've always been happy to do our part to help, 
The downside was this meant Danny and Mariah had to go to traditional school in our community for the first time in their lives. Quickly, we saw just how very different our two children were. Mariah blossomed immediately. She had 10 new friends by the end of her first week and was signed up for five extracurriculars by the end of the second. She got nothing but glowing reviews from her teachers and her grades reflected her efforts. Daniel, well, Daniel sunk in like a rock in water. By the end of the first month, he still had not a single friend to speak of and had made no effort to change his situation. His teachers had barely even heard of him, much less heard a peep from him in class. His grades reflected his lack of effort. Some parents in the neighborhood aren't too worried about grades. There's plenty of jobs that don't require a traditional education, they would say. I am a doctor. And my wife manages the community bank. We do not accept failing academics from our children. But no matter what punishment we gave Danny, his attitude and performance remained the same. Ultimately, we made him go to tutoring and resigned ourselves to the fact that we'd done all we could. By his senior year, we were just relieved he was still attending classes. I constantly had to choke down the urge to lecture him on how he was wasting a perfectly good education, but I managed, if only for Elaine's sake. Daniel and I barely spoke to one another at that point. He was a disappointment to me and he knew it, without me ever saying so. That didn't mean I didn't love him, and I of course agreed when my wife suggested we buy him something practical for a graduation gift. My wife and I had found a nice little bungalow down the road from us that we decided to buy for him. I was against it at first. In my opinion, barely passing doesn't merit such an expensive gift, but my wife reasoned that if he had a lower paying job, the least we could do was make sure he had a good place to live. And before you even ask, no, he couldn't have lived with us after high school. Not only would he and I have shattered the thin veneer that was cordial peace in our house, but it is also simply not the thing done in our community. When graduation day came, my wife and I were excited to show Danny his new home. We of course waited until all the formal celebrations had ended before we snuck him away from the party. As we walked down the road, my wife gave him a little speech on how proud we were of him. How despite being grown up, he would always be our son. How we know things haven't been easy. But it's only going up from here. I honestly thought it was cheesy and not necessarily an accurate fit for our son. But he seemed pleased. At least... He was pleased until he saw the house. Um, so is my gift inside or... Or are we just stopping to rest? He asked tentatively. No, sweetheart. The house is the gift. Isn't it precious? And still in the community. My wife was practically singing each word. I don't understand. I thought I could leave once I was an adult. That I could go back to the rest of the world. You told me. You promised me I could leave. But... Don't you like being our son? We love you so much, Danny. My wife was on the verge of tears at this point. How dare Daniel be so ungrateful for such a thoughtful gift from his mother? I... Okay, look. It's not that I don't like being your kid. It's been fine, really. Much better than I had expected. But I miss my family. I want to go home. You promised I could go home. I shot my wife a stern look. Daniel was many things, but... He was not a liar. If he was saying my wife promised him he could leave the community, then she most certainly did. Foolish. No wonder he had never properly assimilated to the culture. He was always expecting to leave someday. I knew it had to be done. Please let me be clear. I find no pleasure in the removal policies of the community, but they are strict and they are fair, and those who do not remove a non-compliant are subject to removal themselves, moving as deftly as possible. I threw my arm around my son's neck and snapped his head to an unnatural angle. My wife sobbed as his limp body hit the ground. I allowed her to go home before I had to carve the red R on his forehead, signifying that Daniel had been removed from the community. Our community is a safe and happy place, much better for children than the rest of the world. Mariah was understanding about her brother's removal, but largely unsurprised. He was never grateful for the community saving us from our outside families. I do hope they find us a new male child to have soon. I knew right then that my little girl would be a fantastic big sister when the community leaders found us a new boy. And soon enough, they did. His outside name was Evan, but my wife and I renamed him Jacob. He was scared the first few nights, 
crying for his outside mother, but he seems to be progressing quickly. I'm sure he will someday be perfectly happy in the community. It was just the wind, I convinced myself, while going on to the corner of my couch in the living room. Even the thought of a robber frightened me, and I didn't want to think what could happen if someone actually broke into my home. Suddenly, I heard a loud bang, then the sound of shattered window coming from the kitchen. I wish that day never happened. As I regret what occurred after the sound, I took my gun, which I had a legal permit for, and hid under my bed. The person who broke into the house walked over to the living room. I was shaking from fear of death, and I made sure my gun was not in safety mode. It was, and that's when it hit me. The gun made a click sound when taken out of safety mode. I would have to shoot the robber if I wanted to ready the gun. So I made the decision no one wants to make and put the gun out of safety mode. What the hell was that? The person said, while starting to breathe even faster. I came out of my hiding spot with my finger on the trigger and fired. The man had a black ski mask on his head and black clothes. All black except the hole in his chest, which was red. Immediately I ran across the room, looking at the robber in fear, to call the police. I took my phone and dialed 911 and waited for an answer. I heard the words, 911, what is your emergency? Coming from the phone and answered, I shot a man. After that, it was all just a huge blurry mess. I can't even now remember it. The police came quickly, but after that, I don't remember anything. I was in true shock. I had to appear in court, but there was all the evidence with the broken window that it was breaking and entering. And that's what I did. Self-defense. It wasn't. He had no weapon. I faked it. I tried to forget it with therapy and all, but to no avail. I couldn't get rid of the feeling of me murdering an almost innocent man. I went to therapy, but I couldn't tell the truth. It was all staged. Months. Years went by, but I couldn't forget. Then I saw him. I was walking to the bus stop to go home, as I don't own a car. I got onto the bus and walked towards the back, when on one of the seats he was sitting. It's not like I noticed him. Only after getting home I realized it. Spooky. The next appearance of him happened a few days later, at work. I work on the third floor and saw him walking down the street, wearing that damn ski mask every time. I was spooked by these events. I told my boss I wasn't feeling well, and he let me go home for sick leave. I don't know what to do. How can I get this to stop? Are these encounters just hallucinations? Help me, please. It's a sound heard every morning. It never fails to be heard. It sounds so loud that it even overshadows the loudest boom of thunder during the worst storms. Even if a wind could howl loud enough to rip a 10,000 year old tree from its roots, this sound could howl even louder. For you see in this quiet neighborhood, a sound that comes every morning has become a sound of dread to a single occupant. Many could dismiss the sound as just a normal day thing, but for Margaret, this sound begun a night full of sleeplessness and horror. She cannot remember how far back the sound started. Yet, what she does know is that she hated hearing it. It always began for her at least down one end of the street, only for her to hear it echo later down the way. Oh, how she hated being roused from whatever sleep she could gain. She would step out of her bedroom to the living room, going to the large window that faced her front. Peering out, she would see the source of that damn sound. A large black truck would speed down the road, with its sound echoing behind it. Why would someone drive like that so early in the morning? The same question, always on replay in her mind, when the sound would wake her. She stepped out into her living room, leaning onto the couch that faced the window. Peeking outside, with the only light coming from the dimly lit street lamps, she watched as a large black truck with a canopy on its bed drove down in a haste. It came down the street so fast, dust flew up. She shook her head as she moved off the couch. Why on earth would people drive so fast? They could cause a serious wreck, she said to herself. She stared at the clock across the hall. Well, can't go back to sleep now. With the non-stop truck each night, 
It did not help with the insomnia that Margaret had to deal with. She would be lucky enough to even get an hour of sleep. Upset and tired, Margaret went about her normal morning routine of fixing herself some coffee and coming to sit down in the old rickety rocking chair that used to be her mother's. She used to complain to her mother all the time about just sitting in that chair and drinking coffee, but now found herself doing the same thing. With her coffee in her hands, she clicked on the television. Its flashes bringing up the channel she always made sure to leave on before shutting it off the night prior. The day went on pretty much the same for her. Coffee and news in the morning. During the day, she would clean house and start to think of what to make for dinner. Then as evening grew, she would prepare dinner, watch a little bit of TV, then head into her bedroom to read a few passages from her Bible, then head to bed, trying to get at least some sort of sleep. Then like clockwork, the roaring sound of that truck engine awoke Margaret from her sleep. Again, going to her window, she watched as the truck came barreling down the street, the dust kicking up into the air by its speed. Shaking her head, she walked back to her bedroom. Like every night the same question rose within her, yet she shrugged them away. Later in the day, she went outside to clip some of her rose bushes. She heard a commotion coming from down the street. She walked down, learning that one of her neighbors had awoken in the morning to missing four of their toes. Where their toes had been were now just stumps. They had gone to the hospital to see what could have caused it, but even the doctors were left baffled. Scary, Margaret thought to herself. What could have caused someone to lose their toes like that? After leaving the commotion and finishing up with her roses, Margaret sat watching TV with her dinner in front of her. The news brought up nothing about the incidents in her neighborhood. The only thing the news would ever bring up was politics and random shootings that had happened on the other side of town. She sighed, clicking off the television. She sat in bed, read her Bible passages, and went to bed. In that moment she lay down, she could have sworn she heard the truck coming down. She glanced at the clock. It was still early for it to come. She leaned out from her bed to listen, but nothing, only silence. She thought she was hearing things and went back to bed. In the silence of that night, she began to feel the sensation of licking. She tossed and turned in her bed, kicking whatever dog was licking her feet. Then she froze. Dog? What dog? In the past, Margaret had a pet dog that would lay in bed, and whenever it would need to go out, it would lick her toes to wake her. But just last year, she had to put her dog down. Then, what was licking her toes? She jumped up, her eyes wide with fear. She looked down, only to open her mouth in horror. No scream would emerge. There at the end of her bed, licking and nibbling on her toes, were five little red imp-like creatures. They clattered their teeth toward one another in a form of speech. One of the creatures nibbled on the pinky toe, then looked to its others. One of the imps had been carrying a brown sack. It dug its three-digit hands into the sack, pulling out a rustic-looking knife. The one that had pointed at the pinky toe continued to point at it, which the one with the knife sliced it off. The intense pain soared through Margaret. The knife must have been sharp for it to go through bone, leaving a clean slice. The imp placed the knife and toe into its bag only to pull out a green slime that it slathered on the toe. Another imp bit down on Margaret's big left toe and snarled. Emotion for the other, with the bag to come over. Margaret couldn't believe what she was watching. Moreover, she couldn't believe she was just sitting letting it happen. With her mouth still open in horror, she managed to bring out her voice. A loud pitched scream filled the room, capturing the creature's ears. They stared at her with the same voiceless expression Margaret held. They scuttled away like roaches into her living room. Margaret threw on a sock, on her foot missing her pinky. She rushed to her living room to see the front door wide open. She rushed to the door frame to stare out into her front yard. There parked along her driveway was the black truck that she had always seen and heard every morning. A tall looking creature with no features opened the truck bed letting the imps inside. It shut it, locking it. It turned to Margaret before hopping inside the truck. In seconds, the truck barreled down the street. Margaret stood in her driveway, unsure of what she had witnessed. She walked back inside, locking her door. She stumped down on the couch, taking off her sock. The place where her pinky toe once had been was now a stump.
there is a small town, and in the middle of that town is a river. It's filled with strange fish and thorns and branches. It's almost like the river is trying to prevent people from crossing it. The other side of the river looks like it's perpetually nighttime, but in the distance, sometimes a town can be seen. The town's folk on the bright side say that the dark side is a twisted version of the bright side, with strange people and animals under the never setting moon. They say a boy named Victor and his sister Molly moved to town. They made some friends, went on campouts, and made forts like normal kids. But one thing they could never forget was the other side. Their friends, Tim and Susie, were interested in the other side too. All the kids were warned to stay away, but they didn't listen. One night, the kid walked through the forest and swam across the river. When they reached the bank, all noise stopped. No owls hooted, no crickets chirped, just silence. They pressed on. Eventually, the kids made it to a town. It looked just like the town they came from, but the buildings were crooked and the windows dark. Strange, tall people wandered aimlessly, wearing top hats and gloves that hid their eyes and hands. They would look at the kids, shake their heads, and move on. Hey, wait, isn't that Nana? Victor cried. Molly looked closer and realized the person who had just passed them looked like their grandmother, but taller, and without her wheelchair. Before they could ponder the significance of this, four of the people approached them. They looked at the kids and nodded. They threw off their top hats and gloves, and the kids realized that these people were four copies of them. But they had bright yellow eyes and long, sharp claws instead of fingernails. They started walking towards the kids. Everyone run, Susie shouted. The kids scattered and ran towards the river. The copies stared at them as they ran. Then they raised their heads and shrieked. It sounded like a demon from the depths of hell laughing and nails on a chalkboard. Then they started to follow. The kids ran and Victor heard three screams in rapid succession from his left, right, and behind him. He dove into the river and swam as fast as he could to the other side. His copy followed. He sprinted through the woods, stumbling over roots and rocks, desperate to get home, but he couldn't run forever. That night, four kids went back to their homes, tucked themselves into bed, and closed their yellow eyes. You may wonder why I'm telling you this. It's because I replaced my original long ago, and We've already replaced most of our originals, so I want to give the few smart ones some time to run. But no matter where you go, on the other side of a river near you, there will be a twisted, dark land with a copy of you that wants nothing more than to dump your body in the river and replace you. Sweet dreams.